Hello and welcome to Sunday here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed and my goodness me we are glad to be back after of course yesterday's action here at Goodwood was cancelled for the first time in the history of the Festival of Speed due to weather as you can see it's still about we've still got a fair bit of wind but the sun is shining and David Green we're happy to be here ahead of Sunday shootout and so much more to come. Well as you say it was such a shame to miss yesterday but the important thing is we're back and it's an action-packed day so really looking forward to it. Yeah we are absolutely looking Looking forward to what is Sunday here at Goodwood Festival of Speed. Much to come and so much to bring you here on the final day of this year's festival. Well, as you can see from that weather, very much has been a talking point so far for this festival. The winds have died down enough and we are in action today. First glance and road bikes is up first at 8.30 a.m. with batch 6A, the supercars at 9.10. We'll see a Ken Block moment honoring his life in batch one. Tin Tops Drift Rally and WRC at 9.50. Goodwood 75, 75 years of motorsport here at 10.30. Lotus moment, McLaren GP greats and MotoGP, a real celebration there at 11.50. 15, 75 years of Porsche at midday and the celebration moment at 12.35 p.m. before Le Mans, NASCAR and sport races at 12.40. That is your morning and looking ahead then into the afternoon. McLaren, Lotus, GP Greats, MotoGP and Jeff Beck cars back out 1.20 p.m. before the shootout. That's where things get really spicy, get really interesting on this hill. Indeed, in conditions we've not really seen so far either. 2.10 p.m. for that one before more celebration. Goodwood 75, Porsche 75, Le Mans at NASCAR sports races. Supercars back again at 5.15. First glance and road bikes at 5.55 p.m. Before Drift Carna, Tin Tops Rally and WRC, a very fun way to finish off Sunday here at Goodwood. That is the schedule. That's how things line up today. And David, you came in yesterday, didn't you? And obviously saw the conditions that we had firsthand. I was in a, the hotel just a couple of miles down the road and we could see how windy it was. We're just trying to explain the conditions and indeed why we didn't see any action here yesterday. Well, we've had pretty much four seasons on, on uh, Thursday and Friday, but it was the weather, the wind that got us finally yesterday. I think, you know, you've got to imagine festival speed is mostly temporary structures and the wind was, you know, over 50 miles an hour gusts yesterday. It just simply wasn't safe enough to have everybody here. You know, we had a, we presented the show from the house, which was fun in itself, but it was a real shame for the, for the fans and the drivers not to, not to have that day they would normally have on the Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. It was, but we are back today. We'll be celebrating as many cars as we can here. Lotus, McLaren and indeed Maserati as well. Take a look at this. Yeah, terrific there to see Maserati in all its glory. Just one of the many cars we're celebrating here uh, at Goodwood Festival of Speed, the 30th anniversary edition of this great celebration of car culture and motorsport. Batch six, first class of pro bikes is getting underway. So we can now head up to your commentators, Alex Jakes and Henry Catchwell. Good morning, chaps. 
Good morning, Laura Winter. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Festival of Speed, where Henry Catchpole, we begin with a Maserati out on the hill climb. Absolutely, it's a, a very good way to start the day. So this is the Maserati Ghibli 334 Ultima, which is um, saying goodbye to the V8 engine, really. We've obviously seen that there's going to be this new V6, which you've already driven in the MC20, the Nituno engine, which is a fantastic engine with the pre-ignition very clever engine but this is say saying goodbye to the the v8 we all love a v8 don't we we certainly do v8 maserati as well it just feels right it has been their history it has been their heritage but this is our opening run of the day it is great to see so many of you already in on site and we thank everyone who managed to make the site safe yesterday uh, continued the still good prep on site. Great to have you all back behind the straw bales today as we finish this first run. And what an action packed day it is as we head across the line there and put our first time on the board. Plenty still to come. This was the opening run and a little bit of dust kicked up at turn one. <laughs> yes, yeah, always, always a good thing to do. Makes you feel sort of nice. Gets the car a bit squirrely going up in front of the house as well here. And um, Yes, it's a, what a way to start the day. OK, further down we go. And looking at this uh, retro livery on the Porsche. Yes, this is a car that um, certainly should be quite happy clipping a bit of grass on the way up. This is the 911 Dakar. And you can also see the optional roof rack with it, with all the um, extras on it, just to put it a little further <laughs> afield than your average 911. Obviously, the 911 is such a versatile car through the years, sort of, you know, doing everything from uh, racing at Le Mans to taking on the Paris Dakar and the WRC as well in its time. It's time. This is the uh, special livery that you can have on this car, uh, the Rough Roads livery, as, as they call it, or uh, you guess what it is <laughs> imitating from the past. We, we are moving on now and uh, kicking the rear end out with the Aston Martin. Yes, this is the Aston Martin DBX 707 when it's launched. It was um, to be the fastest SUV in the world, and it is incredibly quick and amazingly agile as well for such a big car. And you see a fantastic shade of green. You see there just how oversteery this can get, which is not perhaps what you expect to see with a big SUV, but it's uh, yeah, incredibly agile going up the hill there. So we are sending up. Uh, a variety here in the first batch of the day uh, giving you the uh, first glance as well is what we call this batch so we're looking at new models uh, launched here where in days of old it would be a sheet off a car in an exhibition hall the manufacturers now much preferring to show it in real life in motion and that's what we're seeing once again so this is a new MG we can see going up the hill it's uh, due in the summer of 2024 uh, apparently, and it's obviously something of a, a resurgence for MG that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, 0-60 in under three seconds for this car, and more than 450 brake horsepower possible. And it's meant to have about 270 miles of range as well, and it's expected to cost about £50,000, so it seems like a lot of performance for the money with that. This has been a, a real favourite so far this weekend, uh, having a look at the aim that is currently, the silver aim that is currently leaving the line. Absolutely, and this is a this is a fascinating little car. I sort of thoroughly recommend you go and have a look at this in the first glance paddock because it's a beautiful piece of design, um, and uh, yeah, you can see that wonderful sort of almost sort of zagato esque in the way that it has that that roof going over the top there. It is so good that the weather seems set fair. It is still quite windy out there, but we expect nice warm conditions for the entirety of the Sunday here at the 30th anniversary edition of the Festival of Speed. The uh, aim is, is obviously all electric, uh, 490 brake horsepower, and it was uh, the GTR designer, in fact, who came up with this. Uh, weighs about 1,400 kilos, and uh, yeah, it could become a production model. I rather hope it does. It's sort of um, nice to see something, see small cars going up the hill. And from one extreme to another, we are, uh, we're now seeing Plenty, and this is the joy at the first glance. We've got the uh, Range Rover now climbing the hill, and uh, we're having a look. It's the P510E uh, that is currently making its way to the top. 
I was lucky enough to go on the launch of the new Range Rover uh, out in America as well. And it's just, it's, it takes everything that is Range Rover and just accentuates it for this new model. And it's, again, surprisingly good to drive. These cars are now such good all-rounders. We obviously expect them to be good off-road and to be wonderfully luxurious and to um, be able to go from the farmhouse to the opera house, I think was the original line for these. But now you get in them and with the rear wheel steering on something like this, they, they become incredibly agile as well. Uh, yeah, the, the the pressure of a test day when you're when you're behind the wheel, we're all queuing up to, to to enjoy for the first time. You were speaking about doing that with uh, with the supercars that we'll see uh, on the hill later on as well. Uh, I imagine on launch day of any vehicle, there's a little bit of pressure not to get anything wrong and to get all the information you need for your written report on it. Yes, it's always a certain amount of pressure. You sort of learn to trust yourself after all these years and yeah. you know, have the experience to. Um, just say what you see, I suppose, and sort of and, and trust yourself. But there's always a bit of pressure, certainly, to get the um, photography, or in, in my case, a lot of the, the video stuff during the day, and, and uh, work out where you're going, assess it on the roads that you're on. But that's um, a, a wonderful, the joy of the job. And the Tesla is now making its way uh, up the hill, and uh, that's the uh, Tesla X that is uh, currently uh, debuting. Uh, in your vision, whether you be on site or you be joining us wherever you are in the world on the uh, on the live stream. And the screech of the tyres, the only noise that you're going to hear. And once again, you know, it's a it's a big car, but not 62 miles an hour and just 2.6 seconds for this car, which is uh, yeah, absolutely. So we are we're flying early on. We've got so many vehicles heading to the top, and now the unmistakable shape. It doesn't matter, matter what era it is, it is the unmistakable shape of the Mustang. And uh, this one, the Dark Horse, so-called, and uh, making its way through as well. And the variety, always so enjoyable here. We've gone from the Mustang to the Ford Explorer, which is a bit of a contrast. Absolutely, the Ford Explorer. So first time we're seeing this here, obviously, fully electric and um, very striking piece of design, I think, uh, this car. And one something I think we're seeing a lot with electric cars and the design is actually it's, it's often quite hard to get an impression of the size of these vehicles. Some look sort of larger than you expect, some actually much, much smaller than you expect when you see them. That's obviously the joy of coming to Goodwood and being able to sort of walk around them and see them up close. It really is, really is as well. And certainly the uh, electric vehicle era has has led to design aesthetics being pushed further and further and further as uh, as companies try to try to match the technology under the bonnet with uh, with what we're seeing aesthetically something that feels like the future has certainly led to the styling of the bodywork absolutely and and i think this is something um about the sort of the, the, your Q car idea is sort of being completely changed and rewritten with EVs coming along because um, obviously now you just don't know how fast something is going to be, probably incredibly quick if it is an EV. Now coming off the start line here, we can see uh, the Alpine, which is um, a wonderful little car, this incredibly light and agile and uh, you just get a wonderful flow down the road when you drive this car and then produce a few special editions which they're um, bringing it along obviously to here. This is the Enstone edition. Uh, Enstone obviously being where the Alpine Formula One team is based, um, actually not too far from me. Yes, the A110RS, uh, the Enstone edition being piloted by Abby Pulling, whose name you will recognize from F1 Academy and W Series before that. Had to be in bright and early this morning to get behind the wheel and she was getting her money's worth there. Uh, pushing on, and uh, the first real attacking run that we have seen. And uh, again, continuing the, the sheer variety on show, we're now to hydrogen fuel cell powered machinery. Yes, and this is the Ineos Grenadier going up here with the hydrogen fuel cell on board. Obviously, we've seen launch of um, various Grenadiers here this weekend, and it was a, uh, a good time for Ineos, actually, because they're, they're Grenadiers uh, cycling team, they took a victory in the Tour de France yesterday, so they will be um, cock a hoop, as they say. <laughs> There's good knowledge. There's good knowledge across the board. We're covering all sporting bases, as uh, is the, the real 
uh, design and the, the ethos of uh, Sir Jim Radcliffe, who is uh, always, he's got shareholdings in, in football teams, in the Mercedes Formula One team as well. He's got the cycling team. He's trying to buy Man United and has been for about the last six months of his life. But this, the, uh, the, the tangible result of an amazing pub conversation that uh, you'll know, you'll be instantly reminded of, uh, of what they're trying to not imitate, just trying to keep going, really. He's, uh, that's, the, that's the joy of being a billionaire, where you can recreate your favourite car. Absolutely. Take the ethos on and, and make it live on into the future. It's, uh, yes, an impressive piece of kit. Now, obviously, you're going off the line. We've got the uh, Bentley Flying Spur, um, which is... Uh, uh, this is also powered by renewable fuels, uh, which is a massive theme for this weekend. We know we've got Sebastian Vettel here. Um, yes. Obviously, and he's, he's championing that cause, as Paddy Lowe has been for some time as well with his um, Zero Petroleum company. And it's, it's fascinating. I, I find it absolutely fascinating, this um, idea of the e-fuels e and things like that and how we are going to be able to still enjoy all these cars in the future. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a modern solution. Uh, it's, a, it's a sideways analogy, but the analogy I, I would make is that you had a load of film directors a few years ago buying up the remaining Kodak stock. And I think there was potentially a little bit of a fear that if we're abandoning traditional fuels, which uh, you know, the manufacturers are all going in different directions to the internal combustion engine, what was going to power the historic machinery that we love and that is such the lifeblood of this event and solutions, of course, this being uh, motoring, this being motorsport, have been found. And you're going to see plenty climbing the hill today that is uh, is powered by you so you've got a variety you've got your electric vehicles you've got your traditional internal combustion engines and you've got the synthetic renewable fuel the headline act of which will be sebastian vettel uh, who was uh, who was disappointed that he couldn't run yesterday we were disappointed that we couldn't run anything yesterday but uh, he will be heading up the hill in uh, one of his magnificent car collections it will be a mclaren from 1993. That'll be absolutely fantastic to see that. And it's obviously one of the things we've seen the various manufacturers getting behind all sorts of different uh, things. And we've obviously had Porsche, who've um, had their plant out in Chile for their, their e-fuels out there, um, trying to bring the cost down of that. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to see what all the mines are coming up with um, to keep this sport that we all love going on into the future. Daniel Peck looks like he's just... Uh just stationary at the moment in the Ferrari. It's a Lotus in oh, sorry, just, sorry. Uh, just on the hill. I think right. No, but it's interesting you say that, though. It's sort of because it is a car that I was lucky enough to drive uh, again on the launch a couple of times, actually. I had a couple of goes at it. I drove it down uh, to Mont Ventoux for Evo magazine and then um, for video. Um, actually, further up north, um, took it back to, to Dunn's, um, obviously home of um, Jim Clark. And um, it's it's a car that is for at its price point lots of people um, could have mistaken it for um, a, a, a much more expensive supercar <laughs> and it, it, it turned heads at 50 paces literally wherever you parked it and whatever color it was in i drove a yellow one and you think well yes that's all going to catch the attention but uh, um, the, even the, the gray one we drove um, yeah, really caught the attention of everybody this is the first public showing of the i4 amira and this is the first glance category uh, currently on pause, which gives us a chance to check in with you on the left and the right of the straw bales here. There is so much to see on the infield. You've got all the manufacturers showing off everything, uh, including all of this first glance batch that we've seen here. We've seen loads of action and we've seen loads of launches as the red flag was, uh, was flown and, uh, and we are parked up as a result and a slight halt to proceedings as we get this is the first group of the day whether you've been in bright and early whether you've just wandered in and you are clutching on to tea and coffee um, hope you're happy it's great to have you back there is unrelenting action all the way to seven o'clock this evening and uh, this is this is one of the uh, the recreations that we're seeing uh, you're thinking why is that in first glance uh, well that is uh, one of the uh, bespoke uh, recreations of the machinery and that is why we've got the red flag out on the circuit 
And it's worth talking for those of you who can see the Lotus Amira on the hill at the moment. As you mentioned, this is the, the well, debut of the uh, inline four engine, which is a Mercedes sourced engine, incredibly powerful. We've seen it in the A45 AMG, which is a fantastic little car. Um, lots of Formula One tech in that engine. And um, yeah, in turbocharged, obviously, so many of them are these days. And the Emira was launched with the, the V6, the sort of very V6 that we'd seen in things like the uh, Emira in the past and a manual gearbox, but this gets the, uh, the dual clutch box um, along with the inline four, which is, uh, yeah, I think will really broaden the appeal of that car, actually. I think it, it could be a, uh, a very interesting development for it. Looking great, and now on the move again, everyone giving the camera, and, and you know that's what you've got to do. If you're on the big screen, you've got to give us a wave. Uh, and we're waving back at you from the commentary box as we are looking like we're about to get back underway. Uh, the uh, recreation of the uh, Bentley has been pushed behind the bales and we're sending the Amira back to the top of the hill after a short interruption. And uh, we had, of course, no running yesterday. Day before was very wet. It's great to see a little bit more attack on the hill. Because if you're going to send the car out, you want a little bit of motion. We had that with the first run of the day with the Maserati kicking up a little bit of dust at turn one. And uh, uh, we are uh, cycling through once again uh, with, uh, just to give you an idea of what's coming up in front of you in the, in the next couple of hours, the first glance uh, of these uh, new uh, models and machines. Uh, Polestar now, I believe, uh, lining up. And uh, then, later on, uh, we will have supercars. Henry will be guiding us through plenty that he sat behind the wheel of. And, and then, later on, we'll have a tribute to Ken Block, the tin top, the drift, the rally, and 50-year celebration of the WRC uh, before. And there are anniversaries absolutely everywhere you'd look, uh, with uh, Goodwood 75 taking us to 11 o'clock. And you can see the Polestar 2 edition 230 going up the hill at the moment, taking quite a lot of grass on turn two there. And it's really interesting. This is a, a Tesla rival in some respects. And this is the more performance orientated version. But when the Model 2 was, um, oh, post to Polestar 2 was launched, uh, it was interesting from an enthusiast point of view because it had these very fancy Olin's uh, adjustable dampers uh, in the arches, which is, I think, piqued the interest of an awful lot of people. A lot of pole stars here this weekend, actually. Yeah, a sea of pole stars that are uh, running all the way through. And this, uh, too, the edition 230. So some of the first glances, if, if the eagle-eyed amongst you are, uh, are aware that you might have seen something that looks similar before, we're looking at a lot of uh, specific models. Uh, like, like we saw with the Alpine and the Enstone edition. And uh, I'm liking the lines. I'm liking the lines. Why, wide on the way in, I can tell you, having looked out of the commentary box window, wide on the way out. Who said track limits? Eh? <laughs> oh, it's nice to have a Sunday without track limits. <laughs> Terrific. As we go across the line, that's the Polestar 3 that's just completed its run. Yeah, it's Polestar 3. And then if you go and have a look, there's the Polestar 5 as well, which is um, yet to be released, but it's their first bespoke chassis that's uh, uh, unique to them. Uh, Genesis going on. So the Genesis uh, currently is the uh, GV80, uh, the concept for the Genesis Motor Company. Um, and striking as it makes its way through as well. And uh, more and more attack, it's good to see. More and more uh, pushing, oh, slightly backing off through Malkin Corner, probably wise given what, certainly what we saw on, on, on Thursday where uh, we were trying to trying to create our own line down there at, at different times. <laughs> yes, it's Gethin Jones behind the wheel. It's um, uh, been unfortunate enough to co-drive for me in a rally car <laughs> in the past. So, um, uh, yeah, giving yourself a much nicer, quieter Sunday today. But um, cars looking really good. Those distinctive headlights, which you've seen uh, before with Genesis, and that's the way they wrap all the way around the car. And it's nice to see a, a genuine concept going up the hill, uh, something that we're obviously used to seeing concepts at most shows, just static, but this is fantastic actually on the move. And there's Gethin across the line safely. And completing, completing our run to the line. got the Storato going up the hill at the moment. This is a Land Mini Storato, so the Huracan V10 naturally aspirated engine, but in the same way that we saw the Paris-Dakar 
the Dakar 911 earlier. Mm. This is Lamborghini's version of that. We're seeing more and more of these. This is akin to yes. gravel road bikes, I suppose. This um, trend for being able to go um, off the, the beaten track slightly in something <laughs> unlikely. That does not look anywhere here raised high enough that it might need to be in comparison to the fortune that we saw earlier on. It is not just cars in this uh, first glance as well. We are sending the bikes up the hill and uh, great to see as well the great uh, uh, james hayden's going to be behind the microphone throughout the day guiding you through and uh, it is going to be superb stuff as he does that as well uh, we're seeing these are so these are these road bikes that we're sending up now and uh, and yeah great to be able to see the variety i'm certainly that they are glad for a dry and less windy day uh, today to make their way up the hill. Colourful leathers that we've got um, going up the hill at the moment. So we'll be running through this just to take you through the rest of the day as well because it is absolutely packed. There is so much to enjoy as we continue with the uh, bikes climbing to the finish point. Just a check behind. And uh, we're, we're, running, we're running to pack as much in as possible as we go through. And uh, currently now in your picture is the uh, Yamaha. This is the DB40 prototype. And they are running thick and fast as we make our way through. So these are all road bikes. This is all part of the first glance that is starting the Sunday at the 30th Festival of Speed. And this is the XR, uh, the XSR, I should say, 900, the DB40 prototype. And this is the demonstration run that we're not we're not setting any times we're well we're not setting any times we're going to tell you but uh, this was uh, fantastic scenes off the line as well and i have to say obviously the the disappointment yesterday the right decision taken for the right reasons but it is so good to see all of this action and finally we are burning rubber on the hill once more Incredible rolling burnout all the way up in front of the house. I think we're going to get another one just coming up towards the Malcolm corner here. And this is the Triumph. It is the supercharged speed triple drift. You might have already guessed that. Jody Milhouse uh, behind the bars doing a phenomenal job of laying down a trail all the way up the hill. And uh, what a tonic this is after yesterday's silence, the noise, the sights, the sounds back on the hill climb, back at the festival of speed. And that is uh, built for drifting, and you could you could see why. Yeah, you see the long swing arm at the back of that, uh, giving the extra stability on it, a bit like a, a drag bike. Okay, we're heading back to uh, heading back to the cars now, by the uh, looks of things. And that's a, that's a great sound. Uh, we're getting plenty plenty of rubber laid down there. hearing from our esteemed colleagues in the gallery that this is going to be a timed run. So, maximum attack, I'm all for it. Uh, this early on a Sunday, why not? And uh, it's been a while that we've seen, so this is the uh, the Austral E-Tech Renault, uh, also in the uh, in the uh, full glance. I think uh, first glance. R5 Turbo 3 E-Tech, which has um, actually been built as a drift car, uh, which is, uh, yeah, obviously... Um, harking back to the past, but it's, it's all fully electric, and um, what a cool-looking thing this is. Setting a time on the board. Not sure if we'll be able to tell you the time. No, we will be able to tell you the time. Every, everything working wonderfully at the start of the day. And, uh, and Lee Bristow is behind the wheel, and attacking all the way to the final stage. We saw a magnificent run one year ago, and we have a time, our first time, on the board, which uh, is nice to see. So we're combining a lot of things. I think it's going to be this way all the way through the day uh, because we're trying to cram as much in for your viewing pleasure today. And we're uh, back to Hyundai and uh, we're back to their Ionic uh, 5N, which was launched here on Thursday. And we've obviously sort of had a lot of the um, Hyundai N brand in the uh, recent years and really doing fantastic things but this is um uh, yes this is the electric version of the uh, n brand and it's the ionic 5 and that distinctive n blue n obviously standing for nurburgring yeah the, the team based there of course south korean company and very proud to launch the car here and 
uh, we were we were hearing the the concept that they're trying to match for an EV to maintain the same emotion that we have had in previously. So they're, they're trying different things with different sounds and uh, trying to create the uh, emotion behind the wheel for a high performance uh, model, which this is. And it really is possible with all the other things, obviously, sort of you, you lose some sound in some respects, but as you said, you can replace it with other sounds. And it comes back with things like obviously the steering, the feel um, through the seat for your pants. They, they, they add so much to the driving experience. And, and we sort of seeing the Porsches go up the hill now. The, something like the Taycan GTS really shows what can be done in terms of giving driver involvement with an EV as uh, Taycan uh, goes past the commentary box just now. What a fantastic car that is. Really good looking as well in the Grand Turismo version. It is indeed. We have completed our first batch of the day. It has disappeared before you know it. The course cars are the last cars. Checking everything is present and correct. And uh, getting the uh, the nod and the salute from the marshal outside by Coventry Box. Uh, nice touch. Nice touch down there. <laughs> as uh, we are checking everything is clear. If you see yourself on the big screen, do give us a wave. It's great to have you all rolling in. And uh, it is great to have your company back by the side of the players. Looking at the magnificent structure celebrating all things Porsche. As we run you through the highlights of the first glance from Maseratis to Porsches, whether they be built for performance or off-road, we have kicked things off in some style we've also seen that's one of my favorites of the weekend the aim down there but all sizes all shapes all brand new models and all i think we saw that in the live run but great to see some attacking runs this the dark horse the mustang that has come through here and that was a uh, choose your own adventure into the first turn for the first of the alpines this was the uh, this was the second of them and we had a momentary pause as we did so gave us a chance to look at what is most definitely a lotus down there and the uh, first running of the i4 as well and then we made our way through the pole stars plenty brought to this event wide on the way in wide on the way out and this was our concluding vehicle as well the very stylishly driven lamborghini And a timed run enjoying as well how that speaks to Renault's fantastic small car attacking philosophy and the Hyundai that has launched this weekend. Let's send it to the top of the hill. Ben, one of the first cars up the hill uh, this Sunday morning. The sun's shining, the wind's dropping. Uh, there are worse cars to come up in, aren't, isn't, aren't there? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> it's fantastic to drive the new Dakar car. That's my first run in the car. So been admiring it all weekend. So uh, lovely to jump in there. First run up the hill. And it's just good to be back after our day off, as you say. And obviously reminiscent of the Dakar winner. Uh, I've got to ask, what's, you've obviously got fuel, uh, the plates for getting out of tricky situations but what's in your bag have you got loads of wet weather gear or is <laughs> <laughs> i should have a look i'm not sure what's in the bag that'd be quite interesting yeah maybe some snacks for later and what kind of people are buying these because it's it's not your normal porsche is it sort of someone with a villa in the south of france that has a sort of gravelly track up to it yeah i think so and just true enthusiasts you know there's all sorts people putting them into collections those who are really going to use them I've, I've spoken to quite a few customers that are using them daily so it's it's a real mixture but yeah it's an interesting car with such a vol uh, low volume two and a half thousand globally so it's um a real enthusiast car ben thank you pleasure Paul, Adrian, a very bright and sunny Sunday morning. Uh, were you at the party last night? We certainly were, yeah. It was a fantastic show, but uh, I was drinking water. <laughs> now, Adrian, you're, you're sort of leaning on the car you came up the hill in. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it was uh, my first time in the Mackie. I was quite impressed by the, the talk on the electric car. So, honestly, it was, it was good fun. It's also a really nice atmosphere in, in, uh, in Goodwood, so it's a pleasure. And how's the, uh, the hill this morning? Is there, is there any grip at all? Well, I don't know. I have gravel tires on the car, so it's difficult to know if, if there is gravel. I, I see that there is some dirt, so probably from the first day with the rain. So I think it will be a bit slippery when I will be in the Puma. Paul, you, you, you don't want grip, do you, with things that you do? 
Uh, yeah, well, we, we do like a little bit of grip, um, but no, we try our hardest to uh, break the traction and to have some fun. And obviously with 500 brake horsepower, uh, it's very easy. <laughs> I get the impression that this, this Mustang you, is what the one car that you really want to take home. Yeah, I, I think probably this might be my fourth time driving Mustang at a Festival of Speed. Um, obviously, we've had the bullet and the first first glance of the Mustang. So, no, I um, absolutely love the car. Do you think you'll be able to take one home? Uh, I'm just going to keep going. Once, uh, after the last, we're in the last batch at six o'clock, so it's going to go straight out the top gate. Perfect. I won't tell anyone. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great to hear from those who have kicked us off on this Goodwood shootout Sunday. Uh, let's hear more now. We're talking, uh, we're talking drifting, we're talking the bikes, and we're talking to Jody Milhouse. Jody, I'd, I very occasionally ride a bike myself, and the one thing I wouldn't need is, I think this has 400 brake horsepower, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it, up to 400 horsepower. So it's a Triumph Speed Triple 1200 RR, weighs 187 kilograms with up to 400 horsepower does that with a supercharger and have water meth injection as well. And this is a drift bike? That's it, it's designed to go sideways. So uh, I've had to teach myself how to drift in the last couple of weeks, which is interesting. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, for, we've done all the testing on the, uh, on the hill here. It's taken seven months to put together. So we've got active aerodynamics on the front of the bike. We've got water meth injection, which is a water meth tank inside the full billet swing arm, full carbon body, fire, body work, it's just fantastic. And what is the secret to drifting a bike? Uh, wheel speed, actually. Wheel speed. It's, uh, it's so tempting to just shift up through the gears, going to sixth and sort of cruising along at 100 mile an hour underneath the hill. The problem is the wheel gets away with you. So uh, bang down into the gears, second and third gear around those corners, nice and far forward. But again, that stretched out swing arm really does help. And you're obviously not paying for your own tyres. <laughs> well, funnily enough, I am actually. Michelin, hit me up. <laughs> Jody, it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll tell you get arrested she's sitting in my new sheet we still get a messy I've been in love. Hear them start and then.
so GP Paddock, yes, for one of the first time, and I don't know how long, we haven't had a calendar clash. So we have MotoGP out in full force, plus plenty more on two wheels as well. So we thought we'd get the resident expert in to chat through it all. James, welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, what a collection of motorcycles we've got. We go back from the 1949 AGS Porcupine, the first bike ever to win the World Championship, to behind me here, Pekka Banyaya's uh, 2023 Ducati Desmo di Sedici. Uh, look at this bike here, and just look how much they've come on now. Look at the aerodynamics. This has got 265 brake horsepower, super clever electronics. Look at the rear diffusers on it, huge brakes. This is probably, in my opinion, the best racing motorcycle ever built. It's one, two, three in the World Championship right now, and it is so amazing to see it here at Goodwood. Yeah, that is incredible as well. And look, it's attracting such a crowd around as well. So no doubt, one of the absolute best in the biz. We'll move on because there are so many bikes lined up and we have you to give us an exclusive tour as well. Yeah, as you can see here, there's another range of the old uh, Desmo Sedici's from Ducati. We've got Rossi's bike here. Uh, next to it is uh, Capra Rossi's, then Gibbonau's, and then number 27, that's uh, Casey Stoner's bike. That was his 2008 bike that he won the World Championship on. He's here, so we're going to be seeing him ride that up the hill. And again, you can see the difference, even how simple, you know, compared to all these modern aerodynamics they've got now, how, how much more simple they look. Um, but it's not just those guys. It's not just the latest MotoGP bikes. We've got you know, Mick Doohan, five-time world champion, um, riding his you know, V4 two-stroke. We've got Kevin Schwantz celebrating his 93 world championship. It's exactly 30 years. Obviously, it's 30 years of the Festival of Speed, so there's a, a lovely sort of tie-up there. Yeah. Um, Freddie Spencer, you know, you name it. Next door here, we've got the, uh, the Aprilia uh, RSGP. Uh, what a great bike this is as well. Uh, Maverick Vinales, Alessio Espargaro and this bike has been superb this year and again I think it's absolutely stunning in that matte black really great looking bike um, this is a slightly older version as the Anoni's version um, so the Maniac and so we've got such a collection of different stuff as we get next door we can see one of the first bikes we see number one Kenny Roberts Jr's that's his world championship winning RGV 500 from 2000 um, so we really have a good collection and then we've got some of Barry Sheen's you know we got his old 500 here Yamaha we got his uh, Suzuki here uh, and then we've got this amazing collection of uh, of RGVs we got you know the Kevin Schwantz's as we say lovely to see Kevin Schwantz's world championship winning bike um, and look at this it's one of the iconic motorcycles number 34 kevin schwantz's pepsi suzuki and uh, they used to call him revving kevin <laughs> and he'd have that thing sideways all over the place so so great to see that um some more obviously of uh you know, rgv 500s here and the, uh, the old rg 500 as well again another uh, very early uh, sheen bike here uh, so really good. This is an Anthony Gobert. Um, they're quite rare. He wasn't on for that long, Anthony Gobert. So, I mean, just even looking down this shed, it is like absolute. Just if you're into bikes, it's incredible. Oh, I can tell you are, James. Thank you so much for that. An absolute who's who in the world of motorbikes. Thank you very much for that. MotoGP and indeed more on two wheels coming up very, very soon. The supercars, though, are out in force now. Let's hand you back to Alex and Henry. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, wonderful to see the MotoGP paddock down there. And uh, yeah, really, really appreciate you guys giving us a splendid tour of a splendid part of this site. And we move now to back six, or as you all know it, the supercars that are about to head out there. And we're, uh, we're beginning with uh, uh, the 300 SLR, a bit of a, a throwback. Uh, that has been there, uh, but we're also going to see uh, plenty of high performance vehicles in the next section of the run, Henry. Uh, yes, as you look at that view there, you can just see the modern air vents in this giving away uh, exactly what this is, and it's not quite what it appears there. There we are, it's the SLR going up the hill over the top, fairly breezy, fairly obviously with a black screen, screen there. So we're looking at the uh, there you go the uh, the Sterling Moss edition. So this is the uh, recreation uh, that was out a few years ago, and 
and the collaboration with McLaren there. Setting us off, uh, we're going to see, so we have run these cars up the hill so far this weekend, but this is going to be the first time that we see them on Shootout Sunday, uh, that timed run later on. The SLR is a fascinating uh, machine, actually. I think it's become more and more popular as the years have gone by. Perhaps a little misunderstood when it first came out. Uh, people perhaps expecting something different with that McLaren name on it. But um, I was lucky enough to drive the uh, SLR uh, HDK, so the uh, Downforce Kit version, um, earlier this year. And, uh, yeah, I want an absolute beast of the car. Like, almost long drive, the wonderful doors on that one that upswept and side exit exhaust so now we've got the uh, Ferrari 599 XX the XX programming the track only program 599 one of the best sounding V12s Ferraris they they really did get it absolutely right with this engine and it's um, yeah, naturally aspirated uh, V12 and I think it's just it's just almost never been been bettered I think yeah plenty of cars that we see competing Ferrari have of course so much uh, in the way of motorsport circuit machinery that we are that we are seeing we've uh, seen their trophy car climb the hill as well this more of a, more of a bespoke model Henry yes so this is the Ferrari this is the KC23 so Ferrari as well as their XX program has been hugely successful and inspired a lot of other manufacturers uh, they've also been doing these, these much more um, bespoke programs and and this car is in fact based on a Ferrari 488 GTE race car um, and just going past the commentary box now to a very good line through Malcolm there and yeah, it's, it, it, for the owner that kind of really has perhaps all the other models and this, this program to work it's really very much with Ferrari and have, have a one of one which is, uh, yeah, I can't imagine what that must be like. Incredibly special. Absolutely. Absolutely. What a privilege as uh, Raffaele Di Simone takes it across the line and completes that hill climb. So we're in the uh, supercar batch. We started the day with the first glance and we are now in to supercar territory. And now we've got a now Garni Zonda yes. on the start line here. This is road spec, and again, just a fabulous sounding V12 engine. It's those distinctive uh, four rocket exhausts coming out the back of the Zonda, and um, yeah, we Horatio, I think, would have liked to sort of put the uh, Zonda to bed many years ago, but it just kept getting more and more owners saying, please, one more, just one more. What, what hey, a please. terrific problem to have. What a, what a marvellous issue that you create something so popular, you can't move on. And uh, there are plenty of very expensive projects that have gone the wrong way, have gone the other way in automotive history. So the, uh, the distinctive sight and sound of the Zonda, a celebration as it continues to move on. And this one's from 2021. Absolutely. And uh, Pagani, obviously, a, a, a tiny company, really. We've seen the, um, the Utopia being launched uh, as sort of dynamic debut here this weekend as well. Uh, the Wira was the uh, successor to the Zonda, and they all just have these spectacular interiors. If you get down to the supercar paddock, then go and have a look uh, at that. Uh, this also from Lanzantis, this is the Tag Turbo, so this actually has Stephanie Hansen's uh, F1 engine in the back of it, uh, one that he did actually race. And as you can see, it's, it's a bit of an art car here as well, I think reminiscent uh, of the uh, Jeff Koons um, BMW that raced at Le Mans. But this is uh, Stephanie Hansen, his dad does artwork, and this is his own design on the car. And uh, you can definitely see the, the speed uh, reminiscent or evoked in that uh, my dissertation at university was bmw art cars so there we go i feel like i'm actually like finally putting it to some sort of use in my job <laughs> <laughs> yes dissertations come in handy at the at the strangest possible times but uh nice nice correlation there that works that, that worked out well uh there will be plenty of you with your cameras getting uh, the most wonderful angles of the most wonderful machinery we're moving uh, further down the line now and uh, we're running through as much as possible slight delay earlier on so uh, as I look out of the commentary box window and can see already in comparison 
to uh, earlier days. It is, it is great to see so many of you already well, three or four deep by the straw bales as we send another Lamborghini up the hill. So this is the Lamborghini Huracan STO. So this is the uh, the most extreme version of the Huracan that we, that we have, certainly in terms of um, a, a road or track-based one. And it's a fabulous car, so I was lucky enough to drive it. Um, last year and it's it's just that bit stiffer that bit more sort of uh, stripped out inside and also you see the roof scoop out there it's supposed to help with uh, in fact sort of cooling through the engine it doesn't actually connect to the engine in terms of any form of induction but the wonderful sound of that naturally aspirated v10 in that car and it's a car from the hurricane that has just been getting better and better and better and if you get into the paddock you'll also see the hurricane technica down there which takes an awful lot of what um, this sto gives you but in then a slightly sort of more livable, slightly less hardcore package. Takes a lot of the learnings in terms of the rear wheel steer and things like that. Uh, it is rear wheel drive, this Hurricane STO, and a fabulous bit of kit it is too. So ticking through the order and we move uh, we move on once more so this is the uh, hurricane evo spider so obviously if you like your symphonies open air then this is the one for you and as i say the hurricane is just it's, it's born out of the, uh, the gallardo originally before it and um, the spider as well is a, a fabulous car and obviously we that beat him that little bit better and gone are the days obviously where the spider used to be the sort of the, the poor relation in terms of driving in some respects now these are um, cars that really do stack up as driver's cars as well and now we have the very latest uh, Lamborghini this is the Revuelto um, which hasn't um, never driven it yet but so this keeps the V12 in Lamborghini which I think everybody is exceptionally pleased about but obviously adds a little bit of hybrid technology in there uh, just to bring it right up to date and we're seeing some of the sort of the styling things from the cyan uh, coming into this these distinctive lights on it and talking of distinctive lights look at this on the start line which is the Bugatti Bolide which is based on the Chiron uh, but is the track only version of that uh, still with the enormous engine in the back uh, if you ever uh, lucky enough to go to Molsheim and find a picture of the engine in this car that uh, when it's out of the chassis you can't believe in a way that they can they can have all the packaging in there oh it is absolutely phenomenal it's chasing the Aston Martin Valkyrie up the hill Andy Wallace is behind the wheel of the Bugatti Bolide and it is on British ground for the first time and we are glad that it is as well because it is purring its way up the hill but I wonder if we might get slightly more noise if you're on the exit of Molecombe Corner this car that has been driven beyond 300 miles per hour outrageous yeah Andy Wallace um, uh, one of the nicest people you could ever wish to meet obviously sort of um, also one of the funniest people if you ever chance to have dinner with him his stories are unparalleled um, and obviously he's done an awful lot um, at at um, Aralesian in terms of going incredibly quickly in these cars always a bit of a step into the unknown um, doing these things he also drove the Lego version I don't know if you remember that of the Chiron that they did and I think yeah. he said that was almost as terrifying at uh, about 30 miles an hour as these were at 300 so yes a <laughs> brave surprised. man <laughs> I'm not surprised I'm not sure anyone <laughs> no one fancies driving a Lego based uh, Bugatti, but what a great, what a great job he has. Magnificent stuff. We move on now to Ferrari, and we move on to uh, the one lining up. It is the Daytona SP3 lining up, I believe, on the uh, starting position. Absolutely. So this has uh, another V12. The hill, plenty more chasing it up as well. We've got uh, we've got Bentleys currently uh, preparing to take the course. We've got plenty of Ferraris out there as well. And obviously the Daytona name in this actually sort of the first official use really of the Daytona name for a for a road car, despite the fact that it was the early was not actually called the Daytona, even though we all know it as such. So Mark Webber behind the wheel. And uh, yes. very busy chap, and uh, his association with Porsche continues on the hill climb. Absolutely. This is the uh, Spider, the RS version. The vents over those front arches uh, with the engine from the GT3 in it and these fantastic intakes just behind uh, the heads of the driver and the passenger, so really giving you all that wonderful induction noise. And now we have uh, the Porsche reimagined 
uh, by Singer, and this is the, uh, the turbo version. And I, I love those those shark fins, as they say, in front of the uh, rear wheels. There, and actually, intakes and design, um, as ever, from Rob Dickinson, just beautiful to behold. And now we're onto Jaguar. So this is the F-Type, um, which has been around for a while. This is F-Type 75. And uh, yeah, again, one of those cars I think sometimes is a little bit underrated. I remember when we first had an F-Type uh, in Evo Car of the Year, and it came second in the year to the um, uh, Ferrari Speciale. But everybody absolutely adored that car. And, you know, the classic uh, front-engined um, layout. And it's been, I think it's been quite a success for Jaguar over the years. Graham Moss behind the wheel as he completes his negotiation on the flip wheel and uh, completes the run as well. Great to see so many of you positioned both left and right. Uh, a reminder that the site, if it is your first time here, it is well worth getting a program to have a look at the map because, uh, well, if there is something to surprise you around every single corner and you do have the rally stage as well. Uh, at the top of the hill, there is a shuttle to take you there, but it's well worth wandering down to the cricket pitch. There's exhibitions. There's, of course, the uh, the first glass hey, manufacturer hey, paddock as well. You've got the MotoGP. You've got historic uh, celebrations for Porsche, for Lotus, for McLaren, all to come on track as well. But now we're focusing on the Maserati. Yes, this is the Maserati MC20 Cello. Uh, so it's the, the open top version of the MC20. And this is, uh, we mentioned earlier, so this has that uh, V6, the turbocharged V6 Netuno engine, which took a long time to develop. It has a uh, very clever pre-ignition, which is, is not perhaps a new thing, but certainly something uh, that's taken a lot of effort in terms of heat management to, to bring to a road car. So although it hasn't got the hybrid, which perhaps some people might be expecting, is nonetheless a very, very clever piece of kit and gives it sort of incredible road manners uh, low down in the rev range and then goes absolutely nuts right up to the top <laughs> i'm loving that description as technical as we require on a, on a sunday morning at the 30th anniversary of the festival of speed it is uh, valkyrie time on the start line and on board as well we go oh fantastic is it a view that I am um, actually recognise. I'm lucky enough to have um, uh, driven this car. David Green there behind the wheel. His passenger looking very relaxed about it, which is uh, nice to see. Certainly more relaxed than David, who in no way is terrified about dropping this into a straw bale. He uh, he's been enjoying this all the way through. Through uh, oh, it's like an advert that. <laughs> what he's had to park up once he got in front of him. This is all of David's nightmares coming true at the moment. Just wants a clean run up the hill with a very expensive Valkyrie. So he's got the, uh, the the new DB12 pack going up the hill just in front of them. So that's the sort of the, the core of the Aston Martin line. It's got two ends of the Aston Martin lineup here. Uh, the new DB12, which is um, a fantastic step on actually over the DB11. I drove that recently. Um, and then obviously we we've got the Valkyrie. And I think it's it's fantastic seeing how Aston Martin has come along in recent years from sort of the, the more recent V8 Vantage and just the development. So we've got things like the DB12, we've got the Valkyrie, they've got the Formula 1 team, and it's, it's fantastic to see Aston doing so well at the moment. The Valkyrie, of course, got that incredible Cosworth-designed, naturally aspirated 6.5 litre V12, putting out 1,000 brake horsepower, augmented by some um, electric help from, from the motors in there, but of course all the, the Adrian Newey designed aero in it, so uh, you see the enormous tunnels, and again, another car that's worth going to have a look at, and you see the airflow that goes through that car, and it's, it's a fascinating backstory as to how they got this to actually be a road car, it's not just that inflate for show, it is actually a road car. Yeah, amazing project, and uh, a firm favourite, the uh, the spider version just being uh, driven up the hill as well further back. Yes, we've got three versions of the Valkyrie. So you've got the uh, obviously the original key for the road version, the, the Valkyrie, the spider, and then there's the AMR Pro, which is slightly different. It's based uh, on a different type of automatic tub, but it's um, able to produce enormous amounts of downforce. It's sort of the unleashed track only version. Um, this is the V12 Vantage, so this is sort of the, the last hurrah for the V12 Vantage we had it. Before. And again, this is this is an interesting car. I, I, I really love the fact that they keep producing this stuff and um, the, the biggest engine possible into the smallest car that they produce. It's a, <laughs> an age-old uh, recipe, but a, a very good one. And off the start line, uh, rubber being laid down. Great to see as well. And 
and uh, yeah, as you say, Henry, uh, superb to see the largest engine be deposited on uh, on a design that you'll be used to by now, but uh, a terrific one at that. And past the sculpture we go with Porsche being celebrated for the fourth time on that sculpture, but it's Aston Martin in our vision at the moment. Absolutely, and obviously sort of more cooling on this car. If you go and have a look at it, this sort of where the bonnet turns black, that's obviously so you can vent an awful lot of heat out of the front. Uh, due to see the new Vantage, um, on the updated Vantage facelifted, and the same way we had the DB12 taking on from the DB11, we're due to see the new Vantage, I think, later this year, so fairly shortly, which will be fascinating to see what they've done with that as we sort of um, head from the Tobias Mers uh, era into the um, Odeo Felisa um, era at Aston Martin. Uh, I've had a bit of Ferrari input into the DB12 and expecting even more developments really with the Vantage as it goes forward. So Simon Dickinson behind the wheel of the V12 uh, powered machine. So from Aston Martin, we move uh, down the order now to Porsche once again. Oh, I can see the photographer Jochen frozen speed as he is taking some um, very arty shots of the uh, uh, tire marks down there on the ground. Go and check him out. He's um, he taking some fantastic pictures, particularly out at the Nürburgring. In fact, so um, hello to Jochen. Terrific spot, Henry. Really, really terrific spot down there. Uh, we've still got plenty to come. This is an enormous batch and, and very exciting cars contained within it as well. It looks like we're about to get a smidge of an attacking run here as well. Yes, well, quite right too, because this is the very latest Porsche 911, 992 variant, GT3 RS, which has, as you can see, uh, a huge amount of area in there, so 830 kilos of downforce, and on its uh, stickiest cup to R rubber is a phenomenal machine. It does look like it's turned the wrong way out of the lane, uh, but it is a road car. And then this is the McLaren uh, MP4 12C, so the original uh, McLaren from this latest era of McLaren Automotive. Um, and I remember when this came out, and again, great sort of clean design, which I think is actually. Um, stood the test of time very well. You can see the air brake going up there on the way into Malcolm just keeping that rear end um, from being a little sort of less lively because it was one of those things you've got hard on the brakes, you could feel the rear squirming around um, under hard braking, but that air brake really did help with stability, not just for show at all. And again, again, I think really pushed a lot of other manufacturers on this car because it was incredibly quick uh, when it came on boost. And um, yeah, design stood up very well. Yeah, I was going to say, it holds up brilliantly, if you consider that's a, a car first launched in 2010. And uh, great to see. And we're about to get into a, a run of McLarens now. So this is the sort of, um, I suppose it's, it's child in some ways. This is the McLaren Artura. So this has a V6 in it. So again, this is sort of used to seeing um, a derivation of that V8, that turbocharged V8 that we used in the MP4 12C for a long time. But this has a new uh, turbocharged V6, but mated to... Um, hybrid technology, so you've got the batteries sitting sort of low down just behind the driver and passenger in this. And again, interesting things to go and have a look at. Um, if you sit in the paddock, you can see the sort of the chimney uh, at the top above the engine. Uh, venting the heat out of that and you can see just how low down they managed to get the engine and McLaren's always been incredibly good at actually trying to keep uh, a lot of weight out of their cars still keep some old school things like uh, hydraulic and power assisted steering so uh, for all the new technology they keep some uh, what might be seen as old technology in there uh, just where it gives the the lovely feedback to the car. Uh, Bruno Senna had just gone over the line in the McLaren P1 and that was uh, Joe Osborne completing his run uh, we've also had a 750S out there for McLaren as well, and we move on. Distinctive noise of the kind of thing, the chest coat that is now leaving the line, I believe. Absolutely. Again, I'm sure you go down to the uh, supercar paddock and have a look at this because it's fantastically um, fast. But to go and see the engineering under the skin of um, this car, I was lucky enough they had the rear deck up recently, and you can see the enormous rear wing on it, but the beautiful suspension on this is a, a, a sight to behold. Past the fifth wall. Oh, I'm loving the sound of that all weekend long. That magnificent Koenigsegg sound. And uh, we are up through the gears, pinned flat to the line now, and another run completed. 
There's another Koenigsegg chasing it up the hill once again. And then we've got a Hello. Hyundai that Hello. is Hello. the Hello. Envision 74. Hello. And this is their uh, performance division of the South Korean giant car manufacturer. Hello. And I believe when we were, we were talking uh, to Jokun Kwon uh, earlier in the uh, in the weekend that this is the only version of the powertrain that they've got and uh, so <laughs> no pressure then if you uh, if you're on the hill climb unsurprisingly take it nice and gently into Malcolm corner absolutely and um, it's sort of base taken a lot of inspiration from uh, a previous concept they did I think back in the, in the 70s and you can obviously see that in the design but it's a it's a fabulous thing and it's got an enormous amount of uh, sort of likes and clicks all over the internet um, this car it's uh, hopefully something that we see brought perhaps to production in the future who knows if everybody gets behind it and then um, sends lots of letters or tweets to Hyundai then perhaps they'll build it if it looks that good I think the chances are high it's silently powered across the line and uh, it's all in one piece which is good to see as well Mercedes AMG one has just gone past the commentary box. That is a magnificent little piece of kit. Lots of buyer just going across the line. Another car. You can see the, the huge scoops out of the side of that for the arrow to be fully electric. Lotus uh, going up there. And now a name uh, throwback from the past: the Spanish Suiza. A very distinctive rear of this car, as you will uh, see if you are both hill climb side or finding yourself watching on the live stream whatever your way of consuming the action here it is excellent to have you with us all the way through the day i hope and uh, are we going to get uh, there's no red flag outside of the commentary box so i think you're going to get an, uh, an example of the acceleration down there in the middle of the course just pausing so that everybody can see the uh there will be copper details on that it's been a series of carmen which is obviously an electric car as the uh, car is now seeing the uh, the screen's going up the hill as well. Behind it is the uh, Pinatarina Batista, uh, Nino Farina. Yeah, the addition named for the very first Formula One world champion. So if you're going to put that sort of name on the car, it better be backed up. And they have done so as well. You can see that enormous uh, rear wing at the back as well. No powertrain changes to that, but it is uh, generating, as standard, a breezy 1,877 horsepower. So, um, yes, I don't think it needed any more. And we mentioned earlier Pagani, and this is their latest model from the uh, uh, modern these manufacturer from Supercar Valley. Um, extraordinary looking thing it is. It really is. Fighting it on the exit there and just backing off. We've got the... Uh, Gordon Murray Automotive T50 about to uh, join us as well. Yeah, we do have the uh, red flag out being told to uh, really back it off there by the marshals into Malkin Corner. Uh, no evidence out of our commentary box window as to why that's the case at the moment. But we'll, uh, we will bring you the update when we have it. This is the uh, fantastic, you can certainly see the lineage from the McLaren F1 and the, uh, the Gordon Murray Automotive T50, and look at that. Passenger on the left, passenger on the right, but the driving position front and center. Absolutely. Um, reminiscent, obviously, of the McLaren F1, that fabulous central driving position, although if you ever get to be a passenger in it, it's arguably the best place to actually uh, hear the glorious V12 because, as you can see, the roof scoop, and so you get the induction noise coming down. Uh, from the top there and, and they actually tune the roof of that so that you really you get the, the very best sound coming through there and as we come around the back of this you can see the, the fan on the back of it obviously Gordon Murray known for his fan car in Formula One and this is very clever in the way that it sort of actually pulls the air out to make the diffuser uh, work even better um, so it pulls the air through um, that and gives a bit of downforce it is switchable obviously um, but for all the technology that you have in that, this still has three pedals and a manual gearbox set to the right of the driver. And I know Gordon's been working incredibly hard on the sort of the detente, as it were, of the gear shift and just to make it a really yeah. thing. It's always a heavy post box in a McLaren F1. When you change from second through up to third, you just want to make absolutely sure of it. We've got Dario Franchitti behind the wheel of this. He's done an awful lot of the development driving for it. And he's, he's not the only kind of 
drug it this weekend, but he's uh, you know, thoroughly enjoyed it. Every time I've spoken to him about it, he's just buzzing with enthusiasm for this car, and understandably so. Yeah, if, he, if he's got a late run in this later on, don't be surprised if I don't get it back. He seems to absolutely adore this car, and uh, I think he's definitely down on the list to get it once, uh, once it is available. Glorious sound, just absolutely superb. And that, that low front end, the fan at the back of the car as well. So basically a, a career highlight reel for Gordon Murray at uh, being taken at speed with a couple of passengers as well, the IndyCar legend across the line. Uh, now uh, we move on to uh, Porsche. So this is GT4 Aura on the back of that. And so we also saw the Spider version uh, earlier of this car going up hills. This, uh, version. But you still see those, those little ears, those intakes just behind uh, the head of the driver and the passenger. And they will give it uh, such a fabulous noise. They sort of duct inside, so they're just right behind your head. And this is the Manti kit, so the Manti do the uh, sort of track performance tuning. Whoa, oh, don't oh, take that line into Molka. Oh. Hang on to it, and they do so. Oh, it was a liberal amount of grass on the apex. Uh, they nearly paid the price on the e on the exit. Well held there. <laughs> um, yeah, the GT4 RS is just a fabulous car. It's, it's got the GT3 motor, something we thought, we were told, in fact, that would never be able to happen, but then they redesigned it when they put it in the 992 GT3 and so that they could put it into the GT4. I think we're going to get a replay of that. <laughs> Where are you going at yeah, this I think, point? I think that is, um, that's gone wrong from quite a long way out, it's fair to say, uh, coming over the top there. But, um, uh, yeah, kept it out of the bales. Porsche's always very wonderful over the limit, I have to say. I'm not just saying this because we're looking at it on screen, but it's yeah. the, the cars that you always feel like somebody's been there before in terms of just they, they keep gripping even when they're sliding. So, you know, perhaps it's some sort of demonstration of that. Now Rolls-Royce being driven in a manner that you might not expect. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good summary. I don't know what they've uh, put down in the water there for the last couple of runs, but I haven't seen anyone at that on that part of the grass into Malcolm all week long. And so, now Joseph Hopkins is behind the wheel of the Spectre. Yes, yeah, so this is the Spectre. So this is this is Rolls Royce's electric uh, car. So it, it's something that we've we've been expecting for a long time because really with EVs this is where they seem to make an awful lot of sense obviously something like Rolls Royce is a, is a heavy car anyway and in the luxury is sort of you want it to be silent silent sports car uh, so EV powertrain really makes an awful lot of sense in a Rolls Royce and this is their first one the Spectre the whoosh across the line not accompanied by much other than the air being displaced as it punched a hole in it the other end of the uh, EV spectrum, I suppose, um, so the expensive EV spectrum with the Rimac, which is, is a car that I feel like is, is sort of leading the vanguard in so many ways. We obviously know the tie-up now with Bugatti, um, the Croatian company, and it's 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 a car that is very spectacular. We've seen they've they've been at the vanguard, I think, of really all the torque vectoring, really, which makes these cars incredibly agile and and fun to drive as well. This car has set a, a, an awful lot of records recently um, in 0 to 62 miles an hour in 1.74 seconds. I think they're all up again. You go down to the supercar paddock, you'll see them on the wall behind um, all the records that these have set. Another one of the fan favourites this weekend. The Rimac has uh, deployed the rear spoiler, probably a good job, as they scrub off the speed. There's a, there's a long run down there, and then they all park up at the top of the hill. So some lucky few speak to edge and then they uh, they do head back down the same track 30 years of this wonderful event and we are uh, still in the traditional hill climb format up the track and then back down again before we start the next batch a ferrari currently on our screens yes this is the ferrari roma and um it's a sort of some people have said it's a return to the really truly sort of beautiful ferrari still obviously aerodynamic um, slightly different rear lights on this and the grill is, is fascinating about this as well this sort of this pierced uh, piece of bodywork for the grill. It's, it's sort of baby ferrari but still over behind the wheel of the solar snap yeah, so this is one of those track specials. It's just a single seat for this. It's a um, fabulous sounding car, jug derived, naturally aspirated V20, V10, and 
again, if you get a chance to go and look at this, it's also on, there's one of these in the supercar paddock, but also over on the McLaren stand next to the driver's club. And this is a beautiful car in terms of, again, all the airflow, a bit like the Valkyrie underneath as well as over the car. And I like the sort of the vents on the back deck of this, which uh, are sort of evoking the McLaren badge as well. <laughs> superb, superb, and Mo was not going to uh, let his run go to waste. GT driver uh, in the McLaren stable, and man who used to pinch wins off Esteban Ocon in the third tier of motor racing uh, back in 2015. So we're taking a look at the sculpture on the lawn, and we're saying very much a huge thank you to Henry for guiding us through the supercars. He's got a big smile on his face because he's about to go and run. <laughs> he's about to go and run in a car himself. Overalls on, flying out the window with our thanks as well. And uh, we're running you through what we've seen in a, a really packed run. It's been so good to get cars back onto the hill after the disappointment of yesterday. The sun is out and so is that Bugatti. The fantastic Valide that has been turning so many heads and then the Daytona for the Ferrari. But evocative names everywhere you looked, including three different versions of the Valkyrie. And our very own David Green lighting it up as he went across the line. No doubt delighted it was still in one piece. The McLaren that rebooted their automotive division. Dario Franchitti with the Gordon Murray inspired. And we nearly rearranged the furniture at Malcolm Corner, but we got away with it. It's been a great start to Shootout Sunday. Check this out. It hasn't been such a long time since people first started shopping online, and it was easy to keep up with the clicks. Little by little by little by more, the clicks added up to be more than the stores, and e-tailers worked harder than ever before because they had to keep up with the clicks. No time for borders. Got to stay in control to stay in the flow and continue to grow. But we'll help you. Keep up with the clicks.
So we're looking forward to the batch getting underway. And uh, the first part that we're going to be seeing is the Ken Block moment, uh, the Tin Tops Drift Rally. And then after that, batch three, the Goodwood 75, celebrating anniversary of Goodwood here. And then the Lotus McLaren, the Grand Prix Greats, MotoGP, the Porsche 75s. And they ha also will have a big celebration moment at the Goodwood House. And uh, so batch two coming up at 12.40 and batch four at 1.20. Uh, well, we've got some superstars here this weekend as well, of course, particularly on the, the motorbike side. Uh, we've got uh, plenty more to watch as we go through the course of the day. The shootout, which I'm really looking forward to, I have to say, uh, as we will be seeing the fastest of the cars heading up the hill and being timed all the time that they go up that hill so that's going to be fascinating to see as well and we've also got some wonderful drivers and riders here including the current MotoGP world champion Peko Banyaya we can catch up with him Of course, MotoGP are here at Goodwood this year and the world champion, reigning world champion and currently running first in 2023 as well. Francesco Bagnai joins me now. How are you doing? Welcome to Goodwood. How have you enjoyed it so far? A lot, a lot. I'm, enjoy I'm enjoying it a lot. I'm a great, I have a great passion for cars and uh, motorsport in general. So this part, this, this world is, uh, is amazing. So very happy. Yeah, it is fabulous. How much have you enjoyed going up the hill as well? It will be in mixed conditions so far. I'm bit, no, right now I didn't did, did it already, but uh, I'm looking forward. I think uh, was was always one of the uh, the milestones you can have. So running to the to the high hill climb uh, for sure will be will be amazing, and uh, hoping to have a better condition than yesterday for sure. But uh, looks looks great. Yeah, it is dry for now, and I think it's due to stay as well. A little bit windy, but yeah, you should have a grand old time up there. Your 2022 season, how do you reflect on it now looking back? I know you're in the midst of 2023 and you're always looking ahead, but you must have very special memories of last season. Absolutely, and um, considering that yeah, after the season we were so behind, uh, we started winning and uh, collecting podiums and winning, so it was, was great, and uh, Sicily. Uh, my biggest dream was is complete uh, thanks to the to last year's season, so for sure, it helped me to, to have a great motivation to start this season. And our expert here on bikes, James Hayden, has been looking at this bike behind us, saying it's the best bike in the world right now. Just talk us through it. Looks, looks gorgeous. Uh, I love it, Sicily. Right now with the, the Goodwood Festival of Speed uh, sticker with number 46 is, uh, is complete, so I love it. <laughs> yeah, it is a beautiful, beautiful bike. Um, and looking ahead to this season as well, obviously we are in the midst of it at the moment. A fair way to go still, but running first, starting as you left off from last year. Sicily, uh, the pressure is different compared compa to last year, but um, we are again first position and uh, we have to continue uh, doing what we are doing. So not easy, it's never easy, but uh, we have to continue. We have to continue, we have to try to, to be always competitive and, uh, and let's see. Yeah, they always say that winning your first is one thing, but backing it up and winning your second is, is another task entirely. Uh, uh, Running second, I didn't understand, sorry. Sorry, so win, winning your first is, is one thing, one task, yeah, yeah, but actually yeah, yeah, then the winning one, a second, yeah. it's, it's harder almost. Yeah, and uh, since I remember, uh, just Valentino Rossi and Mark Marquez did it, so for sure it's uh, winning, like you say, is, is hard, but uh, repeated is even harder. So we, we have to focus, we have to be focused, we have to be concentrate on on trying to to do to continue what we are doing. So. Let's see if we can. Yeah, you could be in very good company if you do indeed. And look at the crowds around us here. What's the reception for you been like here at Goodwood? Uh, it's good, it's great. And uh, I saw that uh, all the people here have a great passion for, uh, for our world. And, uh, and I love it, sincerely. It's what we, we need. Yeah, absolutely. We're very glad to have you here as well. Pecco, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And enjoy every moment up that hill. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Mark Webber, we're usually up at the top paddock just here, V12s, V10s, and then we've got tyres burning over there. But you came up and uh, singing, sing, singing to your heart's content. We were. I thought we put a bit of Brian Adams on. We're in heaven, you know, which we are in heaven. Uh, it's just so good to be back. I think, um, obviously, after yesterday's disruption, it's good to see the crowd here. Um, you know, Porsche, here we are, 75 years of the Porsche brand, which is incredible. So, um, yeah, it's uh, a great day out for all again, and uh, Charles has smashed it once again. Now, you've got your Porsche shirt on today. What, what's filling your days at the moment? Um, well, yeah, doing quite a lot of work for Porsche during the year. Uh, Oscar Piastri um, driving an F1 this year for the first time, which is great. So we're heavily involved in his career, which is awesome. He's doing really, really well. A uh, little bit of work with Rolex, a little bit of work with Red Bull. Um, yeah, and some sports documentaries here and there. So quite busy. You must have enjoyed the British Grand Prix. Phenomenal. Yeah, it was great for, well, it was just a great Grand Prix. I think, um, you know, obviously Max is, of course, really hard to beat. But I think having McLaren, you know, a British team take the fight to, to Red Bull, at least for the first part of the race, was pretty cool. Lando drove awesome. So did Oscar. Lewis on the podium as well with a bit of a lucky safety car, but that's all right. You know, um, he, you know, he's always there, Lewis, isn't he? So um, ultimately, it was a brilliant event um, and huge crowd. I mean, my God, I've been going to the British Grand Prix for 20 years, and that was the biggest one I think I've seen. So motorsports in good order. Are you getting behind the wheel of anything else this weekend? Yeah, I'm going to drive the um, the first 356, so I'm going to bring that up in a few hours, I think. So um, I was lucky enough to drive Mr. Porsche uh, in Stuttgart a few months ago in that car. So, um, yeah, it was to the date I was driving that car. That car was registered 75 years ago in Stuttgart, so I drove it in the same, basically the same street um, with Mr. Porsche. That was a pretty uh, iconic moment. Amazing. Well, now that Abba's Waterloo is blaring out from your speakers, it's probably time to say goodbye. <laughs> Mark, thank you. <laughs> It's off. <laughs> See ya. Another absolutely wonderful pre-war car we've uh, shown for the first time since it was rebuilt, the Festival Speed, was the S76 Fiat, the great beast of Turin. And obviously everyone who's seen it just goes mad for it. It's such a wonderful thing, spitting flames out of it. it sounds like a kind of load of gravel being poured into a cement mixer or something. It's an incredible thing. Duncan Pitaway has done a wonderful job to get that, you know, get the engine back, get the engine from Fiat, find the chassis. I think the yeah, chassis still had the brakes attached to it, so it did have some original um, bits and pieces still attached to it. And then obviously to get it going, and he drives it, he drives it so well. I've been up the hill with him a couple of times in it now, and it's a pretty hairy experience. I mean, you have to actually have to sit to one side because the the flames, you're on the side of the of the exhaust pipe, the flames come whistling down past your ear and set fire to your hair if you're not careful.
Well, what a beautiful day it is here at Goodwood. Thankfully, after missing out yesterday with the strong, strong winds, uh, it is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, plenty of blue sky, a bit of cloud around, but it stayed dry so far. And I do hope everyone's enjoying the show so far. And we've got so much to look forward to. Uh, coming up in just a moment, we're going to be seeing uh, the Batch 1 vehicles heading up. And it's going to include a max, uh, a, a huge a mix, rather, I should say, rather than a max. Although you are going to get a, a max of cars because we've got rally cars from uh, fantastic periods in World Rally Championship. And we're going to see quite a few Subarus. We've just seen them heading down the hill. Uh, but there's, there's a whole bunch of them from the period, of course, of the likes of Colin McRae. Absolutely so, and uh, they may largely be blue with bright yellow writing on the side. We'll try and pick out which is which, because as with all competition vehicles, you have that steady development, slightly different body shapes, and we know full well, having walked around this morning, seeing how many people have got Subaru jackets on, so they're nailed the colours to uh, a very, very spectacular mast. Well, it's great to see you all, and thanks for the waves, and uh, everybody here, I can see some big smiles uh, all around the, the whole Goodwood venue here. So many opportunities to go and see unusual machinery people as well some real stars who are here today that we're going to enjoy seeing them drive at their high limit as well which is a wonderful thing to see and uh, well one of the uh, groups that we have is drift Kana, and that is uh, uh, the drift cars coming up hopefully we'll get a chance to see that they'll be competing later on and susie caught up with one of them with mad mike what a pleasure to see the Hoonicorn and Ken Block here this weekend. I want to use this time to talk about your friend and rival, Ken Block, who sadly we lost in January. But he was such a maverick of motorsport, wasn't he? How would you describe his contribution? I think, like, the inspiration. He was a huge, huge inspiration for me to really be able to chase dreams. And the fact that I could use my personality, my style, being unique, and then to make a career out of it, which is... He, paved his own path um, and was always trying to bring though he's you know challenging himself to all these crazy ideas these entertainment bringing everyone along for the ride with him I remember the first time I went to America um, I qualified for this like world all-stars drift championship and I remember him coming up and he I, don't know, I guess like my style the unique stuff that I brought but he gave me a pair of his shoes for me it was just like how honored I was to be given a free pair of like race boots from Ken. From Ken, yeah. yeah. What, what about um, your battles here that you've had at Goodwood that everybody's loved, the jewels? Oh, yeah, I mean, we're here, my son, Link, is, Ken was a massive hero to him as well. Um, and we're chatting away, and I just remember uh, Link being picked up. He would have been four or five years old, disappears out of the circle, and it's Ken Block has picked Link up, carrying him over and put him straight in the driver's seat of the Hoonicorn when he had just revealed it. He knew how much Link loved that car. But the rivals, like, it's like, oh, Ken Block versus Mad Mike. But for us, it's like, we use that as entertainment as well, you know. So it's like, who's going to have the best run up here? And, you know, we're really inspiring others. Like, you know, if you've got the vision, you're halfway there. The rest of it's just a bit of hard work and determination and sometimes just doing it a little different than what everyone else. Yeah, very, very special talent. Mm. What about this weekend for you? What are you looking forward to here? Oh, man, I'm absolutely pumped to be at Goodwood Festival of Speed. Next year will be my 10-year anniversary of Goodwood Festival of Speed. But, um... Plenty of other anniversaries this weekend. You know, we've got 100 years of Le Mans as well. So for me, I'm just as much of a fan as I am entertaining this weekend. There is no event on the world like Goodwood Festival of Speed where people can just come and really feel like they're friends and they can, you know, meet their heroes. Well, it was a very sad moment earlier this year when uh, Ken Block uh, was passed uh, away and a man who has provided us with incredible entertainment, particularly for so many of you who I'm sure have watched on YouTube. His, his actions have been watched by millions of people on YouTube, which is just, just tremendous. Tens of millions, every year a different setting, every year pushing it all the further. And I will never, ever forget his run up Pike's Peak where he hung the tail of his car over the edge, but uh, an inspiration for so, so many. And uh, Becky Evans has just joined us. Nick of time there, Becky, but uh, it's great to have this celebration of Ken Brock, Block's life. Absolutely, I mean, he's a true icon and he lives on in everything that everybody's doing. You know, he just took the whole media thing and just blew it up to a whole new level. Um, all of his films, obviously, the Jim Carner, it, it's just, it was a moment in time built entirely by himself, so it's uh, it's wonderful to commemorate him here this weekend. He's, uh, you're right that he's inspired so many people, I think. The, the interesting thing, uh, 
in the, the, the fact, in fact, Travis Pastrana, his uh, teammate, who uh, they, they rallied together in the States, and Travis is here this weekend. Um, he was saying how uh, he kind of inspired people because he started his rallying career quite late. He was in his mid-30s before he started rallying. Um, and yet he developed that skill that, that he was able to demonstrate and display, didn't he? 100%. I mean, uh, he was uh, the king of four-wheel drifting. Yeah. I mean, the Hoonicorn, what an amazing vehicle. And just, I remember the first time I saw it, it took my breath away. I was like, oh my goodness, look how cool that is. Yes, and I think he also took, did another thing. He, t he took the style of broadcasting to just a different level. The, the way they shot it, the professional values he brought, and everybody else since then has been trying their utmost to catch up. Well, he was an incredible businessman, and then he took all of that prowess. He was an amazing. He was amazing at branding. You know, obviously, he built DC shoes, and then he brought all of that style and cool to cars, and that's why everybody just loved it because it was just such a new, fresh approach. And yeah, I mean, as I say, it's iconic. His films are genuinely iconic. So when you get home tonight or wherever you are in the world, do make sure you just uh, take a look at one of them because the expansion was quite phenomenal. The daring do, but the sheer excellence in what he did was astonishing. Mad Mike, who was talking about him just a moment ago, he's going to be going uh, up in his drift car in a moment. You'll see that heading up the hill in just a little while. We'll have all sorts of fun uh, with that, no doubt about it. And there is Travis Pastrana, actually, as we, as we talk about the fact that he was teammate to Ken Block in uh, US rallying back in the 2000s, uh, mid sort of uh, 2005, 2006. That sort of period was when Ken started so uh, very much in memory of his teammate. They worked very, very well together. They were driving Subarus in those days. And in fact, that is, of course, a highly modified Subaru. It is indeed. I mean, I love watching this thing go up the hill. I mean, with all the active aero on it. And Travis was trying himself. He's such a character. You know, I was very lucky to sit next to him at the ball last year and some of the stories that that man was telling. He's still he's still got that energy of, of an early 20, you know, early 20s. But yeah, he's he's another one. He's a legend of the scene, and it's just uh, a really friendly face to have here at Goodwood. But as soon as he gets behind the wheel, it is maximum attack. Of course, people on bikes and cars, but some people just have it always at 100 percent, not 99, 100, and that's Travis. Oh, he's the epitome of send it. Absolutely, anything that he does. I mean, base jumping, whether it's rally cross, whether it's driving the Subaru, the Subaru up the hill, he'll always give it 110 percent. I think that's why he's such an exciting driver to watch. And it's great just looking at the line of classic rally cars behind them. You know full well that had they been a, a decade older, they'd have been driving these cars. But also, like so many people here, they'll look around the paddock and go, oh, I'd like to do that. And it's just when people get performance machinery. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, obviously, Group B rally inspired so many people. Like the images of Group B to me were the, one of the first things I saw saw and was like, that is one of the coolest things on earth. Uh, and it's just wicked to see these cars still out there, coming to Goodwood every year. And as I said, the, the, the magic of the Festival of Speed is it's showing generations now what, what was and shows them all the machinery that has made automotive history. Uh, it is great to see, isn't it? Lovely. And we're just uh, seeing some of those classics. So Stick Blomfist, who's about to head up the hill. And he's been up this Festival of Speed so many times, always wonderful to watch. Well, it is, and I, again, they jump from car to car, but when they get put back in the cars with which you equate them, that sort of is super special, and you sort of almost close your eyes. I do that quite a lot, not necessarily when commentating, perhaps, but um, it's just so I can hear the engine note, and it just takes me back. I can think where I was, whether I was in the Kiel, the forest, you know, getting cold and wet and loving every second watching the rallying, but the right drivers in the right car, it still has a ring. It's like seeing Emo in a Lotus 72. And I, I'm sure for them as well, getting into cars that they, they, they competed in, they rallied in, it must bring them back some incredible memories. I mean, we've heard some of it from the drivers already, haven't we? Well, and also just standing around in the paddock, I was talking to a friend of mine. He was showing some Ferrari guests around, and they were looking at the, the 512S as raced at Daytona in 1970. And someone in the background just said, the American accent, what's that little flat? We didn't used to have it. <laughs> and my friend looked around and said, what do you mean you didn't? Use it? When I raced it, Peter Shetty, you know, so people aren't making a big shout about who they are, just simply coming to look at a car that they yeah. love, they had success with, and that's it. So many people who have a rich story to tell. And also you've got engineers, designers, mechanics who've moved around between the teams, and they like going back to the cars in which they had their early career. Well, I'm glad everyone's enjoying their views here and uh, getting ready for this next little run. And in fact, the Duke of Richmond is going to be coming up in just a moment in one of the rally cars, which is fun to hear. He's always uh, out in uh, various different cars. We saw him in the D-Type uh, the other day, representing a car that he'd uh, took, taken up the hill here many years ago when this all started uh, 30 years ago uh, but he will be coming up in a Toyota so we're also having a bit of a Toyota celebration
You're a bit late. We've been uh, working a little bit in, uh, in the jump, you know. But Is it going to be any good, do you think? Better than last year? Yeah, I think it can be better from last year. How do you think you're going to make it any better? Like that would be good, no? I think we have something here. Flying. Big jump. I think we got it, huh? Yeah. OK, Sorry, time to go. go. Sorry. Sorry, see you later. So Toyota, of course, a fundamental part of all of this. And uh, the Duke of Richmond is actually he's not driving. I was wondering if he was going to be driving the Toyota. He's actually passengering. He's co-driver for this one. Yeah, in the Toyota GR Aris, Yaris H2, so hydrogen technology. But, you know, in his heart of hearts, Duke would like to be going up in every single batch in a different car. But, of course, he has many, many roles to play here at this brainchild that started 30 years ago. But uh, he looks down the list and such a dynamic rally car. Of course, hybrid power now in uh, World Rally Championship just makes a whole different equation. And speaking with Tony Jardin earlier today, he said they often have about 350 horsepower and then the hybrid part adds another 150. So these are the fastest rally cars of all time. Yeah, absolutely right. So there you are. There you can see the GR Yaris H2 concept. So the Duke of Richmond is a part of that. And uh, we will be seeing that heading up the hill in just a moment. We've got plenty of other Toyotas here to enjoy and celebrate. And then a whole batch of historical cars. So, yeah, the Toyota's just going to the line now, getting ready to come up. And, uh, I, I, you know, one day the Duke of Richmond's going to be able to make a, make a film and write a book about all the cars that he's either driven or been in over the years here at Goodwood. And to say it's a broad array doesn't even start to cover it. He has his wish list, of course, the cars he watched as a child racing on the family circuit that opened 75 years ago. But uh, every time a different experience, will he have time to do the rally stage at the top of the hill climb? But right now, all eyes, his eyes, he'll be looking exactly how this car is being driven. Accelerated to the first corner, looking down the front of course, left foot braking among rally drivers. Yeah, and he will have sat alongside a lot of people. Give him a wave, ladies and gentlemen. The man who has cr created all of this 30 years ago got motoring and motorsport back to Goodwood after the Goodwood circuit shut down at the end of 1966. It is very much the Duke of Richmond who picked it all back up. He wanted to get racing back at the circuit. They wouldn't let him initially. So he said, right, we're going to create the Festival of Speed. And that was done 30 years ago, which, of course, we're celebrating this weekend. And there he is taking another run up this hill. It has, it has built up more and more every year. And every year we come, we just think, this is impossible. It can't be this much here. And there's always more next time. And it's a big, big mistake to think this event is only about admiring the past. It's always about looking forward. And again, with this hydrogen cell technology in this Toyota Yaris, it's the way to go. One of the many ways to go. That's the beauty. We've got lots of alternative fuel as well. But it's a time of enormous change in road cars and motorsport as well. And I think motorsport is leaving that drive. You're a lover of rallying, aren't you? And the fact that these hybrid machines are working so effectively is, is, is impressive. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I love rally myself and I've been watching it over the years. I'm very much a girl that likes cars going sideways. So you can ha you have both, the best of both worlds. You have them going fast and also sideways. But, you know, as you were saying a minute ago, it's really interesting. It, it's not just about looking at the past. It is about looking forwards. And the technology that these race cars have them in uh, now, it's just incredible. And what makes me happy is it shows that there is, there's, you know, the future knows no bounds and that either, it's not going to end anytime soon because all of the money and R&D that's been put into these cars just future proofs our favorite sport. We're going to see uh, more action in the shootouts as well from that car. So Thierry Neuville, uh, of course, great rally driver. He's going to be showing us what he can do. But uh, there are also the bigger ones, the GRDKR Hilux. So this is uh, obviously run uh, at uh, Dakar. This has taken four victories uh, in the Dakar with uh, Nasser Alataya. 
who has been absolutely stunning with this machinery. And having just seen the WRC car dipping its nose and then powering through the corners, the amount of suspension travel on this, it really is a lesson that we should have all paid attention in our physics lessons at school because uh, it is an exquisite bit of machinery. You also get to see these cars on the off-road arena as well. So Nasser al is actually going up there today and we have a memorable moment to absorb as well. So, magic moments from uh, Ken Block, and we are now um, celebrating Ken Block, sadly lost in January earlier this year. And he's been through various bits of machinery, but it's interesting that Tom Christensen is now out in the Audi S1 Hunitron. Hunitron very much his. This was Ken Block's uh, sort of uh, company that they set up, and he put a deal together with Audi in recent years to really promote their electrical machines for all of this kind of action. Uh, he was a man that was always looking forward and he really saw how it was all pushing on and he was like, I need to be a part of this because he knows how to, again, it's that word, future-proofing. Um, you know what, it is wonderful. I'm, I, I'm a big follower of Leah Block, his daughter. I mean, this 16-year-old prodigy daughter of him and, and she's now racing. She's in the American Rally Association. She's extremely, she's nitro cross and like, she just has that absolute passion for motorsport. I mean, she was uh, working with Hoonigan doing the this or that. So. She's been driving these machines, uh, she was driving the, the Hoonicorn and everything like that. So it's wonderful to see her walking and, try, you know, following in her father's footsteps. That's lovely to hear. And I, 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 I haven't actually seen it, but I was reading about the fact that there was uh, a video, one of the last Twitter uh, things that Ken actually put out was about the fact there was a video of her at 16 year olds stripping down and rebuilding a car that she then has gone on to drive. Um, I haven't seen that, but I don't know if you've seen that video, but Leah, his daughter, Ken Block's daughter, and we're looking at more of the Ken Block cars coming up the hill. You will have seen uh, the Jim Carner cars, as they're known. Um, Leah is going to be a part of rallying in the future by the sound of things, which is, which, which I'm so glad the family will keep that element. 100%, like she is definitely going to follow in her father's footsteps. She's a huge inspiration to girls everywhere, and she's doing really, really well. Uh, she's driving a Toyota uh, in the American Rally Association, in, in that championship, and uh, I think she's putting in some really really good time so a really really promising driver and i know that we will see her here for sure in, yeah. uh, probably next year well becky i'm sure you'll be commentating on her many times as well maybe she'd do some drifting as well you do you commentate on the 100%, drifting a lot like yeah. i think she's she is a little bit into drifting as okay. well like she definitely knows how to get a car sideways well, uh, we're seeing some other cars heading up the hill now, uh, which is fun to see. Uh, Richard Tuthill, who uh, does a lot of work for rallying, and, and people get a chance with Richard to have a fun time, but we're also looking at Travis Pastrana. I have to say, this is one of our favourite views of the weekend. The, that moment when, as a commentator, you look across at your co-commentator and just smile, raise an eyebrow, because look at this, the Huckster Wagon, the Subaru estate car from the States. What on earth is happening? A, it's being driven brilliantly, but every time more braking is required, up comes, it's a bit like puppy dog ears sticking up on the top of the wing and the tail of the car. Oh, look at that. The, I can't look at that, there's nothing to see. That's a brilliant rotation. I mean, even, even you as a drift uh, expert there, Becky, that, that's lovely done, isn't it? It's nicely done, nice and tidy. You just <laughs> she just sent it in nice, really, really kept it off the grass, and he's off again. Uh, Travis, uh, Travis is just one of those drivers that everybody comes out to watch. Oh, oh on about? the grass. That is a full 10 out of 10. That's the whole car <laughs> on the grass at the exit of Volcom. Yes, the whole car, but he kept it in control, kept the foot planted up the hill. He goes, <gasps> sharp and take a breath. He's, he's going to be doing the shootout later, which is going to be great. And I'll tell you what, he will be fully competitive on the shootout. He is one of the driver's cars that you're going to be watching and we will be looking at the, the times as they head up the hill. That's not important.
at this stage, this is about a show at the moment, but later on the shootout and who wins the shootout is always a major part of the final day here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Right, the tight spins at the bottom of the hill oh, were like a, a signature from him, but wait till he got to Malcolm and all four wheels off onto the grass. He's made his mark on the grass. And uh, if you find him so personal, Mad Mike Winnick going up the hill at the moment, trying to do the same. But Becky, the slides he's putting in, just exquisite. Oh, yeah, as I said, one of the most exciting drivers to watch here. Um, Mad Mike, as we just saw him come through Malcolm there, I mean, the noise of that four rotor as it comes past you. Guys, even if you're not directly watching on the hill right now, you can probably hear him from halfway across the site. Yeah, we're just taking another look there at... Uh, you know what I said to you? I was like, nice and tidy, not on the grass. <laughs> Well, <laughs> not on the track was what you meant. Anyway, quite clearly. that's yeah. absolutely. But yes, right. that, that engine note of my Mad Mike Widdick's car quite phenomenal. It sounds like four people firing guns at the same time. Matthias Ekstrom, another famous driver, just uh, heading up the hill now in the electric uh, Audi RSQ e-tron Dakar Rally machine, and uh, it, it's a very clever bit of machinery. This it is electric, but it also has an engine in it um, which powers. The battery, so it's a real mixture. How do you do a rally in an electric car? That's how you do it. It's a combination. Yes, because that was our question. What's an electric vehicle doing on the Dakar Rally? Where do you go for a charge? There is the answer. And again, Audi very pleased to be able to show its latest technology. But it's up high, it spins on a sixpence, looks out of this world, and frankly, it is. So that's the RSQ e-tron e2 quite difficult to get your mouth around but doesn't matter you can see it on the track or near the track and it is truly exquisite it looks like a space buggy to me you know I yeah the e-trons are just pushing design further and further like you will always see the electric cars tend to have these incredibly futuristic kind of look to them um, they look fresh out of iRobot, personally. Yeah, absolutely. But not all the Dakar vehicles that we see now are getting more and more bizarre, and that's certainly one of them. Right, now we're into a bit of NASCAR. Who loves NASCAR? And just listen to the sound of it. That's always such a great part of it. And uh, this year, of course, uh, NASCAR celebrating its 75th year, so it's very fitting that uh, this car, the ZL1, ZL1 as you want to call it, stateside Camaro, went to compete in the Le Mans 24 hours, completely like, unlike anything else, and it won armies, thousands of pounds, thousands of pounds, because the sheer grunt, the noise it made, and Jensen Button is one of the drivers, an enormously popular encounter. Yeah, at Jensen, I had a chat with Jensen over the weekend, and I said, you know, how are you finding NASCAR? And he was like, yeah, it's great. It's, it's definitely a race discipline that I, I, I'm just getting used to still. He was like, they actively encourage people to, to to basically push through you on the track. And he was like, that's absolutely fine. Look, he's still a new boy being, uh, you know, tested for his mettle. It, absolutely. I think it was a baptism of fire when he went out there, but he's definitely having a lot of fun. <laughs> oh. He's kicking up a bit of dust so for views for cars that are heading up the hill after him. That could be a little bit of a challenge. And actually, watch out for the RS200 that's coming up, the, uh, the classic rally car, yeah, because Max McRae, part of the McRae family, the younger, uh, part of that McRae family is driving the RS200 up. So if you're seeing that at the moment, um, that's fun to see. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, the family here this weekend, Alistair McRae is also going to be coming up, isn't he? Absolutely. And uh, Max McRae, he's, he's a drift fan. I know that he's been following what's been happening uh, with the Drift Masters and James Dean. They've been having a few chats. So I think it won't be long before we see Max having a go in a drift car, which I, I would love to see. But that RS200, I mean, wow. It's absolutely wonderful. This is one of the Subaru Impressors. We're going to see a few of these. This is Steve Rocking in this one. And, of course, a car that was so, so su successful in its period. Um, Peter Solberg took the title win by one point over Sebastian Loeb in that, uh, in that period that this car was around in the early 2000s. And uh, Peter Solberg here this weekend. He's been here this weekend, which has been wonderful. Subaru was always a massive thing for him. Yeah, Subaru against, against Mitsubishi, such a super strong battle. That's the car from 2003, Steve Rockingham. Well, Rod Fittini and the Impreza WRC 2003, the laid memoir to us commentators. But, uh, Becky, I know you've got quite a, quite a lot of love for Subaru. Oh, cars. I do. And, you know, we were talking about this the other day. I think you were either a Mitsubishi or a Subaru fan. And personally, I was a Subaru fan. I mean, 1995 when McRae won in that iconic L555 BAT. I mean, if, I, if you ever see that registration anywhere, it's all rally fans will nod at each other and go, yep, I know that one. Well, the place you most frequently saw, it was some distance off the ground, wasn't it, normally? <laughs> rally of the Thousand Lakes. And yeah. those jumps were just went on and on and on. Absolutely. I mean, you know, McRae was always, if in doubt, flat out. He was, you know, he, I think he pushed it to the edge and sometimes over it, but that's what made him exciting to watch. Um, you know, I loved watching some of the old footage of him and Mackinnon together driving. And I've seen 
his year was 95 and 96, 7, 8, 9, that was Mackinac's years, but they were very, very close. He won a lot of rallies along the way. He did on all surfaces, but when you talk about Colin McRae going to the edge, I think he comes down to the edge. The other rider is trying to work up towards the 100%. 100%. I think I, I was watching something, and it was it might have been Rally Portugal, I, I, don't quote me on that, but I saw I saw him come in, and you can see him just clip in the car. He just He knows it's going. And wow, it was it was a big off, shall we say? This car is actually a, a McRae car, and the, the, it's the 1996. Uh, he won the title in 1996. Did see um, Tommy Mackinnon actually, as you say, <laughs> the other side, Mitsubishi, just take the title from Colin McRae. Um, but the, the battle between them was always massive. It was, and you know, it, motorsport can be so like theatre. So you have the goodie and the baddie according to which camp you're in, and therefore you get really, really sort of tied into the battle. Right, the car we're seeing coming up the hill is the 2001 car, Mark Shipper at the wheel of that uh, Impreza, and then the cars that keep the nice dog getting small, nimble, light, very dynamic, and of course, isn't it great that we've got the Alpine A110s at the moment yeah. becoming better and better. I think that's one of the greatest cars on the road at the moment for those self-same reasons. Small, light, nimble, a real driver's car. But to go back to these originals from the early 70s, to me, it's a real treat. Yeah, this was um, the car that, that won the first World Rally Championship manufacturers. They didn't have driver's uh, championship when it started, and we are celebrating 50 years of the World Rally Championship. Uh, they won the manufacturers championship. Jean-Claude André uh, won the first event at Monaco. And they had some six victories with the uh, Alpine Renault. It really was an incredibly successful rally car. Makes you think, you know, it, it, in many ways it looks, it is a sports car that was a great rally car. Makes you think of the Lancia Stratos in, in some ways as well. Those, those cars that were sports cars that became great rally cars. And of course, Porsche 911s did it too. Uh, quite so, but to me, I remember seeing these uh, competing against against minis and uh, those early works Ford Escorts as well. So uh, they have a sort of fairly special place in my heart. And to me, it was the first really exotic car I think I saw as a youngster. And then Lancia coming up with the Delta HF Integrale. Uh, Peter McAlpine is just taking this one up the hill now. And this was, of course, another very, very successful car in its period. They had so much success. Um, Didier Oriol was successful with Lancia, but Carlos Sainz as well. Uh, actually went on to win the title for Toyota that uh, that year, that was in 1992, that's the year that this car came from. And here's a rally car that means so much to so many people, it is the Ford Escort Mark II, everybody adores it. Loved it, so many people drove it in different liveries, but to me it really needed two names on the door. One of the driver, one of the co-driver, Ari Vatten and with David Richards alongside, such excellence. And uh, Ari, <laughs> any Ford Motorsport poster you saw at the time, he had two wheels on the road and two nowhere near it at all. Brilliant, brilliant driver. Yeah, Mark IIs are still so popular today as well. You go to any rally, if you go to Rally the Lakes in Ireland, something like that, and it's just a lineup of Mark IIs. Yeah, the truth is there are more now than there were then, I think, and uh, lots <laughs> yeah. of people are getting them out there. And it doesn't matter who you are, what age of rally you had. In fact, we had an interview with Petter Solberg on Thursday, and he rallies one, just in his spare time. <laughs> So coming up the hill now, we've got one of the Peugeots. This is the 205 uh, World Rally car. It was second to Citroen in the manufacturers, but they had four wins. Marcus Grunholm and Gilles Tanizzi were both very successful with this. Tom Williams is actually behind the wheel of this car. Um, as it heads up. And so Peugeot, of course, the World Rally Championship was massive for them. No, absolutely was, and that, in fact, that's a real focus because as you go through history, we had the period we said Subaru, Mitsubishi, and then of course you have the period of Ford, Citroen, Peugeot. They all have a go. We want more people to come in. Hyundai are now starting to really, really press on in rallying as well. But uh, we have, uh, in fact, Hyundai have got a huge presence here, and they, they're TCR class cars as well, uh, road, go road going. Um, saloon series and so much more, mixing their technology from off the road to on the on the track and on the dirt as well. Hyundai are doing really big things. The technology that they're pushing, uh, you know, they're really making their presence known in the sport. Now Hyundai is heading up the hill now, so we can get a look at the show here. We'll be seeing more from him later on too in the shootout, won't we? Yeah, definitely. What, what are the names to look for when conditions were really, really wet on Friday afternoon and they were really, really wet. The rally cars were the quickest up the hill. They didn't seem to notice the race. Absolutely. I, I always, I walked past here in, in, the, uh, in the paddock yesterday and you just catch the glasses and you're like, oh, there he is. I, mean, 
had a little fangirl moment. I think it's such an amazing driver. But that's also one of the things, of course, all the people who come here to ride and to, to drive things up the hill, they want to walk around as well. Some go incognito, others just go, ha, I'll head out there. I don't think you, can, you can't miss those glasses, you know them anywhere. <laughs> Well, it's great to see, and uh, as you say, so many famous faces here this weekend to, to enjoy as we're getting uh, ready now for the drift cars to start heading up the hill as well. So uh, we will bring in Ian Waddington as well as Becky. They're both absolute experts on the drift cars. So Bruce is just going to hand over his microphone in a second. In, the mo in a moment, you will be seeing cars coming up here that are putting on uh, a tremendous bit of fun and games slithering around all over the place and just trying to demonstrate what can be done. And this is actually a very modern version. They've been playing quite a lot with the Hyundai Ioniq 5 in drift spec. Uh, let's see how it gets on this time. It doesn't have quite the same balance, does it, guys, as the, uh, as the drift cars that you've seen so often, but they're, they're having fun with it. No, it certainly doesn't, Ben, and uh, I think that goes for the weight of the vehicle. We spoke a lot about this the other day when me and Becky were up watching the drift carner and bringing you all the sounds and sights from drift carner in those treacherous weather conditions. This car weighs 2.5 tonnes, so balancing this car on the rear tyres is very, very difficult indeed, and a lot of people around the paddock were quite surprised how much it weighed back in. We see that at the top of the hill when he was trying to donut around those barrels to set the sensors off. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, that, that is a difficult car to drive. <laughs> it, trying to keep it nicely balanced, as you said, once you get that pendulum effect of, a, of, of t over two tonnes, yeah. it's quite hard to collect it back up. Now you can see what it is like with a, a true drift car built especially for this kind of work. Yeah, this is... Sorry, Becky, yeah, jumping over the top of you there. Yes, this is a one-off build, specially built for drifting. This is, of course, Steve Banks of Piagione and the Monster Energy Nissan GTR R35. This now runs a Chevrolet V8 underneath the bonnet. 7.4 litres of American muscle with a huge Garrett turbo strapped to the front of it, making 880 wheel horsepower. And as you can see there, it just goes to show what can be done when the balance is correct, Ben. And uh, I can see Becky there looking in awe, wishing she was out there. Now, I always look at this car and, like, for me, if I had a GTR, I'd have kept the VR engine in it. <laughs> but he took the VR out, put the Chevy lump in, and then took that engine and put the VR into a, a Navara truck. I, I, I always question his decisions there, but it works, you know? It's, 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 it's always great to see Steve out here. He's, he's a good regular. I think he's been here many, many years now. But uh, a really fantastically looking car. Ian, this car was built quite recently, wasn't it? Yeah, this is a new build for George Barkley. This is the WF22 uh, Eurofire, four carbon Kevlar, uh, F22 BMW 2 Series. But the engine replaced and now runs that Toyota 2JZ uh, six-cylinder, three-litre, with the turbo on the side of it. This car just <laughs> made over a 1,000 wheel horsepower. And I know Becky is a big 2JZ fan, and you can see George Barkley having a lot of fun. A new build, as I say, and uh, he's getting to grips with it, Ben, but for anyone here with a keen eye, I would say that he's got it absolutely dialed in. Becky, the way he waves at the crowd and draws them in, you, you were telling me that drifting is getting bigger and bigger in terms of popularity. It is. Drifting's having a huge moment. We're seeing unprecedented numbers and also people coming to the actual events. I mean, our European Championship at the moment, we're, do we're doing six stops. Uh, our next stop is in Riga, Latvia, next weekend. Uh, two weekends' time, sorry. We are just... There are thousands and thousands of people sold out every single round. And at the end of the year, we're actually managing to fill one of the biggest stadiums, the PGE Stadium in the middle of Warsaw, 60,000 seater. There's going to be a custom drift track in the middle of it. Never have we had drifting so big that we can have events like this. Oh, we did get yeah. a, a little bit of da damage on the Hyundai, just taking off the rear wheel arch. Uh, yeah. That's fine. That's, yeah, that's, fine. A, that's a common occurrence in drifting, unfortunately. And up next up through the hill is Axel Hildebrand in, uh, yet again, a very good. A strange vehicle for drifting, a carbon Kevlar uh, Chevrolet Corvette. But this, uh, not running the Chevrolet V8 underneath the bonnet, but this actually running a triple rotor turbo engine. And the last car, as we can see, making his way up is uh, wow. Kevin Quinn. Wow, wait. Uh, I don't what know did if you see, uh, yeah. uh, Axel Hildebrand hanging it out on Malcolm there. He came out extremely wide, and I was like, keep it in, keep it in, keep it in. And he did, he kept his foot in, and it was a. Uh, it was a bit of a moment, but actually quite impressive. I mean, that the rotor vet was yes. just was just tested. I bet I bet lots of our fans who are all taking pictures. I love the way they're all taking pictures. Many of them on phone. Some of you up there at Malcolm, I, I, I know, have got uh, some fantastic cameras. Maybe one or two of you will have got that shot that Becky was talking about. Yeah, I hope so because it was spectacular. Uh, obviously, Kevin Quinn and his 2JZ S15. Uh, now here's a man who loves the limiter, as you can hear. He's telling us this before, and he does it every time. He 
Kevin, Kevin is always there, keeping it pinned to the limiter. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he certainly is. I spoke to his mechanic earlier and he said, this is either going to go well this weekend or really bad. He said the, the engine might hold on for the rest of the weekend, but if he keeps driving it the way he is, we could end up with parts of it all over the hill here. As Kevin Quinn now, he's going to fire it into Malcolm. Absolutely flat out. This Kevin Quinn right to the edge of the circuit. He doesn't, he doesn't get too close to this side, but he has a little wobble towards the hay Funnily enough, what we were saying to you earlier about the Mark II Escort, um, Kevin is doing rallies in, in Ireland at the oh. moment and he's driving a Mark II Escort. So it's another one of those transferable skills situations where rally drivers like to have a puff at drifting and drifters love to have a go at rallying because there are so many transferable skills. But yes, Kevin has a lot of fun in his rally car. He certainly does, yeah, and we've seen that transfer into the European Drift Championship where we see Calais Rovampera, the youngest WRC champion, actually making his debut this year and, and competing a full season. And he said he absolutely loves drifting. If we take a look back see a nice little at yeah, the two time replay of that. The two-time European champion uh, Peter Vincek in this brand new A90 Toyota Supra all the way from Poland just getting very friendly with the edge of the circuit there wheel right to the edge of the tarmac onto the grass having a lot of fun well today it's nice and dry so there's plenty of grip out there which is what we were saying about the other day like the aim of the game you actually need as much grip as possible to make sure you can keep that car controlled and and between the grass Becky just tell us uh, later on we're going to be seeing these cars out and they're going to be actually competing then aren't they so so this is going to be a slightly different view then yeah, absolutely. So we've got the Drift Karna coming up at 25 past six uh, this evening. And that is going to be a competition where we're going to see our drivers try to test their accuracy. And there are going to be some sensors which are on the wall ride, around a barrel and in a parking space. And it's up to me and Ian to give out those points which are going to decide who is our Drift Karna champion this weekend. But it's a lot of fun, isn't it? It's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of pressure. But we've got a good view out here of the commentary tower for a lot of fans around Goodwood that are cheering and waving their arms. And the more that they cheer and the more they wave and the more they clap their hands, the more me and Becky are swayed to give them over a thousand points and to potentially win that accredited prize. I, I was about to say, I was like, what do they win, Ian? Do you tell me? I, I, I'm not, not going to say. Bragging rights. <laughs> yeah, it's rights. rights. Yeah, I have, my, I have my scoring system, which is, I wouldn't say, say it's an accurate art, but I can... Uh, give it my best shot. Oh, it's going to be great fun. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, we're going back into some of the rally cars now. We've got the Ford Focus uh, World Rally car from 2008, just heading up the, hit, uh, up the hill. This was a big rival um, to Sebastian Loeb, the Vika Hervenen back in that period. And then we've got this uh, wonderful Nissan heading up the hill now as well. The uh, Jake Hill car that we will, this actually is going to be a real front runner later on in the day. Oh, absolutely, Will. Um, I, I just love the way we're hopping from uh, rally cars to drift cars to tin tops. It's a rich, rich mix of cars, but uh, the Nissan GTR, the Skyline GTR, it's just a legendary design in, in racing, and it's has many evolutions, but it has its own absolute fan club. Yeah, actually, I saw Jake briefly earlier, and what he was telling me, because it's turbo-powered, um, it is actually going to be turned up a bit more in terms of turbo power today. Yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday, when we last saw it on, it was wet. And, and he did, uh, I did ask, because he'd done such a good time, and I couldn't quite remember if these are two or four-wheel drive. They are four-wheel drive. So that partly did help him in the wet, but it'll help him in the dry too. So that four-wheel drive, he reckons it's going to be over 700 horsepower in that when, when they've got it all turned up. They would already have turned it up a bit for this morning. They're going to turn it up for more later. Well, Rick Wood really knows how to get power out of the cars. He's been running Skyline GTRs many times. Now, Mikel Ascona blasting off the line. Entry 106 is a Hyundai Elantra NTCR. So I talked about TCR. It's a touring car series all around Europe. And uh, the, the Spaniard has been one of the great successes. But again, the last handful of years, this has been the category as well as the World Rally Championship in which Hyundai uh, has pushed so hard. And uh, good to see these cars. Always running in that uh, pale blue livery with uh, many different coloured flashes. But uh, again, Ben, I think it's very important when the manufacturer has its work colours. Definitely right, yeah. and uh, I think uh, Mikel Ascona could be a real front-runner in the shootout later because he's due to do that with his various touring car titles that he's won. He's, he, he won in a Cooper Leon originally, but uh, now a winner with Hyundai since he's, uh, since he's managed to move across, and I think we will be seeing him putting in a, a pretty quick run up the hill later on today which will be very, very entertaining. And I know Jake Hill knows he's got some good rivals to, to compete with later on when we get into the shootout. Another touring car star from the British touring car angle now, Rory Butcher, just heading up the hill.
and he's always been very, very quick. And in fact, in the in the shootout on the Sunday afternoon, this afternoon, all the drivers they get to the top, a whole host of uh, drivers from British Touring Car Championship, they are so competitive. They jump out, they run into the tent at the top to check their times. And uh, Rory, uh, born literally on the slopes of Rock Hill Circuit you know, by his father, and he has just been an absolute inspiration. But he's one of the drivers who really pulls it out of the bag. He loves the hill climb element. And uh, while people are kicking off dust around the circuit, he's staying just about on the hill climb. Uh, working up through the shade, the dappled light as he goes up the hill. It's nice to say dappled light after the, the dark, heavy rains of Friday afternoon. Yeah, Rory's a very experienced touring car driver now, but he started all his uh, exploits at Knock Hill, and in a way, that's a good place to learn from uh, a, a track like this. There's no doubt about it. As we're now going to see the uh, the Renault 5 coming up the hill. Well, this is a modern version. This is the Renault, uh, Renault R5 Turbo 3E. We've seen this out a few times. Electric, 380 horsepower, uh, rear-wheel drive. I know Ivan Muller's been driving it a bit this weekend. I'm not sure if he's in the car right now. Um, I'm not sure he is. I think it might be somebody else, but uh, we shall see. It's having some fun and games, and it's, so it's very much inspired by the original Renault 5 Turbos, that mid-engined car that was amazing in the 1980s. Now we've got this electric version. And it's, it's got the, the lovely lights on the front as well, which just, just give it a little bit of extra glimpse of fun and games. Now, more rally cars still coming up the hill, and uh, we're getting into much more modern machinery now as well. Yes, and just to reiterate, we're celebrating 50 years of the World Rally Championship, and how has it done? Now, this was a car that set the fastest time with Octanek at the wheel on, uh, on Friday, and that was when conditions were very, very wet indeed. With rally drivers, look at the eyes, the concentration, Ben. He's already imagining every twist and turn of the hill climb course. Yeah, so effectively, this is another little practice run before we get into the timing later on. Let's ride on board. Just for a moment, as you see the acceleration of these modern uh, rally cars just launch. Yeah, this is fun. Let's just ride on board. I'm going to go quiet for a moment. I love listening in. He's doing a full 360, so he's not doing the full lap, or the full uh, run up the hill. Uh, don't get too much on the grass. <laughs> but beautifully done. He could be another drift champion himself. Oh, such transferable skills. Now maybe he'll... Uh, I don't think he's going to do another, another spin. I think the rest of the course will now pick up the pace. But anyone waiting for this Ford as it approaches Volcom, I think it's going to be in for a treat. But the rally driver is so precise. Drift drivers put it on the grass, he puts it right out of the edge, but not on the grass. That is the sheer speed through there, and we can glance out of our commentary box and just see how rapid it is. Really impressive. Um, changing up through the gears and coming up towards that last section and the finish line where later on we will be assessing the sector times and the time it takes to get to the top. A record that was beaten last year by Max Chilton. But uh, the Mercury is not playing a part in the shootout today, so Max will be watching from the sidelines to see if anyone can get as fast as he can. He could last year, setting a, a completely new record. I rather doubt anyone's going to be quite as quick as that, but we are going to see a lot of fun. Yeah, certainly uh, the track was uh, dampened. Look, the smile, it's the first time he's, Otanak has breathed since he left the start line, looking so tense, neat, precise. He had the fun of those um, donuts. Slightly on the grass, slightly on the tarmac, but as soon as he was focused on going back up the hill in that uh, Ford Puma Rally 1, he was precision personified. But even that, even though it's not a competitive run, he's still going for it. Yeah, yeah, no, he is. He's having fun. So up to the top, that's where the drivers all collect, and they have to wait up there with the cars before the hill climb run has been finished in this batch, and then they'll all be allowed back down the hill and they can go and have a chat, go and have a coffee, go and have a nice time before they're all back out again a little bit later on. And it's lovely to see Otanak there just sort of a, almost giving a debrief to the person who'd been strapped in alongside him. Malcolm Wilson, the man who's done so much for Ford rallying as well, uh, has enjoyed runs in the car this weekend. But uh, we're working our way through the morning. The, the hill is dry, the hill is clean, and uh, yeah, even the grass at the edge is now dry. So that's why the drift drivers go out all over it. So let's have a look at some of the highlights. And the Duke of Richmond was passenger, co-driver, I should say, <laughs> in the rally car, the, uh, the hybrid rally car heading up the hill. And then we started to see some great action. And for those of you standing outside Goodwood House, uh, you get a great view there because so many drivers decide to do full 360s at that stage. And just the level of development of uh, machinery, astonishing the, the latest in the line of the Hoonitrons moved across, Ken Block moved across from Audi, from Ford to Audi, and this one, 1,400 horsepower from that Audi S1. So spectacle, performance, power, and a great deal 
of finesse. And then Travis Pastrana, so closely associated uh, with Kent Block, out with the Subaru GL wagon, just entertaining, amusing, and very, very quick indeed. Yeah, and uh, then we saw this Audi electric and, well, it's sort of hybrid as well, competed at the Dakar, the NASCAR. And we'll see some more historic NASCARs out later on, actually. And Hyundai, who have put up to this new machine, trying to give driver a lot of feedback. They've, they've put a lot of tech into it to give the driver the feedback of an internal combustion engine, even though it's actually electrically powered. <laughs> it did have a little instance at the back. But we did see, as I mentioned, the Duke of Richmond um, going up as co-driver at the early part of that stint. And when he got there, he caught up with Ed Foster. Your Grace, they say everything is slightly faster from the passenger seat. Was that the case? Yes, no, it was good. I mean, the, the car seems to really feels fantastic. And um, I think the hydrogen, we were just saying, it's, it actually gives it a bit more, you know, definitely gives a bit more power. And it, um, it just feels very sweet, you know, it just really runs, seems to run really well. But interesting, come up in a full hydrogen car. Now, it's always nice to see cars on the hill at the Festival of Speed, but I think today more than ever, it's great to have everything going again. It is, thank heavens we're back together, yeah. And the, sun's shining and um, everyone's in a good mood and um, we're, we're back to normal so it's, that's terrific and you've obviously had a, a few drivers staying in the house has everyone been having a good time great time yeah we had a day no one will forget yesterday and um, we everyone got together and spent time together party happened last night which was good everything quietened down by then so no, it was we, we actually had a memorable and good day your grace thank you thanks a lot jake it's not often i see you in the top paddock and you're actually shaking I'm literally shaking, yeah. I mean, the, the adrenaline run you get coming up that hill when you're absolutely committed uh, in this awesome Nissan Skyline, you know, wow. Literally gets the heart going, like more than it does in anything I've ever driven. So I think it's just the rush, you know, it's so narrow, you're going so fast, you're putting a little bit on the line, but that's what it's all about, isn't it? This is Goodwood. Now, you got the time shoot out this afternoon, as in the finish of it. Uh, it's it's going to be more like a sort of rally in the sense that you haven't had much practice. You're quite near the top, so it's all to play for. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, this old girl's running really well at the moment, and I think we've just had a pretty good run. I don't know what time we've done yet. I need to go and have a look, because I think that was our actual qualifying, as we didn't have it yesterday, obviously. So looking forward to seeing what we've done, but I'm feeling good for the shootout. What's the difference between a good time and a great time here? Well, I think anything under 50 seconds is, is pretty good. And then, you know, anything more than that is amazing. So, I mean, I did a 48.9 in the HKS car two years ago. So that's what I'm trying to beat. Well, good luck. Thanks, Ed. Kevin, what I love is that you drifters all come up here and you've got to sit with your cars for a couple of minutes, let them cool down. There's tire uh, rubber all over the top. Of, and then there's actually on your rear mudguard, there's smoking tire rubber. Ah, look, it's all a bit of crack. They call us hooligans, but... It's all, listen, it's all a good buzz, like, you know. We love coming up here and smoking the whole thing out and giving the whole thing a good show. Now, under the bonnet, what have you got under there? Because it is, it is at maximum revs pretty much the entire run. Yeah, that's a uh, 2JZ built, built by DY Engines over in the UK. It seems to be pretty, pretty bulletproof and I'm giving it a good test, like, so. No, it's all good. I love it. And with the, with the rubber that you've got on, is it particularly soft or do you want a harder rubber so you can get so you can actually get them spinning? it would be a softer rubber for more grip, to be fair, because there's so much horsepower, so it's a softer tyre. And it lasts, what, one run? Yeah, one run. They're gone now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kevin, thanks so much. No problem, thank you. To hear them start and then... <laughs> You're built different. Breathing new life into broken. Taking matters into your own hands. Assembling big dreams from the small things. Never stopping until you find the right part at the right price. That's the eBay way.
makes my heart sing. I can't stop smiling. Well, everybody said it's so exciting. You get to see all these cars, not just look at them, but you get to see them in action. That's cool. Goodwood Revival is all about make, do, and mend, vintage style, not vintage values, and of course, sustainability. Not only is there the motor racing, but it's everything else. The shopping, it's the fun fair, it's the look, it's the period, and that is what the Goodwood Revival is. It's just a fantastic day out. I'm here at the Cricket Pitch at Goodwood Festival of Speed and I've been um, enchanted over really by these incredible portraits of some of the legends of motorsport, legendary racing drivers and the photographer herself, Indira Flack, is here next to me now. Tell me the story behind these. Well, I first came to Goodwood in 1994. Um, to the second Festival of Speed, and that was my first foray into sort of motorsport as such. I'm a portrait photographer, so it's the people that is more important to me than the cars. And um, so I came and, and photographed a little bit at, Good, at Goodwood, and then in 2014, I decided I needed a bit of a project, and um, I was coming back to Goodwood, having had a break, and I thought, well, racing drivers, my partner suggested racing drivers as I was going to be here surrounded by legends of the sport and I thought yeah that sounds like a great idea. Um, I'd, I'd had a previous commission by Country Life magazine, great, the Great British Hobby and that's where the idea came from, Great British Racing Drivers and uh, Goodwood was the ideal place to speak to them all. Absolutely, you have such good access here, don't you? It's one yeah. of the charms of the Festival of Speed and indeed all, all of the Goodwood events. Um, this book in your hand, Great British <laughs> Racing Drivers. Now, tell us about this as well, because not only is it fantastic portraits throughout, brilliant portraits of just about everyone you can think of uh, in the world of motorsport, it also has a greater purpose, doesn't it? It does. Um, we're in support of Race Against Dementia, which of course is Jackie Stewart's um, uh, charity. And that's because my partner, Paul, his father, um, sadly died of dementia. And we just thought it was an appropriate charity to, to support. And also because we could have its founder in, in the project and in the book, which is lovely. Yeah, absolutely fabulous. And I'm very sorry to hear that, but I'm sure the work that you're doing now would make him very proud indeed. And, and how much interest have you had here at Goodwood so far? Because these photographs really do draw you in. We've had a fair amount of interest. We've, we've sold a few copies, which is lovely. That's what we always want to do. And um, yeah, lots of people have been over and we've been speaking to them and telling them the stories behind the pictures. Of course, all the stories behind the pictures are in the book as well. So you get that, that little bit of interest as well. Um, but it's, it's been lovely being on the cricket pitch. It's, it's a fantastic spot and um, I'm very grateful for good, to Goodwood and the Duke for letting me um, have the exhibition here. Oh, we're very grateful you are here. It's absolutely stunning. Thank you so much, Indira, and hopefully you sell a lot more copies and raise some money for charity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In my test, I might get arrested. She's sitting on my new sheet. We still get a mess.
The award-winning all-electric Jaguar I-Pace. With fast charging technology and a range of up to 292 miles. Search iPace. Good morning, hello, and welcome to Goodwood 2023. This is the Action Sports Arena. Yeah, the first year was a was a you know a worrying experience, to say the least. We'd invested for us at the time what felt like quite a lot of money, and we got a few sponsors. Um, the idea was that the sponsors would kind of cover the cost, you know, but that wasn't really wasn't the case. And um, we had Bonhams, we had Citroen, we had Honda, and we had Aston Martin uh, that first year. And it rained and rained and rained in the build-up. And um, you know, we actually ended up. I, I can remember paint, I painted the bridge myself pretty much. The rain was the washing the paint off as quickly as we got it on. We had no idea how many people were going to come. I was pretty worried no one was going to turn up. I didn't sleep much the night before, opened my bathroom windows, I've told this story many times, and um, man, they were just pouring in. And I can remember actually, you know, standing out there on that first Saturday afternoon as they all arrived, you know, directing them into the paddock and saying hello to them. And, you know, literally I was greeting each car as it arrived. So there hadn't up to then been so many, so many opportunities to drive these cars in a fun way with your, with, with, with your friends. And we were lucky we managed to bring a group of people together. In 1999, Ron and the team decided they were going to go for the record. Nick Heidfeld was the test driver. Nick obviously felt very up for it. And I think McLaren, well I know for sure, that a few team principals made it very clear to Nick he needed to do the business.
never tire of seeing Nick Heidfeld's run to the record back in 1999. In a few moments' time, we'll be celebrating 75 years of the Goodwood Motor Racing Circuit. Then, afterwards, we have celebrations for Lotus, for McLaren. We'll send some Formula 1 Grand Prix greats up the hill, and we will tick you through MotoGP as well. We will be celebrating 75 years of Porsche putting cars in competition in Batch 5, and then the celebration moment in front of the house, concluding that run. Later on, Le Mans, NASCAR, and the sports races as well. And then we'll see McLaren Lotus, the Grand Prix greats, uh, MotoGP once again, and the cars belonging to Jeff Beck, the late guitarist, before the main event today. Shootout on Sunday. Who can take the win this year? Really looking forward to what is an absolute jam-packed day across the board. And after the shootout, uh, we will again celebrate with the Goodwood 75 run. Again, we'll celebrate with Porsche as they reach the 75th year anniversary of their competition cars. And then Le Mans, NASCAR, sports car races, then the supercar run, then a first glance as we drift towards the end with the drift corner, the tin tops, the rally, and the 50-year celebration of the WRC. What a great remaining run in prospect up the just over a mile long magical mile hill climb here and it is so good to see so many of you uh, taking a look on the lawn down there and look how deep it is by the bales as we await this run to celebrate 75 years of Goodwood Motor Circuit's racing history and also 30 years since the foundation and the formation of the Festival of Speed. It has grown and grown each year. Something has been more refined, more celebrations. But uh, for me, just to encapsulate the history of the sport, two-wheeled and four is what this next batch of cars is all about. Cars and bikes, and we're going to be kicking off with bikes. And uh, I just uh, having a look what's down on the start line, and I know James Hayden alongside me is just constantly saying to me he would love to ride up as a sidecar passenger. Right? Did I get that message <laughs> wrong, James? Well, I've been around the... Uh, I've ridden with uh, Steve Webster, uh, who was a seven-time world champion, around Castle Coombe, and uh, uh, believe me, it was... I couldn't believe how the strength you needed in your arms, and I was fit. And at the end, his mechanic went... Yeah, he said, oh, I was just cruising. His mechanic said, you're only a second and a half off the lap record. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know what that's about. And I presume when you're sitting on the, in, on the or hanging onto the sidecar and moving your body around for sheer life, every single bump must hurt. Yeah, very much. And it's just a different technique like anything. You know, the grip that they've got and the, the difference it is. We've got a couple of sidecars in this one, obviously. Um, we've got the Virtual Brothers. Um, you know, the Virtual Brothers and it are absolutely superb. Um, but first of all, we've got the, uh, the Kawasaki, the LCR Kawasaki, what we're looking at here. And, uh, yeah, this was made famous by uh, Maria Costello, who became the first woman in 2019 to compete in both the sidecar and the solo at the TT. Um, so that's what we're, we're seeing here on the uh, F2 Kawasaki, sort of really giving it some as she uh, comes up here as well, just uh, past the commentary box. And you can see the passenger really busy. That yeah, and don't forget it's about it's about accelerating going through the favourites. So this yeah. bike has always been Maria has been such a supporter of uh, this event, the Festival of Speed, and she does drum people up to hang on. Maybe not do the moving around that all the bike passengers would normally do. Just hang on and enjoy the ride brackets as much as you possibly can. Yeah, this is the Virtual Brothers. They're incredible. They just did the first ever 120 mile an hour plus average lap at the TT um, a few weeks ago. These guys have won everything. They are like superb. If you're talking sidecar, you talk the Virtual Brothers and you know this is them. They really have done an amazing job there on the uh, FHO Honda. We've also just come past us there. You're not seeing it on screen, but we've just had the uh, the old, really old, uh, rough superior, old land speed record bike, no brakes, did 113 miles an hour back in uh, 1924. Hold now, on, just say, repeat two words in that sentence, <laughs> no brakes. How can that yeah. be the case? <laughs> they just wanted it light. And what we're looking at here is the white motorcycles concept. So this is an electric bike that is apparently so slippery, so aerodynamic, that it gets twice the mileage of any other electric motorcycle. So when they're trying to get EVs to get range, this bike is uh, is super, super slippery and uh, it's had a grant from the sort of the funding of the emissions in the UK. It's a 
a UK-based company. And just behind them as well, you'll see a little Honda RS250 with a single-sided swinging arm. Beautiful bike, lovely balance between weight and, um, and power. You know, I used to race one of those, won a few rounds of British Championship on one. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous thing to ride. And looking back over your, your bike racing history, James, obviously went on for a long time, huge amount of success. Was there a sweet spot in that where rider and bike just seemed in harmony? Yeah, I mean, there's a few bikes that I really look back fondly on. Me and my 500 Grand Prix bike V4, that was an absolute weapon when it was set up properly. I um, mean, yeah, I love some of my super bikes, my factory GSXR, my, my R1, my Ducati 996 was beautiful. So some really, really nice stuff. Um, yeah, I was lucky to ride. Now look at this, number 90, what bike this is. This is the Rotary Norton 588, but this is famous for one of the greatest TTs of all time in 1992, when Steve Hislop and Carl Fogarty went head to head. They were never more than eight seconds apart during the whole long race, and it was a battle. They were using the curb, the dirt, the pavement. It was incredible, and it's one of the most famous Norton motorcycles ever. And such an illustrious history as well. Beyond the racing too, the Norton Commando was the bike of choice when I was uh, just growing up. The sort of the first world of top trumps. That's what I was uh, pulling out of the pack. Yeah, and Steve is not bless his rest his soul. Obviously killed in a helicopter accident, but that was his bike, and he made it his own. And boy, was that a race and a half. You know, I was lucky enough to race Steve for many, many years, and he was a wonderful natural rider. And it's beautiful to see that motorcycle here today. Right, a, a car that absolutely blew our socks off last year, the McMurtry Spearling. Get this, when it gets going, it has two tonnes of downforce, and that's in a car that weighs far less than two tonnes. Alex Summers is driving it today. He drove it last year, but it was Max Chilton who took it over to do that final shootout and shattered the hill record. 41.6 seconds was the mark left for many, many years by Nick Heidfeld in his Formula 1 McLaren. 39.08 seconds is what uh, was managed by Max. And apparently Max Children has actually um, edged Alex Summers out of the way. He's taken it back over. And there is a little whisper that if they went for the pace again, there was much more up their sleeve. I mean, it did move into a fourth dimension. And, and uh, they reckon they could have got down to a high 36 second run. They're just going to have a demonstration run and look and just try and understand how it gets around the corners as fast as it can. Massive fan pulling it down to the track. That's where the downfall is. Just listen to the fan as it heads towards Malcolm Corner. Everyone having to readjust immediately. We're looking out of the commentary box window. That is outrageous in comparison to what we've seen. No wonder it's the record holder, Max Chilton. If this is a demo run, what must last year have looked like? Well, we all just uh, stopped breathing for quite some while, <laughs> and I think Max was much the same on board. He was certainly relieved at the top, but it does defy your eyes and just all concepts of physics, but up the top it goes at just that level of downforce, cornering on rails, just unbelievable, the McMurtry Spearling. You know what, they've just made a track version of that as well, the McMurtry Spearling Pure. They've got a real brain trust, but even in super slow-mo, the car just goes where the driver wants to put it. Sensational, no other word for it. Absolutely sensational to see that complete change of pace out of nowhere as we celebrate 75 years of, uh, of Goodwood and having motors on what used to be a base for Spitfires before. That's a story of so much motor racing history in this country. But uh, yeah, it's the automobiles stealing the show for the last 75 years. And that, the fastest we've ever seen on the Magical Mile. And uh, the Ferrari 250 GTO at many points in history, the most, most expensive car just an absolute exquisite beauty. Holly Mason, Frank Eaty driving, or certainly has been driving it through the course of the weekend. Didn't spot if she's on board, but this car from her father's collection, 10 tenths, Nick Mason, her father, who has an incredible array of cars and such a success, such a shade and a joy. Again, brilliant to see it back out again, but this is a celebration of the festival speed, and this has been one of the cars that's been here pretty much every year. Always a treat to see it. Absolutely is, as we have such a variety, such a variation across the board here. Well, we, we saw the McMurtry Spearling wanting to have as much downforce as possible. Do you think this rear wing on this Pikes Peak Peugeot uh, is looking for a similar feat? And most notably it did. And if you've never seen Pikes Peak, it's called the race to the race to the sky. And it is phenomenal up and up and up to the thin air at altitude. And uh, certainly once the rally drivers and crews started pitching towards it, Ender Garvey, the driver right now, is... Uh, driving a car, car that went up with 650 brake horsepower. Uh, Andrew Vatnen at the wheel of one and teammate Juha Kankanen in another. Just super astonishing cars. Yeah, competing 
and taking victory to a record time in 1988. And you always know when you're looking at a Pikes Peak entry <laughs> due to the fact that there's a barn door on the back, but it was absolutely effective for them. That is a, uh, a great looking thing. And don't forget in the early days, in fact, until relatively recently, the, the top part of the course was on gravel or certainly uh, rough stuff before they put the tarmac down. Often you can't even go the whole way to the top because snow and low cloud comes down, they have to readjust. But this, an absolutely stunning car, that 405 Ti 16 with a difference because it was the Pikes Peak special. Going back to uh, the early days of the Formula One World Championship, 1950, that inaugural year, BRM decided they were going to do it and differently. This is a car, the BRM V16, a car that they were desperate with which to achieve glory uh, for Britain against the, gi the giants of the time, which was the Italian engineers at uh, Alfa Romeo that basically swept up for the first two seasons. This car sounds exquisite, 600 horsepower, because it revved in those days enormously high, 12,000 RPM. The big problem was it often revved and then no longer was revving because it had all sorts of mechanical problems, perhaps too complicated, but the cars now are built in a far, far uh, more knowledge-based uh, knowledge fashion and they last a lot longer and they do make the most exquisite sound. Reg Parnell mastered the V16 at a sodden Goodwood back then and he took... <laughs> This car is uh, is a real privilege, and going up the hills great. It was actually dry today, which is a big difference to uh, Friday, when it was pouring with rain, and I was absolutely soaked sitting here, right here, getting rained upon with no tree above me. <laughs> but yeah, but today, I'm dry and I'm very happy, and it's brilliant. Yeah, and to be together with these cars, I mean, it's it's fantastic. I have to say, one of my favourite moments, I think, from the festival speed of all time, is when you all came up. And the Mini pushing on, and uh, we are okay. so we great, great speed through Volcom Corner as we uh, make our way up. An iconic design. Well, 
what is enormous amount of space in a very small car, but better than that, it was a very, very dynamic car. What it was more than that, that's what John Cooper provided to make it the Mini Cooper. And in the early 60s, this is the car to have, but uh, very few people drove it as well as Nick Swift does. He manages with its very square wheelbase, as uh, wide as it is long, to hurl it around. You can even see there pushing the tail out. Front wheel drive, when front wheel drive wasn't really much of a thing. And no wonder it was so popular. Also down at the Good Goodwood Circuit for the revival, we have many a good mini race. And despite the, the number of drivers who reached, uh, will reach no higher age last year, but such a brilliant rack on tour. But the Ford Caprice he ran in the late 1970s. This is one of those very much a fan favourite in what was then the British Saloon Car Championship. So the Capri being powered up and firing past the line. Now the by one registered Mark One Jaguar. This is a car that has entertained enormously. Back in the late 50s in the British Saloon Car Championship, it was the car to have, but then suddenly, a couple of years later, that race four Galaxy to play with, started to outrace them. But these were nimble in the hands of Mark It just cuts the tail out and down the Goodwood Motor Circuit. Great, great crowd entertainment. He loves to get the rear end out of that car as he sends it by. He's going to bring it past our commentary box now. The Mark 1 as he is going to kick the rear end out, I am sure. Is that conservative for him? No, it is certainly quite conservative for Grant. Maybe he's running out of tyres because he's going to be these cars in the Mark 1 Jaguars. In period, you thought they might be staying. They might be staying. Yeah. Notice your local doctor was driving one, but in the hands of the racing driver, the Graham Hills and uh, many, many others. It had success after success after success. Being chased up the hill by a V12 Sunbeam, which is uh, next in line. And we've got some Formula One machinery at the bottom of the hill for you in a few moments' time as well. And again, just to point it out, this is celebrating both 75 years since Goodwood Motor Circuit uh, was open for business and the cars and bikes that have entertained us over the years. And certainly, of course, uh, the Alfa Romeo and the Sunbeam Tiger we've been talking about, the Sunbeam at the moment, the V12 coming through. And these were cars that uh, Some Benetons coming to play. We've got Lorena McLaughlin in the B192 and uh, also Stephen Ossiavelli, the, the car of the year later. So, two cars right at the front of um, Michael Schumacher's career. Of course, he took his first win in 1993, one year on from his de debut. And uh, the United Colours of Benetton, they, 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 they did very successful, morphed into the uh, Renault team and uh, based at Enstone. Not, uh, with uh, plenty of history as well, and this is an amazing car for Michael Schumacher being driven by Lorena McLaughlin. It was always described by those who uh, sat behind the wheel as looking out as if you were sitting in the bath, was the uh, technical description given. But it's a, a great, uh, it's a great design, the simplicity of the 90s Formula One cars, and of course, that wonderful sound. And uh, going rather earlier back in time, we're going right the way back to the oldest car here this weekend, the 1908. Uh, Auriga collection entry, Ben Collins has been sharing that with son Archie and uh, Ben appears to be sitting on the right hand side, the passenger side there, trying to work out who's at the wheel of that at the moment. But uh, again, with these very, very early Mercedes Grand Prix cars, uh, three of them were entered in the 1908 French Grand Prix and we're not talking about uh, racing at Paul Car or even <laughs> on the Banky at Monarchy. The tracks were very, very rudimentary back then. But uh, again, anybody seeing them, bear in mind, in those days, there were very few cars even on the road. Martin Ader is the driver who's uh, fortunate enough to take this up the hill. But Ben Collings' family have been preparing these cars, racing these cars forever and a day. There's nothing he doesn't know about it. He's very quick behind the wheel. And also son Archie Collings, uh, only in his sort of late teens, is uh, now really, or probably just about 16, uh, starting to drive these cars with greater cromp. But there we are, Martin Turner. Talk about you sort of sit on the car rather than in, don't you, Alex? You absolutely do. And uh, we would feel very exposed up there, the car that raced in 1908 across a 47.8 mile circuit of public roads beginning the Grand Prix heritage that continues to this very day. Well, if your car broke down at the far side of that lap, that was a long way back. But of course, you had your riding mechanic. Did they have the right selection of tools? But it's great because it has been about celebrating the motor industry 
and the motor racing industry and the motorcycling industry. That has been the story of the Festival of Speed. So it's great to have these really, really early runners. Now, the Jaguar D-Type long nose, a fabulous car. As a fact, I look up, it's uh, being propelled up the hill. Nicholas Pellet at the wheel. And again, you can see just the, the dynamics of, the, of these cars just changing. Oh, oh he's going to have to back off a bit because he's, yes. caught, he's caught up to the tail of the Afromeo P3 there, the glorious looking uh, Grand Prix car from the mid 1930s. So just having to back it off a little bit. But it is celebrating the 75 years since the first race was held in 1948 at the circuit. And then again, of course, uh, 30 years since the first of the Festival of Speeds, which brought together this amazing potpourri of cars and bikes. Glorious to see all the eras covered back to back to back to back. And uh, we are continuing to run cars. There's so many in this batch. We're continuing on now. Oh, the sunbeam heading up past our commentary box. And now we're on to the Thomas Special. Uh, but it's better known by the name that you will see in a few moments time when they head into turn number one. This is the car known as Babs. And uh, Geraint it it's his father who... Uh after a conversation in the pub with some colleagues, decided to dig it out of the sand dunes at Pendine Sands down in uh, West Wales, where it had been buried after Parry Thomas, unfortunately, in a land speed record attempt, uh, met his maker. But this is a solid state car, and the beautiful irony about it is that Geraint uh, Owen, driving it at the moment, is a lecturer in uh, automotive technology. And this is one end of the scale. You can be fairly sure that his course at Bath University covers the other end of the scale as well. But just to give you a, li a few little statty numbers on this one, it's not 28 litres, it's only 27.1. The car behind it now on the hill is the full fat 28 litres. This is uh, the Fiat F76, so famous now. That's 28.4 litres. This was a land speed record attempt car. Duncan Pittaway, he of the yellow and black helmet, just drives it with such get up and go. And it's very big, it's very powerful, but this is not its natural habitat, but it appears that no one's told Duncan this. And this is one running on alternative fuels, on synthetic fuels, so they're not only things that can work on modern cars, and the advantage last year when he drove up from home in Bristol to come to here, it was nine stops at the fuel, fueling stations. This year with the synthetic fuels, only eight. That's only eight Rolo bars and uh, <laughs> a, a, a tank of your best stuff, please. Excellent stuff, and you will see technology being powered by renewable fuel as the flames come out of the Beast of Turin all the way to the yeah, end. As the early team, as the Fiat, what the Beast of Turin that you're looking at uh, at the moment, the and as late as uh, Formula One technology, you'll see Sebastian Vettel, four-time world champion, also going up on renewable fuel, the same type that is powering this, as we have all types of variation. We have the electric vehicles, we have the hydrogen fuel cells, and we've got renewable renewable fuel as well, sending the cars up the magical mile. Now, after the circuit closed in 1966, yeah, we had a lot of testing went on down there, a lot of Can-Am testing, a lot of Formula One testing, and this is the Lola T160, powered by an 8.4 litre Chevrolet V8. Marcus Black at the wheel of that. He's a guy who has cars of all vintages and uh, trying to keep it in a straight line under acceleration. This would be one of the cars that was uh, competing in that outlandish can -Am. selling those customer cars, and likewise they do with Lola, if you look at the Lola here, that was what kept those marks going as they tried to then push their other cars in other levels of uh, single-seater racing. And whether it's the NASCAR, whether it's the Can-Ams, you know when you're seeing the stateside machines, the growl, the roar, the wonderful emotion that comes with hearing these cars on the hill climb. They really do look exquisite and they sound even better. Now it's Formula One time. Esteban Gutierrez has been doing a brilliant duty. And it's Mick Schumacher this weekend. He's taken over. So son of, and of course, he's a, now a Mercedes development driver and a test driver, reserve driver, call it what you will. But uh, great for him to be driving one of these. Usually has to suffer on Sundays as the cutaway for our director of Formula One standing next to Toto Wolff. This Sunday, he's behind the wheel of the machine from 2021 and the son of the seven-time world champion racing the car that was competed with with the seven-time world champion Sir Lewis Hamilton and he's lighting it up for you in front of the house great to see Mick back behind the wheel and it's great of course after Michael took a few years away from uh, car racing went and uh, raced some motorbikes and then came back at the start of the second generation of the Mercedes Formula One team and had alongside him 
Nico Rosberg, three years back in the saddle, never hit the heights. The team has since moved on enormously. But great to see Mick uh, giving a bit of welly. I'm not sure that's a technical term, but you understand my drift. My drift is his drift. <laughs> Yeah, great to see Vic back behind the wheel as he chases a return to the Formula One grid next year. And what a car to be able to uh, drive and to light up in front of you as he did the donuts on the uh, wet weather Pirellis in front of the house. Uh, thankfully, it is a dry circuit today. And that car in competition to the final mile of the World Championship in 2021. Yeah, you can say that again. But uh, one thing that really strikes me, celebrating the history of the sport, the history of Goodwood and so on, we had the early Formula One cars. They were quite large in, 2000, in, in 1950. By the time we got to the early 60s, they become so small. We're at the stage where we have very large Formula One cars again. All, all the flutes and whistles and the aerodynamic aids, they really do make them less than elegant, but obviously every single part of a car now has to have a function and play it well. Yeah, we've tidied them up with the new regulations, far, almost recalling the, the smooth and uh, an artful shape of the 90s cars. And uh, we are just continuing to run some of the last batch Ferrari on the hill climb. That's the Ferrari Puro Sangue. So that is a car that uh, you must say the course vehicles here are probably the highest caliber of anywhere in the world. There's normally an Aston Martin chasing up the hill, a Rolls Royce as well. And you know what? They've all got a prodigious amount of power and uh, driven by professional drivers, uh, really very elegant indeed, and a, a Porsche right at the front of the queue. They have to sweep up the hill and check all is clear, go to the top, check everything is fine beyond the finish line in, in the collection area, the top paddock there, and then come down. So a lot of very busy individuals, but the Fiero, Ferrari Puro Songue, the pace it's had through Molka past our commentary boxes, made one think it's not a low performance car. <laughs> you can say that again. It's great. The sun is out and you have flocked here at the 30th anniversary of the Festival of Speed, whether you're watching the live stream, whether you are uh, next to the mile-long hill climb, we have so much to bring you for the rest of the day, running all the way to 7 o'clock. If you see yourself on the big screen, make sure you take your moment and give us a wave. We'll be wave back to you from the commentary box as well as we look at the sculpture with the Porsches at the front of the house. And we've completed that run. So the course being inspected by the uh, by the course cars and uh, space being made down there. We're going to have a uh, celebration with uh, Ferrari in a few moments' time, and then we'll be celebrating 75 years of Lotus, 60 years of McLaren. We'll see more Formula One cars heading up the hill, the Grand Prix greats, and some latest MotoGP bikes as well. And uh, very much looking forward to all of that, but most importantly, by far, is that we're back today and we're celebrating all the motorsport history. Throughout the day, we're seeing new launch models, and we're also celebrating the history, and it doesn't get any more evocative than Ferrari. What an array of cars for Ferrari. And coming back to compete in the World Endurance Championship and winning the big one, the 24 hours, their first work entry in that for 60 years, and they just somehow managed to scramble across the line ahead of Toyota that's been there for a very long time. But of course, in GTs as well. But looking at 296 GT3 at the front, that's their new shaped GT car in behind one of the purest designs they ever had, the Testa Rossa. And uh, in the back, of course, the prodigious run of success for Ferrari at Le Mans before Ford came in, took two attempts of, that led to failure. And then in 1966, they finally ended a long run of Ferrari success. Year in, year out, Ferrari just seemed to know what they were doing with wins at uh, Le Mans. Consecutive years from 1960, having took one, taken one in 58, Aston Martin famously won 69, but then it was Ferrari all the way through to 1965 when Maston Gregory and Jochen Rint took victory. Great to see the Tifosi, the Ferranisti, coming out to celebrate. And uh, so much to enjoy with Ferrari. It's still a mark that has its own special place in this sport. Yeah, lovely to see. Lovely that the yellow colour of Ferrari and the region in which the car has been produced is being celebrated there in front of the house. And uh, yeah, great moments. Great moments on screen at the moment. The flags flying, the brand being celebrated. So Goodwood House yesterday battered by heavy winds. Today, that's all cleared. Still a little blowy. Look at the flags. But uh, for the Ferrari fans, treasured photos will be taken right now. And uh, of course, the Ferraris look brilliant when just sitting at a standstill. But to my eye, as someone just 
married to motor racing, it's when they move. It's when those engines are fired up, that special magic. And for so many years, of course, Ferrari allied to a V12 sound, but uh, the 275P, just such an exquisite car. That was uh, their last selection of uh, Ferraris before we went on for Ford's run, but uh, just exquisite machinery. And we should all celebrate the fact these cars are still being brought out. There are still classic divisions of the great motoring manufacturers that keep these cars sweet, plus a lot of individual owners as well. Our, our joy is to get them still out and about, not in a museum. Ferrari celebrating that historic win in the centenary edition of the Le Mans 24 Hours, the Grand Prix of Endurance, and that's what we're celebrating at the moment with the uh, drivers in front of the house. Like, good to see so many people in the sunshine. Thakem providing buggies for all the people to take their children. A brilliant family area down by the start line with its own grandstand. Children allowed to do digging in a ball pit with proper diggers. It's an absolute winner. <laughs> right in front of the house, the inimitable Jerry Judah sculpture. You think you've seen them all, but every year a different twist. So that is famous the world over. What's it going to be this year? always kept as a secret that's the thing and it, yeah, how can you keep something that big a secret but you know what I'm saying <laughs> it is spectacular every single year but this is a very special version and uh, we're celebrating Ferrari at the moment we'll be celebrating Porsche later on as we have been doing all week long and the Ferraris have gathered in front of the house for their moment of recognition after that landmark win on their return so to the just, 24 hours. Just to refresh, it's the Ferrari 296 GT3, the contemporary GT3 racer in the background. The white and blue car, the uh, American racing colours of the Ferrari Testa Rossa from the late 1950s. And near us, it was a, the, one year it was the Ferrari 250P. It was upgraded to this one, which is the Ferrari 275P. Consecutive wins for Luigi, Luigi Scarfiotti and Lorenzo Bandini in 63 and uh, Jean Guichet and Nino Vaccarella the following year at 64. Brandon Wang's car, the one closest to us. Just fabulous body fit. Yes, and the budget cap in Formula One allowing Ferrari to go back to the World Endurance Championship and distributing staff there who they don't want to let them go. And they took all of their knowledge and all of their prowess and all of their competition to try and end the run of Toyota, and they did so. And we have assembled in front of the house to celebrate that landmark as well. And plenty of you down there ready to enjoy the moment on the balcony. And uh, they'll be there in a few seconds' time as uh, we uh, pause in the action. We've, uh, we've checked the hill climb course. It's all in good order. Straw bales are present and correct. And the uh, run from before... Uh, coming back down the hill, so all eyes in front of the house. Uh, flags have been handed out, and they are ready to wave at, uh, at our uh, collection of personnel on the balcony in a, uh, a few moments' time. And plenty more. Celebrations for so many iconic brands across today for Porsche, for McLaren, for Lotus, but we are now enjoying Ferrari and we can send it to David Green who is about to have a chat. Well ladies and gentlemen we have a special Goodwood balcony moment coming up for you now. Give yourselves, put your hands together and give us a warm festival of speed. Welcome to your Ferrari winning Le Mans team. Miguel Molina, Antonio Giovinazzi and James Collado. Welcome everybody. Miguel, a credible result for the whole Ferrari team. You were in the number 50 car with your teammates, Nicholas Nielsen and Antonio Fuco. You set the hyperpole and the fastest lap in the race. What was it like to see the 499P head off from pole position in that centenary moment? Yeah, for sure it was a special moment for us. I think the, coming back to the, to the top class, uh, after 50 years with the number 50 in the, in the car, I think it was very special to start in the, in the pole position, in the upper pole. Uh, both cars were in, in the front row, so that was very, very important for us. I think this, this showed that uh, Ferrari has a lot of power in motorsport and is really be, being able to, to, to create a, a very fast car. And we showed in Le Mans, uh, starting from the pole position in the centenary of the 24 hours. And tell us, what was it like to race in front of over 300,000 spectators? Did you get a sense of that when you were in the car? Yeah, it was amazing. It was uh, really special. As I, like, like I said, I think um, it was a, a special event. 
a lot of people there and the crowd was 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 crazy i mean it was a a very good week uh, especially for for all of us and um, we enjoyed we enjoyed a lot and looking forward for the rest of the season that's still still two more races to go antonio if i could just bring you in as an italian what was it like to see that ferrari hypercar back on the top step after 50 years away from top level endurance racing yeah i i think you know all of us, we are just really proud, first of all, to, to bring back Ferrari after 50 years in Le Mans and 24 hours in the main category. Uh, we didn't expect, for sure, to, to win at the, the first, uh, first time, but uh, you know, it was a crazy race. We put all together. Uh, the car was amazing to drive, it was really fast, the reliability was really good. So, yeah, I think we, we did something uh, really historic for, uh, for Ferrari, for motorsport, winning in Le Mans after 58 years for Ferrari. Uh, just really proud, really proud of my teammates and my, my team in general. So, yeah, we need to be, all of us, really proud. And tell me what it was like when you, after 24 hours of quite intense racing, it was probably one of the best Le Mans for a long, long time, when you saw your teammate, uh, Per Guidi, going over that line in first place. How, what, what was the feeling for you? It was a tricky Le Mans, you know, a really long, it's already a really long race, but the conditions were uh, crazy, you know, start to rain in the middle of the race, just in a part of the track. Uh, then, you know, the last 28 minutes, the car didn't restart and uh, was a little bit of panic on our garage. But we, we were able to, you know, to restart the car and uh, to lose one minute, but still to win the race. So it was right, really like a movie, to be honest, and, uh, but with a good ending for us. I, I thought you were just trying to make it more dramatic for us at the end there with that uh, stuff. <laughs> I was, and it was on the plan, but in the end, you know, like I say, I felt like a movie uh, with a good end for us. Uh, well, just uh, still a special day for me, for, uh, for my career, you know, winning for an Italian driver with Ferrari in Le Mans, one of the best and uh, biggest races in the world. It was something, uh, something really cool. And, uh, you know, it's a fantastic achievement for a very short project for Antonella Coletta and the rest of the Ferrari Le Mans team. You must be very happy with what ended up being a, a fairy tale win. Yeah, you know, one year ago we, we put the car in the track and, uh, and after one year we know we did uh, all the podiums in the championship, the hyper pole, the 24 hour Le Mans. So yeah, just uh, really proud of, of my team and uh, still a lot of things to do it, uh, keep working, but I think we, we achieved already something really great for, for Ferrari. Fantastic work. And James, if I could just bring you in. You brought a British driver back to the top step of Le Mans. How does it feel? Amazing, and it's great to finally see some Brits. I've, I've been with Italians the whole time, so it's amazing to see you all. Um, yeah, it was an amazing achievement, honestly. Uh, we've wanted it for so long, and to bring this car back after so many years, and it's only its fourth race, uh, to get that win was uh, truly outstanding. I'm so happy for the team. Of course, you've won before in the LMGTE class. What's the secret sauce to winning the Le Mans 24 hours? I think uh, not to let it stress you out too much. I think, uh, you know, obviously you've got to be quick. The car needs to be fast, but at the same time, it's a long week. You need to try and recover, relax, re you know, rest as much as we can and uh, not make mistakes. And uh, honestly, we didn't think we'd finish the race. Uh, you know, the car had never done more than eight hours. And, um, you know, to, to do 24 with absolutely no problems was, uh, was outstanding. So it's all credit to Ferrari. What an amazing team. And you're very much part of the family there. You've been part of the team for many years. It's a month later from the win. How does it feel? What have you been doing? I hope celebrating for the last month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, two weeks, uh, I may be put on a few kilos. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's back to training now. And uh, we've got a bit of a break until Japan. So, uh, yeah, uh, relax a little bit. But at the same time, try and train as much as we can and uh, enjoy the moment. And, uh, you know, I always love being here, seeing these old cars. It's so amazing. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just great to see you all. And finally, just at the Festival of Speed here, it's been a great opportunity to bring that fantastic looking hypercar, the 499P, all covered in dirt still from Le Mans. It's probably the most photographed card here, I'd say, this weekend alongside the trophy. What's it like to be here this weekend and celebrating the win? It's amazing, honestly, and to see the car, it still gives me goosebumps, you know. Uh, I still can't really get over to how amazing it was to drive. We were doing 220 mile an hour every single lap. The balance was superb and, um, you know, just to see it every single time just gives you those emotions still. And uh, like I say, it's just great. Great that you can see it. It's great to see so many Ferrari fans here as well. And um, yeah, we'll continue to try and get our third world title. That's fantastic work. I see lots of flags out there, red flags. I'm going to let you get back down, celebrate the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, your Ferrari Le Mans team.
Well, fantastic to see the names that have been etched in motor racing history celebrating. And it's Pierre Guidi, Collado and Giovinazzi celebrating on the balcony. Let's check in more with Ferrari. Well, that was a wonderful moment. Thank you to David for speaking to the winners. You especially got the feeling that James Collado was enjoying seeing a British crowd celebrating his win there. Uh, a month long celebration for Ferrari, who returned to the top tier of racing in Le Mans for the first time in six decades and took the win. Uh, there was an amazing lineup one of the coolest sights I've seen of the entire weekend of everyone waiting to go back down the hill as we enjoyed the Ferrari celebration. And uh, it meant that we had the Mercedes uh, mechanics running to Mick Schumacher's car, telling him to, no, quickly, they're not, they're not designed to stay there like that. Cut it out, and they are pushing him all the way back to the F1 paddock. And uh, if you've not made your way down there, you are, you are advised from the commentary box to make your way down. It is a packed day. It is a busy schedule. We'll take a pause. We'll see you on the other side. And I'll tell you, might get arrested. She's sitting on a new sheet. We still get a messy. I've been in love.
So this is Future Lab. Goodwood's Innovation Pavilion, packed full of dynamic, interactive technology here to inspire everyone, from industry enthusiasts to the next generation of budding scientists. Let's check it out. So I've managed to find a friend over here. Who's Sprout? What's he up to? Sprout is an electric robot for field work. So Sprout's able to carry lots of different tools within it. So we've developed an asparagus harvester as the first tool, where it looks at the crop identifies whether it's right and then cuts it off using a soft gripper and a vibrating blade. Inside, underneath the bonnet, there are two 3D cameras and those cameras look and use deep learning to identify where every single spear is. Sprout is battery powered, it's fully electric, it's lightweight, it can run for 12 to 16 hours a day completely autonomously, no stopping, no brakes and do that day in day out. Now, I don't know about you, but ever since I was a little girl, I have been fascinated by space. So this is an exciting moment because we have a commercial crew astronaut in the house with us here. What we are really excited to hear about is the Saxaford Spaceport. What does that mean? The Saxaford Spaceport is the very first vertical launch facility in the UK. So when you say a vertical launch facility, you mean we go like this? It's important for the world, specifically because we send up a kind of satellite in a particular orbit that we can only do from places like Saxaford. The thing is that tomorrow's jobs are in space. We solve all the challenges we face on Earth by solving for space. Uh, over half the information we have about climate change comes from assets in space. Saxaford is about to do a launch in October, uh, the, their very first one, and it, it is exciting. Well, Mike, thank you again, and we can't wait to see the success of it all. Well, from outer space, I now have my feet firmly back on the ground, and it is time to jump into something even more futuristic. <laughs> wow. So, Sergio, we're inside Climb E. What are we experiencing? Okay, Climb E is the vision, our vision, Ital Design vision of the future mobility. So, it is uh, the merging of vertical mobility and horizontal mobility. You still see the real interior of car, you still see the, the people around you, yeah. your body, your hands, but outside you will see this virtual city. All right, let's give it a go, shall we? Well, wow, Sergio, thank you for transporting me to a whole other universe. Um, it's quite bizarre that I'm actually just sitting here at Goodwood Festival Speed with you guys. Chapman, the private plane commuting chairman of the Lotus Group of Companies, knows the meaning of success. Jim Clark, the first man home. has become a success story for Chapman and for Britain. It is time to celebrate 75 years of Lotus and you're looking down at the infield where plenty of manufacturers, including the great Mark, are celebrating. And it's a huge stand down there, Alice. It's well worth everyone, if they've not been yet, taking their time to not only go and see Lotus, but see all of the manufacturer stands. It is a, a huge array of machines down there. Yeah, it certainly is. Alex had the chance to, to nip out and have a good wander around. It is packed and you can see lots of people giving us a wave, enjoying the partial sunshine that we are getting, but fantastic stand that Lotus do have. So like Alex said, if you are out and about and having a wander around, do make sure that you take a look to the Lotus stand as they're celebrating 75 years.
They are indeed. That's Alice Powell. I'm Alex Jakes. James Hayden is going to guide us through the MotoGP section uh, that's coming your way in a moment. Let me just tell you what you've got on the hill climb in the next couple of minutes. 75 years of Lotus is first. Then we'll be enjoying the MotoGP old era, new era, just classic, classic bikes all the way through. So, and uh, But we start, though, with Lotus, and we start with these wonderful machines. This is just something absolutely phenomenal down there. There, and you've got them lined up in order. You've got the Lotus Climax uh, built in 1960 down there, and you've got the later versions as well. We're starting with the 18 and then running through the 21, the 25, the 33, and the 49 have all been on the hill climb so far this weekend as we celebrate the rich history of one of the great brands one of the great names in Formula One history for so long, synonymous with design innovation of taking it forward and pushing the boundaries. And that's exactly what we're seeing now as we begin this celebration. We begin with the Lotus Climax 18, Alice. Yes, yeah, so this was the Lotus that scored its first ever Formula One win back in the 1960s, a 2.5 litre four cylinder engine. Beautiful piece of kit, beautiful piece of machinery. As you can see, we have some more Lotus Climaxes as well, Lotus Cosworth. Yeah, great to see you all lining up there. You've got the Climax lining up. You've also uh, got uh, the uh, 49 is involved in the runs as well. That's uh, excellent to see. And they're just forming up on the grid in formation. This era of car, which you always associate with the great Jim Clark. And uh, now the Cosworth, uh, Lotus Cosworth 72 in your picture as well. And for so long, these were the benchmark in Formula One. Uh, ticking along in the background, you've got the, uh, the, you've got the 72 in different colours further back as well. The three litre V8 as well. And, and through the era as well with the 77. Iconic and, liveries as well, aren't they? Oh, Alex? yes. Not, a, not only this innovation of design, uh, but uh, really, really impressive to see them all together. This is what you get at Goodwood. This is, James, only what you get at Goodwood. Such an impressive collection of historic cars for Lotus. Yeah, unique and just absolutely wonderful to see these classic JPS color schemes as well. Gorgeous shapes and, uh, you know, just absolutely brilliant to see some of uh, Colin Chapman's masterpieces. Yeah, and joining at the back there, we have some of the road cars too. A mirror V6 here, which you've probably seen already in the first glance, too, with the manufacturers. As here they go, making their way up the hill now. Leaving the line and the last of the Formula One machines giving chase there. The Lotus Cosworth 79, the ground effect 79, the absolute class of the field in 1978. And America's Formula One world champion in the form of Mario Andretti, one of the all-time greats behind the wheel. But you see so many machines here. And seeing the, uh, the 72, the red and gold car that was driven to victory by Jochen Rinn. The only posthumous world champion in the history of Formula One. And uh, we see this wonderful celebration. What an array of history to head past as the 49 goes past our commentary box, completing the order. <laughs> so maybe didn't get the memo as early as everyone else. But so wonderful to see the cars of Colin Chapman. And I absolutely love these celebrations because you can see where it really started. That obviously was founded in 1948 by Colin Chapman, but the first, the Lotus Climax from 1960, and then we go all the way through to 1978, and then how they emerged into their current road cars as well. Yeah, and back with a bang, uh, lots of models being launched this, this weekend, it, it, new iterations as well, and uh, a wonderful, wonderful moment for Lotus. I can't believe how many Grand Prix winners we've just shown you climbing the hill in one batch in close formation as they should be seen in glorious, glorious motion out there as well. And we concluded with the 49 from 1967, the first car to be powered by the legendary DFV V8 from Ford Cosworth, an engine that was used for such a long time in Formula One. 
And this is what I love about the Festival of Speed. We move from Lotus to MotoGP, which means it is a complete gaggle of beautiful bikes down there, James Hayden. Yeah, looking at some of the greatest riders and the greatest bikes in the world. Right there is a uh, number one, a last year's world MotoGP champion, Pecco Bagnaia on the Ducati. And he's leading this year's championship, four wins already, five podiums. He is in terrific form. And that motorcycle he's on there, you're looking at it, number one. What a motorcycle. It revs to 18 and a half thousand revs. It weighs 160 kilos, but it's got 265 brake horsepower. Does over 223 miles an hour. It's an absolute weapon. Uh, next to him as well, you can see the Gas Gas, which is basically a rebranded KTM, uh, number 37 there. And um, it's a, you know, again, what a motorcycle that's come on. The Gas Gas, the KTMs have come on so quickly this year. Uh, they've been really, really impressive. Augusto Fernandez there just getting his bike warmed up, but it's number 33. It is, uh, it is um, Brad Brinder um, who's out there on the KTM. And he is absolutely, what a motorcycle this is. It's been absolutely terrific. Um, it's nice to see him sort of getting out and getting a good go. And look at the aerodynamics on these bikes. They have changed so much over these last few years. You know, all the downforce everything keeping the bikes pressed in um, it really does a job it's a v4 16 valve 260 brake horsepower but look at that that is kevin schwantz and that's kevin schwantz riding his 1993 rgv 500 two stroke that was the year he won the championship so it's great to see him on this bike on the anniversary look at the smoke as he comes out and he actually gives it some beans here is uh, anea bastanini now, he's the other factory rider called the Beast. Uh, what a rider he is. He was unlucky this year so far. He got taken out in round one by Marini. Broke his uh, right collarbone quite badly, but he's been coming back. But look at this Ducati. It really is something quite spectacular. Look at all the extra airlines, the fins, the downfalls, the huge carbon brakes. Well, these bikes have just moved on like you wouldn't believe. They really are. And behind him there, number one, uh, actually, right now, we just cut to Freddie Spencer. He was the 1985 500cc and 250cc world champion. That's the bike he won the 500 championship on. It was a 500cc triple. And uh, it's so great to see Freddie Spencer out. One of the, you know, he's rated as one of the most naturally brilliant riders of, of all time. He won it in 83, 85 in the 500s, as I say, also the 250s that year. So great to see Freddie Spencer there out on that uh, NS500 triple there. Really good in that classic colorway and that classic helmet. Fast Freddie, he was known as, and uh, for good reason. As he completes his run, plenty of smoke out the back, I can tell you, down to the start line, there are some uh, very, very enthusiastic volunteers giving push starts to a lot of the older machinery we have again. There's a lot of sprinting going on to uh, to uh, get these cut, uh, these bikes up the hill. Well, like all these things, they don't like to be sat too long. They overheat. You know, they need that air passing through their radiators. Um, and some of the old stuff, you know, they can be a, a little bit uh, awkward at times anyway. But uh, lovely to see Fast Freddy just rolling across the line there on that beautiful Honda again. So, uh, Great stuff there from uh, from Freddie Spencer. And look what have we got behind him as well. He just crosses the finish line. We're looking a little further back. Uh, got a lot of different bikes. I mean, we, we've got the first ever um, uh, championship winner, the AGS Porcupine, and the last ever winner. That's how great it is. And right now, we're looking at number 10, right? And that, uh, that basically, that's the, uh, that, that's the Suzuki RG500. And uh, lovely to see it in the Heron colors made very, very famous all through the 70s and the 80s. Uh, so it was a bike that Barry Sheen really made famous. He won the World Championship on it in 76 and 77. And it was the bike for all the privateers. If you were racing at that era, it was the bike that you bought. You know, the RG500, it was competitive out the crate. You could just get out there, you could get going on it. Um, you know, they were reliable, they were easy to run. Um, so it was really good. Here's John McGuinness, the TT legend. Uh, he's so lovely to see John McGuinness out there. 
uh, John Wheely. I had a little chat with him earlier, so he was really looking forward to, to getting out there on his Honda. And just he hadn't been out on that for a long while. Didn't want to ride it yesterday in the, the slippy conditions. Actually, he owns that motorcycle himself, worth big money. He said, no, thank you. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to save that one. So uh, as we cut back to the, uh, the RG500 again, and then look at this, the most successful racer of all time. It is the one and only Giacomo Agostini, the 12-time world champ on his MV Augusta. And listen to that bike. And even now, let's not forget, this man's in his 80s, but he's still so super stylish, super cool. He could have walked off a, a film set. And look at him hustling it. He's still, he's not crawling up the hill. He still absolutely gives it the beans. And lovely, lovely to see um, the world champion. You just see he's closing up on the rider in front, hand over fist. So uh, great stuff there. That bike in front is uh, an ex barry Sheen motorcycle as well. Just having a little look as he gets overtaken. Again, that's another RG500, but a later bike. A little wave of the hand from Agostini. But uh, you can't begrudge Agostini coming past you, can you? What a moment. What an absolute legend going past. Uh, there's plenty here on the hill climb today. But yeah. that is fantastic. And on the bike as well, that he, he won the 1966 and 67 titles on as well. Yeah, so here we're seeing another X Sheen bike number seven here. That's the YZR 500 Yamaha. And uh, this is towards the end of uh, Sheen's career here. And really, when we're, uh, when we're looking at these old Yamahas of this era, uh, this is when Sheen had just swapped October, and this was the last year that the Yamaha made it. it the, the engine was an inline four. After this year, they changed it over to a V4. So uh, Sheen got a couple of podiums on it on that bike that year. It was just starting to get outdated a little bit. So, you know, an iconic bike. Um, but uh, and now we're looking at the Jalera. Um, this Jalera, wow. You can really see how things have, uh, have moved on. Uh, the Jalera is from 1957. So, uh, and across the head cap, the cross frame, and you've got that very, very unusual sort of fairing on it. But don't forget, Jalera in the 50s, they were amazing. They won the World Championship in 1950, 52, 53, 54, 55, and 57. And three of those were with Britain's very own Jeff Duke who won it in 53, 54, 55. So lovely to see this iconic motorcycle sort of coming up the hill. And once again, it just goes to, you, goes to show really how much design and, and effort and how things change. And uh, he's trying to hustle it about. He's doing a good job there too. Really is. It's the variation, it's the variety, it's the history that you see writ large in front of you. And here, another iconic bike climbing the hill. Yep, so this is the Matches G50, and um, yeah, the Matches weird are very, very famous, in the, especially in the classic racing seats. This is one of only 180 original bikes that's still left, and this bike was being consistently raced from 1961 to 2018, every year. Now, though, it's just been retired, just doing demonstrations, but these classic G50s, again, I've raced myself at this motorcycle in the... Um, you know, in the revival, you know, it's a lovely, lovely thing. And it was one of those really dominant uh, motorcycles that, uh, Gene, you can stand out. You see the gold cases on the side of it. It really picks it out as a matches G50. And uh, what a great motorcycle it is. And really, really is a, is a, is a classic. And now we're looking at a 1952 Max Norton. Again, when you're talking about classic bikes, they don't come much more classic than a Manx. Uh, Manx, because of you know, what they used to do in the Isle of Man, the chassis were called feather bed because that's how good they were. It felt like you were riding on a feather bed. <laughs> and um, they were welded steel. Uh, they handled like nothing else, and they really did dominate. Uh, this 1952 year was the last to use the, the long stroke engine uh, before they sort of the, they changed. Um, single overhead cam, uh, driven by like a vertical shaft with bevel gears, all hand assembled in, uh, in Birmingham. So lovely to see. And these Manx Norms dominated for so long um, throughout the 50s, throughout the 60s, until the uh, arrivals of the Hondas, uh, the MVs, and uh, it was really then the, sort of the, the death of the, of the Norms. Time, you know, that 40s, 50s, early 60s, the Manx Norton was the racing motorcycle to have. Oh, extraordinary and wonderful to see out there. Incredible run. A 
two-decade gap of victory. Phenomenal competing at the very front of the field in a fine way to conclude our run on the bikes with uh, superb, superb commentary from James there, taking us through, I mean, hundreds, it felt like, of race winners, Alice. Brilliant to see them on the hill. No, just fantastic. And another thing, and I've said it across all the days we've been here so far, how amazing that to see just from the start, cars and bikes oh. all on the time. Here we go, James. Yeah, sorry, here we go. This is what we've really been waiting for. This is Casey Stoner and Pekka Banyaya. Pekka Banyaya is last year's world champ. Casey Stoner, world champion at uh, 08 and, um, and 11. And you can see the difference in the bike. Both of these are Ducatis. Casey Stoner's bike had about 230 brake horsepower. Pekka Banyaya's has got about 265. But look at the difference in the aerodynamics. Look at the difference in the shape of the motorcycles. They really have changed. Both these riders, absolutely incredible. Casey Stoner, probably one of the most naturally talented riders I've ever seen. He could come out, do a warm-up lap, and then go bang, break the lap record. He was stunning. And Pekka Banyaya, you know, right now, MotoGP is at its most competitive. The bikes are very similar. The riders are very similar, and he keeps rising to the top. And that motorcycle to catch you built is one of the greatest that's ever been built. It handles, it stops, it goes in the corner well, it holds its line well. And just listen to it, just listen to it. Webster, to 18 and a half thousand. As I said, 265 brake horsepower, weighs just 158 kilos. You know, it's quicker than an F1 car, up to 100 mile an hour. It really is, and it just listen to them both. And you're seeing two absolute legends here. And Pekka Banyaya, you know, he hasn't stopped. He's just starting. He's won his first title. He's leading the championship this year, and many think he's got many, many more titles to come. So two absolute greats on two unbelievable motorcycles it's a pleasure to see them both go up the hill certainly is amazing to have a world champion of yesteryear and the world championship leader and reigning world <laughs> champion across the line arm in arm great to see Ducati history writ large in front of you and just like we see, you know, when we're watching the Formula One cars, how they've developed, you know, in a relatively short space of time, you can see how much the bikes have uh, changed as well as now we start looking back to some uh, classic Formula One cars. Thank you very much, James. I really enjoyed that. And a special way to finish as well with the two champions up the hill. Talking of champions, we're looking through the gaggle at a world championship winning car, a uh, different driver, though. A world championship winning driver, no less, though. Sebastian Vettel behind the wheel of the car that you all know as the FW14B, but we know so many times, Alice, as Red 5. Yeah, we certainly do. And Sebastian Vettel is going to be smiling like a Cheshire cat coming <laughs> all the way up the hill in the Williams Renault FW14B, the 3.5 litre V10 is going to be screaming up the hill and it looks like alongside the Renault RS10 which is a 1.5 litre V6 turbocharged. It secured the first victory for a turbo car. Jean-Pierre Jabouille in the 1979 French Grand Prix. But first up, here comes Sebastian Vettel. Iconic driver, iconic car, united and powered, Alice, by renewable fuel. That's Sebastian Vettel's passion project at the moment, and it's allowing us to see a car from his personal collection on the magical mile of a hill climb, the four-time world champion doing the donuts of one of the most evocative and technologically advanced cars of all time in Formula One. It certainly is, and I told you he's going to be enjoying it. It really looks like he is giving the crowd a fantastic show. And just giving it the sound is just incredible. As you said, Alex, renewable foot fuel as well inside that car, which is just incredible. Race without trace, you can see there on the livery, which is Sebastian Vettel described yesterday in the ITV programme, that he is just so passionate. We've seen him at various Formula One races, have been collecting the litter, you know, showing his passion by wearing lots of different t-shirts. But here he is now going up in this iconic car, and it's all new. 
car that took Nigel Mansell to his sole Formula One World Championship in 1992. I know this will be a special moment for so many of you at the hill climb because he was a very popular driver, Sebastian Vettel, and Nigel Mansell's car, one of the most advanced that we have ever seen, the FW14V, driven perfectly, and a wonderful reception for Sebastian Vettel and also for René Arnoux directly behind uh, coming across. What a highlight of Shootout Sunday. <laughs> that is his car. He does own that car, one of several in his personal collection. So uh, I think that means that he can get away with doing some donuts in that 1992 <laughs> Williams Renault. Yeah, you would get a uh, you would get a current Williams driver doing that because they would have to answer to the boss. The wonderful thing about Sebastian Vettel is even when he was driving to those victories in Formula One, he knew he knew what it meant. He knew his place in motor racing history, and now he is leading to the advancement of it as well. A great moment on a great day so far. How we are bouncing back from the disappointment of yesterday in the Sunday sun. And we are now into a celebration in McLaren's 60th year. We're going to dot a bound. This is the McLaren F1 GTR long tail. We've also got on the circuit, I believe, as well, the car that competed in Japan for a really, really long time as well. But this was sent. There's the car that competed in Japan for so many years. But this was the car that really raised the game. Wasn't expected to win. Wasn't in the leading class of Le Mans when it won in 1995, but was a sensation when it took the flag. Yeah, it was a very, very popular and famous victory. 6.1 litre V12. Oh, and off, off into the barriers goes the McLaren into the bales. And just got a little bit loose coming into Malcolm Corner, but thankfully able to get out of there without interrupting things. And that's a good job as well, because we've got a Scarlet Ferrari directly behind. This was the moment, unplanned moment, for the F1 GTR, built in 1996 on the grass. Armfuls of opposite lock. No, 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 no. Oh. But a bit of a scrape for a beautiful car down the straw bale. Yeah, just locked up the rear going into Malcolm Corman. And it's not the first time, as you said earlier, Alex, that we've seen a few cars venture off there. Luckily, the grass is fairly dry and the, the hay bales have done its job. It's been caught up by the Ferrari. Not too much damage, thankfully, to the famous The Ferrari behind was driven by Sebastian Vettel when he was competing in Formula One. It has had a halo added to it in uh, to update it going forward, being driven by Mark Genet out there. That's the 1.6 litre turbocharged V6 that was a championship contender in 2017. But ultimately, that title went the way of Sir Lewis Hamilton. We now have the beautiful McLaren M10B, the 4.8 litre V8. And it is a McLaren of that era. If you're thinking, hold on a minute, we're back in the 70s when the Can-Am cars were papaya. But this in uh, in the blue, this is the great thing about the Festival of Speed. You're seeing iterations of car that, I have to be honest, I, I had not seen this before. It's one of my favorites so far. If you've not been to the McLaren Row celebrating 60 years, then... Uh, then it is well worth oh. your time. Say goodbye to the bonnet. Thankfully, that made a bid for freedom before the Ferrari got in its bar. Yeah, I'm sure the Marshals do a great job in retrieving that. As we go further back, this is from 2009, I believe. The, uh, the new regulations that came in for that year, and uh, it was a car driven to victory by Kimi Raikkonen and Spa Francochon, such a specialist at that circuit. And uh, it was uh, a bit troublesome for the rest of the year. That was the Grand Prix when Giancarlo Fisichella pushed the Ferrari all the way and then uh, joined the team. And uh, he's remained with that team ever since that season. A wonderful sound of the V8 engine as Mark Genet continues to push on. I think it's Mark Genet behind the wheel there. Yeah, and that sound, that beautiful sound, which Every time I hear it go past wherever I'm sitting in the commentary box or whether I'm outside by the sign, I sort of give shivers down my spine. Beautiful Ferrari F60. Yeah, and the F60 completing its run. And now it's going to be followed up the hill, not 
on your screens right now, but just gone past our country box, the famous McLaren Chevrolet M8B. And, uh, continuing on. Fantastic, fantastic to see the array. We're, we're bobbing through the various different cars as we uh, we make our way. This and is the McLaren Oldsmobile M M1A, I believe. Yeah, designed for Group 7 racing and uh, competing in the Canadian Sports Car Championship. Sounding terrific as it comes past our commentary box as we uh, move into the Can-Am era, and we are now into the uh, famous colours of papaya. And looks like maybe a slight issue with one waiting on the start line. And continuing to the end, further along, with the McLaren Chevrolet, the M6B. That dominated Corona oh, Chantox being pushed back. Uh, I saw Corona in the dry room and he was, as always, excited. It doesn't matter what car he's, he's excited driving. if he's, if he he's ex anywhere near this place, he's excited. He's always driving something terrific. Exactly, and his family are here this weekend, so it looks like a slight problem for the McLaren Chevrolet that he is driving, but not so much for that car on your screen at the moment. Heading out there as well, we're, we're mixing it all in here, we're chucking it all at you as we uh, celebrate 60 years of McLaren, but the order uh, dotted about as uh, as we make our way by, and this is going to be, and I told you we're dotting about the order, this is the Glickenhaus that has competed at Le Mans in recent years, you can see the hypercar sticker at the front, the new class at the front, uh, different ways to compete in the hypercar class, you've got uh, the full entries, and then you've got the ones where they build the chassis and they provide they provide uh, the power unit themselves. But this is Glickenhaus; they're doing it all themselves. And Glickenhaus, uh, when maybe there were hardly any entrants at the top class of Le Mans, they decided they were going to go there, and they were rewarded last year with a trip to the podium behind the dominant Toyotas. Yeah, they work so much work goes on behind the scenes as it goes past our commentary box now. And this is what I love about these runs up the hill, Alex, is we just have a variety. We've got single seaters, we've got GTs, we've got hybrids, we've got such an incredible mix. And it looks like off screen now at the start line that Karun Chandok has got moving in his McLaren shirt. There we go. So now of riding on board with him as well. Just listen to this. There's a red flag out. I can tell you why we don't want to speak over the McLaren, but the red flag is out. Karim will have to stop. The Leighton House has dropped it at Malcolm Corner. And, uh, and that is why Karun is parking up at Malcolm Corner. The Adrian Newey design of the early 90s has gone into the straw bales. I'm happy to say that the driver is OK and out of the car, but that is one expensive prank. Yeah, as you can see on the screen there, driver is out and OK. Straw bales have done the job. As on board with Karun, he's going to try and get back through. He's already had problems with the car, so I think for Karun, the right thing is to try and slowly take it to the top. Great job by the marshals to allow Karun to go through and sail on to the top. And we'll have a little look now at the replay, Alex. So this is the Adrian Newey designed Leighton House. This is the car that put him on the map, but hitting the brakes and round into the straw. Yeah, I think that's a very, very bizarre incident because it just looks like it's going to lock up the rear tyres there. And at that point, the driver is a passenger. And the straw bales, hay bales doing their job. But as you said, an expensive crash. But I think, unfortunately, I, I don't think that appears to possibly be driver. There might be some other issue there because the, the, rear, the rear is just instantly locked. That is uh, a dramatic moment, our most dramatic moment of... Uh, we've had great moments and we've had dramatic moments. Well, this one, very, very... Uh, 
Uh, just the most important thing is to see that the driver was able to uh, to walk clear. But a dramatic moment at Molecombe Corner, which has taken a battering throughout this Festival of Speed week and has seen more drama yet again in front of so many of you on the left, on the right of the hill climb here. Give us a wave. Give us a wave if you can see yourself on the big screen. And uh, whilst we... Uh, Take a pause after the crash of the Leighton House. We can check in with Ed, who's speaking to Sebastian Vettel. Sebastian Vettel, great to finally see you up here. I think that's the first time I've ever seen an FW14B do donuts. Uh, maybe. There you go. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to know whether it works, and it was it was fine. So uh, we're getting a bit hot with the temperatures at the end, but it's all good. It was uh, good fun. A lot of people, so it's great. Now tell me, it's all about race without trace. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's just to demonstrate people that uh, you can literally race without leaving a trace. Obviously, um, you know, we use e-fuels, so synth synthetic fuels. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it's a really old car and it wasn't meant to build around. It wasn't built around those fuels, but it works. So uh, you just got to adjust the ECU a tiny bit, but it works for this car. It works for modern Formula One cars. It works for your road car. So it's just to see, just to show, sorry, that there is an alternative. And I think we, the world is changing. So. So, um, you know, we don't have to give up on these things. We can still hold on, but do it in a more responsible way. Now, you've obviously just come up in Mansell's Williams. You've got Senna's McLaren. Yes. Have you got a favorite or is it a bit like cho choosing well, between your children? Great. Obviously, uh, being in England, I guess the Red 5 is a bit more iconic, but Senna is a big name. So I'm looking forward to driving his car later on. Now, you obviously love driving these cars. Just finally, you obviously know all about the Goodwood Revival. I'm sure we could maybe persuade you to get in the race seat there. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I haven't made it to the event yet, but it's exactly my thing. I love old stuff, so I should go there. Cheers, Sam. Cheers, thank you. Sebastian Vettel speaking to Ed at the top of the uh, top of the hill. Great to hear about his whole campaign and uh, from one legend to another. Ed is speaking to Derek Bell. Derek Bell, lovely to see you um, in a wonderful McLaren Can-Am car. These things always look terrifying, but every driver I talk to says they're lovely. They are the first time. <laughs> no, it's not my first time. I drove it in period a few times, but they're just glorious. You know, McLaren has done a wonderful job restoring this car. And of course, it, it runs very well, but we've done nothing apart from once up the hill the day before yesterday since 45 years. So apart from all their wonderful work, it took a bit of getting used to and it's, it's now getting better. <laughs> now, this weekend, we're celebrating 100 years of Le Mans, 75 years of Porsche. It's, it's a sort of a Derek Bell celebration, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, I, I was finally involved with quite a lot of it. But, yeah, it's been a fantastic year. I mean, the centenary, I think, spectacular. And I, to be honest, I thought it was a phenomenal that Ferrari won. I thought it was great. I know to come back once and then win it is a bit outrageous, but thought it was great, good for them. And, you know, for me, it was great because it was 100 years. And, of course, I won it a few times. And then, uh, you know, just everything we've been doing has just been a sort of festival of speed, to be honest. Always so modest. Derek, thank you. Thank you. Well, we've got a slight delay to proceedings after the Leighton House has found the bales down at Molecombe Corner, which gives us a chance to uh, check in with John McGuinness. John McGuinness, it's always a pleasure to see you up in the top paddock here, surrounded by some of the greatest machines that we've, we've had for the last kind of 50 or more years. Um, it's nice to see you back on this. Yeah, it's my 2000 uh, Honda NSR 500 V-Twin, so... It's about that race in various races in the UK and also I did the wild card at Donington 500 Grand Prix, rode it at Macau GP, rode it at the TT that year. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing, you know. It's, 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 it's the only, one and only bike they ever got on and it sort of whizzes me back 23 years to when I was 27 years old and uh, it makes me quite emotional to ride it, to be fair. Yeah, it's a, it's a great bit of kit, I love it. Do you get to keep any of your bikes? I've got 75 of my bikes in my bike collection. Uh, some, some of my race bikes, some of my other things. Uh, I've had a word with the owner of this bike and he's uh, not keen on selling it. So, but I'll keep at him and at him and see if we can uh, have a deal. See if we can have a deal. I mean, anything that makes you 23 years younger, you can't really put a price on that, can you? <laughs> It's quite a rare bike. I think they only made about 15 of these, so uh, it would be really nice. I mean, I've got the 250 as well, so I've got the Vimto 250 bike, and uh, that won my first TT on that lives under the stairs at home, so it'd be nice to, to add this one to the collection. What does the wife think of that? She's all right. I've got two I've got two in the house. I've got one in the hallway and one under the stairs, and I popped my electric bike in there, my Mugen, a few years ago, and uh, when she was out shopping, when she got back, she was like, now you are taking the Mickey, so get, 
get that out of the, out of the house. So I'm allowed to. And, and it's two of her favourite bikes. It's a bike that did my first 130 mile hour lap on the, the HM plant one and my first ever TT win in 99. So they're the ones that paid for the house as well, so she can't mourn too much. <laughs> Amazing, John. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, guys. I absolutely love it. Bike kept under the stairs and everywhere else besides it sounds. Uh, let's check you in with another competitor here. Katie Mullings is speaking to Laura Winter. Well, I've just popped out of the Drivers Club and you see the great and the good of motorsport there. And Katie Mullings is joining me now. World Rallycross, extremely driver, a bit of Nitro Rallycross as well <laughs> all over it, aren't you? Yeah, it's been a busy few years, actually. Um, it's great to be back here, though, because I'm not actually driving this year. I've got such a FOMO. Um, but, yeah, it's great to be back seeing so many friendly faces again in the Drivers' Club. And so nice to see such a busy crowd as well. I know it was a challenge yesterday with it being cancelled, but everybody's in such good spirits and making up for it today, I think. Yeah, it's been a sold-out event. Over 200,000 expected over the four days. And, of course, not having a day yesterday makes today feel a little bit more special. It's such a celebration of car culture, of motorsport here, isn't it? It is, and there's so many different forms of motorsport here. That's what I love. You know, I was at the ball last night and I was chatting to Travis Pastrana and like hearing what he's got here compared to, you know, the McLarens they've got obviously for their anniversary here. It's so cool to see all the different cars going up the hill. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see a bit of the action today. And you're not heading up the hill you said, yourself, as you just said. I know, a bit of FOMO. <laughs> but can you explain just how how challenging, how, how unique an experience it is, certainly as it narrows and definitely in mixed conditions that we've seen here? Yeah, we were meant to be here with our Extreme E car, but we couldn't get it back from Sardinia. We were racing there last week in time. I'm sure Goodwood are probably quite excited about that because I think last year my teammate was just cutting the grass oh everywhere. <laughs> if you haven't seen that, go and Google it. Timmy Hansen all over the grass at Goodwood. <laughs> I mean, why not? Uh, Extreme E, a podium for you guys last time out in Sardinia, and you had quite the move to get it done as well. Yeah, it was the last corner on the last lap. We had Michael Andretti, our team boss, over, so we had to get on the podium for him at least once. So, uh, yeah, we definitely felt a bit of pressure, but I'm really glad that we were able to pull it off. And, you know, we'd, we'd actually, well, I'd rolled the car the day before um, in an overtake move. So that was, uh, yeah, it was it was the redemption that we needed, really, on the second day of racing. That's what Extreme is all about, <laughs> isn't it? Absolutely anything can happen. You roll it one day, you're on the podium the next. It's, it's fabulous. Um, yeah, what, what are your plans for the rest of the afternoon? And indeed, looking ahead as well for the next few weeks. The afternoon, I'm actually going to go hang out with Cartier in their um, classic car collection. So I'm going to go have a look at that, watch some of the action up the hill, I think. Um, and then I've got my home race in Wild Rally Cross in Lyndon Hill next week. So that's like 20 minutes from where I grew up. So it's going to be a big one for me. Oh, that is awesome. That's so special. Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Go and enjoy your lunch. Bless you, sir. <laughs> See you later. Thank you. <laughs> Jensen Barton, we had a chat earlier in the weekend, but it's nice to see you in a single seater again. I guess it all makes sense. It does. Um, I kind of prefer the NASCAR, though. <laughs> it's just what I'm used to now. But um, no, it's always it's always a pleasure to drive. You know, cars that have such you know history and heritage. And um, I've been lucky enough to drive some fantastic cars up the hill here. Uh, I drove the 14B at Silverstone last weekend, which is my dream car. It's Seb's in it at the moment. But uh, this is the 8C. This is a um, a pretty awesome car as well. It's funny because everything's so mechanical. Uh, it's from 1983. Um, and uh, but it's it's amazing when you get into the the, the torque band it, it goes it's pretty quick but I just I can't find first gear so I pulled away in third and just cruised um, but no it's uh, it's it's lovely to get out in, uh, in 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 classic or historic cars the 14B you drove it's obviously you know for its time was so advanced is it difficult to drive because of that or is it like every other Formula One car no, this is more difficult just because you it's a bit more difficult to get the gears. Um, in the 14B, it's it's paddle shift. You do have to blip the throttle on the downshift, but um, yeah, I mean, the steering wheel's tiny, the pedal box is tiny in it, but once you get it on track, everything just feels so natural, and the high speed, it feels like a, a modern F1 car, but with 250 kilos less weight. So um, really cool, a little clumsy in the low speed corners, it's so wide, uh, but such an amazing car, and you see why it was so competitive back in 92. Cheers, Jensen. Cheers. Well, we have a delay with the accident at Mulgham Corner for the Leighton House. Gives us a chance to speak to so many of the good and the great that have made their way to the 30th anniversary Festival of Speed. Next up is Mark Stewart. Mark, there's something about seeing one of your father's cars with a Stewart on board that it's very Festival of Speed and very wonderful. So welcome. And uh, how was it up the hill? Well, it, it's wonderful. It's great to be here at Goodwood. You know, uh, Goodwood is such an amazing and wonderful event. It's one of the best of motor racing events I think there is. Um, driving up the hill and being privileged enough to be able to drive 
my dad's office <laughs> um, and sit in here and drive this car is uh, is a real privilege. And going up the hill is great. And it's actually dry today, which is a big difference to uh, Friday when it was pouring with rain. And I was absolutely soaked sitting here, right here, getting rained upon. There's no tree above me. <laughs> but, yeah, but today I'm dry and I'm very happy and it's brilliant. Yeah. And to be together with these cars, I mean, look at this thing here next to me. I mean, it's fantastic. I have to say, one of my favourite moments, I think, from the Festival of Speed of all time is when you all came up as a team and uh, Lady Helen came out and, and gave Sir Jackie a, a rose. I mean, what a moment to be part of. Absolutely. I mean, you know, my mother plays a, such an enormous part in the life of Jackie Stewart. And he's the guy at the front of the house, if you like. But my mother is, uh, she's also a three times world champion and, uh, and many times over probably more than that. Um, I made a film about my father called Stuart, but in fact it's about my mother and father. And very much, uh, um, you know, she makes plays a very important part in that in that life. At a time when motor racing was stupidly dangerous, and my parents lost all, a lot of friends, and and uh, doing this sport they they loved, um, and uh, and you know to be sitting here in the car that my father won his last world championship with uh, means a, a great deal, and. And also, um, you know, I talk about my mother, who, uh, we, you know, together we started Race Against Dementia, which was my father's idea. And, uh, and we're, you know, we're turning a negative into a positive. And uh, so it's also, I'm also flying the flag for Race Against Dementia. I've got it on the helmet here and uh, hoping people will, will take an interest and maybe donate and, and do all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Cheers, Mark. Thank you very much. Well, we are ticking through the legendary surnames that we have seen climb the magical mile of the hill so far today on Shootout Sunday at the Festival of Speed. Let's add, let's add another terrific name. Uh, Agostini is the next one we are going to hear from. Giacomo Agostini, you're a firm fixture at the Festival of Speed, and quite rightly. But this year seems a bit special, doesn't it, with so many modern motorbikes and, of course, all the classics as well. Yes, I'm happy because when I come the first time 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, it's only a few bikes. Now it's this year, especially this year, it's a lot of riders, a lot of bikes. It's very nice. Only the weather Saturday is very bad, but anyway, we enjoy as many people coming and... Uh, we meet uh, all, all, all the young and the old riders, so it's, it's, good, it's a good party. <laughs> and have you ridden one of the more recent MotoGP machines? Yeah, MotoGP machine, I think today is uh, too much electronics and uh, it's not, I, I don't like very much. I, I spoke with Casey Stoner also, he's, he's agreed to reduce because we must, give, we must give the power, more power to the riders, not to the electronic. So I think we must change something to, to, to give to the rider the, 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 the more responsibility. And you've come up the hill on your Augusta. It must bring back so many happy memories. Yeah, especially the noise, the music. The music for my MV is fantastic. And uh, the bike I use today is a three-cylinder 500. I win a lot of world champions with that bike. And uh, I'm happy sometimes to use and, and to... to can, and, and the people can hear the music of my engine. <laughs> Giacomo, grazie. Grazie, ciao. Well, thank you very much down there. Ed has been getting through the interviews, plenty of them. He's been very busy out there. Let's now check in with Paul Casey.
in the garage at home. I've got two of my original Matchbox cars, both 911s. You know, I've still got them. I mean, they're all bashed up, you know, but it says made in, made in England, Matchbox, and I love that. And it's one of those things, it's like, how cool is that? That that's what I dreamt of and that's what I played with, just like this, you know, sort of rolling the car around. And now I've got them sitting in the garage. So, Paul, thanks for joining us on what is this huge celebration for Porsche. 75 years of the brand, 60 years of 911. I think it's fair to say you're, you're a fan. I'm a fan. You know, if I'm not on the golf course or if I'm practicing, my passion really has been cars. You know, the, dreams is a big thing with Porsche, as, as you know. My dream was actually to be a, a racing driver when I was a kid. Ended up as a golfer. Didn't do too which bad. Which isn't too bad. <laughs> Still got that dream to actually maybe one day get behind uh, the wheel of a race car. Yeah, I'm fully vested in, in the Porsche brand. Seeing Porsche in its finest, we look at the cars, the 356, 911s. Do you have a particular favorite that stands out to you? I do. So there's a story. So people who've probably followed me for a while know that I had a poster of a 959, silver 959 as a kid, dreamt of that car. That was my sort of dream, iconic supercar. And I've been lucky to, I guess, fulfill my dreams. One of my favorite cars that I'm, I'm lucky enough to own is actually a 55 Speedster. I think you look at the iconic James Dean and Steve McQueen and all these sorts of Hollywood legends and their image and that car, the essence of what that car was about. Yes, the 911s, it's in here, it's in the heart and, and in the brain, but that 356, there's something about that car that I think resonates with me, certainly right now at this period of my life. Glad to see you got the, uh, you know, the dress memo for Festival of Speed. We look good. Thank you. Well, you look good. I don't know. I'll just hang on. I'll stand near you. And of course, you're dressed and ready to take quite a special car up the hill. The millionth 911. Look fantastic. I mean, there's pressure. I've, I've been up the hill before, but never behind the wheel. They could have given you an easier car for your first time up the hill. You know? I know. A I mean, very valuable one of one car. The iconic 911. <laughs> um, what an honor. I mean, it really is. You know, the 911 has been really the the icon of Porsche for such a long time. When you look at that Mission X concept, it's going to go fantastically well. Doesn't it look good? It's beautiful, it's staggering, you know, and there's been electric vehicles in the lineage of Porsche. You know, this is a look to the future and they've done it so well to this point. I'm a car lover. Yes, I've got the old stuff and I will always have the old stuff to enjoy and drive and the, and the smell of uh, the oil and, and, you know, the fumes and everything that goes with that, the smell of the leather. But I mean, I'm going to embrace the future as well because it is really, really exciting. past isn't something I really think about. I only think about the next race, and I only look into the future. This is the story of a young man from New Zealand. The name, of course, is Bruce McLaren. What's the secret of success? Experience is tremendously important in motor racing. Got one from very nasty one indeed. The important thing for me is to drive and to win, and I did that. What a fantastic finish! beyond what I could even understand. You know, going for the stars.
It is time to continue our celebration of McLaren in their 60th year, and we are seeing some heritage on the circuit. We've just seen the M23 head up the hill, and it was followed up as well by the uh, McLaren Cosworth. We've seen the M29C out there. This is phenomenal to see so much heritage climbing the hill in the M26. That's Michael Lyons behind the wheel there, very experienced in historic racing, had victories in the, the Monaco Classic as well, and he's you can tell that he's an experienced racing driver, kicking up the dust there as he's streaming up the hill. The roar of this incredible engine, steady away through Malcolm Corner, absolutely fantastic piece of machinery, a three-litre V8 screaming up the hill, Alex. 1977, and oh, what a car it was, piloted by the legendary James Hunt, who didn't like it at first, they made revisions, and he got on famously with it in the end, a year after he claimed his sole world championship title. There's a lot to celebrate with McLaren. That was excellent. And... Uh, We've got the classic Subaru. We have the Subaru's gone out as well. Travis Pastrana fancies another run, and he's not leaving anything out there at the moment. That was pretty conservative for him through Malcolm. I know there's. I mean, there's a little bit of uh, dust down from the earlier excursion, and that's why I love it. Stamping on the brake, really seeing the car pitch forward, the wings flying up, and all sorts of. Oh, and there we go. There's the the Travis we are getting it bit sideways as he flies across the line <laughs> it's the it's the variety that you get at this place which makes it truly unique anywhere in world motorsport and motoring uh, there are uh, plenty of cars parked up uh, i wonder if we've run through the last of the mclarens this was <laughs> travis pastrana out there once again in it's the waving Subaru. at us isn't it <laughs> yeah, it is it is Lovely, lovely shots that we get treated to on the stream and also if you're here at the circuit as well. Lovely shots of the cars going past. But we've got more heading our way. We do. We do indeed. And uh, lots of action to come throughout the day. There is so much to enjoy. We've celebrated Lotus. We've celebrated McLaren. We've seen the MotoGP bikes and the Grand Prix greats, one of which ended up in the bales at Malcolm Corner. And uh, do we have any more for any more? We do indeed. Now Williams is about to join us up the hill, making our way through. This is the FW19. That is the car from 1997 that Williams took their last Formula One World Championship title in this wonderful wide design, and making its way up the hill. And uh, this version in front was developed from Damon Hill's championship winning car from the year before. It was the final Williams to have design input from the great Adrian Newey, who departed for McLaren, and uh, was the car that was involved with that thrilling 1997 World Championship finale at Jerez. I love this era of car. And certainly, uh, Alice, the sound of the V10. It just goes straight through, doesn't it? Stands, makes your hair stand up on ends, heading up through the hill. A lovely three litre V10 in the rear of that car being driven gently up the hill. And it, as you said, Alex, another Adrian Newey design. There's plenty of his cars about here on display and going up the hill as well. And the hind leg is, uh, is out there. Terry Grant doing his thing once again behind the wheel of the car that uh, was uh, very much a uh, feature on Thursday. Putting on a great display for everyone. It's a busy spot down there where they do, do the donuts. Looking out the window, I don't think there's anything that isn't a busy spot out here today. We are back in style at the Festival of Speed. Yeah, and a great crowd as always turning up here track side if you're unable to make it this year be sure to try and get some tickets and come up this year because there's nothing like being at the circuit and getting to see these brilliant displays that go on 
and also so much to see around the paddock as well. That is the course car that brings that batch to an end. And we're just going to inspect the circuit as we have celebrated Lotus and McLaren. We'll be doing that again on the hill climb later on. Remember, the centerpiece of the day, the one we're really looking forward to, Ben Edwards, Alice Powell, talking you through the shootout later on. Uh, but very much enjoyed seeing so many Grand Prix winners, whether it be on two wheels, whether it be on four. That was a special last hour. Certainly was, Alex, and that's the beauty of Goodwood. There's so much more to come. So if you missed an earlier batch, you're likely to see it again later as well. As the course cars, they, uh, as Bruce said earlier, probably the coolest course cars that you'll see at any circuit, any hill climb. As they venture up the hill. And the shootout that Alex touched on as well coming up where the drivers will be, majority of the drivers will be giving it absolutely everything. The likes of Adam Smalley and Jake Hill will be trying to post the fastest time of, well, you could say probably the weekend going up the hill because the majority of their, their sessions are, are, have, been in, have been in wet conditions. So that's one to, to really look out for if you want to see some cars being pushed to the absolute limit going up the hill. Well, we had the interruption with the accident for the Leighton House, but we also saw some prestigious machinery go past as well. Really enjoyed the run from the two wheelers up the hill. MotoGP current riders, no MotoGP round, no Grand Prix either in Formula One. It means that we've got so many great names here in attendance. And it was wonderful to have James Hayden tick us through the class of yesteryear and our contemporary stars, the world champion. Peko Bangyar next to Casey Stoner, one sure to be. Yeah, you, you feel if he can continue his, his momentum, a two-time world champion with a current two-time world champion in the Australian Casey Stoner. And these two putting on a show. They certainly were an incredible shots. I just love these highlights really seeing. And then we had that man there, Sebastian Vettel, his car as well. Uh, one that is one of the cars that he owns. And then Unfortunate off for the McLaren. Malcolm is a popular corner at the moment for, for cars venturing into the hay bales. And we saw part of the bonnet flying off. We saw a 2009 winning Ferrari as they made their way through. But the most dramatic moment of the last two hours, the Leighton House getting away from its driver and into the straw bales. Yeah, and the driver's marshals, okay, worth saying. Marshall's well. doing a great job as well, of course, for getting the action resuming. Great job, so a big shout out to all the marshals that are down there. And then was Michael Lyons going up in his McLaren, kicking up the dust along the way. Okay, we've had plenty of drama at Malcolm Corner. We can speak to one of the drivers involved in that drama, who's at the top of the hill with Ed. Jesus, it's a, it's a narrow track, the Festival of Speed Hill Climb. Uh, yeah. Just talk us through what happened. I, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I just lost it and uh, went to the grass, and then it was impossible to, to stop. I was a bit really slow, I think. But, um, yeah, I couldn't stop it. I just crashed. Easy. But, it, I mean, I know there's obviously there's water coming out, so there must be a radiator or a hose or something, but it doesn't look too bad. No, no, I mean, I think it's not uh, that bad. It's quite easy to, to repair, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's an unfortunate uh, happen. I mean, it's a quite expensive car, you know. It's uh, but yeah, shit happens, you know. <laughs> now, uh, th I mean, these McLaren F1 cars are just everyone who drives them says they are absolutely fantastic to drive. Is that is that right? Totally right. I mean, it's really easy to drive and really amazing to drive. It's uh, it's like a it's a road car. But uh, yeah, so that's why I don't know what happened because it was a surprise. I did the two runs on Friday, really easy, really soft, really normal. And today was doing the same. And uh, I don't know if there was oil or I just lost it. I have no idea, honestly. But uh, yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. But we'll repair it and uh, bring it back. You're fine. The car can get mended. Yes. We're all good. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll tell you, might get arrested. She's sitting on my new sheet. We still get a mess. I've
You get up every morning and your car is still the same. It ain't the one you want, so it's time to make it change. Choose the one you're feeling with thousands of choice galore. Go ahead and place your order. It's delivered to your door. Or if that ain't what you're after and you'd rather have a chat, hit up a trusted dealer, speak to my pal Pat. Now you got your new ride, what you gonna do? Cause if you buy with hate car, the choice is up for you. Whether you're buying online or through our trusted dealers, feel good your way with Haycar. technology, intelligent all-wheel drive, and the performance of a Jaguar. Search F-Pace. Casey, Kevin, it's always so lovely up in the top paddock here. You've just been chatting to Korean Chantok about sort of engineering behind the bike. It's amazing the crossover, isn't there? Massively. Um, unfortunately, a bit too much, in my opinion, these days. Um, you know, looking at these bikes, they're getting a little too similar to this, uh, this beautiful Ferrari over here. Uh, I'd like to see there sort of stay a difference and um, unfortunately I, I grew up in the wrong area and I would love to have grown up in, in Schwantz doing rainy sort of era and, uh, and get to ride 500 two strokes but um, you know I was still privileged to be able to ride some of these things. Kevin, it's, we look back at your era, what an amazing era it was but the bikes weren't without their problems. <laughs> no, they were definitely, two strokes were so finicky you know and just trying to get that extra little bit out of them and then they'd seize up on you which a lot of times happened in areas it was, you know, less than convenient. But, uh, you know, they were still just unbelievable to ride. When you got them right, when you had a good day, when you got the thing close, uh, they're so much fun. And I saw you wandering down the paddock there having a look at a Can-Am McLaren. Do you fancy having a go? Yeah, I was trying to talk Derek Bell into riding my bike back then. I'll drive the car, but, yeah, I'd love to drive one. Especially one of those old ones. Oh, my gosh, that would have been amazing. Those cars, they, they look so scary, but actually they always, the drivers always say it's lovely to drive, those can am things, so you'd, you'd enjoy it. Yeah, tons of horsepower, wing on the back, little downforce, that's probably a lot of fun. Casey, okay, so you're obviously on, on your Ducati this weekend, but what a selection of bikes. You must have had a wee look, and have you got your eye on any of them? Too many of them, but um, probably only the, the two-strokes, to be honest. I'm a, I'm a mad two-stroke fan. I, I grew up loving it. I think there's artistry in riding, tuning, Every, every aspect of a two-stroke, there's such a, an art form to it, uh, where I think four-strokes kind of um, you know, became a lot easier to ride. They, they sort of fix a lot of problems. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you don't need to ride it in that perfect part of the power like you needed to with a two-stroke, and they certainly didn't bite you as hard. Even though with an extra, you know, I think they got nearly 100 horsepower more than what, you know, sort of Kevin's bike was when he was racing, but they're so much easier to ride. So it's, it's very, very hard to sort of comprehend that. Um, but yeah, seeing some of these, these 500s down here, it's, um, yeah, I'd definitely snatch them all up if I had the chance. Casey, Kevin, thank you. No problem.
It's an absolutely fascinating time for the automotive industry at the moment because it's going through its biggest change since inception over a hundred years ago. Fortunately, protecting the planet is now at the forefront of everyone's minds. And we've got some of the smartest brains, policy makers, government and car manufacturers all trying to make a difference. What am I talking about? Going electric, of course. A few short years ago, this place, Electric Avenue, didn't even exist at Festival of Speed. But now it is commonplace to see fully electric cars quite quietly, but super quickly whooshing up the hill climb. In fact, so fast that last year, the hill climb record was smashed by the fully electric McMurtry spilling driven by Max Chilton. And I think proves that electric cars can be fast, but what else do they have to offer? So I've enlisted the help of an expert, Dan from BP Pulse, to tell us exactly what's going on here in Electric Avenue. Dan, what car in Electric Avenue has been the real head turner at Festival of Speed so far? We've had a couple, to be fair. Um, we've got an Alpine, little two-seat sports car, what's awesome. We've got a Human Horizon that's come over from China, that's really good. And we also have a Kia EV9. They're probably the three that just people hover around all day. But yeah, it's really cool. Why are people making the switch to electric? We have the environmental benefits we all know about and we're all aware about. But also, I think in, in your lifestyle changes, you know, I've converted both my household cars to EV. Um, we charge overnight. We never have to go to a fuel station during the day. Um, look, and there is savings to be made with EVs. What I always say to people is, look at whole life cost of an EV. People initially get a little bit put off by the upfront cost. When we look at the statistics, most people are financing cars nowadays. And actually, these cars are really good from their residual values. So there's savings to be made. There is one concern that everyone always talks about, and that's range anxiety. Running out of juice on the motorway. You don't want to do it. Modern EV nowadays, we're seeing cars that are doing well in excess of 300 miles. But also, you don't need to buy an EV just for range. Understand your lifestyle. And I don't think it's range anxiety anymore. I think it's change anxiety. It's that fear of is something a little bit different. The technology is so good on these EVs that you've not got to worry. So much has changed in the last 30 years since that very first Goodwood Festival of Speed, but I'm excited about the future and can't wait to see what this avenue will be called in the next 30 and also what this little bump will be driving. Just seeing actually all those cars lined up on the way to the start line, we did a sort of static moment uh, on the straight in front of the house with them all there, and they stretched from like pretty much from the crossroads right back up to the bridge, and it looked absolutely incredible. We had a great, great lineup of drivers, masses of help from the museum. We had uh, Al Anser Jr., Johnny Rutherford, Danny Sullivan, Emerson, who's been so many times such a great supporter. Bobby Rahal, Dario Franchitti, Scott Dixon, Castro Neves, Gilles de Ferran. It was, it was a, a wonderful lineup and, and very emotional, I think, for everyone to sit there. This was a breakthrough for Richard. Uh, this was the moment he really sort of came out of himself. He was purposely put head to head uh, with Colin up the hill and, and he beat him. And suddenly he found that he could do it. And he went on a course to become world champion immediately after that, I think the, the next season. <laughs> Thank you.
So I'm here with Flavio Manzoni, Chief Design Officer of Ferrari. What brings you to the Festival of Speed? Well, well first of all, the, 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 uh, the magic of this place and this event, which is absolutely fantastic. I don't know how many, time, how, many, how many times I've been here, but such an incredible event. But also because we wanted to present this new one-off, the Key C um, 23, which is, I think, very, very particular, very modern, futuristic, with a special touch. I think it's already wowed the crowds. We've seen it going up the hill the last couple of days. It's such a fantastic car. I mean, tell me, how did that come about? It's, this is a very special person who gets a one-off Ferrari. Well, it's, it's um, uh, track only use a car uh, with a very um, particular shape. Also, due to the fact that the idea was basically to make something, a volume which is almost, let's say, uh, monolithic, thanks to the treatment of the glass, which has a kind of a mirror effect, we use the same effect on the on the body body work, so then you have a seamless effect on the uh, on the on the volume, which is I think very. very I think good. the color is absolutely stunning, and it's so yeah, unusual it's to see it. Yeah. Do you get to sort of have some fun and experiment on these one-off designs that you get commissioned? It took a lot of time eh, to to find the perfect matching between the two treatments, but I think the result is really. Um, interesting. Well, everybody I know has been talking about the car and that alongside all the other wonderful Ferraris you brought. Thank How much you. are you here for the whole weekend? What else are you looking forward to? Yes, yes. And tomorrow I will be part of the jury of the Cartier uh, Concours d'Elegance. So another beautiful moment. And anything caught, anything caught your eye? I will, uh, I will, I will have the, the chance to drive the car. Are you going to be driving the, the, the one-off up the hill? Not yet. <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of your time. It's lovely speaking oh, to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. At the center of the action here at the Festival of Speed is the iconic hill climb. Every year, this unassuming stretch of private road within the grounds of Goodwood House is transformed into one of motorsport's most challenging courses. The 1.16 miles climbs a total of 92.7 meters with an average gradient of 4.9%. In 1993, the fastest time was set by Willie Green in a Certes Cosworth TS20 at 56.3 seconds. 
but the current record was set in 2022 by Max Chilton in the electric McMurtry Spearling fan car with a breathtaking time of 39.08 seconds. For the drivers, manufacturers and race teams, it's a chance to show off their stunning machinery and expert driving skills. But when the stopwatch comes out on Sunday, only a select few will get the chance to be crowned champion of the hill. The course is narrow, features blind rises and tight corners, plus plenty of hay bales. And the close proximity of the crowd and the festival atmosphere makes this climb a spectacle to behold. Well, here we are, just looking forward to the next batch of cars coming up the hill. We're going to be looking at uh, the Porsche Le Mans winners and celebrating the history of Porsche in sports car racing. Um, ben Edwards and Bruce Jones back with you. We've still got some of the machinery heading back down the hill after that last run. A couple of the bikes still making their way down. Yeah, a lot, uh, an incredible array of machinery up there. That fabulous display of McLaren's particularly caught my eye. But now from McLaren to Porsche, I mean, this is this is motorsport royalty. And uh, Porsche, the most successful uh, mark at Le Mans with 19 wins overall. And just looking in the programme, if you have one, certainly do make sure you buy one. Looking at the variety of cars with which they won. The very first victory to, was 1951 in the 1100cc class. A far cry from their ultimate victories in the very top class. But it just shows the progression of the mark the profession of technology and so on and of course Le Mans enjoyed its centenary this year as well that's a good point because when I was looking through some of this uh, history as well um, the 19 wins as you say it doesn't include the class wins does it that's only the outright win only he says only the outright wins which began in 1970 so it is remarkable um, so I do hope you all enjoy seeing some classic Porsches heading up the hill shortly uh, these Le Mans winning cars some of them driven by some of the stars of Le Mans as well we will be seeing some of them in in the cars coming up tom christensen is going to be driving here this afternoon uh, the nine times winner of le mans the record holder for the number of victories any goodwood event seems to have a, a tk here because he loves trying all sorts of different cars so he's still educating himself but uh, tom's record quite extraordinary and that first win at le mans get this le mans takes place between saturday and sunday that 24 hours he was only asked on i think the tuesday in 1997 would he fancy a go yeah sort of why not young racing driver and how you go from that to victory with 24 hours in between is quite extraordinary there is tom it's the wsc 95 model it won in 1996 that was in the hands of davy jones manuel reuter and alex wurtz another young gun who took victory in his first attempt at the moment but then the following year in a white livery tom christensen on board sharing with uh, michele alberetto and stefan johansson there you can see the names written on the side of the car a car that actually started life as a porsche Indeed, yeah. It's a Jaguar, the oh, XJR14, and oh, then yes. the Cabo Porsche. This Sorry. was the combination between TWR and Porsche, yeah? Yes, it was a car that was put aside, and as with so many occasions in the history of most sport, rules changed, and suddenly uh, it was considered, hold on a second, we've got something that could uh, be quite useful for that, and it proved, out, proved to be a very, very good... Uh, occasion to do so by the following year they took victory with an entirely different car the 911 gt1 we'll see that shortly but the first car in the queue it's the tiny 1100 cc class car i was mentioning look at the bodywork covering the the front wheels as well the wheels inset so of course they could turn within those um spats if you will it was all about small engine but with small engine you need aerodynamic efficiency and, and then uh, this is the 550, which came along, which is kind of the racing version a bit more of the 356. But, th but actually, the 356 you're going to see was specially done for Le Mans for the aerodynamics. But then the 550, slightly more mid-engined. And this was very much the start of Porsche building specific racing cars. No, exactly so. Not a road car adapted for the, for the racetrack, but a race car but purely. And uh, a lot of drivers who went on to compete in the 60s sort of tried to start their careers in Porsches. I certainly know that a long-time colleague of both colleague of both you and me, John Watson, always has an eye on a 356. Yes, he, uh, he definitely has. He has a rather nice 911 himself as well. Um, and then, of course, the 911s came along. And, and what is so remarkable, Bruce, is that the 911 is still um, a, a fundamental to Porsche, whether it's on the road or on the track. It is still such a huge part of their success. And bear in mind, they just decided in the, in the early 70s that perhaps the format was uh, running a bit short on what people wanted. And they decided to go the other way around and put the engine up the front. They made the Porsche 928 brilliant road car. Never had <coughs> the success 
on the circuit, but a car that uh, frankly scared everybody who drove it in the early years, the Porsche 917. This is the car that won in Le Mans in 1970. Richard Atwood at the wheel. He's still here this weekend, and uh, it was a car that, uh, when the bodywork is off, you realise the meagre amount of uh, <laughs> actual frame around the driver. It's a very scary-looking car, but once they've got the aerodynamics right and gave, made the tail longer and longer, it just started to suit them all so well. Well, here you go then. Tom Christensen, the nine-time winner of Le Mans, is lining up, ready to go up the hill and to do the demonstration. So um, enjoy this moment as uh, Tom heads up the hill and having shared this car with two great drivers, and he was telling us quite a lot about it yesterday, how Michele Alberetto and Stefan Johansson gave him good advice, but he also had to deliver, of course, for what was his first ever victory at Le Mans and uh, starting an incredible career. And now we're looking back at a, a much earlier start. We've got a, a lovely uh, onboard view here. And it just looks, it does look simply, Ben, like a road car, but this 356, of course, was uh, adapted lightly. That's the spats over the front wheels and the rear wheels to make it as aerodynamic as possible. Looks very much like a jelly mold. Strike me down for saying that, but uh, it made the progress that was required to win that class and uh, many, many classes at the Mans back in the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, this was in the junior class, but it mattered not because it took victory. And that's what really encouraged Porsche to push on because they suddenly realized this could drive the sale of our, our relatively new road cars. And uh, it really, really is a little stepping stone in the history of this most illustrious of motor racing marks. Yeah, that 1.1 class was, was an important uh, stage to get in, the 1100cc engine, but then, of course, uh, you want to go for outright victories in an event like that, and uh, it really does make difference to try and... Uh, the 917K is just such a, a, a stunning machine with a big, big engine sitting behind the driver. And, and exactly, take a look at the car. There is so much behind the, co the cockpit and that right to where the engine is. And it's just right to have the right car with the right driver on board. Richard Atwood at wheel took victory in 1970 along with Hans Hermann. And uh, brilliant to have this car. No longer in Richard's uh, hands in terms of ownership. Pika Frio Brute have, have taken it on. But the 917K, and of course, it came in other colours as well. And a lot of success in the blue and orange of uh, Gulf Racing and Gulf Colours over the year. But this is the colours of uh, Porsche Salzburg, red with the white pinstripes. And uh, it still looks brilliant and sounds so sweet. And uh, Richard Atwood has not lost any of his amazing finesse. He is 83 years old now. And he's driving this car up the hill, the car he won at Le Mans. And you know what? Uh, his first race was at Goodwood uh, back in 1959 in a standard 10. So his love of Goodwood has continued all over these years, uh, including victories at places like Le Mans. What an amazing career this man has had. Exactly so, and when you're driving effectively with muscle, muscle memory, because, of course, when you start to get back in a car you've raced before, it always feels just right, just how you remembered it, hopefully. Across the line it goes, and uh, a car that Karun Chandok was driving yesterday, and he thoroughly loved it, the honour of being able to be out there. He was warned it is one of the most valuable Porsches in the world. We've got some of the most value of ev valuable everything here, but to be the first Porsche Le Mans winning car driven by this man and its time, and being driven again all this time later is, is a lovely story. Yeah, I mean... Karun would have understood the value of the car far more than the value value of the car. He <laughs> understands the racing value of the car. Now, Brumov racing in the stage white with those broad red and blue stripes up and over the nose and down the flanks. Absolutely a linchpin in American racing over the years. And uh, again, the 911 came in so many different body shapes, but uh, Brumos ran a lot of them, but they started scoring great success with the Carrera RSR with a 2.8 litre 1973. And it was just great to see. This was a car that got into the hands of a lot of privateers and uh, success through numbers, you might say, but no, it's success through excellence. And races like the Daytona 24 hours, the Sebring 12 hours, Targa Florio couldn't be more different around the island of uh, Circuit on Sicily, but just such an amazing car, and to a lot of people of a certain age, this was the ultimate handling Porsche. Indeed, and uh, as you say, we're into the next batch of cars in a way, we've seen a lot of the Le Mans winners, we're now seeing winners from lots of different forms of GT racing, sports car racing over the years, and Porsche, you know, they, 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 right from those early years have done amazing jobs, but the 911 being a crucial part of that, and then rebuilt versions of the 911, many of them turned into superb sports racing cars as well. And it's a lovely sound when you hear it going up the hill. It looks brilliant, and Brumos ran Peter Gregg to a large number of championships. He went on putting down Trans Am titles almost at will, but of course it was a car that was uh, 
The Porsche 911 has been used in rallycross, it's been used in rallying, very, very nimble, but it's home to me is still out on the track. Looking down at uh, the, the Pink Pig, this was a, a race livery, the cuts of a, a pig, the butcher's cuts on a Porsche 917 early on, but a handful of years ago, back in 2018, Porsche brought, we're having a little look at a replay, this is the... Oh, dear. Ooh, that was oh a bit... Dear. Oh, the rear wing coming. That's the 1998 Le Mans winner yeah. in the hands of Aiello McNish and... Uh, Unfortunately, the tail being wagging the dog a little bit on the exit of Malcolm. The but anyhow, back to the Pink Pig, back, back in 2018. This is the 911 RSR, and they decided, and I really like this touch, to bring back the legendary uh, liveries that it had many moons before. Uh, Porsche had run many moons before, and this is put on the car uh, running in the GTE Pro class, a class that actually came to an end last year. That's quite a souvenir event. Someone's found a rear wing to it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it'll be going back to the car because that's a, a beautiful car. We didn't see much of it going up, but as you mentioned, Alan McNish was uh, also a part of that car when it won Le Mans in uh, 1998, and it was his first win at Le Mans as well. And they beat some uh, top teams that were competing at Le Mans that year. So I'm not sure who's in the car today, um, but uh, just had a little wobble, took off the rear wing, but it has been saved by the marshals. It has meant we've got a red flag uh, briefly while that has been sorted out so I have seen a couple of cars have stopped to the side of the track so that's why we're just waiting a little while before this much later 2018 car sets its way up the uh, the hill it won that LMGTE Pro class in 2018 with Michael Christensen uh, Kevin Estre and Laurence Vantour they were the three drivers that took that class victory uh, a yet another win for them uh, at Porsche which is it's kept going all over the years. It does, always very strong in the GT class. Obviously, uh, this year we've got them back at the top in the hypercar class. Not quite hitting the high notes as yet, but if it's Porsche and they're working on it, they will get there. Ferrari and Toyota are the marks duking it out at the very top of the class. That's expanding all the time. Of course, Lamborghini coming in next year, uh, BMW next year. So it's super, super boom time in the it World is. Endurance Championship. No, I totally agree with that. And uh, watching Le Mans, I know you were there commentating on it, but watching Le Mans, I was really impressed with the number of manufacturers fighting for the win in that in that race this year. And as you say, with new, more manufacturers coming in and someone like Porsche, who we know will always develop their cars extremely well. So my, while they're not quite there yet, they actually had a decent run at one stage and then they had uh, an accident going into the evening, didn't they? So, so they weren't totally out of that mix at one stage. No, entirely. And the car that did it, it was re really impressive. It was the, the car from Jota. So we've got the two works cars from Porsche Penske Motorsport, then Jota Sport, and now we have uh, Debsi Proton Racing or Proton Competition are running one as well. Some other ones are in the hands of privateers and the Imps are serious. So they're spreading their wings, but having customer cars has always been part of the Porsche racing ethos. It doesn't just balance the books, it maximizes your chance of victory. But if you want a bit of a, a good getaway, I think we'll uh, give full marks there for the 911 RSL 2018. Brilliant looking car, but obviously, if you put that alongside the first ever Porsche 911, it's wider, it's longer, it's just about three times as powerful. That was a wonderful start. It's not the way you start at Le Mans, of course, it's a rolling start at Le Mans, but, but that was absolutely worked great the way that he uh, just put the rubber down. Yes, I think all the drivers here are trying to audition for the, the Drift Car and the Smokiness Award that uh, the Drift Ooh. Boys and Girls uh, really seem Look to grab. Look at this again, if, you, if you're up there on the outside, you might get another view of a bit of more smoke coming off those rear tyres. Yep. <laughs> Start, but still quite impressive. When someone else is paying for the rubber, do abuse it as much as you <laughs> possibly can. We love the show. So that's a, a GTE Pro car from 2018. Now, five years later, we've come to the end of the GTE class, and henceforth, in 2024, it'll be GT3, slightly less powerful cars, slightly smaller wings, but uh, with so many manufacturers in that, it'll be a rich, rich competition. <laughs> yeah, that's always very intense. And of course, when you're driving in GT class, you're battling for your own wins, but you've also got to keep out of the way of the cars that are fighting for the outright victories. And there are incidents. We saw some this year, didn't we? Uh, it happens everywhere. And uh, certainly if you're on one of the prototype cars, the hypercar class, you're the one that gets the bad mark if there's contact. You have to give space the junior class cars back when hybrid sort of was uh, starting to find its leg in uh, the world endurance championship uh, porsche were very much in the mix in that and in uh, 2015 they took victory and to me this 919 hybrid still looks so it was only from a few years ago the history of the sport is developing all the time but that victory uh, all those years ago 2015 was uh, a, a cracking one and it was the last time a contemporary formula one driver came away with a victory in the le mans 24 hours and that was nico hulkenberg and he went to the following race and uh, popped up in the thursday press conference and popped the winning trophy on the table again <laughs> hey guys what did you do last weekend talk about playing a trump card
No, fantastic stuff. And so Porsche's success has continued. Uh, they had a very good period with this 919 hybrid, and that's why we think that they're certainly going to be there once the uh, the new car is around there. And one of the best things about this were three manufacturers at the top of the class, at the top of the World Championship at the time, and their hybrid versions all tackled the mechanical problem, the design problem, in different ways. So at different points around that, the toy to be better in a straight line, around the corner of the Porsche to be better, and so you can have these chopping and changings of the lead. It was a brilliant time. It was indeed. And uh, But then we're going back to 911 style again, a more modern version. Yes, in fact, you put them side by side and you think they may look fairly similar, but they certainly aren't. They keep on changing. Now, often the sleeker front end uh, was brought in because they're wanting to be more aerodynamic, and the 935 was a car that really... Um, they were looking for more and more downforce in the cars. As you can see, the bodywork goes way out uh, beyond the, the haunches of original 911 shape, and uh, this is an absolutely exquisite uh, 935. And uh, you'll see, I hope, in the course of this, uh, this display of this Porsche celebration of 75 years, the subtly different changes year in, year out, just a little bit of tweak here and there. That was the 935 76. Uh, that took victory in the following year 935 also took victory and I think it's going to be the next car up the hill a totally different shape which is the prototype the 936 77 but this one is the 936 76 and uh, just such a great car took victory uh, Jackie Hicks and Heath Van Lennon the Dutch racer Jackie just adding yet more to his uh, relay of wins yeah that's right uh, Jackie Hicks one of the most successful of course of all time his uh, his record being beaten by Tom Christensen of victories but Jackie was a key part of this and uh, his teammate Derek Bell for so many of his victories that was a, a crucial part of it all as well and you were talking uh, just there about uh, how Porsche's wins haven't only been outright wins at Le Mans there are 19 of those and a, a colleague who's worked at Le Mans for a very long time calling in from the stage to say Bruce by the way it's 109 class wins at Le Mans <laughs> Jim Rona I hope you're right that's an interesting number Good, goodness me 109 in total with all of that so we're looking at uh, that's one of the slightly later ones here, the 935s, the, uh, the 936, rather, the 81. But the, the most contemporary one, this is the car from not far away from France, South Tunbridge, outside Tunbridge Wells, Jota Sport, and they pulled off a masterstroke to uh, get the Hertz sponsorship, you know, one of the world's largest car hire companies. The car looks absolutely brilliant in its gold livery. This started at the back of the pack at the more in the top class, and yet somehow worked its way through to the front. So still early days. But still then it crashed out, didn't it? Didn't it? Was it that one? Don't spoil the story, Ben. Don't spoil the, spoil the story. But these cars, they're absolutely fabulous. Four and a half litres, 4.6 litre V8 turbocharged, and hybrid, that's the whole point. Hypercar is really working with different technologies and uh, the Porsche 963, history will relate. I am sure, I can guarantee it would advance and start picking up race wins. And of course that electric uh, hybrid power will give it very good uh, acceleration. That's where it can be so valuable. So it's doing a few little slowdowns and pickups once again. Uh, but it is the latest version of what Porsche are aiming to go for, for more titles, more Le Mans wins, and we'll be seeing a lot more of these cars, as you say, this run by an independent team, as are many of these Porsche 963s now, uh, but this is something to watch for the future. And in the days, the great days of Group C racing in the mid to late 80s, of course, Porsche really maximised selling customer cars, Nine, Porsche 956s and 962s, and they too, were so many, you just simply chose which one that you like the colour of. But uh, rather earlier, we had, this is really the moment when the cars started to change shape in, in the, the, the world of um, yeah. Porsche 904 Carreras becoming the 906. This, this is, is a very nice. successful one, yeah. This was because uh, it had all new Jubilee space frame. This one actually raced in the United States. Um, it's uh, Hiroshi Fushida who's driving this. She's, uh, she's a very key Porsche driver herself. And I saw her signing off a few uh, a, a little signatures uh, down in the paddock earlier on with people coming along and saying hello. And hopefully she can enjoy taking the Porsche 906 up the hill. And uh, as you say, this was part of that switch to becoming true sports prototypes that would take overall victories. Yeah, so they stepped on from the 904, very successful GT car in the early 60s. By the mid 60s, 1966 came uh, the 906, but then uh, a few years later it became the 908 and had a long tail. And that started to very much go towards the body shape. We'd see just within another year of that with the 917 being launched. But lovely to have these exquisite lightweight cars from Porsche. Yes, the 906, not as common as some of the others, but this was one of the, one of the best ones, I think, that, uh, in terms of results. Um, and in the Uni United States, it won a lot of local events from 1970, so it was used. Now, here is another 
beautiful look of the Porsches from the early 1970s. Yes, we've already seen the 917 came with Richard Apple. That was the red one with the white pinstripes, the winner at uh, Le Mans in 1970 but uh, within a few years you can see the wheel arches become a little broader the haunches are wider but that to me this fabulous 917k would have been raced in these colors the gulf colors but also in the martini colors you, colors you, the white with the red and blue stripes but just such an historic car it's some of the greatest sports car races thinking a uh, brands hatch thousand kilometers in the rain where some of the driving from the leading drivers was quite astonishing it was indeed and uh, it has become such a part to see this and the golf uh, sponsorship and the jw automotive team that uh, used to run the porsches very very successfully of course with um huge and they'd come from various other manufacturers as well and it went on to give them plenty of success right the 911 shape continues in gt racing and uh, in, you have it in the porsche super cup and this is a manti prepared rs club sports and uh, still very popular long distance races, the Nürburgring and the various championships around the world. But uh, the GT2 RS Club Sport is something that's uh, very much a sort of track day car. And a lot of people just like to have the horsepower and uh, all the downforce that massive rear wing can supply. Olaf Monte is actually driving that and he, he uh, runs the team and they've, they've spent some 25 years working with Porsche. They have, and they're one of those many, many teams just based across the road at Moyes Pass from the entrance to Nürburgring, and it's a real hub of motorsport excellence. Now, this is Adam Smalley, who is going to be one of the front runners when we get into the shootout later. He has set some, some of the most rapid paces up the hill so far. Look at that, the way he just slides it, bounces it, and this is impressive. He's a youngster who races Porsches. He's done extremely well in the British... Uh, Porsche Championship, and look at him sliding it around. This is really impressive stuff. We will be seeing if he's going to be able to set the outright pace later on. Yeah, for a second he got the tail really quite out of shape there, but it wasn't, it was controlled out of shape. So I'll give him 11 out of 10. No, I'll give him 10 out of 10 for style, but it was also the sheer degree of attack we can see in this 911 GT3 Cup class car. Car he knows very well, but of course, this isn't quite the same, the hill climb course here. So narrow, it's not a racing circuit, but he really pressed on. And I just heard word that the Mercury Spearling earlier this morning went up the hill in 39.8. Really? Okay, well, that's not surprising. That was a 47.8. Uh, that uh, one he's just done, but there'll be more performance, I'm sure, even more later on. Nice little run onto the grass. I don't think it forced him to lift, but you've got to be so careful here. It is such a narrow place. There's uh, Mark Webber giving everybody a wave. This is just a, a, a gentle demonstration in one of those very early open cars. Yeah, and for all Mark's success in Formula One, he's almost more associated now with Porsche. It's a Mark he absolutely adores, and what a great ambassador. He always puts uh, so much enthusiasm and you know, al aligned with knowledge about whatever he drives, and he really, really gets this. And again, a for a lot of people, you know, the Porsche road car is just as important to them as the, the Porsche racing car. So give him a wave as he comes up, because Mark really loves this event. And it's, the, it's for a lot of the drivers, past and present, it's the interaction, Ben, with the tourists. So this won't be the fastest line. It'll be an excellent line, because it's Mark Webber, but uh, nice and gently into Malkin. Yeah, he is taking it nice and steady. This is not a full distance run. Let's give him a wave, everybody. Yeah, that's lovely to see. Mark Webber, who has been such a star of motorsport and is still a star, even though he's not uh, driving so much, because he went from Formula One into uh, racing at Le Mans and doing that level of motorsport. But now he's more commercial. And of course, he's the man who manages Oscar Piastri, the uh, Australian who did such a fantastic job with McLaren just a week ago at Silverstone and we're celebrating so much of McLaren this weekend. I know that Mark really rates Oscar Piastri. Obviously, as a manager, he's going to be positive about him, but I think we all saw just how effective he can be. It was a, a superb drive by him last week and Mark Webber now just soaking up the atmosphere here at Goodwood, which he's been to on many occasions. Lovely little story just coming down from the top paddock. We saw Richard Atwood going up in the 917K, the Le Mans winner from 1970. He was chatting with Tom Christensen up at the top, who went up in his 1997 winner. And I've just heard that uh, while they were chatting, Richard asked, uh, Ed, Ed at the top of the hill asked Richard if he'd ever driven a WSC 95. He said no, so he's going to be popped in it to come back down the hill from the top. <laughs> I love that. It's about that cross-pollination. And all racers like every other vintage of car, don't they? 
They do, and you can see that uh, with Mark as well. This is a car that uh, was he even bought, I doubt it, when this car came along, and yet he, he enjoys it. He loves getting out in anything, get that different feel, that different sense from early cars. And there we're looking at one of the most recent, I believe, was it a million or something, 911? They've passed, yeah, that's the million to 911, or they've passed a million cars, yeah. followed up by a, a racing 928, which is, was a, a relative rarity. And then again, the bloodline of Porsche, it's so strong, it's so unidentifiable. And an awful lot of people here, they tell you, I've got, I've got flat six in my veins. Of course, that's for the earlier cars. But uh, any mark that's so closely associated with motorsport always finds friends. So there we are, celebrating 75 years of the first Porsche manufactured car, 60 years uh, of the 911 as well. So uh, let's have a look back at some of the Porsche history. I think the unique thing about Porsche and the cars that they make, it's the mix between the purity of the engineering and the beauty of the design. That whole mix is really, really something special. So it's a joy to be in it and it's a joy to actually make it work and to actually feel it. How the car feels in the steering wheel really and the view out of it and everything, which are the important things. The handling of Porsche, very particular thing. Porsche, without any doubt, are going to be a major part of the success of It's amazing how we've done the 50th anniversary, now we're doing the 75th, so 25 years later, here we are, we're still doing it. Porsche were the only brand to have double sent and displayed four tanks and that shows an incredible amount of support and that we're not having it all, we're all huge fans. The special moments each day are the absolute climax. The whole site turns to look at them. This year, with this fantastic sculpture, Porsche cars will come and encircle it in front of the house. There will be music, there will be these wonderful daylight fireworks and there will be this huge, very emotional celebration of 75 years of one of the world's greatest brand. I think I've driven more Porsches than anything else at the festival speed. I'm very lucky, I've owned a few Porsches over the years, and the moment I made a little bit of money in my early 20s, I was definitely out there trying to buy myself a decent car. My favourite's got to be the original 924 Carrera GT that I owned, and I wish I still had. Carol plays a big part in most sports, liveries are usually memorable and Porsche liveries in particular. I mean, graphics and cars and liveries and colour, all super important. Everything a brand stands for is what the Festival Speed is all about. The joy of driving, uh, the joy of mobility. We're looking at change, we're looking at innovation technology. I mean, that's what the Festival Speed is all about and Porsche epitomizes that on every level. So let's have a little look back over some of the highlights that we saw of the Porsche runs from cars from the early period, the car still being first being built from 1948, and that's what we are celebrating. Of course, there was already heritage in the family of creating cars pre-war, but then as it all developed, they went into racing in such a fantastic way with sports cars, sports prototypes, carrying it all the way through, and particularly at Le Mans. We've seen a number of Le Mans winners here this weekend. Unfortunately, not all of them made it up to the top, but this is the GT1 car from 1998. Little, tiny little moment, just coming out of Molecombe Corner, and ping, what is stronger than the rear wing? A straw bale. Not yes, that's right. Damage, Let's hope uh, not too much damage done. It, it all looks pretty good. The straw bale's doing their fine job. This is a more recent machine doing that wonderful start off the line, going past Goodwood House 
And we will see Porsches out again a little bit later in the shootout as well. As we know, there are a couple of very quick ones that will be heading up that hill very quickly indeed. The 919, that's always done well here at Guru, but particularly on the long distance races where Porsche have had more and more to play with. So much to celebrate from Porsche this weekend. And it's time to just talk about Porsche that little bit more. Tom Christensen, Richard Atwood. What a treat we have. We've got, Tom, your first Le Mans winner, Porsche, and of course the 917K, the first Porsche to win Le Mans. Richard, there's some history here, isn't there? Uh, a little bit for Porsche, yeah. More for Porsche than me, I think. Um, I've always considered that Le Mans is uh, really a manufacturer's uh, championship, really. And um, Porsche in 1969 set out to win the World Sports Car Championship, which they won in 69 and 70 and 71. And uh, then the 5 litre Formula finished, so the 917 was finished as well. And the next car that came along, I think, was a 936. But uh, they have a history of Le Mans, uh, the most wins ever for anybody. Well, I don't know how long that will continue, but hopefully for quite a while, a long time to go. <laughs> Tom, you had a chance to drive this car yesterday. It must have been quite a nice sort of rounding of the corner because your first win came in a Porsche. You drove the first Porsche winner. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's really fantastic. They both have a very good mechanical feel. Obviously, you know, this Porsche is a bit of a lovely dinosaur. There's a bit of British blood in that TWR uh, chassis, just private Porsche. And then driving uh, this beauty, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful Le Mans cars ever. And what uh, Richard and, uh, and Hans uh, did back in the day is, uh, is very amazing. He's a very, very modest man, uh, Richard Atwood, and he's still uh, fast and competitive. Uh, but driving it, yeah, good mechanical grip. I had a few things. I thought the steering is a bit far away. And immediately he used a few swear words. And said, yeah, it was not like that ba back in the day. But, you know, these are good things uh, to experience. But to drive the car, and it was a, a lovely machine. But when you look around, uh, from building 69, um, all the carbon fiber around is not really carbon. Uh, the lovely tubes are very fine and very thin, and uh, in that sense, um, you want it, you the, <laughs> you uh, you have to be uh, you have to know exactly where you put uh, you put the cars from the back in the day, and uh, big respect with the speeds we uh, we do or, or did at Le Mans. Richard, have you driven the WSC 95? Uh, no, no. Would you like to? It's probably too fast for me now. My neck muscles weren't sound because there's a lot of uh, ground effect, is there, I think? Yeah? Uh, you, now we drive to the house. You drive it from the house. Deal? Okay. Okay. This is fantastic. Well, you heard it here first. <laughs> Richard, look at me. I'm, so, I'm getting you drives. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. What about the pay? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll discuss that afterwards. We'll look, Tom, yeah, Richard, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. So much history, and uh, it's brilliant to have them both here. Cheers. Thank okay, thank you. Kevin, it's all about reuniting the right cars with the, with the right drivers. Um, and you just said you haven't driven this for five years. No, it, it's great to, uh, to drive this, this car again and, and found my suit and the helmet and everything and, and feel, you know, the, the pink pig love from, from all the spectators and, and just, yeah, have, have the feeling of, of this car, which was amazing and amazing memories for, for us. So uh, very proud to, to drive it today. Typically, if a racing driver, you still fit as well. Well, I fit, I fit, yeah, exactly. I fit in the suit, which is good. Let's see if I can do it in 10 years. But <laughs> at the moment, it's still okay. And uh, yeah, really, really glad to be here. Fit in, in, the, in the suit, remembering where to start and, uh, and having all these memories uh, coming back. And when, I know it's only been five years, but you drive so many cars. When you get back into this, how long does it take to just everything to make sense again? I just coming in and looking at the steering wheel, I say, ooh, oh yeah, that's pretty old actually <laughs> although uh, it's only five years but uh, there's the involvement of the cars is, is quite uh, quite big but uh, yeah it takes probably three minutes being in looking ah yeah okay this the button this and then that's it then you feel at home straight away when you when you start driving but for sure the buttons are always different from one car to another Kevin thank you thank you Alex, you never know who's going to get out of these cars. Um, but actually, this is probably not too far removed from the E-Type that you race at the members' meeting in Revival. 
No, not too dissimilar. I mean, massively a lot. I didn't expect it to be that, that fast. I mean, what an engine and a lot more grip than I thought. But obviously, the first time I sat in it was about 20 minutes ago. So, um, yeah, a bit of a last minute call for me to be in this car. But um, thanks to Nick at uh, Duncan Hamilton Rothko for inviting me to drive it. What a fantastic car, great history car and l lovely day to be able to drive it. Thank, thank God the weather's nice today. It's a very short hill climb, it's very narrow, a brand new car for you, but do you get some idea of why these were so successful in period? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was eye-opening. I mean, I've not been up this hill for seven years, so it's been a little while for me, so a little bit of a, a refresher of the hill, but yeah, you know, I want to keep the car in one, one piece, but also I love to go quick and race, so a bit of a, bit of a strange one, but re really enjoy driving the car. Again, you know, much faster than, I, than I've thought it would be sounds fantastic on the overrun which is the main thing and hope the crowd enjoyed it it's great they say today's Malkin's pretty much flat <laughs> not today not today so um no it's great and uh yeah i think i'm gonna get to drive it a bit later on as well today so great cheers alex thank you very much cheers guys in my tesla might get arrested she's sitting in my new sheet we still getting messy I've been in love. So all part and parcel of the fun and games this weekend is the celebration of Porsche, the 75 years of Porsche and the Le Mans winners, plus the 60 years of the 911s. So much that uh, we have been able to look forward to and enjoy and this incredible collection of cars. There is so much to know about Porsche.
So what a joy it is to celebrate the 75 years of Porsche here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Anniversaries is very much a part and parcel of every event that has been held here since 30 years ago. And for Porsche fans, and I'm sure there are many, many, many of you around here, I bet you're seeing cars that you've dreamt of actually seeing and being next to. And here's the chance where you can actually be so close to cars that perhaps as kids you grew up thinking, oh, one day that would be so amazing to see. Here it is, it's happening today. And for the youngsters as well who are here, what an opportunity to see how this brand has developed over the years. Quite an extraordinary story, and they don't just have to look at the cars on the track and a tractor as well. It's yeah. the coolest tractor, perhaps, definitely the coolest tractor here, the Porsche tractor. It's not just Lamborghini that started life making tractors, but of course, they can look in the sky as well. That incredible Jerry Judah sculpture with the only Porsche to win a Grand Prix that's the 1962 model right at the top of that sculpture and uh, just their history up above, but also down below, and the whole circle underneath that Jerry Judah sculpture just showing the diversity of Porsche's success. Very much a family uh, company. It was created, created originally in a way by Ferdinand Porsche, who he was the man who would have been behind that tractor, for example. Um, and also the auto unions pre-World War II, he was part of that. And of course, the all important VW Beetle. He was the man who, who designed that. But it was his son who then, after the war, decided we, we need to make our own cars. We need to do the Porsche brand. That, the, he, he really came up with the, 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 the cars that we're now enjoying here. German manufacturers tend to have a really, really strong family bloodline in them, but, but none stronger than Porsche. But just the sh it's not just the number of successes, it's the different shapes of cars they did it in, not just circuit racing, all endurance racing, of course, but also rallying and rallycross. What a motorsport, Mark. It's time to celebrate Porsche here at Goodwood, and you're going to see some lovely fireworks coming up in just a moment as well to make the most of another very special anniversary for the Porsche manufacturer, for that family that started off just before the war but started creating the, the cars, which is what we're really celebrating now from 1948, building cars that were spread around the world and now, of course, are truly international. Always been a, a huge brand in the United States as well and a family that has also taken on some of the best designers since then as well. And the 911, which has become such a, a part of the heritage of Porsche throughout that history. Let's enjoy, watch and celebrate their anniversary.
what a lovely celebration this is for Porsche and the fireworks going up and in the wind being blown across and this is a day where we've had gentle wind compared to yesterday when unfortunately the event was uh, turned down because it was just too windy for safety and you can sort of see the effect of that wind but what a fantastic celebration this is just phenomenal the success the Porsche manufacturing brand has had across the years the diversity but it's just the relentless pursuit of trophies around the world the 911s and I'm 35 in the background the 904 the bodies kept on changing adapting to the ever evolving rules of sports car racing but rallying rally cross as well but it's just that relentless pursuit of victory and so many successes and so lovely so so many fans in that part there down by goodwood house absorbing that atmosphere and in fact i think everybody here good we've got a, a sense of it as well no matter even if you weren't down right there you could get the music and the the sights which have been so great to see it always amazes me how they could put this sculpture together and uh, it must be so nerve-wracking for the owners of these cars seeing them <laughs> mounted up in the air upside down but it works every year it's, this has happened from many many years ago jerry judah uses strong glue i joke of course everything <laughs> and we've had some unbelievable cars up cars worth more than you can possibly imagine but uh, you've never i've never seen Porsche's 956s and 962s upside down, the Formula One cars, and even the very latest Porsche 963 up top on that amazing sculpture outside Goodwood House. And great to see so many people down there with all the music and, and the synchronised fireworks. Very, very good show. So the Porsche company who have got so much to enjoy here this weekend to, to celebrate their anniversary and we are certainly enjoying the output that they have given us for so many years. You're a bit late. We've been uh, working a little bit in, uh, in the jump, you know. But Is it going to be any good, do you think? Better than last year? Yeah, I think it can be better from last year. How do you think you're going to make it any better? 
like that would be good, no? I think we have something here. Flying. Big job. I think we got it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Thank you. Go. go. Sorry. Sorry. See you later. So we've enjoyed it, the Porsche celebration, and now it's time to do another anniversary, which actually the same number of years, funnily enough, we've been talking since Porsche was first built, but we're celebrating NASCAR now, because it is 75 years since the NASCAR racing uh, gig started in America, uh, just after the Second World War, with these big saloon cars that have become true racing cars. Of course, they race on the ovals, they race on road circuits, they do huge numbers of laps, or huge numbers of uh, races throughout the course of the year, far, far more than we see in pretty much any other uh, title battles. And it's lovely to see some of these historic cars. And what you will notice, of course, Alice, is the noise of the, the classic Can-Am V8. Uh, not, not the Can-Am, but the NASCAR V8s in this case. Yeah, they will roar up the hill. As you said, another anniversary, celebrating lots of anniversaries. It's 75 years of NASCAR, and the first NASCAR stock, strictly stock race was held in Charlotte Fairground Speedway, which Jim so Roper, sorry, Jim Roper won the first race. So you can see there's plenty of NASCARs that have been waiting patiently for the Porsche celebration to end. We've got Dodge Avengers, we've got Chevrolets, Dodge Chargers, we've got a huge variety then. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, Dodge Charger just heading up the hill now, in fact. Um, Philip Chervin, who's driving this one. And this is a much more... Uh, in fact, uh, Simon Chalkley we've got down as right driving this one this time. They were kind of swapping around a bit over the weekend. So this is a pretty recent version. You're looking at a, a 2021, uh, the Dodge Charger here. So you're going to see some of the older cars as well, but some of the more recent versions. And the names from NASCAR, such as Dodge, I mean, Dodge is, of course, one of the main suppliers, Ford, Chevrolet, we've got plenty of the Chevrolets, uh, Pontiac, uh, another great name from NASCAR as well, and we're seeing a mixture of them, and, and cars that also won the championships, driven by some superstars of NASCAR over the years. It's very much a specialist game, isn't it, Alice? You don't see many drivers in the world of motorsport flicking into NASCAR until just recently we saw a saw a New Zealander flick into NASCAR on a road course as Shane Van Gibsberg and took a win on a debut but generally NASCAR is American drivers who learn from a young age and stay with it for their their whole careers yeah it's exactly that I would say it's probably considered to be one of the top ranked motorsport organizations in the world and certainly is one of the largest spectator sports in America hugely hugely popular and Jensen Button even said, didn't he? He said he actually quite misses his NASCAR. And there's quite a few people who've driven NASCARs that I've spoken to in the past, and they say, actually, even though they look big and they look heavy, they are really fun to drive. You're looking at a relatively early one now. This is a great looking car, isn't it? The 1970 Dodge Daytona. And this, um, in a calendar of 48 races, took the title. Uh, Bobby Isaac, uh, who won it that year, he won 11 races out of the 48. Can you believe it? 48 races. Just imagine how your, your season goes like that. Um, he had a total of 37 wins in the career. So it's a seven litre V8. I mean, that's, that's the sort of size of engine that you're looking at in all of these cars, sort of seven and six and a half, seven litres, as we see the next car heading up the hill as well. And, and, and such a, a, a beautiful mix of machinery. Charlie Turner this time, who's in one of the Ford Mustangs. Yeah, so most of the popular manufacturers we have Ford and Chevrolet, obviously, that are uh, huge, huge names in NASCAR and a different kind of roar going up the hill. And they almost are shaking our commentary box, aren't they, Ben, as they head past us through Malcolm Corner. Does Charlie Turner streaming up the hill? Yeah, this one's from 2014, so it's not 
It's not one of the older uh, classic ones in a way, it's a more recent version, but still, well, you've got to say, nine years old now. OK, now Jensen Button is about to go up. Now, this is not a NASCAR, but it has competed recently in uh, America because it's done the Pikes Peak. And um, this is going to do the shootout later on as well. So this is the Radford 62-2 Pikes Peak edition. And they had the, they ran it in June this year, and it was fastest in class up the Pikes Peak, which is a, an amazing hill climb. And it's a very different hill climb to this one. Let's watch Jensen Button, everybody. Jensen is very much part of the Radford Company, which is a, a company that has rejigged once again to create cars, their own versions of cars. Originally, the uh, the Radford Type 62-2 based on the Lotus Exige and done their own version, then they came up with this, which is a, a much more developed version, uh, producing something like 700 horsepower. It's lovely to see Jensen doing this stuff, isn't it, Alice? Yeah, it's wonderful, and he's really enjoying his time here. He had his family here earlier on in the weekend. It was Thursday that his family was here, and, and he was just walking around, just enjoying the sights. He just can't stay away, can he, from a, a racetrack or a motorsport event, and it just shows with the amount of variety of cars that they're out there on display and the variety of cars that he, he's enjoying driving. Absolutely. Harold Radford was the man who originally set up this business uh, from 1948. They used, to, they used to do adaptations of Bentleys and Aston Martins, that sort of thing. Um, but it was revived by Jensen with an Anstead and Mark Stubbs, and now they've got these uh, remarkable-looking bits of kit as well. So very, very enjoyable to see. As uh, we've got some more electronic power now from a, a more recent Audi in terms of uh, the Le Mans history that we're looking at. And uh, it's the Audi R18, isn't it? Yeah, it's that's the right. It's the hybrid power that was introduced in the Le Mans in 2012. And it was uh, Audi's hybrid system that d delivered power to the front wheels, so making this technically a four wheel drive car, but went to victory as well in Le Mans, a 3.7-litre V6 diesel. That's right. It won uh, by only a small amount, actually. It was one of those victories, yet another victory for Audi. As you say, uh, they only won by 12 seconds. And winning by 12 seconds at Le Mans when you've been racing for 24 hours is a pretty scary amount, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. And now we've got this incredible Bentley that's on your screen now that Sean Lynn is driving. Beautiful car, that iconic livery the Bentley Speedo which a four litre V8 turbocharged another Le Mans winner we've got so many Le Mans winner cars that are going to be going up the hill Ben yeah that's right this was a, a car driven by another Tom Christensen car actually when it was uh, racing in period so we've seen Tom go up the hill already today in a car that he has uh, taken victory well this was one he shared with Ronaldo Capello and Guy Smith and uh, they, Bentley were in great shape by then, I have to say, and they delivered a superb victory. Oh, the Audi has come to a halt, and I don't think there's been any incident as such. It looks more like a, um, a mechanical or electronic problem. Yeah, it just seems to pull over to one side there, so red flag is out, which means all the cars will end up slowing down. So that looks like he's gone past the wall, and that's heading up the hill somewhere there's not many too many pulling points here but he's done a great job as you can see the Bentley passing there nice and slowly in the background so we'll have a brief pause here to, to make sure we can move the the Audi to safety yes I wonder what's gone wrong and whether they need to give it a quick tow up the rest of the hill I'm not sure so yes as you say the Bentley just going along fairly steady at this stage um, but hopefully all will be okay uh, Sean Lynn in the car at the moment and uh, as I say with tremendous history that Bentley managed to have and um, also memories for me for a, a man who was very involved in running this team John Wickham who sadly passed away not very long ago and uh, a lot of us motorsport people knew him well he'd been in all different elements of motorsport and this was one of his great uh, successes running the, the the team effectively at that time when they they took the victory but there we are the Audi hopefully we will get that going soon although it's going to take a few minutes to to get it moved there's a the beautiful Renault uh, another ex uh, Le Mans car uh, the Alpine Renault from 1978 that's another sort of period. winner as well yes indeed um, it was a, a, a winning car Didier Peroni and Jean-Pierre Jusso they were the, the, the winners there uh, whether René Arnoux is driving it today he was driving it yesterday um, but uh, maybe Alain Sataji who's 
driving it. Right, OK, it's Alain who's driving it on this occasion. And you say that winning by 12 seconds was, was a lot. <laughs> this car won by five laps. So slightly bigger margin to, to the Audi's 12 seconds, but built in 1978 and a very, very impressive car. Yes, the Renault brand very much into that kind of uh, motorsport at that stage. Audi, of course, then went on to remarkable success some years later and all the battles they had. And at one time, they were such a, a dominant force. You always kind of knew, oh, it's probably going to be Audi that wins Le Mans. Uh, it's then gone through a little period of that recently, in recent years, with Toyota. But then this year, there was the battle that Toyota had with various other manufacturers. And it was a Ferrari victory for the first time in many, many years. So Le Mans is picking up, I think, again, as we were saying earlier, in terms of interest with so many different manufacturers getting involved in this new type of... Uh, HD engines and combinations of hybrid, but they're just trying to get the Audi out of the way at the moment. It may just be that they can put it into a safe area. Yeah, look so. Uh, great job by the marshals, as always, that have certainly been tested with uh, plenty of weather conditions thrown their way over the course of the weekend. Obviously, due to, to high winds yesterday, there was no running here at the hill climb venue. It was closed, but on Friday, a lot of rain if any of you were here the brollies were certainly well used but today we are grace with no rain at the moment nice sunshine as the marshals are pushing the audi back through in between the hay bales and hopefully we'll be underway very shortly yeah the marshals as ever doing a fabulous job here at goodwood thank you so much to all of the marshals who uh, as ever in motorsport keep us going and allow it to continue and they're Energy throughout the long, long days here at Goodwood is really appreciated by all of us. And they've uh, got the car well out of the way. So I think we'll be able to continue this run in just a few moments' time. We won't get too much of a delay. And the rest of these cars that have shared the uh, history of Le Mans, we've got some really, you will see some really older cars as well, because we, we saw that Bentley going up just now, that one in 2003. But Bentley actually started their Le Mans heritage back in the early 1920s and you will see at some point some of the big rather heavy but wonderful Bentleys from those early 1920s uh, 22 1924 and the 1929 Bentley Speed 6 old number one which uh, took the fourth Bentley win in a uh, third in a row in fact in those early years so so much to enjoy another winner of Le Mans over the years in a rather unusual car in the Mazda was Johnny Herbert Let's hear from Johnny now. Johnny Herbert, back in the Mazda 787B. Uh, what a car, but really my eyes are drawn to the fact you're still fitting into the same overalls. You, your eyes are drawn very well, but it is quite tight in here, I have to say. But I'm, I'm fortunate I can still get them on. But yeah, you know, it's a wonderful experience to come here to Goodwood, but also seeing all these wonderful cars that we see that nearly takes you down. <laughs> But it's, yeah, the 787B, you know, it's such a special thing for, for us as drivers, myself, Bertrand and Volker, but to Japan as well, you know, the first Japanese manufacturer to win Le Mans, and she's still going strong and she st still sounds sweet. There are worse cars to be killed by than the, sp the Speed 8 behind me. Uh, apologies for that. Um, there's no getting around the noise with this, though. It is, as a racing driver at the time, it probably wasn't that nice because it was so noisy. But actually now, it's hard not to love it. It's actually, in the cockpit, it's not really a problem because the exhaust is just here. So it's shooting at the side. So it's all behind us anyway. So it's not such a problem inside. It's actually everybody else who was at Le Mans, it's everybody here who was at Goodwood, who get a real sort of bang from uh, from the four rotor uh, engine so it's uh, yeah it's great that it's got that special sound something we're never ever gonna hear again unfortunately but you come to goodwood you still can thank you johnny thanks oh it's always lovely to hear from johnny uh, the man who took the victory in that uh, in that mazda at le mans he was absolutely exhausted afterwards he didn't actually get onto the podium because uh, he was in an <laughs> a bit of a state I was, I was just about to say he's always full of life I know. full of energy and uh, you've just uh, proved there that that isn't always the case no i think it was uh, a, a bit of a tough one but it's interesting what he was saying about the noise i can totally understand that especially the speed that johnny drives at <laughs> all the noise goes behind him um, rather than in front of him and that was lovely to see so it looks like we're getting the cars beginning to move up the hill again which is good news and we're going to see plenty more of this historical lineup that we have the Renault is going to be one of the next cars that comes up the Alpine 
Renault from 1978 that we were looking at. There it is, just on the start line now, so that the marshals are just making sure they're getting all the signs that it's clear. There you are, they're getting the fire up. And they can bring it back up the hill for another run. One or two of these cars we will see later in the shootout as well, although most of the shootout cars will be getting ready for that because we're not too far away uh, for the pace setters coming up the hill pretty soon. Well, we'll be looking for that. So this is the Alpine Renault, as we mentioned, the winner of Le Mans in 1978. Didier Peroni, who was uh, one of the drivers, of course, was a very experienced Formula One driver. He drove for Ferrari in uh, Formula One, Didier Peroni. Um, sadly, his uh, career ended uh, before he had a chance to take a title. There was a very tragic year uh, involving him and uh, Gilles Villeneuve. But before that had all happened, he had taken this victory at Le Mans in the Alpine Renault. And, and we're seeing quite a lot from Alpine now. Of course, we saw the very early Alpine rally car come up the hill, and we are seeing some of the later Alpines. It's lovely that the brand, I mean, it's, you know, the, the name is now used in Formula One, but the, the brand itself has it, it, grown a lot in recent years. Yeah, it certainly has. And if you were here bright and early this morning, would have seen the Alpines out in the, the first glance. They're obviously here with their new Le Mans edition A. 110R, the A110R, and they also had the Entstone edition, the A10 as well. So lots of different cars going up, and they've, they've got electric cars as well. And, and it is really nice to, to see the brand really growing. And actually, it's nice to see that quite a few people actually say, to me, I didn't realize Alpine did did cars for, for so long and so it's nice to actually see them here so people can really see them in the flesh and actually it's there's a rich rich history behind Alpine there is you know, and I like the way Renault have decided to sort of go go the Alpine way for their performance side of things and uh, it's working well for them yeah it certainly is obviously racing in Formula One as well so we've got a, a few more uh, cars to come up the hill um, just trying to get things going. So I'm surprised we haven't got uh, somebody else up and running just yet um, because they're trying to get this uh, little batch of cars. Whether there's a problem getting it fired up, I don't know. That could always be a little bit of an issue here. Yeah, so it looks like the, the marshals are trying to wave the car up the hill. Yep, yeah, come on, up you come. This looks like one of the NASCAR group <laughs> does, again, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Yes. So we shall see which one is just about to come up the hill. Uh, in that NASCAR group. Remember, we're celebrating the 75 years of NASCAR as well. We've got a, a couple of uh, very recent of the Chevrolet there we go. Camaros, and in fact, I think they've got it fired up now. So up to the line, and then we can get to witness one of the, another of the, the NASCAR machines. This is 293, so this is a, a pretty recent one. This is a 2022 car, uh, another of the Chevrolet Camaros. And uh, Goffredo Piro is driving it here today and getting the ball top of the line. So you're getting back to that lovely V8 noise. Oh, in fact, Ed Berry is in it. Oh, that's good news. Ed Berry, um, he is a very, very experienced uh, NASCAR driver. Now in his 60s, uh, but loving to come into Goodwood. He's, uh, he often comes here to Goodwood. Comes from North Carolina. He was the NASCAR racer between 1995 and 2000. And uh, now he's just having a little play in a much more modern version of what he used to race. Yeah, exactly. He's certainly not hanging around either, as you can see, going into Malcolm Court. And this is Piro in that beautiful. I actually really like this. Yeah, this is uh, Emanuele Piro. So, yet another winner from Le Mans. He's in the Matra Simca. And um, actually, this one was a victory for Henri Pescarolo and Gerard Larousse um, in the 1970s. It won Le Mans. They, they won the constructors' title for two years, actually. And uh, Emanuele Piro, we've seen Emanuele. Of course, he he's been here with Goodwood for so many years. He's one of the captains of the teams at the at the events as well, the members' meeting, and. Emanuele is always wonderful to talk to about anything, really, whatever it is, but a very talented driver himself. And now he's got this little chance to enjoy the Matra Simca. Yeah, he certainly has. And we've got a more stream of cars going up the hill. We've got a Ford Mustang GT3 that Harry Tinknell is behind the wheel. We're going to have a Mercedes-Benz AMG GT2 as well. So we've got some more modern cars coming up the hill. And as Piro comes over the line, the five-time winner of Le Mans, uh, winner of the Nürburgring 
24 hour race in 1899. He's been winner at Goodwood RACTT. Uh, he won with Dario Franchitti some years ago, long time ago now, actually back in 2005 in a Jaguar E type. So a huge, huge mixture of cars. Thomas Jaguar now in the AMG GT2. And of course, this is a, a very modern machine, the sort of car that we see as a safety car when we're going to Formula One races as well, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It is. And we quite a popular car racing across all categories of GT racing, British GT through to obviously racing in Le Mans and, and, and other championships as well. And I can see that Mike Wilds is out there now in that lovely Jaguar XJR. Bit of squealing from a car just going past us, but the, 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 the Mercedes over the line has 700 horsepower in that, so it's a, it's a very, very powerful piece. Big rear wing that they've, uh, they've fitted to it as well. Um, and they have a, it has an amazing steering wheel. It's a bit like a Formula One steering wheel. It's got loads of stuff on it. Right, here we go then. This is Mike. This is Mike in his. Excellent. It, well, not his, but uh, in the seven litre V12 Jaguar and such a lovely car. Yeah, this is beautiful. From 1988, they uh, took their victory and it was driven by Jan Lammers, Andy Wallace, and John Chung Priest. And uh, at, at the end of the, at the end of it, they actually had a, a real problem with the with the car, and it was Jan Lammers who just managed to bring it home without really changing gear at all. So that was one of the stories. Now we're looking at one of the Bentleys, the Bentley Three Liter Sport. So I, I mentioned earlier, Alice, that you, you've got to go right back to the beginning, and this was when Bentley was successful at Le Mans in the 1920s. Yes, and another Le Mans winner as well. And we've seen quite a few of the Le Mans winners, and, we, and, and that again, very old, as you said, built in 1924. And they would actually end up winning by just a, it says just a single lap, but uh, that's still quite an achievement for, for a car like this and in so long ago. Yeah, that's right. It was only the second ever uh, Le Mans, in fact, and um, it was the first Bentley win. So it was it worked well for Bentley, didn't it? Getting involved in Le Mans when it only had just begun. Um, so that was 1924. So. 99 years. We're celebrating, obviously, the first Le Mans, which was in 1923, uh, with some of these earlier cars. And they're one of the most uh, beautiful classic shapes of all. That's the Jaguar D-type long nose. Um, this was the, the Curie Boss run car, um, and it won in that uh, the Le Mans beating. Actually, it beat Sterling Moss and Peter Collins in, a, in an Aston Martin that year. And they managed to take victory, but Jaguar then were very successful in that period. Yeah, they certainly were. And it was actually, they took a, a commanding victory and it was a one-two finish for the Scottish team as well, as now we see the Ferrari 250, TR58. Another winner, and uh, from Le Mans, this was uh, Olivier Jean de Bain, Phil Hill, who of course went on to become a Formula One world champion a few years after he took the victory at Le Mans with this Ferrari 250. And I was saying how five laps was impressive. Well, this car won by a staggering 12 laps. So uh, some hugely impressive wins out there. Obviously a long time ago, that was in 1958. This is a three litre V12. So another impressive car and a an, an very, very impressive victory too. Yeah, it was a part of um, the Ferrari's success in, in Le Mans, in fact. They'd already had two victories before this one came along. And then after that, they, they missed out to Aston Martin the year following, but then they managed to win uh, six in a row after that. So it was a, a really tremendous time for Ferrari. They were the dominant force. And I think in many ways, that was what lifted the whole Ferrari manufacturer name in the world of, of sports cars. Obviously, they were known in Formula One, but in road cars and sports cars, uh, I think their success at Le Mans in that period of the 50s and 60s was crucial to building up the whole brand. It was, and that will be one of the victories that they will think back to, especially seeing that they won this year. We've got a, a slightly different looking kind of car on our screens now. Yes, that's right. Built very much for Le Mans. This is the Cadillac uh, Series 61 Le Monstre, they called it, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, we, uh, so it, it wasn't actually successful. It was built for Le Mans, but it wasn't actually particularly successful. Now then, Tom Christensen is heading up the hill then, the, uh, the star of Le Mans for 
so many years, and he's in the Audi R8 this time. This was from 2000, and yet another of his victories. He took this one with Frank Bieler and Emanuele Piro. So we saw Piro a moment ago. Well, they were teammates in this car, and it was uh, when Audi's success really began because they took the victory. It was the the beginning of 13 wins for Audi in 15 races. I mean, it just seems crazy. Absolutely. Very crazy. 3.6 litre V8 turbocharged Tom Christensen behind the wheel, who is such an idol. And you could say a hero of Le Mans with his great success. <laughs> <laughs> just probably just about manages to stamp on the brake, catching up the, the Cadillac. So some great driving there from Tom, because it can be very blind uh, coming yeah. around the top of the hill. So he did a great, great job. Well, unfortunately, the, the Cadillac is the Le Monster, as the French, they, the, it was the French that apparently nicknamed it the, the Monster. Um, it was done by Briggs Cunningham, and, uh, but it's, it's not looking particularly quick going up the hill, one has to say. Now, here's a Bentley that was racing at Le Mans uh, right at the very, very beginning. So this is the three-litre Bentley, and that's lovely to see. And it's also being run in environmentally friendly ways by synthetic fuels, which again is very impressive. And actually 20% of the cars that are going up the hill here this weekend are either running hydrogen, electric or synthetic fuels. So Bentley, of course, showing off here that you can still power a vehicle this old, 1923 yeah. by synthetic fuels. And it's still, as Vettel touched on in his interview, yesterday with ITV that he said that it still sounds the same it, it, it still looks the same it's just all powered in a much better way for, for our environment how wonderful to watch as well to see the car that was actually at that first ever um, Le Mans and it's going up the hill so that's very very enjoyable indeed we're seeing a car now that we're actually going to be seeing later on in the shootout uh, it's the Viper and uh, Florent Moulin has already done some pretty rapid runs with this car so I, I don't know if he's doing like a little practice run but I think he's getting yeah. a sneaky practice run and we'll also see the Ferrari 88 challenge as well so those cars that are in this this batch are pretty lucky to be getting the, the run up the hill so close to the shootout shootout which is coming our way very very soon as you can see they're just testing out the limits. They head through, the Ferrari heads through Malcolm Corner now. Yeah, and we've got this, as you say, this Ferrari, um, all part of what we're going to be watching. And when we do get into the shootout, we're going to see it's such a combination of, of cars. Some won't be super fast, because some we are going to enjoy some of the older ones as well. Um, Andrew Morrow just taking up the 488 challenge for the moment. Uh, we're going to see a real mix, though, of cars that will be heading out for trying to set a, a good time up the hill. Yeah, Ferrari comes across the line. Oh, and we have a car just gone off in our comment by our commentary box. So I think that will be the red flag. I think it might have been the BMW M1, possibly. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, unfortunately. Um, and uh, that is a pity because David Brabham is just coming up in that Jaguar you're looking at. That's the XJR14. He's getting the sign. He'll get the red flag. He's being told to slow down and stop. Um, in the background, in fact, it's right outside our commentary box. He slowed it right, right down and taking it through. So David Brabham, they, they had to fix the, his car because it, it actually failed on the first run up the hill on Thursday. Um, thankfully, that car is still working, but we've got another one in the in the barriers. Yeah, I think that's the, the pro car, the 3.5 litre straight six BMW that has gone off at Malcolm Corner. We'll have a look, as you can see, the, the crowd enjoying themselves in the sunshine. Yeah, that's a great shame, though, isn't it, to have lost a car uh, into the barriers. Let's, uh, let's have another little look here. Yeah, you're right. It is the BMW M1 car. Oh, my goodness. That's a little bit like the incident we saw earlier on over this uh, four-day uh, plan here at Goodwood. Yes. Oh, I got a wheel on the grass yeah. while braking, I think, or in the braking area. And then at that point, you're just hoping that it's going to grip once you come back onto the tarmac. But unfortunately for the BMW, it didn't. Hay bales doing their job. Marshalls as well. Fantastic, as always, straight on the scene. 
just to make sure that everything is all right. And there's another angle there. Hay bales. So we'll have a, I'm expecting a fairly lengthy stoppage here now. Steve Osborne, the driver, I think I'm sure he's OK. Um, th those, those bales work very, very well in protecting drivers. And obviously, there will be damage to the front end of the car as a result of going in like that. But uh, I'm sure Steve will be fine. Um, this, this car, in its history, it was, it was late 1970s, early 1980s, when these cars used to be a support race to Formula One, actually. And they used to, in, it was a championship in a way, but they used to invite five Formula One drivers to join that support race. So you get some Formula One drivers being stars in these BMW M1s, and Lauda won the 79 season, and Nelson Piquet won the 1980 season. I'd quite like to see that now. In, yeah, wouldn't in, it be uh, fun? Current Formula One, yeah, because the Formula One obviously has a variety of uh, support packages, the Porsche, Porsche Carrera Cup, obviously, and the Formula Two and Formula Three championships. So I think that I think we should bring that back in, Ben. I'd love to, but I think nowadays it's a bit <laughs> more difficult with branding. I think in those days it was interesting that quite a lot of F1 teams were quite happy for their drivers to go and drive a BMW. Can you imagine now a Mercedes driver being allowed to drive a BMW or an Alpine driver? You know, it, I think that commercially now it, it's unless we could come up with yeah something completely independent. Of course, that's what you need. <laughs> or we should uh, throw in something from the revival, get them in a pedal car race. Yeah. Like, like they have the children do at, at revival. That would be fun, yes. We'll look forward to that in September, won't we? I'm sure that many of you who are here today will be coming along uh, to the revival as well in September. Oh, that's that's one way to wear your radio. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good way to listen in on everything that's going on. Um, but it's so wonderful to see uh, so many of you enjoying the day, and I'm glad that the weather has actually been good so far, touching wood. Uh, being a commentator, of course, it's always a mistake <laughs> to say something like that because it usually goes wrong. But we've been lucky today already, and uh, I'm glad that it's been a, a very enjoyable day without the, the rain that we had on Friday. And although it's breezy, it's not quite as strong as it was yesterday on that rather sad day that we had to stop everything taking place. And, yeah, it was a quiet day for everybody, keeping out of the way. But today has worked out well, and we've got so much more to look forward to. Let's look back at some of the highlights uh, from this event. And there we are, just looking up at uh, the NASCAR machinery that was heading up the hill, first of all, with its very characteristic noise, and going back to the 1970s with some interesting aerodynamic angles. But uh, the newer cars, we will see actually a couple of these coming up in the shootout. They, they are pretty competitive. I'm not sure they'll be fastest of all. Not a NASCAR, but a Pikes Peak uh, uh, winner. We also saw Jensen Button heading up the hill. And we've seen a mixture of these then, the Le Mans classics, haven't we? Yeah, we've seen some wonderful Le Mans classics. And then back to the NASCARs streaming up the hill. So we've been very, very lucky to have a variety and such a privilege to be here, to, to see these wonderful cars, great array of cars and Le Mans winning cars as well. Yes, that's right. And uh, a shame that it ended off uh, quite like it did with that little problem we've had. But it does give us a chance to catch up with some of the drivers that have made it up to the top of the hill where Ed can catch up with them. And he's talking now to Mike Rockefeller. Mike, I spoke to Jensen about this car and you all just talk about it and have a massive smile on your face. Definitely. Uh, it's, it's a really cool car. It was a unique project uh, to be together with uh, Jensen and Jimmy and Team Hendrick. Uh, you know, uh, going to Le Mans, it was just a huge adventure, uh, bringing that car there and uh, being fast, you know, uh, faster than, than all the GT cars. It was just amazing. The people love the car, um, the sound, the look, the size of it, uh, and definitely the speed. And, um, yeah, I, I think we... We had a great time and we will always look back to it uh, with a lot of joy and, uh, like you said, smile on our faces. It's obviously a NASCAR, but it, it had a lot of work done to it. How hard was it to get as quick as it was? Uh, well, not that hard. I mean, we did the obvious things, right? We tried to reduce a little bit the weight, um, increased slightly the downforce. Uh, power stayed pretty much the same. Uh, the tires are a bit wider, so Goodyear made special tires for Le Mans. So all these things add up, and uh, I would say we, we gained quite some time. We had the goal to be within the GT cars, um, and finally then uh, in quali we were like four seconds quicker, which was amazing. But, you know, the thing is the car was also fun to drive because you could muscle it around. 
the window is quite big so you can drift it in a high speed corner and you really feel it it it's honestly it's a lot of fun to drive i i mean it's a shame we didn't compete against anyone that's for sure the one thing we were all missing a little bit but we were trying to compete against the race against the clock knowing racing drivers you're probably competing against each other as well a little bit yes and uh yeah it was good. that was good as well you're right within the group we were trying to beat each other Mike, thank you so much thank you to hear from Mike now this is the damage ooh, done to the front of that BMW M1 no surprise that there is uh, rather a lot of damage bikes are beginning to make their way over to Goodwood House for celebration but in the meantime uh, of course we've got many world champions on bikes here today but we've also got a four-time world champion from Formula One a little bit earlier on Ed spoke to Sebastian Vettel Sebastian Vettel Great to finally see you up here. I think that's the first time I've ever seen an FW14B do donuts. Uh, maybe, there you go. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to know whether it works and it was, it was fine. So uh, we're getting a bit hot with the temperatures at the end, but it's all good, it was uh, good fun. A lot of people, so it's great. Now tell me, it's all about race without trace. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's just to demonstrate people that uh, you can literally race without leaving a trace. Obviously, um, you know, we use e-fuels, so synth synthetic fuels and uh, yeah, as you can see, it's a really old car, and it wasn't meant to build around. It wasn't built around those fuels, but it works. So uh, you just gotta adjust the ECU a tiny bit, but it works for this car. It works for modern Formula One cars. It works for your road car. So it's just to see, just to show, sorry, that there is an alternative, and I think we, the world is changing. So, so um, you know, we don't have to give up on these things. We can still hold on, but do it in a more responsible way. Now, you've obviously just come up in Mansell's Williams. You've got Senna's McLaren. Yes. Have you got a favorite, or is it a bit like cho choosing between your children? Great. Obviously, uh, being in England, I guess the Red 5 is a bit more iconic, but Senna is a big name, so I'm looking forward to driving his car later on. Now, you obviously love driving these cars. Just finally, you obviously know all about the Goodwood Revival. I'm sure we could maybe persuade you to get in the race seat there. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... I haven't made it to the event yet, but it's exactly my thing. I love old stuff, so I should go there. Cheers, Seb. Cheers, thank you. So lovely to hear from Sebastian Vettel, four-time Formula One world champion. But what we're doing right now is gathering together superstar riders, world champions amongst them, uh, who have got tremendous... Uh, results that they've had in recent years we've also got dry, uh, riders here with tremendous backgrounds as well james hayden is with us once again and james this is this is a special moment isn't it it is indeed i mean if we look there on the right there in the honda that's uh, freddie spencer and mick doohan two of the legends of our sport mick doohan you know five-time consecutive world champion um absolute unbelievable ride i raced him for two years of those i he won from 94 all the way through to 98 I raced him in 95, 96. Incredible rider. Uh, incredible rider and with Honda. a lovely Honda. guy as well. Yeah, super nice Australian and uh, so focused, so fast. Next to him, Fast Freddie Spencer, the only man ever to win both the 500 title and the 250 title in the same year. That was in, in 1985. Uh, he also won the 83 500cc World Championship. And now we're looking at some of the younger riders as well, mixed with the old Randy Mamola there. You can see the American. Four times he finished runner-up in the... Uh, in the, in the uh, 500cc World Championship, so very unlucky not to uh, to take a win for him. Kevin Schwantz, Revin Kevin, absolute legend, the 93 World Champion. So great to see this real mix, a plethora of riders from every generation coming here and, and all celebrating. It must be wonderful. And, and for the current uh, riders who are doing so well, Pekka Bangnaya, for example, the current champion leading at the moment, to meet up with some of these guys that, that, that must be a very special time for him yeah because it's you know these guys yeah they do come to the occasional grand prix but you're right there's yeah there's but a when you're not racing that's you know, right it's a slightly it, different approach isn't very it? very much and it and it, it does you know that you can do it in a very relaxed way you can form relationships with people that you know you never had before and um it's, it's sort of lovely to see this you know this cross sort of polarization as it were and look at these bikes that we're looking at there there we look at the latest KTM MotoGP bike, the Aprilia RSGP bike, 
That's Alex wins his bike, that won the American MotoGP a few weeks ago, um, his RCV. And then we're looking at Fast Freddy's uh, RS. Casey Stoner there, that was his World Championship winning bike. Then you've got Swanson's winning bike. Then you've got Kenny Roberts Jr.'s winning bike. And now you have um, Bastianini's, uh, the bike that he's riding this year uh, in the... Uh, 2023 World Championship and as I say just look at the evolution of those bikes as you come along the way the aerodynamics have evolved the way the engines have evolved electronics have evolved you know absolutely stunning um, they really are just gorgeous bikes and so nice to see it all done outside the house and it's just a really amazing setting Welcome to the Goodwood Balcony. We have something very special for you today. For the first time in a very long time, we have MotoGP in the house. It's the first time there hasn't been a race uh, for a long time, so we can catch up with a plethora of MotoGP heroes, starting with none other than Michael Dewan. We seem to be talking all weekend, Mick. Five-time world champion. You always love it here. What's so special? I think it just brings everyone together, doesn't it? So, sort of old guys like myself to the, to the young generation, new bikes, old bikes, cars, you name it, so even tractors really. But, uh, but then all the display for everything, motorsport and motor related, mobility. So, um, but uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a shame we uh, didn't have the run in we'd like. Yeah, well, yesterday obviously was a little bit of a nightmare. I'll squeeze behind you so as not to go in front and speak to fast Freddie, Freddie Spencer, a, a multiple world champion. But I still think how special it was that you got the two championships in one year. I mean, that just couldn't happen now, but it must have been so difficult back then. Well, it was certainly difficult back then, and everybody wasn't sure if I was maybe crazy to try and, but uh, I had a great support, great team, and, uh, and with HRC and all my crew, and and it was a really a dream of mine, you know, uh, when I started Grand Prix racing in 1980 was maybe to try it and it worked out. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And you were the youngest rider at the time to take the championship. And that lasted until Mark Marquez came along and took that mantle. But you're obviously working in MotoGP now, still enjoying it. Yes. Um, well, you know, talk about the when I became the youngest world champion, I never imagined that it would last 30 years, you know, that, that record. So when Mark come along, I, I told someone he, he certainly could break that, uh, break that record. And we need to move a little bit forward because unfortunately uh, everybody here can't see. You might want to have a big round of applause for the MotoGP heroes that you're about to see. Here is uh, Freddie who we were just talking to. Come forward guys, come forward and, and give a little wave and let's have a chat with Randy. Randy Mamala, uh, well you are, basically this is your second home. Uh, listen, it's great to be here, Susie. Um, I think it's my fifth time, uh, but it's the first time up on the balcony, so at least we get to share it together. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so special to be up here, isn't it? Uh, Valentino Rossi, we all remember those years ago, and he still says it's one of the highlights of his career to be up here, and what a beautiful view, and it really is all about the crowd here, isn't it, at Goodwood? Yeah, I mean, it's a blessing for us to be able to come up here with the motorcycles. Uh, it always seemed that Goodwood was about um, cars, yeah. uh, and... Uh, the Duke of Richmond decided to change that way. And when he came to Valencia at the end of the year of the MotoGP round and, and invited the championship to come because it was the first year that there would be no Grand Prix, I'm glad that Dorna took it up on it because it's uh, been a great weekend so far. Yeah, it really is. Uh, the sun shining down. Let me bring forward Casey Stoner, double world champion. Did it on a Honda and a Ducati. You are greedy, Casey. <laughs> it's fantastic to see you here. And we know you still have a massive passion for the sport. No, it's incredible, and um, to be honest, I think I've been coming here since 2006. Uh, I've missed out some years, of course, due to um, you know schedule problems, but it's an incredible event. From the first moment I came here to see the amount of cars that I grew up watching, uh, being able to share a room with so many of my heroes and, and get to share some stories, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an event unlike any other. Um, there's nothing that even compares to it in the entire world, so it's a privilege to be here. It really is, uh, Casey. It's great to see you here. Thank you very much. I think that's the thing that Casey said there, isn't it? You, you know, you get to hang out with lots of different world champions from all different disciplines. Here's another one. No, here's another one. You're not going anywhere. Kenny Roberts Jr., ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Sorry about the weather yesterday. We don't blame you, Kenny. Uh, 2000 winner on the Suzuki. And how lovely is it to be out here riding a bike again in front of all these people? It's awesome. I 
wasn't aware of what it was initially and didn't Google or all that stuff to, wanted to experience it. Once I got here, I was blown away. You could have asked your dad. He, under, you know, understatement from what he explains it. But no, it's, it's unreal. When I got here, I was super impressed. My wife and kids were able to come and there's not many opportunities left to ride a bike that I rode with a two stroke and get to simulate sort of what we look like in leathers and helmet. Um, so it's important for them to kind of see what we did in whatever form it is. And this event is, uh, I've never seen anything like it. I, I, I hope to come back. It's unbelievable. It's out of this world, isn't it? Can I just have a quick word with one of the young riders? Is that possible? Um, let me grab, uh, we've got here, Augusto Fernandez is here. Brad Bender is here. Come and let everybody have a look. Are you enjoying it? How was, how was your hill climb? Yeah, amazing. It's been an amazing day. Uh, being able to, to share the day also with some of my adults um, and uh, then be able to see uh, this huge heaven with uh, so many fans here. Uh, yeah, lovely day and having so much fun. Absolutely perfect. Brad Bender is here, Kevin Schwantz is there, Alex Gravillo, I can see, and Ralph Fernandez as well. And we've just run out of time. So, ladies and gentlemen, a massive round of applause for, for your two wheeled heroes, MotoGP. <laughs> Well, that was lovely to see and Susie talking to many of the superstars there of uh, MotoGP and the World Championship Grand Prix over the years. Yeah, absolutely amazing. And just Kenny Roberts Jr. there, he, you know, him and his father, the only pairing ever to both win the Premier Class World title. Uh, obviously, we've also got Wayne Gardner here. His son won the Moto2 and he won the, the 500. So there's the, uh, they're the only sort of father and son duo, but only the Kenny Roberts and Kenny Roberts Jr. and Jr. did it in the top class. And what a great an amazing display of of all eras you know coming 70s 80s 90s you know the noughties to now you know covering all the bikes a fantastic display and a, a wonderful to hear from all those great riders yeah lovely to hear from freddie spencer how surprised he was that it took uh, until mark marquez took it became the youngest yeah. champion yeah yeah, I mean, what a talent he was and what a talent Mark Marquez yeah. is as well. I mean, we are really blessed with some superb guys around us. Lovely. Thank you so much, James. And uh, we'll be looking forward to those bikes coming up a bit later. They've changed the pattern a little bit, but we're, we will be seeing them come up later and you'll be able to talk us through seeing that remarkable bunch once again. So we're getting ready for some more fun and games now um, as we're seeing the first cars coming out in the, in the shootout. Now, this is all going to be about how fast they go up the hill, isn't it, Alice? Yeah, this is the, the part of the day that we, we, we love to see cars thrashing up the hill and wanting to set the fastest time overall. Just before we get into that, though, we are going to be uh, celebrating uh, a man who sadly passed away not that long ago and uh, was a, a very much a man who had a great love of cars. We're making a tribute to a great friend, in fact, of Goodwood, the legendary guitarist Jeff Beck. Tragically, he died in January this year. He was a great fan of American Hot Rods, as well as being a brilliant guitarist. And uh, three of his own cars will uh, head up alongside cars owned by fellow rock legends, Billy Gibbons, Eric Clapton, and Nick Mason. And uh, that is part and parcel while we listen to Jeff Beck's rendition of Nesson Dorma.
So the tribute there to Jeff Beck. Now, we are beginning to get ready for what is going to be a, a remarkably fun run of the shootout, uh, getting coming the uh, cars up the hill to see who can set the outright pace here this weekend. And it is always a, a big thing. We're just seeing one or two cars heading up before that all starts um, to make sure that everything is cleared away for uh, the shootouts and we'll see some cars that as i mentioned are not necessarily the fastest of all but as we go through the whole lineup the whole schedule we will see some very very rapid cars. this is actually a fun car to see this is uh, hasn't been seen here at goodwood before this is called a, a prunello ford from 1969. Um, it competed in argentina uh, it's been driven by uh, gaston zeziola and it was in its day, it was driven by Carlos Reutemann, of course, a famous name from uh, Formula One. And it was designed by uh, an Argentinian called Heriberto Pranello, who actually has helped restore it. So it's only been restored in recent years. But the man who designed it in the 1960s has also helped restore it, which is rather lovely. So we're seeing something, as we often do here, that we just haven't really been aware of because it didn't race in this part of the world, but it was raced by a uh, particularly famous driver in Carlos Reutemann. We've got plenty of other uh, machinery going up the hill as well, of course, as the track is being checked out, made ready for the shootout, which will be starting in just a little while. Um, they get a tailwind, Alice. Do you think that's going to help with the speeds today? Look at that. You can see how the flags are flying. Yeah, and it could explain maybe why we've had a few cars go off here at Malcolm Corner now, which is where the BMW on your screen is passing through. Packed grandstands and packed banks either side as well as <laughs> look at that fantastic shot there beautiful yeah. car but the the shootout they obviously didn't have their qualifying yesterday which effectively would have set the order in which the cars were, were coming up so uh, they may use the time practice times we'll have to, to to wait and see but it was your usual suspects that were, were up the front adam smalley included in that as well so these will be split into different batches. They will, they all have their, their, their sort of groups, but uh, just to make it fair, because we have cars ranging from 1907 all the way through to the current year, 2023 as well. So a wide variety of, of cars we will be seeing, Ben, going up the hill. We will indeed. And uh, yes, I'm very much looking forward to that because it is the competitive element of the weekend, which and of course we all love motorsport and therefore seeing a bit of competition as well. I mean, that's not what the Festival of Speed is all about. A lot of Festival of Speed is about displaying cars, of course, and that's what we uh, enjoy. But it's lovely having a competitive element and we can all get a little excited into the into the final stages of that, can't we? Yeah, we certainly can. And we we saw if you were here on Friday or you were checking out the stream, the drivers that were at the top of the hill were keeping a very close eye on the lap times, even though it was just practice, but uh, they're all racing drivers. So they all want to be posting the fastest times. So in totally different conditions, it was very wet conditions on Friday, it's nice and dry at the moment. We see more pictures of you all enjoying, standing out, seeing some fantastic sights and looking out in the sunshine that, that we're very lucky to, to have here today. We are indeed, yes. I'm so pleased that we've got the decent weather. And, and of course, uh, when it's dry, we've always got a chance of going for a record up the hill, but I think that might be a bit of a challenge, bearing in mind uh, the McMurtry, McMurtry last year was just so, so rapid. So I think it's going to be difficult to, to beat that, but we'll see. And at the end of the day, it's all about who's ever fastest on the day that takes the victory. So we'll be looking forward to the shootout coming soon. To hear them start and then you're built different breathing new life into broken Taking matters into your own hands. Assembling big dreams from the small things. Never stopping until you find the right part at the right price. 
That's the eBay way. And I'll tell you, I might get arrested. She's sitting on my new sheet. We still get a mess. I've been in love. Range Rover Velar, designed to intrigue. Nineteen ninety-nine, Ron and the team decided they were going to go for the record. Nick Heidfeld was the test driver. Nick obviously felt very up for it. And I think McLaren, well, I know for sure that a few team principals made it very clear to Nick he needed to do the business. This all-electric Volkswagen IDR kicks up the third on the inside of the second turn. Now onto the park straight and up towards Malcolm. Every time I say it, you look out the window and he's arriving so fast. And by the time he's looked out to see where he is, he's three seconds up. He's going to go fastest. The question is, can he go quicker than yesterday? Can this car get into the forces? That was his aim after yesterday. I think the answer is going to be yes. He's taking even more time out of Jeremy Smith's top time. 36, 37 on the clock. He's up to the timing line. He's going to go below 40. Yes, Whoa. he is. It's a 39, 9, 0. The fastest ever time up the Goodwood Hill. What a So here we go, Max Chilton getting all ready to run the McMurtry up the hill. Can he beat the record? Listen, picking up the power. And away goes Max Chilton. The McMurtry, you're looking on board. This flying machine, it does the first 100 metres in just 3.51 seconds. It is flying as we expected. But will it set an all-new pace? Very close to the grass, but he makes it through. Up to the first sector, he's done 17.3. We're seeing the fastest times of the weekend, maybe the fastest ever from Max Chilton in the McMurtry. 2,000 kilos of downforce, 1,000 
horsepower, and it's all working well. Just coming into the final section. Can he do it? Max Chilton heading for the line. He's coming across the room, just about to come across the line. Oh, yes, it's a fantastic time. 39.08. He has set a new record here at the Festival of Speed. And just look at the congratulations he gets from the crowd. A superb performance. He's done it. A whole new record. The McMurtry showing incredible pace. So we've just been looking back over some of the history of rapid runs up the Festival of Speed Hill Climb, and we're going to be looking at some more today. Whether anyone can get to that, that record, I rather doubt, because that remarkable McMurtry with its huge amount of downforce and huge amount of electrical power, and being quite small, it was perfect up here. It's not having the run uh, this weekend, but we have got some fabulous cars who are going to be uh, out there. So lots to look forward to. So here we've got a here we've got a car that will be doing the run up the hill. Uh, this is the McLaren Solus GT. Uh, they're only making 25 of these now. It did a run up the hill earlier on this weekend, and I'm very glad to say that uh, a little bit like we see in other forms of motorsport now, a helmet camera. Uh, so Rob Bell driving it, very experienced driver in all sorts of ways. So let's just take a look at how this was. I'm going to go quiet, actually, and let's just see how it looked from on board from the helmet cam. Well, there you go. What a fantastic view of the run from Rob Bell in the McLaren Solis GT. And I, I, I really enjoyed just going quiet and, and watching that, listening to it and seeing his perspective as well of going up this, this hill climb. Yeah, there's probably one of my favourite helmet camera shots that we get to see over the weekend. Just see, and actually, we, we actually were talking, weren't we, whilst watching that, how much they actually do have to slow down for that tricky off-camber left camera ca left-hander, sorry, at Malcolm Corner, and how many people actually have made that mistake, and it's quite easy to make a mistake there as well. And uh, lovely shots now of the cars coming back down the hill as we eagerly await the shootout. And actually, I, I would say that that McLaren is probably going to be one of the favourites, especially with Rob Bell behind the wheel, a very, very experienced driver. Well, we're looking forward to this. I mean, this is a, a, a big thing, the, uh, the hill climb shootout, which has been going ever since uh, this all began in 1993. Willie Green was the winner of the very first one back in 1993. Uh, there's a bit of detail in getting it just right. So let's have a little look at what it takes to go up here at the Festival of Speed. At the center of the action here at the Festival of Speed, is the iconic hill climb. Every year, this unassuming stretch of private road within the grounds of Goodwood House is transformed into one of motorsport's most challenging courses. The 1.16 miles climbs a total of 92.7 meters with an average gradient of 4.9%. In 1993, the fastest time was set by Willie Green in a Surtees Cosworth TS20 at 56.3 seconds. But the current record was set in 2022 by Max Chilton in the electric McMurtry Spearling fan car with a breathtaking time of 39.08 seconds. For the drivers, manufacturers and race teams, it's a chance to show off their stunning machinery and expert driving skills. But when the stopwatch comes out on Sunday, only a select few will get the chance to be crowned champion of the hill. The course is narrow, features blind rises and tight corners, plus plenty of hay bales. 
and the close proximity of the crowd and the festival atmosphere makes this climb a spectacle to behold. So a lovely explanation from Karun there about what it takes to go up this hill in an effective way and uh, be as fast as possible. And uh, a few cars already making their way down to the bottom now, and we will see that battle getting underway very, very soon. As I mentioned, it all started in 1993. We've had some top drivers taking victory here in the Festival of Speed Hill Climb. Martin Brundle actually took the... Uh, took the honours back in 1994 and for a while they were allowed to run uh, sort of relatively current Formula One cars uh, to come up the hill. They did actually stop that after a while. Nick Heidfeld was very rapid up here in the McLaren and uh, those shots of him going up here, the car bouncing around, always fun to see. That's probably one of my favourite VTs watching that Nick Heidfeld could say lap or trip up the hill he actually said been bouncing around he almost looks at some points completely out of control and the car's just carrying so quickly up the hill but goodwood has got such a, a rich history as a festival speed and actually its first ever festival speed clashed with with several major events including the 24 hour of le mans but there still was for, for back then 20 5,000 people attended the event and and just look how it's grown now yeah, it, it has grown and developed wonderfully well. Um, we've got um, drivers, as I say, in the mix who have gone so well here in the past, and we're just going to have to see. Uh, Rahel Frey, I believe, is is driving the Iron Dames uh, Porsche 911. And, uh, of course, they've recently been battling at Le Mans. And now we'll see how, how the hill climb goes. Yeah, so a very strong driver line that they have of Rahel Frey, Sarah Bovey, and Michelle Gatting, and they were so close to getting that famous victory had a, a, at Le Mans, had a late brake change, which then ended up putting them out of contention, but a, a great job by the entire Iron Dames team. And, and it's so good to see the team doing so well. They all work in incredibly hard. But you will also see some of the ancient cars here as well. I, I like that. So they may not be ultimately setting the pace, but it's always fun to see them being pushed pretty hard all the way up the hill. And, and I tell you what, they're brave. Some of the, the owners and drivers of those older cars, they will still push hard. It's hard for me to choose which one I'd rather go up in, but the experience that the old cars going casually up the hill, which still look really hard to drive. We're going to have the Mercedes 120 horsepower pre-war 1907 car which Archie Collins will be driving and just watch how much work goes on behind the wheel and then we're going to have you could say current cars going up here the Ferrari 488 challenge I'm not sure which one I'd rather drive actually because they're probably all of them in their own right it's a it's a, it's a hard skill to maneuver up the hill there's the uh, the Jaguar that we saw uh, had to pull over, um, and it's David Brabham who will be behind the wheel of that one, a, a car that he's had success with in the past, and he's going to be doing the shootout today, which is lovely to see. He looks very calm and relaxed as we get ready for these to be heading up the hill in just a few moments' time. That was a car that uh, Ross Braun, of course, the man who has produced so many brilliant machines over the years, he was part of the design of that one as well. And there we're looking at uh, one of the McLaren. So you are going to see some of the Formula One cars that we are celebrating this weekend. And they not the latest, of course. They're, they're not allowed to go out on the, the latest Formula One cars in the, on the shootout these days. But we do have some of the older cars, which is, which is fabulous. And McLaren uh, M26, Michael Lyons, will be driving that here today. That was uh, a car that did have some good success. And uh, Michael himself has had success in motorsport uh, right back in historic Formula Fords. He's been a champion in the past, so he knows what he's doing. And then another mix of cars, of course, some of these celebrating the 75 years of Porsche that we were seeing earlier. This one's definitely one to keep an eye on. Yeah, certainly we've, that's the famous car we've been seeing that everyone enjoys going up the hill. And I would say it's going to be up there for, for setting fastest lap we, we, we did see a rally car top the time practice session in the wet conditions the other day so we'll be interested to keep an eye on that as well just now this is interesting the Merc Mercury's in the lineup which I wasn't expecting necessarily to see so that's, that's a good surprise I would say that's a yeah, pleasant surprise it is it is no it's lovely that it's uh, it's going to be there and Max Chilton maybe he's doing a little display today to sort of celebrate what happened last year 
Um, or will he be going uh, against the clock again? That's that's going to be fun to see. We're holding the record of the last year, 39.08. Apparently, it is just going to be a little display at the end, yes. <laughs> so, oh, that's a shame. Come yeah. on, Max, come on. I think he's very calm and relaxed. But some of these... Um, some of these cars are also very rapid. One of the touring cars here, and okay, Rory Butcher with that. It doesn't have nearly as much time. Now this one, this one is definitely a contender to be the winner. Yeah, and I think just because it's got Jake Hill driving it as well in the Nissan, gonna be hugely impressive. And then we've got, which one is that? Is that gonna be Ash Sutton's I car? I think Ash Sutton's driving it today, yeah. So, so even though Jake Hill and Ash Sutton are often <laughs> side by side, um, they're going to be going up separately this time. Uh, we'll see how that all goes for them and get very different types of machinery as well. So everyone's seeming quite calm down there, patiently waiting. Now, was this the car, Ben? I think I am correct. The Ford Puma that was ultra quick yes. up the hill on, on Friday. Yes, it was absolutely. And um, just to just to give uh, everyone a, a little reminder of the sort of times. So we had on Thursday we had a dry run, and uh, Adam Smalley did a 48.51 seconds ahead of Travis Pastrana, who we saw a moment ago. Um, and then Ott Tanak with that uh, Ford was a 54.3 when it was a bit damp. Adam was second fastest. Thierry Newbell uh, was third, and Travis Pastrana was fourth on that second run. Of course, yesterday they didn't get a run. Normally. They would have had another run yesterday, which would have set our order a little bit in a little bit more detail. But um, yeah, I think it's it's great to see it. And as, as ever, you've also got some of the really ancient cars down here, land speed record holders, like the Thomas Special, the Babs. Um, that will be certainly not beating the the times, but it will be lovely you to never see know, it out maybe, there. Maybe, yeah. maybe, no, maybe. And look at the seat. Nice. That is just incredible. I mean, it doesn't look the the comfiest of rides, so I would definitely be driving it <laughs> gently if that was me going up the hill, but that is just incredible. It is funny, isn't it, when you think no seat belts, no seat, you're just sort of rattling around in there, um, and yet it's actually capable of very high straight line speeds because it was a land speed record uh, car, and they, theirs were very different. You know how small the steering wheel is <laughs> on Formula One cars or any single seat, look how big the steering wheel is there. I know, exactly, and you can see People even taking pictures. Doing their own videos. Doing, yeah, no, and I think it's great to see the, the atmosphere here, Ben, for what is my only, my, believe it or not, my second Festival of Speed. It's just such a friendly atmosphere, and everyone is here just to appreciate motorsports in, in general, but also cars and the development of cars. And, and, and that's what I love about the shootout, no, too, is we can we can appreciate the speed of, of and the, the talent of these drivers yeah, taking gone. the cars up on the hill. But we can also yeah, appreciate yeah, just the the development of cars and, and, and also enjoying the sights of some of the older cars that uh, are probably not you're not going to want to thrash up the hill. Uh, you want to kind of take it steady, but also show off. Yeah, definitely. And uh, for, for all drivers, they will give it, a, give it a go and just see how they can come to the top. And uh, let's hopefully we can keep it all nice and clean as well. They will be trying hard, though, kicking up some dust every now and then. Uh, so we are building up, looking forward to the shootout coming up very soon. You get up every morning and your car is still the same. It ain't the one you want, so it's time to make a change. Choose the one you're feeling with thousands of choice galore. Go ahead and play shot as delivered to your door. Or if that ain't what you're after and you'd rather have a chat, hit up a trusted dealer, speak to my pal Pat. Now you got your new ride, what you gonna do? Cause if you buy with Hey Car, the choice is up to you. Whether you're buying online or through our trusted dealers, feel good your way with Haycar. You're never too young to fall in love with classic cars. It's a passion that lasts a lifetime, and it's a passion we share. Backed by over 75 years of motoring experience, Goodwood Classic Solutions is a unique new way to ensure your pride and joy. 
Goodwood Classic Solutions. It's a passion we share. So here we are, just looking forward to uh, the shootout beginning in just a few moments' time. I hope everybody's had a wonderful time looking around, getting a, a feel for all of the amazing vehicles that we have here this weekend. We're going to see them starting to come up the hill pretty soon. And there are some very rapid modern cars, as well as uh, some older machines as well. And, uh, yeah, we shall see. It looks like uh, the Rimac Nevera could be or well be the first car that's going to be coming up the hill in terms of modern that is very much the case and we shall see how that heads because that is an all-electric sports car and uh, only been built since sort of 2021 very very powerful it's got four electric motors on it actually uh, driving all four wheels well over a thousand horsepower so that's going to be a, a rapid car off the line in particular a little bit like we saw with Max Chilton getting off the line with the McMurtry last year in such amazing style. We're getting ready to go for the shootout now and the first of the cars beginning to line up is one of the most modern machines that could be very, very rapid up here. The Rimac Nevera, this all-electric supercar that uh, is being driven by Miro Suzunche. And let's see what he can do. He's part of the development of this car. He's done a, a huge amount of work on it. And off the line it goes. It's able to do 0 to 60 in 1.7 seconds. It's that kind of machine. And already it is rapid through the first section. 4.49 seconds to the 100 metres. And then up through into the next stage. Yep, so blazing underneath the bridge, now kissing a little bit of glass. You can see that the ABS is kicking in as it throws it into Malcolm Corner, a corner where we see plenty of cars ending up in the hay bales as it charges all the way up the hill now, dabbing on the brakes just to get the front end in, going past the wall there, which can really make you feel quite claustrophobic. As you can see again, ABS kicking in to bring it up now, up, heading up towards the start line to set our first time in the shootout. And I tell you what, this is going to be a pretty good time. So, yeah, 49.32. That is truly competitive. We've seen a, a 48.5 as the fastest of the weekend so far. But we'll just have to see how this goes. Now, this is going to be an interesting run. Yes, yeah, so Rahel Frey now, a very, very talented female driver. Loads of experience as she storms now through the first corner, getting a little bit out of shape. It is quite, and kicking up plenty of dust there, kissing the edge of the grass as she storms up past the pack grandstands. She was fourth in class this year at Le Mans, just missing out on the podium in class. They, they did a fantastic job. They had a bit of poor luck with the car just towards the end, but she is putting it together here. Let's see. Uh, not in the sector, as uh, we saw from the Rimac a moment ago, but not far off, a second down. Yeah, I mean, she's heading up through the speed trap now and she's topped the speed trap compared to the river but I don't think it's quite going to match the pace as she's going to bring it over the line to probably set a time yet into the, the 50 seconds of the 54.2. Yeah, so Rahel Frey goes second fastest for the moment. As uh, now look at this, this is, a, this is an amazing beast. Uh, this is the McLaren that we uh, have seen going up this hill already. The Solus GT, 
And uh, it's actually Marvin Kirchhofer who's in the car this time. So we shall see just how rapid it will be. Again, this is another supercar with a mid-engined 5.2-litre V10. Let's watch it as it goes, ready to get off the line. I think this could well be right up there. It's a central seat cockpit as well, as a racing driver loves. Absolutely, and it launches off the line as we easily look at its first 100 metre, and it's not quite as fast as the Rimac, but it certainly has got the pace to charge up the hill. It's got an eclipse of the fantastic onboard here of Rob Bell taking it up earlier, 829 brake horsepower as it steams past. Our Comedy Brock slams onto the brake through Malcolm Corner, takes a little bit gentle, and you can see how dirty it is there, Ben, kicking up the dust. Yeah, you've got to be so careful with track limitations here. There are no curbs to go on. You can end up, and you can end up in that wall too. We've seen cars hit that flip wall before, but it was beautifully done. Marvin Kirchhofer is actually driving it very, very well, and the sector times are looking good. This is going to be a very rapid time coming Oh, 45.34, that is a very quick time, fastest so far. Yeah, it's not quite the record that we saw last year from Max Chilton of 39 seconds, but I tell you what, Ben, I think that's going to be... That could possibly be the fastest time we may see go up the hill today. It's a very, very competitive time. It is indeed. Right now, you're going to see an older Formula One car. Always lovely to see. Uh, this is the 1976 McLaren Cosworth. And many of you will have heard these Cosworth engines over the years in Formula One. They have a very characteristic sound to them. And Michael Lyons, who's a very successful historic racer, uh, raced Formula Ford and Formula Renault in his times in British GT, so he's done a lot. Let's see what he can do in the McLaren. Yeah, beautiful sound as he takes it through Malcolm Ben, a very experienced racer in this type of machinery. He had many, many wins in historic racing, so knows exactly how to drive these vehicles and has experience of racing them up the hill as well. He sends it through very, very close to the hay bales on the right-hand side there. And the storm's coming up to the line now. It won't be fastest, but it's not a bad time. It's a very good time, and he's only just missed out. 46.89 is the time that he's done it in. So that's just over a second off uh, what we've seen so far from Marvin Kirchhofer. So very, very impressive. Now, Olaf Monte, who is the man behind the organization that creates this car, uh, very experienced, but uh, not perhaps the sort of top, top young drivers. He's somebody who, who has been responsible for building these cars, making them work. And this the, is a special Porsche 911 GT2 RS Club Sport 25. They're only building a few of them and, uh, and a good initial run. Let's see whether it's going to be fully on the pace. Yeah, just a little lock up there. We had a quick look out of our commentary box window heading into Malcolm Bend. And actually, a Porsche was second fastest going up the hill last year with a 45.5. And it's a, not a bad intermediate one. Hey, maybe not quite as fast as the fastest time. A couple of seconds off as he heads up the hill now. We can have a, have a little look as he goes across the line. And it is a 51.4. Yep, so that's not uh, quite the pace that they've been looking for. But I tell you what we've got to watch now is Adam Smalley, because Adam has been a pace setter all weekend. This is the Porsche 911 GT3 Cup. Away goes Adam, the 22-year-old from Lancashire, the karting champion, champion in Genetta's. You know him well. He's a great driver. Yeah, I've had many times where I've sat next to him in a Genetta Junior back in the day, and I was always falling on looking to the to my seat. Last year he set a 47.9 and we saw that on board for him last year storming up the hill as he takes it just a little bit of inside grass there and kisses the outside grass and this is fantastic on board there. The sector time is good. It's right in the mix. 21.6 is not the fastest we've seen but he's definitely on the game here isn't he? Yeah you can see making plenty of corrections going up the hill getting ever so close to those hay bales on either side and he's going to storm across the line at 47.4. 47.4 for Adam Smalley. So it's not quite the fastest as yet. It's still Marvin Kirchhofer who has got that pace currently, having set it just uh, a few times ago. They are all pushing on, trying to get the best that they can possibly get. But it is the McLaren Solus GT, which is currently the fastest. Right, now then, Adrian Formo heading up the hill. We're riding on board, and once again, getting a really interesting view on a on a rally car this time it's not raining today and ford puma 
World Rally Car. Oh, you see how a rally car is always happy going off the track. Now, it was Ott Tanak, of course, who set such a rapid pace in the Ford, but let's see what Adrian Fulmar can do. Yeah, as he screams through, and this was a great lap that uh, this car performed in really, really tricky conditions on the Friday, and you can see the absolute concentration on Adrian's face as he's steaming up the hill. Yeah, into the last section now. Uh, he's done 36.3 into the sector, so he's up there, but I'm not sure it's going to be quite enough because it won't have quite the sheer horsepower. 49.47 seconds. So, yeah, it's good, but not quite enough. No, I think the rally car needed a little bit of rain as we're going to see yet another rally car take up the hill. They were very competitive, obviously, in the tricky conditions that we saw on Friday. So it's the Hyundai i20N Rally 1 hybrid that uh, is going to be heading up the hill now. Yeah, and it's the great driver, Thierry Lobel, who is driving it and sliding it with great style. Let's see how this goes. 500 horsepower in one of these uh, Rally 1 hybrid machines. The World Rally Championship now uses hybrid uh, machines and Hyundai have had uh, eight podiums in the World Rally Championship so far this year. Looking good so far, too. Oh, beautifully done as he kicks up a load of dust, which streams into the Grand Slam. I don't want to be the car that's going out next behind him. You can see a dab on the brakes and get ever so close to the wall as he's heading up to the, to the finish line now, Ben. So he's right up against the bales, too, isn't he? Just uh, rubbing the car alongside them. Let's see what the time as he comes over the line is it. It's not going to be enough. Let's Let's see, across the line he goes, it's 52.7, so he has missed out a little bit. And I have to say, uh, Adrian Formo, uh, the other rally driver, definitely a bit quicker on that run. Now, this, this could be one. Jake Hill is in this wonderful Nissan Skyline, and I can tell you there is a huge amount of power. It is four-wheel drive. The Nissan Skyline GTI, it's a classic racer that had huge success in its early years, and it's been driven by Jake Hill, front runner in the British Touring Cars, puts a wheel on the grass, but he's kept his foot on the throttle. He has kept his foot on the throttle, currently sitting P3 in the British Touring Car Championship. He's had great success in this car, winning the Spa Classic in 2021, and also winning the 2021 Touring Car Cup the shootout with this liveried car. It's a beautiful car, and I wouldn't want to be a passenger next to Jay driving it so effortlessly up the hill. He's very much in the mix, but I'm not sure it's going to be quite enough. The second intermediate has come through at 35.7. He's still trying to get a little more pace, 48.818 uh, as he goes over the line. It's not quite enough. And we still got that pace that was set by Marvin Kirchhofer, 45.34. That is still the target. But I think that's a fantastic effort from Jake Hill, really ragging the campaign. And he really, really does enjoy driving the car. And this is back to now looking at machinery that Jake is usually used to driving, <laughs> a British touring car, as we're going to have Rory Butcher now heading up the hill. Yeah, so Rory Butcher is, as you say, one of Jake's rivals from British touring cars. He's in the Toyota Corolla, uh, his best uh, finish this year. He's had a second place at Snetterton in this car. He's been with uh, Toyota now for the last three years. Uh, he's got to keep it going nice and smooth. But, of course, touring car limitations uh, on the rules, you don't have quite the same power that some of the vehicles we've got out there have. No, you don't, and, and that's why they are put into their, their batches um, so we can make it a little bit fairer for, for those that are trying to compete. As you can see Rory just a dab of the brakes and easing the touring car into the corner. Foot now flat to the floor as he heads it up. As you said, not going to quite match the pace that we currently have seen. But it's not going to be too bad, Ben. Let's have a look. He did 38.4 in the second sector, 51.6. So it goes just over the 50-second mark. So not as quick as Jake, but of course Jake in a much more powerful, even though it's an older touring car uh, that had so much success in the late 80s and early 90s. And I know I was talking to Jake earlier, and they, they've turned up the turbocharger a lot for today's run. Uh, he said it was about 700 horsepower. It might be even more than that. <laughs> uh, but it hasn't been quite enough, because at the moment, it's one of the newest cars uh, the, the, we've got here at Goodwood this weekend. It is the McLaren Solus GT of Marvin Kirchhofer, who has set the pace. And of course, all of those front runners are now watching the screens at the top of the hill, waiting to see how they go and whether they're going to be threatened. Adam Smalley there, who's done a, a great job as well. Uh, always competitive here at the Festival of Speed. 
Yeah, certainly are. They're all eagerly watching on as they await, and so is everybody in the crowd, really enjoying the atmosphere and seeing these wonderful cars be put through their paces, kicking up plenty of, of dust on their way up and setting some very impressive times. I have to say, Marvin Kirchhoffer's pace, uh, setting it at 45.34 is so good. Are we going to see anybody able to beat that? Don't forget, there are still some very rapid drivers to come. Travis Pastrana, of course, who we've seen competitive, not just this weekend, but in the past. Now, that could be exciting to see. And uh, Justin Law, who's been successful here several times. In fact, it looks like it is Travis Pastrana who's coming up to the line now, Alice. So this is always one to watch. One of my favourite cars, the 1983 Subaru GL family Huckster. As, as you'll see, when he stamps on the brakes, almost everything sort of flips up and gives us a wave. And this is going to be an incredible lap. And if we've had the chance to watch any of the stream over the weekend, you will see that he gives it absolutely everything getting up the hill. Here we go. Pastrana's away. The runner-up here in 2021. He was fifth here last year. Let's see what he can do with this fantastic machine. I don't think he'll be doing 360s this time as he did my little display early on today. He's going for the sheer pace. Yeah, chucking up more than just grass there. Load of dirt. Now you watch this as he stamps on the brake and sends it in to Malcolm Gordon, kicking up plenty of dust and nearly losing the rear on the exit. Did you hear the cheer from the crowd? I tell you what, his sector times are looking at one of the fastest in that first sector. The acceleration off the line was truly remarkable. This is a great run from Travis Pastrana. Can he beat that 45.3 second? I know he's not going to quite do it. The clock is ticking away. Over the line he goes, 46.3. Wow, and it's got a round of applause from the crowds around here, and so he should. What an incredible time from Travis Pastrana. He's going to be right up there again. He hasn't still quite managed to beat Marvin Kachoffa, though. Uh, that was so close. And as you say, the style with which he went for it, that was impressive. Like uh, the fans, I know you all loved it, as you could see just how much he was sliding to the very edge, but still keeping it going in the cor correct direction. An absolute pleasure to watch. That really, really was. And actually, it didn't look like it was going to be a good lap time with the amount of sideways he was getting, the dust and dirt that he was kicking up. But then we were glued to the timing screens. And then we saw these, these sectors pop up. And we thought, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. But just lost out in the end there. Well, let's see if anything is going to change. The McLaren Solus GT is the fastest here, and I think that could be very difficult to beat indeed. Even though it wasn't the fastest into the first little 100 metres, it then picked up so much pace in terms of... We, we have a speed trap, and it was very impressive there as well, one of the fastest through the speed traps. Let's go to Ed Foster at the top of the hill. Well, what a fantastic shootout that was. I'm joined by the Duke of Richmond and Michael, you came in third there. Uh, it didn't look like you left much out there. Oh yeah, we were trying. I mean, Travis's lap looked pretty impressive at the end there, but yeah, that's the first time I've had it hop just before the Flint wall. So I knew I was trying there. There's a couple of little bits as always, but yeah, really enjoying hammering that thing up here. It's a fantastic day, isn't it? It was a cracking effort, right? Um, if you follow me, James, we're going to uh, go, go down here. We're going to have to do a quick walk. We'll find Travis. Um, I've never seen such commitment on the hill. You look a bit weak at the knees, Travis. Uh, the last turn, I, I was like, I can do it flat, I can do it flat. It started going sideways. I'm like, this is going to be the biggest off ever on Goodwood Hill. <laughs> no, I tell you what, I just want to thank uh, all the guys at Vermont Sports Car and Subaru. Um, this is so much fun to be here. So many legends. Uh, I know that McLaren uh, Space Shuttle uh, definitely, definitely has it. The McMurtry is phenomenal. But to be up here in an 83 wagon playing Danger Zone when the, <laughs> the eight track, I just, man, this is uh, just an amazing time. So uh, thank you everyone for the opportunity. And we, we gave it all we had. That's, I think, the fastest I've gone up the hill, but uh, there's not much left. <laughs> it was an amazing time. Well done. Thank you. Right, James, we'll go back up here. Um, and Marvin. Congratulations, that was an absolutely fantastic climb. 45.34, you must be delighted. I'm, I'm super delighted, I'm actually quite speechless because I did not expect that. Um, as I said, it's my first time here in Goodwood. Uh, I have to say, first of all, amazing run from, um, from Travis Pastrana. I was like, 
It was just lovely to watch. Like the car control he has, it's uh, yeah, absolutely hey, stunning. Congratulations! But thank you what so much. Result. Thank you so much. I, I'm speechless. Wonderful like, drive. Thank you so much. What was yeah. Fabulous car. Well done. Thank you. Well, well done. Well that's done. Back to the guys in the factory. They've built that car. I had the honor to drive it, and yeah, sure, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was an, um, a fantastic effort. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so so much. So Marvin has been recognized as the winner of the Festival of Speed Hill Climb. And the young German racer who's had success in German Formula 3 and Formula Masters in the past now drives for McLaren and he's won ahead of Travis Pastrana who probably put on the most dramatic display of all. Michael Lyons was third, Adam Smalley fourth ahead of Jake Hill. Uh, the Rimac Nevera was in sixth place ahead of the, the rally car, the Ford Puma. And then we had the Porsche Toyota and Hyundai uh, finishing in 10th place. But it was all about Marvin Kirchhofer. He did a stunning job. Yeah, an absolutely incredible lap. Like they said there, everyone was glued to the screen. And we've got more cars now which are going to continue their batch of shootout. We've got the Ferrari 488 Challenge there little stream up the hill very popular race car this is yeah let's see how this goes it's going to be pretty rapid but i think uh, we just got to calm down a little bit and see how quickly these cars are going to be going right now andrew morrow this is in the ferrari 488 and the 488 in various versions has had a lot of success it won the spa 24 hours a couple of years ago and they have this uh, challenge trophy now uh, where you get ferrari drivers all competing against each other in similar cars of one make series let's see how times are going pretty good uh, stint 22.6 seconds so he's actually doing a good job isn't he? yeah very good job and you can see the little dab on the brakes there you see how the car just pitches into the final technically the final braking zone it should be at least for this car maybe not so much if you're travis in his subaru as it steams now across the line so the time that he has set is a 49.88 anyone who gets under 50 seconds is very very impressive indeed well now here's a very different kind of beast of course uh, about to come up the hill and uh, this is uh, that's what I love about seeing with all of this. You get totally different machinery from the modern era to the old era as well. And you're going to see the Rolls-Royce, the electric Rolls-Royce, heading up the hill, and we'll see what kind of time it can do. Quite quiet, of course, in terms of power. Yeah, the Spectra just kicking up some dust there. And each of their these cars are sort of in their individual classes as we mentioned earlier, so we'll see the Spectre now come into Malcolm Bend. You can see how much it dives going in and it screams, the wheels screeching as it kicks up the dust and continues on up the hill then. does indeed, and uh, the times are looking quite impressive. The speeds, obviously, in a big car like this, that's the challenge in a way. You don't have much space to, to use a, a kind of racing line very much. You've just got to squeeze it between all those bales, haven't you? Yeah, you certainly have. And the reason why these cars are in separate batches is just to make sure it's a level playing field for all as it comes across the line and, and a respectable time there from, from Joseph with a 56.6. Yeah, that is good indeed. And uh, as you say, every little group will have its own battle so we can still enjoy the competitiveness of all of this. We'll see some of the older cars from the 1920s and 30s, as well as the most recent super touring cars like this Ferrari Roma with Edward Norfolk at the wheel, Grand Touring 2 plus 2 coupe, front engined, memories of the, uh, the 250 GTO in the way that it's been designed, but absolutely a, a truly modern machine here. Yeah, and as you can just see the hazard lights flickering on there, just meaning the ABS really is kicking in and they, William is absolutely pushing the limit to this Ferrari Roma as it's coming up across the line now. We'll have a little look at what time it's going to do. Might It's going to be close to the Bentley, is it? It is a 56.3, so ever so slightly slower. Yeah, that's right. So not quite there, but uh, as you say, only a tiny difference. So now, as I said, you've got some of the, the, the group, the pre-war racers group, this is. So uh, obviously they're in their own competition. They're not going to be competing in quite the same way as the, the cars that we saw 
uh, going up the hill just a little while ago. But nonetheless, you're going to see some great fun in terms of driving style. When you look at the narrowness of the tyres that they're having to run on as well, all from the era, it's a very different story. Yeah, and this is, if you haven't had a chance to come to the members' meet, or you get to go to the Revival as well, you get to see these cars actually racing side by side on track, and actually they produce some pretty incredible racing and hugely competitive racing as well. So it's great to see them going up the hill. And this car, of course, is powered by synthetic fuel and it just sounds just as good as well. It does, it's lovely to see. It raced at the very first Le Mans in 1923. It finished fourth overall with fastest lap. Well, it hasn't got fastest high hill climb today, 90.97, uh, but nonetheless, they've done a great job with it. Yeah, they certainly have, as now we can see. This is actually a rapid one to keep an eye on. This is the uh, Hyundai Elantra NTCR and Mikel Ascona, who's a, a very rapid driver. Yeah, very quick, you see, kicking up plenty of dust. That does seem to be the fastest line again. Very close to the Abel there. Now, this is David Brabham behind the wheel of the Jaguar. Someone who has very experience of going up the hill here and a successful racer as well there. Oh, yes, he's won Le Mans. He's, he's had GT victories at Le Mans with Aston Martin. He's won the Spa 24-hour race. He was Japanese GT champion way back in the 1960s. He can drive anything. David Brabham, and uh, so yeah, he's doing a pretty good set so far. Yeah, he certainly is, and actually is pretty, looking pretty handy out of our commentary box window as he gets ever so close to the hay bales there. That de definitely, how close can you get? Not much more from David Brabham there, and it's just a beautiful car, and it's great to see these type of cars with their famous liveries that are still shining upon these cars. He goes across the finish line now and records a 53.2. Yeah, 53.2, so just outside the 50-second mark, which is where you've got to try and just get below, if at all possible. But not, lovely to see that very classic Jaguar hitting out and going on to the circuit. So, um, Aaron Morgan is next out in a, a McLaren, so this is a more modern version. It's not going to think, be quite as rapid as the other McLaren that we saw the pace on, but, of course, this is in a different class because that other one in the absolute top class. And this is a car that is designed for, for racing, but very much built around a road car. Yeah, it is, and they've really tried to make sure that they stick to that as it slows down, goes through nice and gently through Malcolm Corner and the famous Brit livery on there as well. Now steams up the hill, crowd eagerly watching on, and it's been a fantastic show so far for, for this crowd today. It has, and uh, of course we're going to see a lot more of McLarens coming up the hill as we celebrate uh, with them. 60 years since, since the company was created by Bruce McLaren, who created it as a, a racing company, but in more recent years it is both uh, a very important racing company, but also producing wonderful road cars and supercars and track cars. And so not quite uh, up there, but uh, indeed within the group that will be interesting we'll get the final sort of group performance uh, figures right at the end and we can try and see who's where so here's a, another mclaren but uh, this is a formula one car the m29 2 this wasn't the best of the mclarens they ever produced and it was at a time uh, it does 55 7 6 that's still a very good time um, and it's lovely to see that those very familiar colors yeah it is and i just love that it's just such an incredible living and now we hear we see Garrett Owen going up in what you call the, the Babs car. I gather the, uh, the timing won't necessarily work on this one because the, the start was slightly different. It may have been that he had to do a rolling start with a vehicle like that, quite possibly. And uh, there's an Oflascona. That's, that's rather lovely to see as well. This is a, another classic rally car. We've got a, a few of those here. The Opel Ascona 400, uh, a car that won the World Rally Championship in 1982 with Walter Roll, who was uh, one of the great drivers. Ari Vartman won the Safari in one of these as well. And uh, Paul Gunniston, who owns and is driving the car up the hill. I think for us, and you see a car like this, it's not so much about the, the, the sheer pace, but how lovely it is to see one of these rear-wheel drive cars that sort of followed in the footsteps of the Ford Escorts. No, it's beautiful. And a lot of these cars have such an incredible history behind them. And as you can see, the lean going through Malcolm Corner there as it comes up the hill. A beautiful opal. And, and, and again, there's so much history. And that's what I like about Goodwood is really get up close and personal to these cars and speak to the team and the drivers that, that even have had the chance to drive the cars and really dive into the history. 
Yes, they have. And uh, I think this is a lovely opportunity for Paul to take it over the line once again. Uh, in just a moment, we shall see him. Let's see what he's done uh, across. It's not going to be quite as competitive as some of the fastest cars, but it's still a good effort. 62. 0.86 and the uh, Mark 1 Jaguar is out there at the moment at Grant Williams. Ooh. He's sliding past our commentary position, so we've just had a bit of a, a screech in our ears. But it's oh, there it is, all going well. And suddenly the wheels came off it the other day. Uh, thankfully, nobody got hurt, and uh, he's now having a, a, another run up that, the hill climb. Yeah, sorry about the all there, Ben, because he was fully sideways going through Malkin Corner, and I thought, no, keep it out of the hay bales and great car control there. Now we see something totally different. We see uh, one of the NASCAR Chevrolet Camaro going out and at the roar as it comes blasting under the bridge and heading up towards our commentary box. Yeah, the very experienced Ed Berrier, who's uh, 60 in his early 60s now, um, and he's come here to Goodwood on a number of occasions. In the This time he's using the Chevy Camaro, not a car that he has competed in, but a, a car that uh, was on to the NASCAR scene in 2022, uh, the Gen 7 Cup, so that was sort of a new time where they, they brought in some changes to NASCAR. Uh, instead of having four or five wheel nuts, they've gone to one wheel nut now on NASCAR, a bit like Formula One, that, uh, that was a bit of a change. Uh, they have rear cameras as well. Joey Logano won the first race, um, and uh, there was a bit of a pre-season clash to all of that, but that was a nice run by Ed Berrier. Uh, lovely to see one of the many NASCARs that we've got coming up the hill. Yeah, we've got the lovely McLaren Cosworth M23 now, three litre V8 screaming up the hill and such a beautiful sight. And again, as I mentioned earlier, such great livery as it sets the time of 54.63. That's impressive, isn't it? That is a good time, 54.6. Uh, just having a little look back um, to some of those other times, but uh, yeah, that is that is certainly a, a fast one. And um, we've got some more Formula One cars. We've got a couple of Benettons that are doing this one as well. And uh, we're looking at Lorena McLaughlin in the Benetton B192. That was an interesting year, of course, for Michael Schumacher when he was driving uh, for Benetton and getting his first opportunity to take a victory on his way, of course, to becoming such a superstar of Formula One. Lorena's a, a very regular competitor here at the Festival of Speed. Yes, yeah, she is, and she does great jobs with keeping this car under control. You can see the sparks flashing up as she's full chat now across the finish line, stamping on the brakes. And I know that she really, really enjoys driving this car. It's her pride and joy. It's a wonderful opportunity, isn't it? And it must be something that you kind of aim for all year to make sure the car's in good shape for an event like this, which is so good to see. Um, now, the Porsche just coming over the line. So Max Moritz, who has just set a time of 55.59 in one of our historic Porsches. And we've got several of those uh, coming around now. Alex Ames is now heading up the hill with uh, one of the later cars that we've seen so much success over the years with their Le Mans history. And these are always very popular. Yeah, they are. And lovely, fa another famous livery. It's nice to see that many of these cars really try and keep their, their original livery. As we see now, Harvey Stanley behind the wheel of the Jaguar there goes through Malcolm Ben. Yeah, this is the Tejero Jaguar, uh, a sort of modified version of what was a D-type. Um, in fact, at Goodwood, this had some interesting history. Uh, many, many years ago, um, in 1959, at the, uh, the TT race, Marston Gregory uh, that felt something go wrong with the car and leapt out before it actually hit something. It was well, rebuilt. That was, that was good, that was good uh, timing, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. In those days, drivers used to be able to do that, didn't they? They used to be able to leap out of cars. They had no seatbelts, of course, and sometimes it was the safer thing to do. Uh, 59.65, very, very uh, good run up there in the Tejero Jaguar from 1959. Yeah, and steaming up not far behind soon will shortly be the Lola. There it is on your screen, the Lola T160. The 1968 8.4 litre V8. Uh, yeah, and Marcus Black, and listen to that sound. This is a Can-Am car, which means American engines, and it has that characteristic sound. Yeah, it certainly does, With again, with another famous livery on board, and it was fourth in Mid-Ohio back in the 1970 as it steams past our commentary box and the crowd get 
as some of them covering their ears, I can see out of our company box window just from the sheer sound of this Lola. Yeah, we've got plenty of the Can-Am cars here this weekend, and uh, Lola was a very successful manufacturer of all sorts of cars at different levels. The Formula One as well was all part of that too. Uh, let's just see what Marcus Black manages to do in this 1968 car. It's one of the earlier of the Can-Am car, 60.2 seconds, respectable indeed and uh, another run has been done, 8.3 litres. Now, here we go, we're back with the Hyundai Ioniq 5N, and this, uh, this is quite a very modern machine, so you're going to the very latest type of machine where it's all electric, but they've built it to give driver a real feel for what it's like going at speed. Yeah, exactly. The N standing for Nürburgring as well. We got a great demonstration earlier on in the weekend of this car steaming out. The first time we're seeing it here as it storms uphill very quietly, jumping on the brace. ABS is kicking in, getting ever so close to, to the bales there on the left hand side. And it's going to come up now to go across the finish line. Won't be the fastest time we're going to see today, but also a fairly respectable time. I must say, of a yeah. 54.2. That is pretty respectable, as you say. I mean, under 50 is the real top level, but that is that is a good time. Oh, I love this, the Mini. Nick Swift in the Mini. Uh, Nick is a um, multiple Mini racer. His dad, he, he grew up with Minis in his life. He, uh, I know uh, he has photographs of him as a kid sitting on the point of a car that was just like this, but uh, he's, he's had it rebuilt. Brilliant. He rebuilds cars now and comes up with great engines. Isn't it lovely? It is brilliant, wonderful. 1.3 litre, four-cylinder engine. And actually, these Minis are quite a highlight, I would say, of the, of the revival and the, the members meet, and they often quite take it to their, their rivals. So we'll see Nick, and oh, I just love, what a shot this is, Ben, of the, the Mini coming up now, actually moving at a pretty swift pace, getting sideways as Nick does through Balkan Corner and heading up the hill now. Nick's done a lot of winning at Goodwood, uh, whether it's up here, um, he's certainly done it at the circuit many, many times, many events that have been raced around the circuit. He's been um, impressed with uh, the John Whitmore Trophy in 2021, the Revival, for example, he won that. Uh, clearly, he doesn't have the pace in the Mini to be the fastest up the hill climb. That's a bit of a different story, but it's still a great fun thing. 59.17 seconds, the pace that he sets. Yeah, very impressive, really, pace for the little Mini, which was built in 1965, so good job. Now, here we go, Ben. We've Fred Shepard, yeah. Fred, Fred's, uh, he loves coming to Goodwood as well. Part of the family that have been coming to Goodwood for many years. And he's in the 5-litre V8 Ford Mustang Boss 302 from 1970. And this were the sort of cars, it wasn't a NASCAR, this is a, a sort of car that raced in British, tour, uh, well, it wasn't called British Touring Cars then, but British Saloon Car Championship. And they were winning many, many races. Sometimes they were championship because they, they were class victories and sometimes you could win a different class. It's lovely to see. Yeah, it is, and the, just the sound of that engine. Fred, full pedal to the metal as he steams up, maybe a slight lift at the top of the hill there as he brings it now across the line to set 59.07. Yeah, that's that's interesting, actually, because uh, Mike Whitaker had just gone up just ahead of him in the Ford Capri, and Mike was actually a fraction faster. <laughs> it's quite interesting that, uh, uh, that those cars from the 1970s, the Capri was a little bit younger, not hugely different. Lovely to see Benoit Trulouille in the Ford Escort Cosworth. Benoit Trulouille loves this uh, his festival of speed. He's always rapid here. And 52.4. That's a good time. That's a very, very good time, isn't it? We all know the Escort Cosworth's massively powerful and uh, he's a great driver, tremendously talented, with a huge heritage of top-level motorsport. Now, we see the Sunbeam <laughs> Taurus Trophy, so some slightly different, and this is what I love about the shootout. We can go from, you could go for your Ford Escort, your Mustang, and now we're on to the Sunbeam Taurus Trophy. Won't be setting, you could say, purple sectors, but still not easy to drive one of these if, you, if you're trying just to even keep it on the black stuff. Yeah, that's right. And uh, remember, when these were raced, uh, when they were originally out in the 1920s, no crash helmets were worn then, of course. It, we always think about, you know, the safety side, very no different story. No seat either. No, and they, well, they still don't have seat belts, but they do have to wear the crash helmets, don't they? <laughs> They're still allowed not to wear seat belts, but uh, it does seem a bit strange. This, this Sunbeam uh, tourist trophy car actually was quite undersized in terms of its engine size and yet had a lot of success, so it started to teach Manufacturers, you didn't always need to put aero engines in. It's only a, a three and a 3.3 litre engine. 
87.66 seconds, very respectable. And uh, I think that was a fun run once again for Nicholas Pellet. Yeah, and not far behind will be Archie Collins. And if any of you were at the members meeting, you would have seen him racing around and actually pretty competitive. As I said, very competitive racing between these old cars. Yeah, definitely. There were three of these entered in the French Grand Prix in 1907. Yeah, that's how old it is, 1907. Uh, they didn't actually win that Grand Prix. They did the following year, but uh, their best finish was 10th. They had, I think, quite a few different issues. It's lovely to see the youngster, though, Archie Collins, getting into doing some runs up the hill in, in a car like this. It sounds wonderful. And he's, he's got some great confidence, I think, now. We're going to have to compare, because his dad, Ben, is due. Uh, we'll have to compare their, their times. Yeah, no, and it's lovely to see him going up. He's almost got someone like you know, Almost the passenger is acting a bit like a, a sidecar driver or, or, or rider as such, really leaning to try and help Archie manoeuvre this Mercedes up the hill. Only 17 years old, and here he is, about to cross the line uh, to put in another wonderful display. And that was great stuff from Archie. 79.9 seconds. Uh, of course, uh, I think that's actually a good effort with some of the other pre-war cars that we've seen, not quite as rapid as that. Uh, now, there's Ben Collings. So, Ben, actually, I thought he was going to be in the, the other Mercedes, but no, he's in the Alfa Romeo P3. So this is likely to be faster because it was uh, some years later and it was incredibly successful at its time, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah so 1934, 3.2 litre straight eight supercharged. And it was great to see these two racing each other back at the members' meeting. So, yeah, well, I'm sure they won't be bothered about times, but deep down, maybe they will say, well, hang on, Dad, I went slightly faster than you up the hill, but we shall see. Well, let's see. Your dad's got the faster car, I would have to say. Well, there we go. That's Archie's excuse straight away. <laughs> so we shall see. Um, uh, but I think, yeah, I mean, Ben is always... Uh, I mean, he's part of the family at Goodwood, so uh, he knows how to go up this hill very, very effectively indeed. And we shall see when he comes over the line. And as I say, this Alfa Romeo that was so successful in the 1930s in Grand Prix, they had multiple wins in 1932, 1933, and even more. I believe in 1934, they won something like 15 big events. Amazing. 67.93, yep. So he has won the, the family battle there, Alice. <laughs> Oh, next time, Archie, next time. Just get him if you're going to be racing him at uh, Revival in September. Quite right, yeah. So next up, uh, Pat Blakeney Edwards going up the hill and uh, some of the other older cars. This is the Sunbeam V12 Tiger. So this was a car that was kind of created for land speed records, but then also for racing. That was a, a time when you might do both, a bit of racing and records in a straight line. And uh, Henry Seagrave, who was a famous land speed record uh, driver, he, he drove this. That's a good time. Pat Blakeney Edwards is always rapid here. Yeah, certainly is. And we've got uh, another Julian Majoub as well. If anyone saw that great race at the members' yeah. meeting that uh, just missing out on the whim, just because he quite didn't have the straight line speed to his rivals. But there we can see on screen. He's, um, al he's always spectacular here. Yes, he certainly is. He's always making plenty of corrections behind the wheel. So I'm actually quite intrigued to see what sort of time he sets here. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the older cars, this could be one of the faster times. Let's just see. 65.4, that's quicker than Pat Blakeney Edwards just did. I think, yeah, Ben Collins did 67. So of those 1930s cars there, I think, as you say, that he may well win that class. Yeah, and now we're, we're having a little look at the, the record holder. And it was done by this man, Max Chilton. And look at the speed as it launches off the line. <laughs> yeah, it is astonishing seeing that pace that it has off the line. Uh, and the, the, that smoke that you're getting out the back, don't worry, that's not exhaust smoke. That is air that is being sucked up from underneath and thrown out of the fan at the back, isn't it? Yeah, and you know that Max Chilton said that he was going to be taking it slowly up the hill. Yeah. I think that might have been somewhat a lot. It really looks like he is giving it absolutely everything as he's steaming up the hill. So, yeah, that's really interesting that he's going at a good pace up the hill here. Uh, Max Chill took a new record, and uh, he is about to come over the line. And uh, you notice the clock has just come off our screens, and as I'm looking at our timing screen, it's saying demo, demo. It's not to be timed. Oh. So it was a demo. 
it doesn't it doesn't count as a as a timed uh, performance so i wonder if he was timing it himself or not because he would be quite intrigued wouldn't yeah he? But... i'm sure he actually when we had the clock on the screen i was thinking hang on a second it looks pretty pretty fast but uh this is just a demo just to show what the car can do I mean, we already knew what it can do. And I think, actually, if he was to go up the hill again, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that record would be would be beaten. So uh, maybe we'll have to say to Max, come on, try and put it in to do do another record next year. It's lovely to see it again, though, because they're stunning what he did last year. And, and this car itself and they're building uh, you know, for customers some of these special McMurtrys. Uh, they, that, it's an electric car that really does excite you, and, and we've seen what it's done in the past, and he's just put it on a little demonstration for us once again. Well, I do hope you've been enjoying the shootout. We can uh, take a little look back at some of the highlights of some of those brilliant performances in such a variety of cars, uh, some great drivers at all different levels, whether it's rallying or racing, um, and cars that have four-wheel drive, two-wheel drive, electric motors, high power low power some formula one cars from the past and there a glimpse of the car that actually set the outright pace yeah and we said didn't we at the start that we thought that one of that was going to be one of the cars setting the pace and we got that correct we see michael Lyons actually setting a very very impressive lap time for personally i think in in that old beautiful mclaren yeah adam smolly was very quick as ever and uh right up there in the battle for the top in the order. I'd love to see him one day in another car here. I mean, he's a Porsche driver very much, but he need put him in a supercar here, and I think he could be a major contender for the fastest. We got, saw the rally cars. They were exciting to watch. They didn't have quite the advantage they had in the wet, though, the other day. No, they didn't. And it'd be interesting if it was wet, but uh, we see Jake Hill as well going up the hill. And again, a very impressive time from him. Yes, it was. No doubt about it, Jake Hill. One day, I think he could well end up winning this. We shall see. But Rory Butcher, his rival in touring cars, he was having fun too. And some big smiles on Hill. And I love this run from Travis Pastrana. I have to say, <laughs> that was one of my favourites. Do you know what? Maybe if he wasn't so sideways, he might have actually set the fastest outright time. He just seemed to be always sideways going up the hill. Well, it was great to watch Travis there. Um, but it was also fun to see Max Chilton do that final demo. And he's up at the top talking to Ed Foster. Max, after setting that record time last year, it's fantastic to see you both back here this year doing a demonstration. But your eyes must have flashed, your, your life must have flashed before your eyes as you went into Malcolm there. Yeah, that was um, obviously the first dry run of the weekend. We're not here for the time trial, but um, as we're now turned this into an actual production car and a track car that people can buy, we wanted to show what it can do. Um, and the, the new car that we're actually saying is quicker than that. And that was blisteringly fast. I have a feeling that was probably faster than last year, but it was a joy. Um, I love putting on the, sh you know, the, the, the show for the crowd. You can see the, the crowd sort of gasping and then you get their round of applause at the end. So it's an honor to be back here. I did have a bit of a lock up, so I was definitely um, sort of on the, on, the, on the limit of the thing, but hopefully everyone can see what this new technology can do. Um, and it's a great to be a part of a British brand, McMurtry. We chatted last year and you said that you, you've led the Indy 500 and this was more nerve wracking. Honestly, my heart rate right now is probably come down to about 160. But when I was coming up that hill, it was buzzing. Um, it's just an amazing place. I love it. It's, I'm passionate about it. Last year was very nerve wracking. That run was probably more nerve wracking because we had no practice. So when you just get sent out there, you'd have no idea if there's mud or oil across the track. But um, it, was, it was great and I uh, loved every minute of it. And so this afternoon, I think we've got one more run. Um, I'll probably turn the traction control off this time and some, see how much smoke this thing can create because it's got a lot of power, a thousand horsepower, straight to the rear wheels creates a lot of smoke. Well, we can't wait. Cheers, Max. Thank you so much. In my Tesla, might get arrested. She's sitting in my new sheet. We still get a messy. I've been in love.
less bump, a little less fight, a little more spark. Close your mouth and open up your heart and baby satisfy. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Welcome to Future Lab in the heart of the Festival of Speed and I'm joined by a national treasure astronaut Tim Peake. Now Tim, I've actually brought you to a tiny exhibition in the corner of the Future Lab but it makes a really big impact seeing these infrared galaxy images and I thought that might stimulate some memories for you of your time being an astronaut if you could share with us exactly what it's like to be in space. Absolutely, yeah, we, we don't quite get the same view as the James Webb Space Telescope, but very different, but it's very beautiful. From the space station, you look out the cupola window, just down on Earth. Yeah. It's magnificent. Yeah. And Earth changes so much by day and by night as well. Um, but it's an amazing feeling, both floating in weightlessness and being able to look down on the planet like that. Yeah, I mean, it sounds incredible. If you could describe that feeling of zero gravity, I mean, there's only a handful of you that have been in space and experienced that. We can only imagine that weightlessness must take a toll on your body um, well it, it kind of takes a toll on your body without you realizing mm. and it's when you come back down into a gravity environment that's when you need to be really fit and healthy for it so we exercise for about an hour and a half every day on the space station to try and stop our body from adapting too much to weightlessness right. but it's a huge amount of fun as well I mean you're floating <laughs> around you can do things that you simply can't do down here on earth so yeah on the one hand it's great fun but on the other hand it is changing your body mm -hmm. and the nation very much enjoyed watching you when you're on the internet National Space Station and it engaged so many children as well across the country and we know you're a big ambassador for STEM education so just tell us a bit more about the work you do in encouraging the younger generation to engage with STEM subjects. Well I think it's important on so many levels that we do encourage STEM subjects I mean we need people who are going to solve problems in the future we need our younger generations to do that mm -hmm. and so we need to educate them in science and technology and engineering um, they are going to be the, the, the solution solutions for some of the things that we're really struggling with now, problems with climate for example, trying to develop new energy, clean energy and so investing in our children today is investing in the future, that's why I think STEM and places like here, the Future Lab are so important. Yeah and we can see it's a really family friendly event here. How important is it to showcase STEM like it's doing in the Future Lab at an event like the Festival of Speed? I think it's really important because when you see it here, you're able to relate. Sometimes when you do stuff in the classroom, sometimes it's a bit difficult to think, well, why am I studying physics or chemistry or, or maths? And then you suddenly see something like this and think, ah, right, you know, this is what it leads to. It can lead to virtual reality simulated worlds where we can go places and train and experience things, um, you know, or different. Uh, I've just been looking at some uh, sails that are being developed for our oil tankers that can really help to reduce the carbon impact of the shipping industry and I think when you see this you think yes it sparks imagination and creation creativity and desire uh, and so I think that's why it's so important yeah well it's brilliant to have you here at the festival of speed thank you so much for joining us and it was wonderful to get your insight on it all thank you great talking to you thank you there from Tim Peake and here we are at the Goodwood Festival of Speed on Sunday shootout and my word David what a shootout it was I think I heard you say you were watching through your fingers so was I that McLaren Solos with Marcin, Marvin Kirchhofer at the wheel just sublime wasn't it unbelievable I mean an unbelievable car brand new fresh out of the box but also he's never been here before and you know I just think that's a real testament to how good his drive was and the car it's not only you know take the brave pills for this track <laughs> but you have to be it's a very technical track so uh, you know it's it's an incredible result uh, but you know 
that plus Travis, I mean, oh. if you got extra points for pleasing the crowd, then, you know, he's up there as well. And it's amazing the difference, uh, certainly aesthetically, between those two cars as well. You had the sort of F1 almost road car in the McLaren Solace, and then the sort of 1983 Subaru. It, it was just so different, and that's part of the magic of Goodwood, of the Festival of Speed. And indeed, Travis Pastrana, of the way that he could just send it up that hill, and he knows how to please a crowd, doesn't he? Unbelievable. And also the other cars, you know, we had old F1 cars there. We had Jake Hill in a very old Nissan Skyline. Just absolutely nothing. Did, never going to leave anything left. And then Adam Smalley, he was one of my tips. Got very close in the Porsche as well. So just an amazing array of cars. And, and they all go so close at the end. But, you know, full credit to Marvin in the, uh, in the McLaren. Yeah, Marvin definitely uh, read the script, didn't he? 60 years of McLaren, I'll tell you what, I'll take the brand new McLaren Solace straight out the box, straight up the hill, and win it. Why not? Absolutely, and it just shows you, we're in front of a McLaren Extreme E car, and it's the breadth of the products they make now, obviously known in the past for racing, but road cars now, and Solace sits somewhere in between. It's made by the road car division, but it's a track-only focus, 25 units, very purposeful car, and that cockpit to get in, it's really dramatic looking as well. Oh yeah, it is absolutely stunning, and as you say, yeah, the McLaren Extreme E car is just behind here, of course, um, Emma Gilmore and Tanner Faust at the wheel of that one, and across the Extreme E calendar, they entered for the first time last year, Emma Gilmore therefore becoming the first female driver in McLaren's history. Pretty amazing, and she's been about today as well. Absolutely. I mean, McLaren got so much to celebrate. We were talking to Oscar Piastri, Gilles de Ferran earlier on, and, you know, it's a great time to be at McLaren, especially after the British Grand Prix last weekend. Yeah, it's really interesting, that, isn't it? Because I think in Formula One, what we're seeing at the moment is a battle not for P1. Red Bull have got that sewn up, let's be honest, but a battle for P2. And weekend in, weekend out, we are seeing a number of different teams take that mantle between Aston Martin initially, then a bit of Mercedes in tracks like Barcelona. And now McLaren have come to the fore as well. Ferrari have been up there too. It's kind of exciting. Well, yeah, we've got nothing to look at at the front, so we need to see that battle for the second team. And, you know, McLaren have really got the tails up after next weekend. I mean, for Oscar, his foot was nearly on the podium, you know, but I think that gives him something to aim for for the next race. But, you know, as you say, it's 60 years of McLaren, and, and, and they'll be really celebrating this, uh, this hill climb win today. Yeah, that was some British Grand Prix for McLaren. It's been some shootout, some hill climb as well for them. The good times keep on coming for McLaren, and why not? It's their 60th birthday, and David's been to take a closer look. When you hit 60, you're old, over the hill, past it, should be retired off. Harsh? Definitely. Stereotypical? Maybe. But after 60 years in the automotive business, just try telling McLaren that they need to slow down. Here in walking, the need for speed is greater than ever. But would you believe it? This tiny, humble Austin is the genesis for all things at McLaren. It was back when he was a small boy, Bruce McLaren restored this car with his father and went out as a 15-year-old to get the fastest lap in the 750 class when he raced this car. This is the start, but the rest of the boulevard tells a story of 60 years of some of the greatest road and racing cars you can imagine. McLaren have made race cars for many years and they've made a big deal out of taking their road cars and adapting them for the track quite effectively. And this car, Rob, is a very special one. It is, uh, absolutely. It's something I'm really lucky to be able to say that I helped develop it. I've driven it extensively and, uh, yeah, I absolutely loved every minute of it. You actually took the title of fastest up the hill in 2021 in this car. And I remember watching it. It was a staggering run up the hill. The first conversations were basically, Rob, we're going to do it with you and I was like great and then afterwards it was only a few weeks later when they found out I'd not actually done it up the hill and it was just my job to join the dots and the car didn't disappoint and um, so we got everything out of it and we needed it you know it was a, a great day great run and something I'm really proud of. McLaren have had so much success on track but it's not all about racing. Here's a James. In the mid 90s they came out with this the iconic F1 road car. This version here, XP5 on the boulevard, is valued at a staggering 30 million pounds, but many consider this the greatest road car of all time. 
I think after that car, it gave us a real idea that people really appreciate some of the things that we took from motorsport and then be able to use some of the expertise that we've got in F1, so the aerodynamics. Aero is a really important part of any McLaren and aero balance actually really, really important. So being able to take those two things and apply them on our road cars has been a really key element for us to be able to deliver the cars that are just absolutely a huge amount of fun to drive. McLaren may be 60 years old, but it's always looking to the future, as we can see here with this Solus GT. And outside, we have their latest supercar, the 750S. Always forever forward. Very much Bruce's philosophy. We shaved 30 kilos out of the 720S, making it by 200 kilos, the lightest of its competitors. We've added another 30 horsepower. We've also upgraded all those things that the average customer would love. Apple CarPlay, better cameras, better screens, all together providing just a better prospect. We've always had a, a long history with Goodwood, and for us, there was no better place to, to have the dynamic debut than in England, where we're based, at a place we have such history with. Well, thanks, Sandy. It certainly looks the part, but someone's left the keys in there, so if, uh, if you could just look away, I might just give it a little try. Already in the Spider version, I can hear that the 750S is louder, it's a little bit more involving. It sort of dialed up the fun factor from the 720. All those McLaren characteristics we like, but with a little bit more of that sort of lairiness, maybe. Some say 60's the new 50, but I'd say after driving this, maybe it's 20. Plenty of life left in McLaren. And I had the honor of taking the 750S up the hill. Here we go. <laughs> wow, that's quick. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Into Malcolm, off camber. God, it feels so powerful, so quick. What a great feeling. If you're gonna launch a car into the world, it's certainly not a bad place to do it. And even better, I've delivered it to the finish line in one piece. The 750S. Welcome to the world. So uh, it's a lovely afternoon here at the Festival of Speed. We've enjoyed the shootout, but we have plenty more to enjoy coming up in uh, a few moments' time. Uh, the next batch will include the Moto GP bikes once again. Uh, we'll be seeing them coming up the hill, but we'll also be celebrating 75 years of Lotus, and we're also enjoying the 60 years of McLaren Racing. And just to let you know, um, there will be uh, a celebration of Sebastian Vettel's uh, wonderful career and having him here this weekend at the house at 5.30, uh, on the outside of the house at 5.30. Sebastian Vettel will be up there. Hopefully we'll have uh, opportunity to hear from him as well. So there really is plenty more to look forward to at the Festival of Speed. We still get it messy. I've
You're never too young to fall in love with classic cars. It's a passion that lasts a lifetime, and it's a passion we share. Backed by over 75 years of motoring experience, Goodwood Classic Solutions is a unique new way to ensure your pride and joy. Goodwood Classic Solutions. It's a passion we share. So we are looking forward to the bikes coming up the hill soon and it's lovely to see the riders having these friendly sociable chats before doing another display um, and I think this will be their last opportunity to have the, the run up the hill because we're getting through uh, all of our Goodwood action. We certainly action. are but it's actually uh, a fantastic lovely to, uh, open paddock to have it, as well. Uh, you, know, you can nice come weather. around and stay as long as you like and talk to as many people, see as many different cars as you like. And it really is uh, a brilliant opportunity to even bump into a couple of legends as well. We've had the likes of... So uh, we've got a bit of uh, action coming and it looks like we've got uh, one of the McLarens now ready to come out. I was just wondering whether we'd see the cars or the bikes out first. We'll find out in a moment, presumably, as the, the riders have not put their crash helmets on it. Uh, the, it looks as though the riders might be coming out later in this, didn't James? Yeah, it looks that way. Um, although, you know, all the legends there, you've got Stoney, you've got Schwantz, you've got Roberts, uh, Spencer in the background. So, uh, yeah, some, some big names there just chilling. And, yeah, that's what makes it so unusual, just sitting on a, a hay bale in the sunshine, chatting with your friends, talking things over. So really, really good to see. Yeah. So, uh, of course, the riders that we have had, we've had so many star riders, as you mentioned, um, James, we've got a wonderful mix here today. But Valentino Rossi, he, sadly, he's not with us today, no. but we have seen some very special moments in the past from him here at Goodwood. Let's look back. front door in the middle of the party and he, of course he won the race which was just spectacular so he'd come back with in absolute spectacular style he arrived this must have been 10 o'clock in the evening he was in shorts and a sort of t-shirt and his hair was you know like like it is so he was take whipped upstairs put his dinner jacket on came down and um, I presumed he would you know sort of disappear after dinner or something but not a bit of it no he stayed for the show and he was just so enthusiastic and and um, he was like a boy really so excited about it all I think of all the moments we've had with the crowd at Goodwood and the crowd being caught up in the moment um, we've had a couple of them um, but that was one of the one of the absolute big ones yeah. This is history being made here at the Festival of Speed. A big moment there, Wayne Rainey leads the grid. Everybody at trackside, it is a sight to behold. You would not believe that this man is paralyzed from the chest downwards.
Well, the history of um, MotoGP is remarkable. And seeing Wayne Rainey here last year, James, were, was incredible. But now we've got a whole bunch of star riders ready to put on a display for us. Yeah, we have indeed. Um, we have indeed. So number 29, that was Ian Oney's bike, you know, the factory Aprilia, um, back uh, when uh, when he was riding it. It's one of the test riders riding it right now, probably Lorenzo. So, um, yeah, amazing footage to see, you know, the Rossi years, you know, just they're unbelievable to see the crowd that year. And what can you say about my Absolutely incredible stuff. But right now, you know, we are looking at the uh, the Aprilia and uh, what a nice motorcycle that these Aprilias are. They've come on again so much. Obviously, they've won the World Superbike Championship. They've been fighting at the front of... Uh, of GPs, you know, with uh, Maverick Vignales and uh, Alicia Espagaro, and they really have come on leaps and bounds over these um, over these last couple of seasons, which is uh, which is just lovely to see. It is, no, it's remarkable, and, and I just hope everybody you can enjoy this the special sounds that we're going to be getting, that sense of the motorbikes coming up the hill now, because this just gives this that other element, and, and the combination they've got this weekend james because of it not clashing with motor gp we've got a remarkable number of modern bikes but also some great history too yeah we have indeed like this the 2000 this is kenny roberts jr um on this uh, 2000 winning rgv uh, 500 suzuki pulling some nice wheels enjoying it he said he's got his family here and he's absolutely loving it you know being reunited so it's great to see him back following him behind you can see his uh He's one of Kevin Schwantz's 34 Suzuki's, but as we continue with uh, Kenny Roberts Jr. So yeah, he won that year in 2000. He was runner-up the year before in 99, and what a lovely motorcycle that little RGV 500 is. You know, it was before they all went four strokes. And you can watch him here, just gets on the power, comes up, and you can see how quick they come up. They love to rev through. Love to rev through, love to wheelie. Well, there we are, heading up the hill, and uh, you're seeing plenty more. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody uh, that the Sebastian Vettel celebration will be at half past five. It has changed its timing slightly, so um, for those of you who really love to be up by Goodwood House when the Sebastian Vettel celebration is going on, it will be at 5.30 today. Um, but let's keep our focus on the bikes for now, James. Yeah, we're just seeing one of uh, Schwartz's uh, number 34 Pepsi Suzuki's. What a motorcycle that was. Revin Kevin spinning it up in right in the thick of the battles with him, with Rainey. Um, you know, it was really when the, the guys were battling at it. It was such a classic part of the... Um, yeah, the 80s and early 90s, those 500 two strokes as we look a little bit further back in time. Yeah, it's lovely seeing these older bikes from the 1950s, isn't it? And you know, really great. Yeah, no, it, it I is. think that's the Gilera, is it? It is. Gilera 500? It is a Gilera 500, it's exactly right. 1957 bike, double overhead cam. Um, you know, the first time they did a four across the frame as well, you know, copied very much after that. And Jeff Duke obviously won three world championships with these guys, and Gilera won six. Six world championships of this motorcycle throughout the 50s. I tell you what, it comes from the Sammy Miller Motorcycle Museum, and Sammy Miller here this weekend. It's, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? It's him riding it. It is, is it? I wondered if it Yeah, was. it was. I okay, mean, he's he, such a ledge. Yeah, yeah, I know. He was due to, to ride again this weekend. I just wasn't sure exactly which bike he'd be on. Yeah, no, he is indeed. Now, yeah, we're looking at uh, YZR 500 here, and um, you know, these bikes, uh, yeah, this is a, a 92 machine. Yeah, these, these really were... They dominated, you know, like being Rainey won the World Championship on these in 1990, 1991, 1992. You know, these multiple Yamahas. I raced a similar version in 95-96. And um, V4 two strokes. You know, you had to be so careful with them. Nothing below nine and a half thousand revs. And then that little band between nine and a half, twelve and a half, you got it a few millimeters on the zip. And suddenly you're upside down looking at it the wrong way. You know, they love to bite you. So you had to be really, really sharp with them. But when you were in the zone with them, they were fantastic. I did ask you earlier, James, but we can put it out public. As a, as a very experienced mobile rider, how many bones have you broken over the years? Uh, 42. 42. <laughs> right, OK. But you look in fantastic fitness at now. So you've dealt with it remarkably well. <laughs> well, these things happen. It's all part of the job. Uh, we've seen one of the, um, uh, the uh, modernists there as well. Uh, you just see just in front of that as well, one on another Grand Prix, one of the, the Grand Prix bikes. I rode a slightly light, later version of that, um, but lovely to uh, lovely to see that. You know, that is the Bondus KR3 triple that we're seeing in front, just alongside um, just alongside the uh, the uh, 1996 Bondus 500 Yamaha. Um, yeah. So 
Yeah, great bike, but no one could stop doing in those years. That, that was just doing Mick doing and his 500 were just such a pairing. Isn't it know. interesting that his son now is aiming to go into Formula One if he can get there? You know, we'll have to see whether he manages to do it. They've gone a slightly different route. Yeah, they have indeed. They have indeed. We're looking there. You can see there was that the number one bike with a little number eight on it. That's a Triumph 500. And that was the last Triumph to win a Grand Prix. <laughs> Until now, Triumph obviously sponsored the, all the engines in Moto2 currently. But um, you know, back in 68, 69, this was the last Triumph to win a Grand Prix until the new Triumph rules came in these last couple of seasons. So very famous motorcycle. That. That's lovely to see then, yes, because Triumph was such a great name. And uh, it's lovely that the name is back on the scene again a little bit more. And you get that lovely sound of it as well. Yeah, you do. So again, these um, you know, triples that uh, I'm not sure it's running absolutely no. perfectly. I think he might have just to be crawling that across the line. And now we uh, look back to a uh, lovely old Williams Formula One car. Yeah, this is Sebastian Vettel. So as I mentioned, the celebration for him is going to be at half past five. But Alice, he's, uh, he's about to set off in one of the most famous Formula One cars. Yeah, and he, he touched on that he, he <laughs> loves coming to, to Goodwood and, and getting to see the crowd and drive these incredible old cars and also powered by synthetic fuels as well. Yes, it is powered by synthetic fuel, but this car, the uh, car that won the 1992 Formula One World Championship for Nigel Mansell, uh, he won the first five races in a row in 1992, and then he had a huge battle with uh, Ayrton Senna in uh, Monaco, which didn't quite work out for Nigel, but uh, he, it was absolutely dominant, and the, the form of Nigel plus the technology of this car with its active suspension. Uh, superb. Let's enjoy watching Sebastian Vettel bring up one of the most classic Formula 1 cars that took Nigel Mansell to that 1992 title. Give him a wave, everybody. He'll be loving this. Only recently retired from racing F1 himself, but he is thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah, he's decided not to stop and do some, some donuts. Maybe the car's had enough of those already today. As you can see, he's got the race without trace, powered by synthetic fuels, basically <laughs> racing and not leaving a trace behind as he slows down to the crowd in front there, lights up the wheels and plenty of people cheering and waving him on as they should do up the hill in what is an incredible piece of machinery. It is. It was a time when the Williams team was very much at the level that Red Bull is nowadays. Uh, of course, the Williams team is not at that level now, still in Formula 1 under different ownership. Um, in those days, it was very much about Frank Williams and Patrick Head running the team, Nigel Mansell driving for them, and part of that huge amount of success that they had. Alain Prost went on after that to take a title as well, and then Damon Hill. It was a massive time for the Williams team, but to see this car out here at Goodwood with four-time world champion Sebastian Vettel driving it, that's, that's a very, very special moment. Yeah, it is, and he would have had an absolutely massive smile on his face and now we are being treated to the wonderful lotuses again this is the lotus connection 405 this is the uh, lotus cosworth 49 so this is the next graham hill car and this was when the ford cosworth was introduced into formula one and the ford cosworth v8 engine became hugely successful um, from the late 60s into the 70s and 80s it was remarkable how long the ford cosworth engine worked but also the lotus 49 uh, beautifully designed by Colin Chapman, lightweight and rapid from the beginning with Jim Clark winning his the first race out in it at the Dutch Grand Prix. Yeah, it's a three litre engine sitting at the rear of that car and I love looking at these because it's, it's almost, it's not bare but it, you can really see the bones and structure of that engine from the rear of that car which you can of course go down and have a look once these have come back down the hill. Uh, and have a really close look at them. We've got a few bikes, a couple of bikes coming up behind as well. Yeah, it's got a, we've got a bit, a bit of a mix uh, going on up the hill at the moment, haven't we? So, but this was a, a, a lovely car, and, and it was just before aerodynamics wings came into play, and, I, and it's lovely to see. Of course, it didn't have downforce like some of the 
many of the Formula One cars that we've got here at Goodwood this weekend, but it is a very classic shape. And I know to many, many people, the Lotus Cosworth 49 is one of their all-time favorites uh, before the wings started coming out. I know many other people love this full aerodynamics. We all have the things that we enjoy, but it's well done to see it up, going up the hill there and uh, with so much heritage to it as well. Ken Pritchard Jones, who's the, uh, the, the man who's behind the driving of that one. And then we've got some of the, the Can-Am uh, cars coming up the hill now. So the McLaren team, uh, McLaren in 1963, one of their early stints, they did build single-seaters in the early days, but one of their key things was to build these Can-Am cars. It was a sports car series in America with the big V8 engines in the back, and uh, they were very, very successful with them, and they're still startling-looking cars. They are really, you can see the structure at the top there, the, the roll hoop, just in case you had any mishaps. But it's being driven beautifully up the hill, coming to finish the end of the lap. And now we've got slightly more modern day machinery. Yeah, we've got the Ferrari coming out now, haven't we? So uh, this is entered by Scuderia Ferrari, Mark Genet, who's in this one, the SF70H. And uh, this was another Sebastian Vettel car, in fact, when he moved to Ferrari and he won the first uh, race of the year in Australia in it. So this was, this was a year, Alice, when Ferrari really did have a competitive car, certainly in the early stages. Yeah, they got up to a very strong start, didn't they, when uh, Vettel actually won the opening race of the 2017 season in Australia and, and he actually led the championship for the very first part of the season, but it was the Mercedes then that came pretty dominant towards the end there, and Vettel eventually run, finishing runner-up to Lewis Hamilton, who had a, a strong finish in the second half of the campaign, but a halo wasn't driven originally with a halo, so halo now attached to the car. Yeah, all about safety, of course, which is an important part of uh, Formula One, and that's good that they've done that. And, of course, the halo, I mean, I remember wondering when, I, when a halo came into Formula One whether it was a good thing to do. Now, the Stewart family driving their um, dad's car up the hill, which is so great to see. Uh, Mark Stewart, who's driving the Tyrrell up, and, of course, Jackie Stewart took three world titles uh, with this team and the final one, 1973, and the car is hugely competitive. It really did work extremely well, and it's lovely to see it here. Yeah, and you can see the famous uh, airbox sticking very perfectly at the top there, and it's lovely to see that this being able to be driven by family members up the hill. Yeah, and uh, it was a, a year that, that uh, 1973, where he took the title, but sadly, of course, his friend and great teammate, Francois Sever, uh, was taken out at the very end of, that, of his career, which was very sad indeed. So another of the Williams, this is the uh, FW19, heading up the hill now. This was from 1997, and this was a car that uh, was another title winner in the hands of Jacques Villeneuve. Yeah, and it was actually the final Williams to have design input from uh, that very famous man that's still having great success in Formula One at the moment, Adrian Newey, and he eventually departed for McLaren just before the start of the, the 1997 season. I'm sure some of you will remember the final race that year too was almost uh, as dramatic as some we've seen uh, where there was an incident between him and Michael Schumacher. How suitable, because you're seeing Michael Schumacher's crash helmet now, um, and coming out to play because Mick Schumacher is driving this weekend. Yeah, and I can imagine that this is quite a special moment for Mick wearing Michael's helmet as well. We've seen him out earlier on in the day. This is the 2011 2.4 meter V8 that he is behind more of slick early tyres there. Is he going to slow down for the crowd? Possibly light up the wheels. Maybe he'll treat the crowd to a couple of donuts as well looks like he might be deciding to to do that but what a lovely moment for him it's really good it's really good look at that Mick Schumacher putting on the display in a car raced by his father when he went back to Formula One and joined Mercedes it wasn't his most successful period in Formula One and his best result that year was a, a fourth place fourth position in Canada. Uh, it didn't quite gel yet. It took a few years for Mercedes 
to get it together, but of course, when it did come together, when a certain Lewis Hamilton was there, it worked very, very well indeed. Yeah, and I think Michael was a massive part to, to the success that Mercedes eventually did have after that. You, you talked to many of the people at Mercedes at the time and said how important and critical Michael's input was into, into the success and which delivered Lewis Hamilton many world championships and, and Nicker Rosberg's famous world championship, only world championship as well. So lovely to see that car here and also to be driven by Mick. So that's uh, lovely to see Mick Schumacher in his father's Mercedes Formula One car. In the meantime now, we also want to celebrate 60 years of McLaren. The past isn't something I really think about. I only think about the next race, and I only look into the future. This is the story of a young man from New Zealand. The name, of course, is Bruce McLaren. What's the secret of success? Experience is tremendously important in motor racing. Got one from very nasty one indeed. The important thing for me is to drive and to win, and I did that. What a fantastic finish! And it's happened immediately! This is amazing! He had ambitions beyond what I could even understand. You know, going for the stars. So here we are, enjoying the climb up the hill uh, from McLaren and uh, seeing these wonderful Can-Am cars, many of these very, very powerful beasts that have uh, were so successful in America and actually helped fund uh, some of the stuff they were doing with Formula One. But Bruce McLaren, the man himself, became a champion in Can-Am. Yeah, he certainly did. And we're going to see plenty of these. There are plenty of these around the event, but a lovely, lovely tribute to see the evolution of McLaren. We're going to see some of their GT cars as well, and we're going to get a treat to some of their Formula 1 cars as well. So this is the McLaren M8C. Uh, this was a, a privateer version, um, but of course there were plenty of works, Can-Am cars as well, created by McLaren. And that connection with the United States actually is something that's still very much a part of, uh, of the McLaren team, particularly with Zach Brown uh, in charge. And they've also got a, a real input into IndyCar racing as well now. So it always seems to be in a strong connection between McLaren and the United States. everybody we're looking forward to the Sebastian Vettel celebration at Goodwood House it's taking place at 5.30 5.30 for Sebastian Vettel coming up to Goodwood House and we will be interviewing him 
hearing some stories, I'm sure. So do look forward to that. Half past five uh, for the Sebastian Vettel celebration. So cars on track uh, from new to old and uh, all continuing on their way at the moment. We're looking at some of the McLaren road cars as well as the sports racing cars. Yeah, exquisite machinery because also I'm really, really pleased that these days McLaren's back into GT racing. It makes such a difference. The P1 GTR is so stunning, but also the, the 570S, the Artura is coming out to, to play in GT racing. And the 650S that was so successful about six, five or six years ago with the likes of Fate, uh, Shane Van Gisbergen, and the driver who just a few weeks ago in October made his NASCAR debut and went and duffed up the whole field, rose from 17th to 1st, so great to have him as a former driver in the category, but uh, one of the meanest cars on the hill is the uh, GT3 version that uh, black with a little bit of orange trim, the 720S, and that's their concurrent for, uh, GT car working its way up the hill, but uh, right now it's a case of McLaren pushing on to try and get into IndyCar racing all over again. It's a cyclical game. If only we could bring back Canaan, that would definitely be my vote. <laughs> I think we'd all love that, wouldn't we? And, and look at this. This is lovely to see. The Austin 7 that really began um, Bruce McLaren's career, it was uh, bought by his father, Neil Oakley, who's driving it, a very key part of the F1 team. Oh, lovely, they've got an onboard camera for him as well. And what, what's so magnificent about this car, pivotal, of course, to Bruce McLaren learning his uh, engineering and getting his competition debut, but uh, when you go down to McLaren's base, the stunning building outside Woking, this is the first car you see in their foyer. They're not forgetting their past. 60 years, illustrious history, but never just brush anything like that under the carpet. Lovely uh, on board there, and it just looks like a perfect Sunday drive. I'd certainly love to, to sit in the passenger seat there and, and take a lovely drive in this wonderful 1925 Austin 7. Yeah, and, and Neil Oatley, uh, Bruce, we know him. He's, he's been in Formula One forever. He's still involved um, at McLaren. He, he, he just is immersed in motorsport, a really top engineer, but he loves this sort of history too. He, d he does too, and I think he really, really gets it. And, and one beauty about McLaren, you have a lot of people who've been there a very, very long time. Yeah. Ron Dennis, when he took over in 1980-81, uh, had a Formula One team before Ronda with uh, Neil Trundle, who was there literally until a couple of years ago. Always just kept on. He loved the historic stuff. So Ron said, you can concentrate on that. I like that continuity. Yeah, no, I think there is a, a lovely element to that. So climbing up the hill in the Austin 7 Ulster. The other key thing, I think, actually, also, Bruce, was the fact that Bruce McLaren was a, a, a great engineer himself. He wasn't just a driver. He, he was a talented engineer. It, it wasn't the case of make do and men, which is how he started it back in New Zealand with the Ulster, but he really had some great ideas. Of course, a lot of the credit those days went to uh, Colin Chapman at Lotus pushing them on forward, but McLaren were never that far behind, and the team was so, so tiny. One of his mechanics, a, a fellow Kiwi, um, Howden Ganley, of course, went on to race in Formula One, and he would have plenty of input, and they had to sort of do most of the stuff, make it by hand at their base, just at the end of the runways at Heathrow down in Feltham. Of course, they've moved on, they've expanded, expanded. Formula One teams now are so large. But back then, the fact that Bruce was so personable was what drove that team forward. He wouldn't ask people to do things that he couldn't do or wouldn't do himself. That's a real motivator. It is. Now, um, that's Oscar Piastri, isn't it? Is that him heading up in this car now? The M23. Um, because we were, ex we were certainly expecting him to be in the, the car for McLaren. Well, it be rude for him not to try, but this is the, the M23 ran from 1973 to the start of 1977, and this is the one that took the first of those two drivers' championships. This was for Emerson Fittipaldi in 1974, and of course, they had great success at the Indy 500 about the same time, 1976, they, they went out to play with the M16, and uh, the likes of Johnny Rutherford achieved great things in those, uh, and that was the only car that was still racing in McLaren's Papaya at that point. Okay, yeah, that's a good point, but uh, they had, as you say, great success in Indy, and it's nice that they're doing it again now, after after a long, long gap for McLaren not to be racing in IndyCar uh, racing, now they are. Yeah, and this was the winner of the Indy 500 three times using different, of course, variants of the, the M16. But it's a, a lovely car. And, and I think this, that looks like Oscar's helmet yeah, now. So uh, it does, you're right. He, uh, I saw him having his, his seat fit, just checking out all of the, the cars. So it looks like that is, yeah, I would say that is Oscar now behind the wheel. <laughs> Another McLaren, a very special McLaren. Yeah, and we've got the onboard camera. He's got all the McLaren kit on. So Oscar Piastri up the hill in the McLaren. Uh, this is a lovely opportunity for the young Australian 
who, uh, of course, is making his name in Formula One, that brilliant fourth place. A bit unlucky not to get a podium at Silverstone due to safety car. He could well have finished third. Uh, he has to end up with fourth, but it's still his best result so far. You don't win three consecutive single-seater championships without being an extraordinary talent. So Oscar Piastri has it all ahead. But right now, there he is experiencing the sort of thing, the sort of bark, that DFV engine note that was uh, just Formula One for so many years. You can be sure his father liked it even more because uh, very few families suddenly arrive in motor racing. There's always a bit of a push, a bit of a history. Yeah, so it's lovely to see Oscar Piastri here at Goodwood this weekend. And for many of you, I'm sure it'll be the first time you've ever seen him uh, driving a car. And there's the Mika Hakkinen. How wonderful wow. to see him back in the McLaren. Celebrate Mika Hakkinen coming up the hill now. Double world champion driving for the McLaren team in the late 1990s. A true talent and uh, lovely to have him here. He's always uh, a member of uh, being part of all these events at Goodwood. He has such enthusiasm. And this, and this sounds wonderful too. It does, and this really takes me back to my childhood, the fierce battles that we got to, to witness between him and Michael Schumacher. So let's have a little listen in to this incredible V10. He's just taking it nice and steady. There's no need to do a rush. And in fact, I think sometimes the fans enjoy it just as much when it's going past slowly because they can wave at him. Yeah, and I think it just shows that he's communicating with them and vice versa. But Mika was one of those drivers who made Formula One. In fact, any single seater series looked effortless. He was one of those drivers that so many looked up to. And his, his scraps with Michael Schumacher were the stuff of legend as uh, the 1990s came to a conclusion. And you know, when he, when he took that first title in 1998, he got out of the car, they wanted him for the podium, but he was running around as a Suzuka, punching the air. They almost had to lasso him to get him back into shape. Yeah, no, wonderful. it was a wonderful time in Formula One when he took those titles for the team. And maybe they'll be back again one day um, to be able to do that. I, the uh, later car following him up the hill as well. So it's, we've got a real mixture of uh, Formula One machinery here from McLaren. Mika Hackman always a good part of that, but how lovely it was to see Oscar Piastri, the new star, the teammate to Lando Norris, here today at Goodwood doing the Festival of Speed as a Formula One driver who is very much on the climb. Yes, and I really, really think that uh, it's just so good for drivers with a team with a history as rich as that. But let's hear from Oscar Piastri up at the top of the hill with Ed Foster. Oscar, you must be enjoying the United Kingdom at the moment. You get to drive James Hunt's McLaren this weekend, and then what a great performance at the British Grand Prix the other weekend. Yeah, it's been a, a nice time um, you know, to drive a car like this. Today's been a very, very special day. It's the first race car I've driven that hasn't been uh, one of my own, actually. So, yeah, what better car to, to do it than James Hunt's? Now, McLaren's got such an amazing history. We're celebrating 60 years of the manufacturer today. I mean, what an incredible lineup of cars. It must be pretty special being a part of that yeah it definitely is you know we've had a an up and down year obviously Silverstone was uh, definitely the highlight so far and hopefully we can have uh, some more weekends like that but you know to be part of so much history has been uh, a very nice welcome into the world of F1 and um, you know we've had some some special liveries this year and what as well so um, hopefully we can have some more good weekends and uh, hopefully we can have a year or end to the year that uh, Bruce would be proud of now, with these historic Formula One cars, do you, do you get much time to test them or are you just put in on a vent and told to, told to get going? So my first time driving this car was about 20 minutes ago when I went to the assembly area. So uh, I sat in it for the first time this morning. Um, yeah, it's uh, a very different beast to, to what I'm used to driving. But um, yeah, it's uh, a very, very cool experience. They sound awesome. I mean, you know, that's half the reason uh, I'm sure most of us come to Goodwoods to hear the, hear the cars. So um, yeah, it's been a, a very cool day and hopefully uh, I can do it again in the future. Oscar, thank you. Thank you very much. So let's have a look back at some of the highlights of that whole section. We saw the bikes out early on and some of the great superstars of the MotoGP that are here this weekend with people like Randy, Mamola, Mick Doohan, uh, Wayne Gardner, but also great riders from uh, the TT as well, uh, the museum owner, all sorts uh, who have been showing us uh, bikes from the very beginning of motorbike riding, right up to uh, an amazing collection of modern bikes, to be honest, a bigger collection than we've often seen here. And then we saw Sebastian Vettel. Yeah, we did. His car, of course, really enjoying the race without trace. And then we moved on to the beautiful Lotuses. 
Yes, uh, they're very fine. The Lotus cars coming up the hill from the 1960s and then the Ferrari as well uh, from 2017. That uh, was a good one for Sebastian Vettel. Didn't quite get them to the title, but they gave Mercedes a hard time and the stunning Tyrrells that Jackie Stewart raced to three titles and the Williams as well. That was also lovely to watch. And that was a car that Jack Villeneuve will always celebrate. Mick Schumacher driving his dad's former Mercedes and doing some lovely 360s outside Goodwood House, putting plenty of smoke out there. The Can-Am cars, of course, with the history of racing in the United States that was such a fundamental part. And then the, the modern history, too. And then we saw some great runs from some superstars in Formula One, including Mika Hakkinen who's been talking to Ed. Mika, I feel as though my festival of speed is complete, having seen you in this car. This, what a fantastic era of machine this was. Oh, it is beautiful design. I think the, the engineers, mechanics did a fantastic work. Uh, and I think it's brilliant to bring it here, celebrating 60 years anniversary McLaren. Uh, it, was, it was great to be part of the history of McLaren doing those, those results. And now, now it's a young, young guns. It's their turn now to create some history there, you know. Were you celebrating uh, after the British Grand Prix results for McLaren? Yeah, I, I definitely. I'm super, I was happy, of course. I have seen the, all the hard work, what everybody has done. So it's beautiful to see the, the performances racing all the time. Now, just tell me, how, how has your Sunday at the Festival of Speed been? Well, we know the weather has been a little bit this little problem, but uh, again, the fans, I mean, amazing. The fans, amazing. And it's beautiful to have so many fans every year, more and more. It's brilliant. Mika, thank you. Thank you so much. It's lovely. It's lovely hearing uh, Mika Hakkinen and he, he, the, how much he enjoys being here and the, the support that he's getting from fans as well. So, so important to him and seeing him in that car was a special moment. But uh, we've seen so many special moments, Alice. It's hard to... You, 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 well, afterwards, we're all going to have to sort of remember all these things or look them up and uh, get, on, get online and watch it back. Yeah, exactly. I have to watch the, the stream back, but it's just some amazing cars. And exactly, you, it, it, I think it's actually impossible to pick a favourite moment. It is. No, that's right. And of course, the bikes as well. We've we've seen these remarkable champions um, and we had a, a really interesting conversation just a little bit earlier with the double world champion in the bikes, Freddie Spencer. Freddie Spencer, you, you were up on the Goodwood House balcony surrounded by fellow MotoGP motorcycle Grand Prix racing legends. Um, it's a special weekend for MotoGP, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, I've been coming here um, pretty much um, the whole time since 97. And to see the, the growth of the, the motorcycle part of it, and of course the support that Charles and the, the entire um, Goodwood staff gives to our sport, and to see it like today as one of it equals and premier uh, representation with the MotoGP riders from the modern era, and of course all of us from the past, it's like for me, it's very special. And uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, and it's a, it's a truly a privilege to be here. And for all the fans who stayed around with the weather situation to enjoy watching us ride through, we appreciate that. Now, you set the world alight when you came over here in the 80s, but these modern MotoGP bikes are like something out of space. Would you have liked to race them? Well, you know, of course, I get asked that quite a bit, as you can imagine. And I've ridden, I've ridden the modern Hondas all the way up until the last version. And it's basically the trash control uh, that, that you would have to get used to. Um, obviously, you know, I've ridden four strokes, two strokes, so that's, that's not really a big difference. Um, and just the, the grip of the tires. You know, every, everything is better, um, and you, you certainly do with that. And in modern bikes, the last few years on MotoGP bikes with the aerodynamics uh, become part of what the rider has to adjust to. Um, but you certainly think that you could, you know, I would, I mean, like any rider from different eras, but I do appreciate uh, the bikes that I had the privilege to race with in the beginning years of HRC, which was the beginning of the modern era, understanding uh, geometry and frame technology and also uh, radial tires, all the things that 
that uh, are being used today, we begin that process of development. And, you know, being involved with that and just the pure of the connection with the motorcycle, that's how I learned to ride. Um, but I, I ride modern bikes too, you know, with trash control and, and uh, they, they have their uniqueness that you get used to. But uh, I, I like my era, yeah. Well, Freddie, it's great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alex, uh, lovely to see you up here. We're, we're used to um, you doing some fantastic performances in more modern Williams. Um, how is the 08? Uh, it's fine. It's a, a bit of a tight squeeze. I feel like a bit of a bobblehead driving around, but it was a lot of fun. Um, it's got a lot of power, but it's quite aggressive. Um, obviously not m maybe as refined as what I'm used to, but it was still uh, yeah, a rare treat. Now, you've obviously been having a fantastic season. It must be, I mean, it's certainly the British Grand Prix to have that kind of performance in front of the home crowd in terms of Williams and, and the UK it must have been great. Yeah, very special. It was uh, obviously Williams' home race and um, 800th GP for us. So it was a, a good time to, to have a good result. And obviously, um, you know, we started this year not really where we wanted it to be. Um, but bit by bit, race by race, we've been chipping away. And, and we've got to a point now where um, that's yeah, some a couple of points finishes in three races. It's a uh, it's a good time right now. There's a lot of good energy in the team. Now it's, Williams has obviously got an amazing heritage collection. Did they ask you to drive, or or do you go knocking on their doors and look at them saying, "Please, can I drive that?" It's a bit of both. It's basically you ask them what's available to drive. Uh, they give you a couple of options. I think Seb beat me. Uh, well, if Seb owns that car, then he gets that car, right? It'd be a bit odd if I if I was driving it. Um, but next time, maybe I'm gonna pleased with him and uh, ask him if he trusts me in his car but uh, it's still a great car and um, yeah uh, you know we do a lot of marketing things sometimes not as fun as others and this is one of the ones the very very few ones where I say that we are uh, very happy to go to. Alex thank you. Thank you.
For 75 years, Lotus has been a hallmark of British engineering. From its humble beginnings in a garage in North London to the decades beyond, it can lay claim to some of the most iconic and well-loved cars. Colin Chapman, the chairman of the Lotus Group of Companies, knows the meaning of success. The Lotus has become a success story for Chapman and for Britain. I'm here with Clive Chapman. You've got this wonderful thing, the Mario Andretti car, isn't it? It's a beautiful car. It was called Black Beauty in the days. The famous black and gold colours. Mario and Ronnie winning at ease. We've got ten cars here, uh, thanks to the owners. Black and gold was, was really actually the, the main colours for Team Lotus. The Type 49 from the uh, National Motor Museum at Bewley. And then, of course, the iconic Sterling Moss Rob Walker Type 18. Monaco Grand Prix ring car, 1961. So, uh, you know, in six cars, you're just telling a lot of history. And while the past is celebrated, Lotus is firmly fixed on the future. And this new car, the Lotus Electra, is a step in a completely new direction. Oh, wow, we've got fireworks and everything to celebrate. <laughs> This is a big car, but it doesn't feel big behind the wheel. The quality of the interior is unbelievable. Very good quality. You've got these screens instead of rear view wing mirrors. Is it Lotus? It certainly is. And it's going to take this company into the next era. It's still got that essence. I'm obviously just starting the car now, so I can't tell on a full test, but it seems to turn in really sharply. It's definitely quick enough. They're pinning their hopes on this Electra, selling in high numbers and selling to a whole new group of Lotus fans. Silent, rapid fun. It's the bold, new, exciting future for Lotus cars. People say, what would the dad think about Electra? He'd love it. He'd like nothing better than a clean sheet of paper. And that's what's happened with the Electra. They've just started with a whole new concept. Hi, I'm here with Jake Hill. Jake, so close, but not quite there today. I know, yeah, but still, what an experience. You know, I've had an absolute blast. Fifth overall uh, and winning the touring car class as well in this awesome, yeah, 31-year-old Skyline. It's uh, It's been a privilege. What an event. I was going to say, you know, it's a 31-year-old car. You should get something for that. We'll get all these new ones, hey? I know. It should almost be put in the historic class. But, no, do you know what? It's been amazing. I've absolutely loved it. It's uh, Considering, obviously, Saturday was missed, um, it definitely made up for it today. And what a Sunday we've had. The weather's been good. And, um, yeah, it was nice to throw some commitment at the hill and come away with a P5 there. In true Jake Hill style, you left nothing on the table. I mean, I saw you in them first couple of corners. There was grass. You are just off the edge of the track. How, tell me about the run. Yeah, it was great. You know, we uh, put a little bit more power in it. That's the joy of having turbochargers. And, yeah, we wound it all the way up for that final run. And, yeah, going into turn one, it's, it's the corner I hate the most because it's the first one you've got to commit to. You haven't been through any corners yet. And, you know, you just don't know where the tyres are, where the brakes are. And it's just a bit unnervy. But we threw her in, took a bit of grass, and, yeah, it all felt good. So we carried on committing up the hill. And, yeah, it was great. I mean, I went eight tenths faster than I've ever been up the hill, which is obviously quite a chunk. And come away with beating my own tin top record up the hill that I set this morning so yeah I'm just thrilled to bits. You're still smiling and you get as you say you're getting quicker every time you come back here on the hill so it's there for you one day do you think? Oh the 47s are in reach I think you know we're only two tenths away from that now um, but I mean how much how, how far do you go with it you know I mean it's still a 31 year old Nissan Skyline and it's an amazing car but I don't know how much more there is left to give we were on hill climb tyres we wound the power up as far as we could yeah, we tried, but it's uh, it's still a great result. And to be amongst all those new cars as well, Le Mans cars, rally cars, you know, special stuff, Travis's uh, Subaru, mega. Well, we... Um we, we, we hear that we talked to you earlier about how busy your schedule is and it's like it's incredible but you still choose to spend what could be a weekend off down here at the festival tell me why you do that mm -hmm. just love it you know it's simple as that goodwood is um a really special place and, and all of them the members meeting the festival speed the revival all of them hold a very special place in my heart but festival speed's a really fantastic one just because of the variety of cars and people that are here um, and I think the fans love it as well, you know, because there's so many cool things going up and down the hill. But yeah, it's uh, any invite I get to Goodwood is a really well received one. Well, I'm sure that means you'll be back. 
I hope so. Yeah, we have to wait and see. We'll, so we'll certainly like to see you again. Thanks very much, Jake. We're now going to take a look at a special on the great Petter Solberg. Now this is going to be fun. This is going to be sideways. This is going to be spectacular. This is going to be worth watching. Oliver Solberg, then son of the great Petter Solberg. He's been a real hit this weekend. He's been on the rally stage. He's been in the drift arena. He's been on the hill. He's been in a variety of cars. Oliver Solberg has been great value all weekend. The Citroen DS3 WRX World Rally Cross Car launches itself off the line. Brilliant acceleration with four-wheel drive from these cars. First sector, he's a second over, he's got bags of understeer, and he's got to sort that out on the run now. Up Park Street, look at this! That's unbelievable from Oliver Solberg in the Citroen. Fantastic stuff now as he comes up the hill. Is he going to get on with the same shenanigans here up at Malcolm? Onto the brakes, flicks it in, back on the power, hooks it up, powers up the straight. He's quick on the second point, it's all sideways, but he's managed to save it. Through past flint wall he goes, the tail wags. So he's got to try to beat a 49.5, yeah, he's still quicker. Going through the second intermediate, again he's sideways, but he's millimetres away from the bales. Oliver Solberg up towards the timing line, he's sideways again, there's the flag. Can he go quicker than a 49? Yes, he can, a 49.39. Puts Oliver Solberg fastest, fantastic stuff. Well, down here at the start line, Max Chilton in the spectacular McMurtry joins me now. Record intact, Max, but we have a new uh, hill climb champion for this year at least. What did you make of the shootout earlier on? Um, I definitely got to see them blast away from me. Um, I, was, I think um, we were meant to be starting the shootout, but we ended up closing out the shootout. So it was quite a cool experience seeing everyone blast away from me, from the really sort of new world rally cars to the really old school front engine V12 monsters. So... Um, that was a cool experience, um, and yeah, the, obviously the record is safe. My run was uh, pretty, pretty happy with my run as well. The car was on great form. We, it's the only dry run we've had all week, so yeah. I just sort of sent it and made sure I put on a good show for the crowd. Um, and then this run, I'm probably going to make a lot of smoke and, <laughs> and make, the, make the crowd realise how much power this thing has. Yeah, a real demonstration, absolutely. It was so fascinating to see the spectacle of it, You from the McLaren Solace, of course, that, that won, and then the Subaru of Travis Pastrana in P2. It's quite a show, isn't it? Yeah, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful event, this. It's great. It just makes you realise when, obviously, yesterday was cancelled, how much it means to everyone, because everyone today is in such great spirits yeah. that we're back where we want to be. Um, and it's great for us as a brand, McMurtry, who obviously broke the record last year after 23 years, and then we've come back a year later with our uh, McMurtry Spearling Pure, which is now a customer car available for track days uh, on, a, on a stand just next to the supercar paddock. So it's really all come full circle for us, and it's, uh, it's just always fantastic to be back and uh, surrounded by these wonderful machines and drivers. Yeah, absolutely. I heard a whistle. I think that means you probably have to go quite soon, so I will let you focus in ahead of this run. Thanks so Thank much, you. Max. Appreciate it. Great to hear from Max Chilton there, who uh, was watching all the cars disappear for the shootout a few moments ago. I say a few moments ago, it took us a while to get through everyone, but well worth it in the end. Thoroughly entertaining and wonderful to see all the Lotuses, all the McLarens, everyone celebrating some sort of anniversary, it appears. I believe we can take a look at the run that we were speaking about. Um, and uh, yeah, let's throw it back to that record-breaking run a year ago. So here we go, Max Chilton getting all ready to run the McMurtry up the hill. Can he beat the record? Listen, picking up the power. And away goes Max Chilton. The McMurtry, you're looking on board. This flying machine, it does the first 100 metres in just 3.51 seconds. It is flying as we expected. But will it set an all-new pace? Very close to the grass, but he makes it through. Up to the first sector, he's done 17.3. We're seeing the fastest times of the weekend. Maybe the fastest ever from Max Chilton in the McMurtry. 2,000 kilos of downforce, 1,000 horsepower, and it's all working well. Just coming in.
into the final section. Can he do it? Max Chilton heading for the line. He's coming across the room, just about to come across the line. Oh, yes, it's a fantastic time. 39.08. He has set a new record here at the Festival of Speed. And just look at the congratulations he gets from the crowd. A superb performance. He's done it. A whole new record. The McMurtry showing incredible pace. Might get arrested. She's sitting on my new sheet. We still get a mess. I've been in love. Continue straight ahead. In 40 yards, do not turn left or right. Do not follow the crowd. Just drive. You have reached your destination. You are home. You're never too young to fall in love with classic cars. It's a passion that lasts a lifetime, and it's a passion we share. Backed by over 75 years of motoring experience, Goodwood Classic Solutions is a unique new way to ensure your pride and joy. Goodwood Classic Solutions. It's a passion we share. still down here at the start line getting as much as we can and Dario Franchitti joins me now. How much are you enjoying Goodwood? Final few runs up that hill. Yeah, it, it, you always do, don't you? This has been the longest time I've been here. I came here Wednesday and <laughs> I, wish it, I wish it wasn't ending tonight. It's been so much fun. Sad yesterday. Sad for everybody that was coming to watch um, not to get on the hill, but uh, it was definitely the right decision when we saw the bits of the trees lying in the middle of the, uh, of the, the hill yesterday. So, but I've had a great time driving T50, the Rocket, and this BT44. Yeah, it's sad for me as well. I was due to come up with you in the T50, wasn't I? How is it? How was it up there, going up the hill? Yeah, the T50 is uh, it's at the end of its development life, though they're in production. Um, but it's so much fun. It's a great car for the hill. But earlier in the week, I had it on the M1. I was driving up and down to Donington, <laughs> using it for the commute. So <laughs> it's... Uh, you know, that V12 singing away to 12,000 on the hill, but then you can also use it as a, a daily driver. 
a daily job. Imagine just looking over your shoulder and seeing that coming past. <laughs> that is something. Uh, tell me about this one. Tell me about uh, the car you're in right now. Okay, so BT44 Brabham, Gordon's first F1 designed from a clean sheet of paper, uh, 1974, and um, won its first race in South Africa, his first Grand Prix win. So um, to get to drive this is, is a really special experience. It's just a big go-kart. It really is. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm going to race this car later in the year in America too, so I'm excited about that. Oh, that is amazing, isn't it? Um, and tell me, how much, I know you say you've been here um, the longest time yet at Goodwin. Obviously, we didn't have a day yesterday, but how special has this one felt? Certainly with all of the celebrations that we've had, all of the car anniversaries, the 30th running of this one. It's just been incredible. Every year you come here and you see something special. This year, you looked at, I looked at the entry list, I thought it was like a misprint. It just went on and on. And all these special cars. I mean, we're sitting here. There's a 250 GTO. There's a McLaren and Formula One car sitting there. This is part of history. Everywhere you look, BT44. You know, look behind you. There's the Pikes Peak Peugeot. It's just... It's this doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Yeah, it really doesn't. It's become a true global sport and such an appeal as well. You speak to fans and they say, oh, I'm coming all the way from Australia. I'm coming from New Zealand. I'm coming from America. Yeah, I met a marshal from Brazil, from Rio. He said, oh, I watched you race in Brazil in the, in the 90s. And that's, we all share the passion for this. And uh, I have to say thank you to the marshals, though, because without them, yeah. none of this is happening. And they have been phenomenal during the rain, the wind, everything. Great stuff. Dario, thank you very much. I'll thank let you. you head up and uh, get ready for thank the next you. run. Thank you, Dario. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to Laura Winter. Speaking to Dario Franchitti, the IndyCar legend, a man having the very best time this weekend. I'm Alex Jakes. I'm standing next to Bruce Jones and James Hayden in a minute. It's going to guide us through the bikes on what is, I'm delighted to say, a thrilling and rather sunny day out there. And we're about to see more action as well. Well, the weather's been great. The weather's been kind today. Still a bit of a blow this morning, but nothing as to yesterday when the wind was uh, gusting to nearly 50 miles an hour up the slopes. The bike stayed up right there, James. Yeah, it did indeed. And we're looking at the Birchall brothers. These two are unbelievable. It doesn't matter what discipline you put them on. Put them on the TT, put them on the short circuits. Uh, it was a centenary for the TT uh, this summer. Uh, and these were the first ever psycho outfit to do over average over 120 miles an hour. Um, which is, you know, unbelievable. And they just never fail to disappoint. They're just one, two, two minds thinking as well. They're one organized, one organism on this uh, cycle. Um, they really do do a, a wonderful job. And when you watch them as well, they are fully committed. These boys do not mess about. Is it possible to ride a sidecar outfit without being committed? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is, but you're going to be slow. But um, you, know, you just you, you just know these guys are, are all action, 100%. You know, they, they give it all, and as we watch them just come up to the commentary box, obviously got that little bit more grip, but they're committed already. Slightly wide, just gets it to quite the apex, but he's in a full on the brothers and the Virgil brothers absolutely slamming down there on their LCR Honda. And behind them, we've also we've got Maria Costello uh, and her passenger, uh, actually Maria's passenger, as we just watched the uh, Virgil Brothers finish off, is uh, Kate Walker, who normally races in the BMW F900 Cup for FHO in, um, in BSB. So uh, interesting little combo there of the two ladies coming up. And there they are, that's uh, Maria Costello, MBE, and uh, her passenger. It's only the second time she's ever been in a sidecar, so they're doing a, a fantastic job, the two ladies there. Um, screaming up the hill just behind the Birchalls. And was that a prize ride? Either the first prize or the booby prize to be the out, <laughs> outrider. But uh, yeah, such a lot of uh, muscular contraction there to keep down low, not to fall off the back, but the pressure on your forearms must be huge. Yeah, and this um, FHO team, yeah, they're, they're doing a wonderful job of getting behind women in our sport as well and, and bringing, them, bringing them on and bringing them through. Uh, so, yeah, and now we can see one of the old land speed record bikes. And uh, that looked like the... Um, that did look like number 84 it is. It's the CSI Norton ridden by Ian Bay. So this was a land speed record bike. So 113 miles an hour this did in uh, 1928. That's the reason it has no brakes, no mud guards, no anything, just because they wanted to keep it light. He rode it in the rain yesterday, and we were had our hands in our mouths somewhat.
Yeah, I mean, the, just the leg tentatively going down as the bike with that <laughs> tiny tire contact area trying to turn left at Malcolm. But what a fabulous job. Bravado still exists today. Now, what have we got here? It's a, a bike that appears to be missing an engine. Yeah, this is the white motorcycles concept. And uh, this is an ultra slippery bike that they're trying to develop for the bike electric bike land speed record. At the moment, it's got 100 kilowatts and it's nearly doing 200 mile an hour. And they want to take it to 350 kilowatts. So that thing is going to be mega. And oh, look at that. Ayrton Senna's old car, isn't it? It is indeed. Ayrton Senna's 1993 McLaren, and it is being driven once again uh, by Sebastian oh. Vettel, who is kicking it out. And uh, having gone to the bottom of the hill, he's gone back up there again. This part of his personal collection, and uh, again running on sustainable fuel. And he is having run after run after run to promote his race without trace program. Race without trace, it may be, but race to impress is certainly what he's doing. He's starting to hang it out. You know, Sebastian's one of those drivers that really gets this in the sport. He now acknowledges, let's get a bit of a burnout. And then, of course, you suddenly get to the, the flint wall. <gasps> Breathe in, turn the corner. Very, very valuable car. But I really admire drivers who want to get back to the cars from before their time. And Sebastian has got this totally in measure. Yeah, we were speaking about the fact that during his career, he always had an appreciation for where he sat in the grand history of the sport, and he's uh, he's gone back and collected some fine, fine items. Knows his history well. Of course, he's part of it as a four-time world champion, and he's trying to change things for the better with this program, which is why he's running in both the Williams and the McLaren this weekend. Now, of course, this, uh, we're celebrating 75 years since the Goodwood Motor Circuit opened, but 30 years since the start of the Festival of Speed. It's grown and grown, and some of the machinery we have now, quite extraordinary. Just seen the McLaren 300 SLR blasting up the hill with that wonderful uh, straight eight blaring away. But out on the start line, we're bringing faster and faster stuff. This is a real mix of cars and bikes, because, of course, that's the very nature of what we've had here over the years, the Festival of Speed, ever more a draw. And off the line, we heard from him a... Well, off the line, and then eventually a <laughs> fantastic burnout. <laughs> As we heard earlier on from Max Chilton, now we're seeing him on the circuit. He's uh, claimed the record in the past. This one just for fun. And uh, Max Chilton in the, in the McMurtry. Once again, McMurtry really, really looking superb behind the wheel. And this time, he's just taking it all in rather than going for outright speed. With the incredible fan under that car producing two tons of downforce, it's very, very good for cleaning a track as well, but uh, a thousand horsepower to play with from the electric motor. The McMurtry spearling, this is the tip of their iceberg. We're going to see more and more machinery coming through. We've heard that the uh, track car, the McMurtry spearling, pure is already out here down in the supercar paddock for track days. There is a much more to come, an incredible brains trust uh, down in the Cotswolds, and uh, it is still the car for the fourth dimension. Oh, it sounds completely alien as it sends itself across the final, but barely get a chance to get the sentence out. And he's pushing on at the end there. You heard Ben's wonderful commentary of the record-breaking lap a, a couple of moments ago. And every single time, whether on a demonstration run, whether chasing pure lap time, uh, absolutely brilliant to see. And it's going to be a favourite for years and years and years. And that record might stand for years and years and years. You certainly feel, I think, the only car that's likely to topple it is itself, the McMurtry Spearling. They think there's more in hand, but uh, so, so spectacular. Made for purpose. Don't forget, this is a car not uh, just let's have a go in a competition vehicle. This is a car made to do precisely what it did, and it does it very, very well indeed. But uh, on this run, Max Chilton just playing to the crowd. Everyone likes a smoking car, but it's the, it's the near silence. Then the whistling of the fans underneath of those electric motors and to my eye still slightly looking like a batmobile off it goes unbelievable acceleration yeah there's a few that fit that description uh, but that is uh, excellent to see and uh, we tick back through now and looking at many in the field and celebrating the entire 75 year history and once again we're out there with something further back yeah well this is celebrating more more the uh, the race circuit and it's Jaguar E-Type lightweight and Sean Lynn's car has been always a very very popular one down at the circuit and the likes of Graham Hill, Roy Salvadori, Jack Sears all race these cars at the Goodwood Motor Circuit with great aplomb and, and no one can underestimate what it was in 1961 when the Jaguar E-Type hit the scene it jaws dropped most notably Enzo Ferrari who described it when he saw it at the Geneva Motor Show as the most beautiful car in the world this a slightly more purposeful version thereof but he wasn't far from correct completing the run and 
Slightly more leisurely pace than we've just seen, but uh, that compares to almost everyone out there. Cutting the beam and through, uh, through they go. Plenty more still on the hill, though, as uh, we are slightly behind schedule due to the uh, thrilling shootout that we saw, uh, but no less spectacular as we mark off the Ferrari part, uh, making its way past our commentary box. Yeah, this is the Ferrari 250 GT SWB, short wheelbase competition. It's the only person who's going to make the dirt red van with the extra aerodynamic tail put on that, the longer bodywork, and uh, it was dubbed that, and it seemed to fit very well indeed because it was such a ridiculous nickname for a car as pure as this. Unfortunately for the uh, driver of that, they've had to back off a little bit before the end of the run. That's Miles Griffiths has had to back off. He's caught some older, slightly slower, but just as meritorious machinery at the top of the hill. Almost falling out of those old cars. You have to get very, very snug if you've got a passenger alongside, like plenty have. And uh, Miles Griffiths just having to wait across the line. But that picture tells you all you need to know about Goodwood. That's why we're celebrating 75 years old, classic, groundbreaking. We've seen it all in the last couple of minutes of the Magical Mile. Still cars coming up the hill, some making the most incredible sound. Now, of course, uh, Brabham was the first uh, constructor to win the World Championship 1966 in a car bearing his own name. So it's great to have that here uh, coming out to play. Long, thin lines. This is just before the advent of little wings that in very short time became very, very tall wings indeed. Aerodynamic tip Formula One. The cars have never looked as pure since, but by golly, they've had so much more downforce. They have, but you're absolutely right, Bruce. The, the pure racing shape. Well, it was something special. We go from one Brabham to another, from the BT20 to the BT44B, and this is Dario Franchitti behind the wheel. He told us a few moments ago he's going to be racing this in America. This, uh, when you get the debate about the greatest looking Formula One cars in history, this one always finds its way into the conversation. It does, even without that. In that incredibly crisp white and uh, martini livery. I just look how simple it is, but a lot of my colleagues, similar age to me, <laughs> them, that was their car. It is superb, and uh, you, you tell. I mean, he's had a smile on his face throughout the entire weekend. He's been racing up the hill in some beautiful machinery, but that, that might just top the lot as he finishes his run, and uh, they're both chasing the uh, phenomenal uh, Ferrari 250 across the line. Then we had the Brabham. Uh, it's a uh, another appearance for the Beast of Turin. And having stood by this on the start line a couple of hours ago, you've got to give it a wide berth because it is quite literally spitting fire at you. I did wonder why you came into the back, <laughs> back of the Cobbish box with a, a seared arm on your shirt, but it's an honour to be seared by the S76. <laughs> but this time, of course, Duncan Pitaway not going for a time. He was in the shootout. He had his serious helmet on, the black and yellow striped skid lid he's had for so long. But uh, every single passenger in, in the car, 28 litres of uh, roar away fun. It handles incredibly well for a car that was meant to be, or certainly Duncan gets it round corners, well, for a car that was made for straight line speed, going to the land speed record. But hang on, hang on, and just keep on smiling. That's my only message to the passenger <laughs> alongside. What a machine. Absolutely no choice. And uh, a reminder, that is on renewable fuel as well. So the contrast is Sebastian Vettel with a couple of Formula One icons, as well as one of the fan favourites of this fantastic festival. And better still, this is a car that doesn't just drive up the hill here and round the circuit. He drives it back to Bristol on the opener road. So just imagine your surprise. But we saw Sebastian Vettel take to the top of the hill, and he's always got something to say. Let's, so let's find out. He's with Ed Foster. So up in the top paddock again, but this time with uh, the McLaren, you were just saying, do you actually use these a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, we have to make sure that everything works, and uh, so far everything has worked here. So I had a little um, shakedown in Silverstone after the Grand Prix and uh, did about, uh, I think, 10 or 15 laps, so it was a lot of fun. Now, you obviously love your classic cars. Um, this is sort of one of the most wonderful shot windows. Has a few things caught your eye? Yeah, I mean, there's so many cars. I think uh, I haven't seen everything, but I think that's uh, quite a, a big ask to try and see everything in the day. Also, a lot of beautiful bikes. So, um, yeah, very iconic cars from my childhood, but way before that as well. And modern cars. So I think, um, yeah, you can really pick here. I saw you having a good chat with the bikers earlier. It's a wonderful meeting of two worlds, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, obviously nice that, you know, a lot of the 
not just race bikes, but also race bikes from, not just race bikes from nowadays, but also from the past are here and some of the riders even. Uh, I mean, we had Mr. Agostini that I think is now 81 years old and he's still going up the hill, which is incredible. So um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of joy today. Cheers up. Cheers. Maria, another festival of speed. It's lovely to see you back on your uh, on your machine. It's quite something, this, but it, the crowd seem to love it. They do because it's such a spectacle, sidecar racing, and it's great to represent sidecar racing here at the Festival of Speed. I love coming here, and also I love the fact that you can share this experience with other people. And today I've brought Kate Walker with me. She's one of the young girls that races for FHO. Um, she competes in the uh, BSB. BMW Cup, and um, this is her first sidecar experience. Well, I'll have a word with her in a second, but you're, you famously rode two wheels, three wheels at the Isle of Man TT, but I, I get a feeling that you love the three wheels more. Well, I've done solos for a long time, um, over 20 years, and of course I love doing that, but yeah, uh, this is just great. It's so different, and I really enjoy racing now. Fantastic, Maria, thank you. What we'll do is I'm gonna catch Kate behind me. I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in here, ruining your video. Um, first, first time you've been on a sidecar, how was it? I really enjoyed it. It's very different to riding a bike, very, very different. But it was insane. And I can't wait for Maria to take me out on a track. Yeah, you don't get too much time to actually kind of get your head around it when you're coming up a 1.16 mile hill. Yeah, it's, it's, quite a short, it's quite a short hill for getting my head around it. Today I've just been sat still, still passenger. Um, but I would quite like to get into it and start learning the movements because um, it's very interesting to watch the Birchills as they go up in front of you. So, yeah. Sat still but clinging on for dear life. Yeah, but you, you pin yourself with your feet and then you don't have to cling quite as, as bad. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'll tell you, I might get arrested. She's sitting in my new sheet. We still get a mess. I've been in love. to hear them start and then Honestly, it makes my heart sing. I can't stop smiling. Well, everybody said it's so exciting. You get to see all these cars, not just look at them, but you get to see them in action. That's cool. Goodwood Revival is all about make, do, and mend vintage style, not vintage values, and of course, sustainability. Not only is there the motor racing, but it's everything else. The shopping, it's the fun fair, it's the look, it's the period, and that is what the Good Revival is. It's just a fantastic day out.
<laughs> Good morning, hello, and welcome to Goodwood 2023. This is the Action Sports Arena. Guinness World Record attempt. Terry Grant on two wheels. The clock has started. Can he get to the top on two wheels? And if so, can he do it in less than two minutes and 55 seconds? Just think about this. You've got to maintain the balance. This isn't in a straight line. This is climbing all the time. You've got right-handers. You've got left-handers. Now up the straight. The road getting steeper and steeper at this point. Now this is the tricky bit. Let's hold our breath for him. Let's wish him well because he goes through the right. Now the left. This is where he got the wheels on the wall earlier on. He's nearly there, he's nearly there, he's nearly there. The chequered flag is at the ready for a two-wheelie Terry Grant. How about that? Now this is going to be fun. This is going to be sideways. This is going to be spectacular. This is going to be worth watching. Oliver Solberg, then son of the great Petter Solberg. He's been a real hit this weekend. He's been on the rally stage. He's been in the drift arena. He's been on the hill. He's been in a variety of cars. Oliver Solberg has been great value all weekend. The Citroen DS3 WRX World Rally Cross Car launches itself off the line. Brilliant acceleration with four-wheel drive from these cars. First sector, he's a second up, he's got bags of understeer, and he's got to sort that out on the run now. Up Park Street, look at this! That's unbelievable from Oliver Solberg in the Citroën. Fantastic stuff now as he comes up the hill. Is he going to get on with the same shenanigans here up at Malcolm? Onto the brakes, flicks it in, back on the power, hooks it up, powers oh. up the straight. He's quick on the second point, it's all sideways, but he's managed to save it. Through past flint wall he goes, the tail wags. So he's got to try to beat a 49.5, yet he's still quicker. Going through the second intermediate, again he's sideways, but he's millimetres away from the bales. Oliver Solberg up towards the timing line, he's sideways again, there's the flag. Can he go quicker than a 49? Yes he can, a 49.39. Puts Oliver Solberg fastest, fantastic stuff. Welcome back to the 30th edition of the Goodwood Festival of Speed, where it is time to gather now on the lawn by the sculpture because uh, Sebastian Vettel is heading to the uh, to the turning circle. He's moved his way past there, and I think he's moving his way. Uh, he's, he's, he's got a fair way to go. Um, I'm not going to give you play-by-play -play commentary of every stride, but he's making his way to the house uh, where we will hear from him the four-time world champion who has been 
up in two of his private cars. He was telling us about that shakedown at Silverstone. He was shaking down the McLaren from 1993 at the same time that Daniel Ricciardo was doing his tyre test in the latest Red Bull. And so two very popular drivers from the history of Formula One at different stages. One retired, one ending a mini hiatus and getting ready for his time back in Formula One from the Hungarian Grand Prix next time out. And if you're in front of the house, stay put, because you will soon be hearing from Sebastian Vettel. He will be talking to Karun Chandok, I believe, who's, uh, who's down there. And a guard of honor awaits the four-time world champion. Give us a wave if you're down there and you've had a terrific time. You can see yourself on the big screen. Thanks for making the atmosphere today so, so wonderful. What a contrast to the last 24 hours and uh, wonderful to speak to so many of you. The knowledge out there, the enthusiasm. It is an event to make you fall in love with motoring and motorsport all over again. And you really have made this a special shootout Sunday and we are in a few moments' time, going to hear from the four-time world champion as we get the batches back down the hill from, uh, from that 75-year celebration of the Goodwood Motor Racing Circuit, which, of course, will be hosting the revival later in the year as well. So they're coming the wrong way down the hill. If you think that you've had a few too many jars and you're like, what, they're going the wrong way? They're, they're, they're coming back. They're coming back to, uh, to park up. Give them a wave as they come back down as well. This is the last time that we'll see the uh, cars from the 75-year batch on the hill climb today. We've got a Porsche celebration to come your way. But before we get to that, we are awaiting the grand entrance for Sebastian Vettel. Or at least that's what I've been told. It really could be anything at this stage of a Sunday, but I believe it's going to be Sebastian Vettel who is going to be heading your way if you're in front of the house, if you're on the lawn. Just looking out the commentary box window. And uh, his car is parked up. His car is parked up, but I don't know if he's still in it, which is not the most descriptive commentary. Um, I'm, I've, I've asked the gallery. Gallery aren't particularly sure. I'm looking in the rest of the commentary box. There's a little bit of uncertainty in the comp box, but we're all having a terrific Sunday and awaiting. We will hear from him. We will locate the four-time world champion, and we will get his thoughts on uh, his fantastic runs up the hill today with the renewable fuel. I think he's just turned into a bit of a magpie looking for shiny things. He's got an amazing <laughs> car collection, but in whichever direction you look here, maybe he's looking up to that incredible sculpture, the Jerry Judah Porsche celebration in front of this house. And I'm sure that collection will grow and grow. And you know, with uh, Sebastian, he'll be getting those cars out as much as possible because his race without trace uh, concept is a really, really strong one. And I must say, the 2023 Goodwood Festival of Speed, celebrating 30 years of the event, but the amount of uh, alternative synthetic fuel, the hydrogen technology that's coming in alongside, and may in time supersede the electric technology, but uh, it is a time of change, but this event is as much about looking forward as it is, is looking at the illustrious, glorious past that covers over a century of uh, motorsport engineering. Yeah, well said, it absolutely is. And you can see that we are ready and waiting to receive uh, Sebastian Vettel. Yes, a lot of waving going on. Will we get a wave? That's the question. Do we get a wave from, yes, we get a thumbs up. That's one step above a wave. But what I love <laughs> is the fact that uh, people have looked at their timetable. They've worked out which of the many celebrations they want to go to in front of the house. There are giant screens all around the grounds here so they can watch the hill climb, even if they're not immediately trackside. And one thing that really stands out for me is that ripple of applause when the, the, the fans see a move, even if they're looking at it on the screens and it's further up the hill, everyone is involved and uh, everyone will go home with a camera chock full of photographs and yes. images and moving images, but also they'll capture the sound. And sound is such an important element of motorsport. Yeah, some of uh, certainly the Can-Am cars and the NAS cars and, well, let's be honest, absolutely everything, really, that we've seen, even when it's just a distinctive fan on the record setter. It is uh, an alien sound. It's great. Do we get any waves from anyone in our picture at the moment? Does anyone want to win the wave off? That's the question I've got. Has anyone noticed that they're on camera at the moment? Check yourself on the big screen. Yes, there's a wave. We're having a wave on. That's terrific waving. Everyone loving it. Is anyone going to better that? 
uh, Sebastian Vettel's been fired up, which is good news for everyone in the commentary box. Uh, Sebastian Vettel's been fired up once again. Hopefully he's being fired in the direction of the house and the turning circle down there. Here he is. Here's the four-time champion of the world, the man who dominated the first time round for Red Bull, and he's lighting it up. If there's enough room down there, yeah, probably wise when you own it, not to take too much punishment out there. And Sebastian Vettel with a couple of donuts, and I know that you're going to give him the warmest of receptions down there. He's completed the donuts, he's completed his runs as well, and that hybrid helmet that he's got, recalling the colours of Ayet and Senna, and his own traditional design that he had at the end of his Formula One career. Let's hear it for Sebastian Vettel getting out of the car and taking your applause down there. An epic driver with a, a look, an eye to the future, a view to the past, and that glorious McLaren MP4 8. That's the car from 1993, of course. The, the Senna's final McLaren, his finals win, scored in that car. It still stands the test of time. It looks crisp, it looks clean, and I'm just so pleased to know that Sebastian owns it. He's going to get that car out for more and more people to see around the world. Yeah, not, ju not just going to have a collection, not just going to leave it in a hangar, not going to admire it on his own. He's going to take it on a tour. And now, a warm, warm reception, and rightly so, for a man who made Formula One his own for four consecutive years in a Red Bull. That rings a bell. Here's the man who did it first time around, and this is lovely stuff. I mean, it's the very essence of the Festival of Speed here at Goodwood, the ability to get up close to the drivers and the riders, and they, they return. They love the fact it's not a pressured weekend. You're not at a MotoGP event, you're not at a Grand Prix. There is a little bit more space. There's less of a format that really restricts you to being in the car, being in the garage, being in the, the debrief. And uh, these photos will be so, so treasured. But I, I think, Sebastian, we need you up on the balcony. <laughs> chop, chop. <laughs> we, we do, we do. And uh, excellent to see that everyone is a Sebastian Vettel fan. He won plenty over with his driving. He won plenty over with his sensibility and his eloquence towards the end of his Formula One career as well. And he's taking his time to pose for photographs, to sign autographs down there as well. So the Duke of Richmond waiting to greet him on the, on the front steps of Goodwood House and uh, I think also just appreciating what the fans are appreciating, the human face of Sebastian Vettel, the pressure is off, but he's always been very, very good with the fans, but sometimes life as a contemporary Formula One driver makes that very difficult indeed. And he earned so many plaudits with appearing on television on Panorama, no, it was on um, Question Time, wasn't it? Yeah, he Last was. Year, in his second language, but he's such a master of it and uh, really put up some very good points. And in fact, a lot of the points were pretty much leading to Race Without Trace. Yes. And... He was very eloquent in his concerns, uh, but hasn't just spoken about it and disappeared. Has this program now that he is promoting, and uh, who knows how many cars will be added. Famous, iconic cars that will be added to the collection and running on sustainable fuel. Well, as we've seen here at the Festival of Speed, some cars back to the 1930s are now running. You know, in fact, 1911, there's Fiat S76 are running on uh, uh, you know, you just yeah. wouldn't have thought this would happen, but they're now running on synthetic fuels. The, the, we're definitely about to crest a rise, I think, on that front. And he's nearly made his way to the house. Funny enough, though, there's plenty of people who want to speak to him, want to meet him, and want his autograph as well. Selfies are plenty in there, as I imagine. And uh, this is what happens when you're a four-time world champion. And that amazing high shot looking down just shows how many fans and uh, family people are down there looking for a piece of the action. And he will, as he's only just at the front of the Jerry Judah sculpture, but I'm sure it'll be sped up and he'll get up to the house. So uh, enjoying the moment, not as much as the fans are, though. This is something very, very special. Of course, so much success uh, from the moment he got into Formula One. Clearly a cut above the vast majority from this fresh faced young German driver to get on board with Red Bull after his initial forays uh, with uh, BMW Sauer of the team yeah. and of course he took it away from there and uh, an illustrious career at Ferrari no further world champion chips after his Red Bull days but uh, always in contention he was and plenty of wins as well for Ferrari he was chasing down the win record with the famous Italian team uh, set by Nicky Lauda and the final years uh, didn't quite go to plan but then that move to Aston Martin that memorable podium 
in Baku when he was standing on the rostrum and gathering the pen up to sign. It'll be worth it to hear from him. And this is really, really nice for Sebastian. He had a wonderful send-off at the end of his Formula 1 career last year. And this is probably the first time that he's had anything like this since he stepped out of his Formula 1 career. And uh, a large smile on his face as he signs the last of the, all <laughs> the, last of the autographs. And understandably, everyone wants a piece of it. And it's incredible when you have a sporting career, you almost take it for granted when you're of his calibre, you're going to be up at the podium. But with a sports person, what is the right time to retire? So he must have thought, my podiums are behind me. He got that final one last year, which in many ways would almost feel like one of his very most special podiums. Yeah, absolutely. And the acclaim of the crowd and they're cheering for him as we pause things on the hill to celebrate the four-time world champion, the man who raced with Toro Rosso. As you mentioned, Bruce, could have been a very different story if BMW had stayed in the sport. He was a BMW driver, tempted to Red Bull when the Verin team pulled out, and he's finally made it. He's finally made it. And a warm hug for the Duke of Richmond. So they're not just disappearing for good, they're disappearing into the house and will work their way up the stairs to the balcony, the grand balcony, to give everybody down in that amazing crowd in front uh, of the house. And I'm sure we'll have some very, very warm words. And I know our own Karun Chandok is waiting to greet his hero, Sebastian Vettel, up on the balcony. Yeah, he'll be waiting just say there. His hero. <laughs> and yeah, uh, and I think that uh, Karud is very nearly in place and ready to uh, ready to receive the four-time world champion. Of course, Karun has a very, very rich taste. He has many heroes going f way back even before his birth, because of course the Chandok family steeped in racing. But he'll be up there on the balls of his feet waiting for Sebastian. It's going to be a big moment up on the balcony. It is. I'm not sure we've hyped it enough. Uh, maybe we could have had a little bit more of a build-up. <laughs> but we're really looking forward to it because Crude has got the microphone in hand and Sebastian Vettel has surely now made his way to the balcony. Now it's a big house, a lot of steps. But it can't be long now. We are ready and waiting to receive him. Gallery are standing by, we're standing by, you're standing by in front of the house. And it is nearly time to welcome the four-time world champion. I mean, it's a big house. I doubt they've got lost, though. So uh, it's not too, not too far away, surely, now. Yes, you can pull off for a cup of tea later, but uh, <laughs> you'll hear the roar. You'll see the flags waving from the fans down below. The second Sebastian Vettel goes out onto the balcony. OK, let's send it to Karun, who's speaking to Sebastian Vettel. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Lovely to see all of you here at the end of the weekend here at the Festival of Speed. It was a tricky day yesterday and a fantastic crowd. Uh, he surprised us. Four-time world champion, 53 Grand Prix victories. And he's brought two of his own icons to show off to all of you here, Sebastian Vettel. Seb, lovely to see you, as always. Um, first of all, thank you as a fan of the sport for bringing those cars back, restoring them, and showing them off in all its glory. Yeah, I mean, uh, likewise, I have to say thank you for all the people. Um, obviously, yesterday was a bit of a disappointment, um, but I think today the weather also made up for it. It was a really beautiful day, and um, I really enjoyed the time that I had. Every time you come here, there's so many cars you can get to see, so very special, as you said, to... Very special, as you said, to bring my own cars and, um, yeah, doing it in a more responsible way. That was the target, and I think a lot of people perceived it as, uh, you know, a very nice gesture and probably the way into the uh, a, a possibility to, into the future. So um, I heard a lot of people asking, how can we ask this for, you know, the, to use these kind of fuels all the time? So i um, not quite sure I have the answer, but basically if you, we all ask for it, then I think one day it's going to happen. Well, we often said... We, uh, we miss you in the paddock because you were one of the grown-ups. You think about the world outside the paddock. Um, how, how wonderful has it been to go through this journey? You've created sustainable fuel. For those of you here who aren't aware, both of Sebastian's cars that he had here were running on, on synthetic fuels that are eco-friendly. Um, and it's a project you're very passionate about. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not my project. I think we all live on the, in the same world and we've got to look after it. Obviously, the world is changing and it's very serious, but um, I think we've got to look out for it. Obviously, I love motorsport and um, it would be a shame if, you know, events like this or races or motorsport as a whole would, would be a threat or were to disappear. So that's why I really would like to protect it. I want us to be ahead of the wave um, before we really face that, uh, that threat. And um, I think all of us, we came here today, we admire these cars. Obviously, I had the pleasure of driving some of them. But, um, you know, to see them, it would be, would be a shame if they were silent forever and if they were to disappear. So I, wanna, we, I think we want to keep them alive, and I think we can do that together. Well, li well, listen, last year, we had Nigel Mansell here. He driven Red 5, parked exactly where you did. did he do did he do a donut? He didn't do donuts, no. no. He, 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 I did make him cry on the balcony when he, when he saw that. Uh, you do a good Nigel impression. Go on. Can you... Uh... No, 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 there's too many people now. So, uh, and I, I love Nigel. But um, I admire him because, you know, I drove his car earlier. And I don't know how he has managed to be that quick. There's no space in that car. And I'm tiny. Whereas he, you know, he's a strong guy. He's the lion. So... Um, really incredible time. I would love to just time travel back to the 90s and, uh, and find myself in the grid in one of these cars and, and race these guys. Not sure I would, uh, would get on, <laughs> but I would definitely love to have a go. No, incredible, incredible machinery and uh, nice that 30 years later we still get the chance to, you know, uh, fire that car up. Well, the uh, car that you parked in front of everyone here today was Ayrton Senna's McLaren from his last season McLaren, his last Monaco win, an incredible car. Was it an emotional experience? Because you, you were there in Ayrton's seat, the steering wheel, I saw it, it said AS on it, the pedals had his initials. Is it emotional? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, uh, I guess to most of us here, Ayrton is a big, big name and means, means a lot. So, um, yeah, to touch his, his steering wheel, to sit in his seat and to drive his car, really, is, uh, is incredible. But um, it means so much more to do it in front of so many people. I had a secret test. Um, this week actually in Silverstone where I shook down the car and wanted to make sure that everything is running and, and working. It was so much fun because I got like 10 or 15 laps and I was trying to push a little bit as well. It was incredible. Um, I wasn't that much slower than nowadays cars. I heard. Yeah, so um, I was still taking a little bit of margin because it's my car. So if I crash, I have to pay. So bit different to usual, but no, it's incredible. So um, I think it's, like I said earlier, it would be a shame if, you know, these cars were locked up at some point and not allowed to breathe some air, especially with racing cars. You know, they have that history. Um, Ayrton is one of the legends of our sport. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's make sure that car keeps, keeps on living. And listen, I think all the fans here would love to hear, are you missing F1? Have you been, I don't know, sitting on the sofa with a bag of popcorn watching it? Like, what do you do on Grand Prix Sunday now? Well, I've got three kids. I think uh, there's a lot of children today and a lot of parents. I think you're quite busy when you have kids, but I do enjoy it. I think, um, you know, obviously F1 is very intense. The way I want to do it, the way I did it, um, you've got to give it your everything. And at some point you, I don't know, as a parent, maybe you, you, you sympathize, but uh, you run out of time. So um, I, I do enjoy the new, new challenge. I'm not quite sure what the next, next chapter is. I mean, I do care about you know, the world and uh, want to make sure that I use my voice for, for good things. So this today, this weekend is, uh, is part of that. But I'm, I'm hoping there's more to come. But um, yeah, I watch the races without popcorn, but I do enjoy it. I'm, I'm very much a fan. I can't help the live commenting when I'm watching. Um, uh, to my wife, but um, I hope she doesn't mind. But it's it's uh, it's been a you know the time has gone by fast for for now, but it starts to tickle a little bit. I think this will help a little bit this experience to dampen it a bit. But um, yeah, eventually I think um, I will have to obviously find something that really challenges me. I'm not quite sure yet what that is, but I will well, we can find you a job in the commentary box. Who would like to have him in the commentary box? What do you think? <laughs> Well, the key, the key is you've got to keep feeding crofty sausages and hash browns and you'll be all right, you know? No, I, I think that's more for you. I'm, I'm happy to, to watch. Uh, also, I have a habit of talking too much, so <laughs> it's probably not the most enjoyable commentary then. But, um, yeah, I'm sure I'll be back to, to one, of the, one or two races soon um, because I miss, you know, a lot of the people as well. It's, it's all about people in the end of the day, a lot of friends, and, uh, yeah, there's a lot of friends that I, that I do miss. Now, listen... Have you had a good time here today? Are you going to be coming back? Are you buying more toys to come and show off to everyone? What's the plan? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I had a very busy day, but I did, in, it did enjoy it. So um, it would be nice to be back. It didn't, I have been here, I think it was in 2012. So that's more than 10 years ago. It didn't feel that long ago. And I hope that the next time is not going to be t uh, another 10 years. There's the revival as well. I, lo I love old shit. So uh, I hope to be, hope to be back uh, rather sooner than later. Well, I'm going to invite the Duke of Richmond along here. Um, Sebastian says he's going to come along and race at the revival. Are you going to find him something nice to drive? I think we'll, I think we'll find him something quite easy. Uh, I think um, maybe a, uh, nine, in the 911 race, maybe all on synthetic fuels we're riding in the car. So that'll, 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 that'll suit you. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or maybe on the bike, because I spoke to some of the riders earlier. I think it's incredible. There's also so many nice motorbikes. I love motorbikes uh, out there. So... Um, the revival also happens for the, for the riders. That would be a proper challenge to get me on a bike. <laughs> I'm not sure how your wife feels about you racing on the bikes. But <laughs> uh, listen, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to give one last big round of applause for Sebastian Vettel. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Well, what an unbelievable reception it was for Sebastian Vettel there, the four-time world champion, 53 times a winner. And look, still people standing and waving, cheering the guard of honour. It was incredible, wasn't it, David? And rightly so, celebrating the man's legacy on the track, celebrating what we're now seeing, the future of it off the track as well. Absolutely. It's always great to see these Goodwood Festival Seed balcony moments. We've had Valentino Rossi last year. We had Nigel Mansell and a huge crowd here for Sebastian Vettel in the Red Five. And also really interesting to know that uh, Seb's into old ships. That's what he said. Absolutely. Uh, this crowd now dispersing amongst us. There you go. Very busy here in front of Goodwood House. But it's really interesting. He, we chaired a press conference with him earlier on where he spoke to the media about Race Without a Trace, about his vision for the future of motorsport, fundamentally saying we need to preserve the heritage, the passion, the fun that everyone has, the sound that we heard from his Williams and the McLaren, of course, Ayrton Senna's McLaren earlier on, while also being able to do it sustainably, responsibly, and looking to a cleaner, greener future. Well, Seb's like most people here, they love motorsport. And like you said, you'd hate to see these cars silence. You know, so if there's a way we can do it, that's both responsible and still keeping these cars alive and enjoying them, what better way is that, you know? And, and the crowd are loving it. And I think it's just a great way for him to move into something after his Formula One career. Yeah, it's a pretty impressive message, isn't it? A guy who's obviously come from a vast, rich motorsport background to understand and realize his place in the world and how he can then help. Absolutely, yeah. And look, it's a, it's a really honorable thing to do. And I think, you know, he's come here months after finishing F1. He's clearly relaxed. He's enjoying it. I mean, it took him ages just to get from the track to the house because of all the fans. And, and, and I've just seen him more relaxed than I've ever seen him in F1. And it's I great know. to see. Yeah, he is, absolutely. We saw glimmers of that through the last part of the season where he knew he was going to retire. He'd made that announcement. And obviously, he could allow the season to unfold and he looks to his future, um, which is here at Goodwood, spreading his good message to all of these wonderful people and all of these brilliant fans who are joining us now. Hello to all of you. <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, we have a bit more action to come, David, don't we, on the hill? We do, absolutely. We're going to see some more batches. It's been jam-packed today. We've got an extra cram day after yesterday, so the more the merrier for me. Yeah, absolutely. The atmosphere here is just brilliant today, of course, with the cancellation of yesterday. Everyone making more than up for it today. Uh, so we'll be back with Action on the Hill after this short break. To hear them start and then... <laughs> You're built different. Breathing new life into broken. Taking matters into your own hands. Assembling big dreams from the small things. Never stopping until you find the right part at the right price. That's the eBay way.
It makes my heart sing. I can't stop smiling. Well, everybody said it's so exciting. You get to see all these cars, not just look at them, but you get to see them in action. That's cool. Goodwood Revival is all about make, do, and mend, vintage style, not vintage values, and of course, sustainability. Not only is there the motor racing, but it's everything else. The shopping, it's the fun fair, it's the look, it's the period, and that is what the Goodwood Revival is. It's just a fantastic day out. Still getting messy. Come on, Joe, where are you? I need that lift. Come on. He's never let me down before. Where is he? Ooh, that's more like it. 
This is nice. This is a I heard when they want to make this car, they want to make it a Rolls Royce first and an electric second, so you had to feel like you were in a Rolls Royce. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I'm in a Rolls Royce straight away, immediately. What I love is the rather perceptive Charles Rose said, the electric car is perfectly noiseless and clean. There is no smell or vibration. No. Pretty wild. 123 yeah. years later, with that company founded with Henry Royce, they finally have it with this car. They're all electric Rolls Royce. Yeah, uh, his dreams have come true. I mean, let's just listen for a second. Nothing. <laughs> and you can put your foot down, can't you? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That is amazing. He is so much power, isn't it? Yeah. I couldn't help myself. Warm me next time. No, I'm joking. <laughs> That's brilliant. And that steering weight, it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's all one hand driving. Uh, it's super easy to drive. You could call it the Rolls Royce of electric cars. Ha <laughs> ha. I like what you did there. Very good. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Appreciate that. Let's see what else we got in here. Now, this is very interesting. We're seeing this for the first time here at the Festival of Speed. The new halo car from Lamborghini, the Revolto, replaces the Aventador. It's got three electric motors, but crucially, still a V12 at its beating heart. This thing looks fast standing still. We're also seeing some brand new manufacturers here at the Festival of Speed. This is Hi-Fi from China, and this is the Hi-Fi Z, and it's absolutely jam-packed with high-tech gizmos. Look at this, powered by Unreal Engine from Epic Games. I love it already, look at that. Only a few years ago, they said they wouldn't make one, but here we have it, the Ferrari SUV, the Pura Sangway, used at the festival as a course car. launch here at the Festival of Speed is a Hyundai Ioniq 5N. And N, this little letter on the back here, is very important. Think BMW M Sport. It's the performance division of Hyundai. And it's taken this quite lovable SUV crossover and turning it into an absolute beast of a car. We also see Maserati's last ever V8 in their 334 Ghibli Ultima. The fastest four-door saloon on the market, 207 miles an hour. The Ineos Grenadier was Sir Jim Ratcliffe's first 4x4. And the festival this year, we see the second model, the Quartermaster, basically a double cab pickup version of the Grenadier. To end this year's look at new cars at the festival, we're going to Aston Martin. They've got the DB12, which is an important car for them, but the crowds will be turning up for this, the Valkyrie, their F1 car for the road, and I'm driving it up the hill. Super excited. Oh, oh. oh my God, that mechanical sound is incredible. We come through the smoke here, and then you let them revs creep up and you feel like you want to change and you realize you've got about another 5,000 reps to go. It's absolutely incredible. Wow. And as the reps climb, wow, gosh, it's unbelievable. This thing, it's got so much potential. Warming up these two hard tires and over the finish line there, and it's just mega quick. Whoa. The cars of 2023 at Festival Speed, setting a new high bar, and of course, this one's up there, the Aston Martin Valkyrie. Just need that two and a half million pounds and we'll be sorted. It was one of those ideas which we had no idea how, how good or bad it was going to be until we did it. And of course, Dougie, well, he made a fantastic job of it.
Bit late. We've been uh, working a little bit in uh, in the jump, you know. But is it going to be any good? Do you think better than last year? Yeah, I think it can be better from last year. How do you think you're going to make it any better? Like that would be good, yeah. no? Yeah. I think we have something here. Flying, big jump. I think we got it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Thank you go. go. Sorry. Sorry. See you later. So here we go, Max Chilton getting all ready to run the McMurtry up the hill. Can he beat the record? Listen, picking up the power. And away goes Max Chilton. The McMurtry, you're looking on board. This flying machine, it does the first 100 metres in just 3.51 seconds. It is flying as we expected. But will it set an all-new pace? Very close to the grass, but he makes it through. Up to the first sector, he's done 17.3. We're seeing the fastest times of the weekend, maybe the fastest ever from Max Chilton in the McMurtry. 2,000 kilos of downforce, 1,000 horsepower, and it's all working well. Just coming into the final section, can he do it? Max Chilton heading for the line. He's coming across the room, just about to come across the line. Oh, yes, it's a fantastic time. 39.08. He has set a new record here at the Festival of Speed. And just look at the congratulations he gets from the crowd. A superb performance. He's done it. A whole new record. The McMurtry showing incredible pace. So this is Future Lab, Goodwood's innovation pavilion packed full of dynamic interactive technology here to inspire everyone from industry enthusiasts to the next generation of budding scientists. Let's check it out. So I've managed to find a friend over here. Who's Sprout? What's he up to? Sprout is an electric robot for field work. So Sprout's able to carry lots of different tools within it. So we've developed an asparagus harvester as the first tool where it looks at the crop, identifies whether it's ripe, and then cuts it off using a soft gripper and a vibrating blade. Inside, underneath the bonnet, there are two 3D cameras. And those cameras look and use deep learning to identify where every single spear is. Sprout is battery powered, it's fully electric, it's lightweight, it can run for 12 to 16 hours a day, completely autonomously, no stopping, no brakes, and do that day in, day out. Now, I don't know about you, but ever since I was a little girl, I have been fascinated by space. So this is an exciting moment because we have a commercial crew astronaut in the house with us here. What we are really excited to hear about is the Saxaford Spaceport. What does that mean? The Saxaford Spaceport is the very first vertical launch facility in the UK. So when you say a vertical launch facility, you mean we go like this? It's important for the world, specifically because we send up a kind of satellite in a particular orbit that we can only do from places like Saxaford. The thing is that tomorrow's jobs are in space. We solve all the challenges we face on Earth by solving for space. Uh, over half the information we have about climate change comes from assets in space. Saxford is about to do a launch in October, uh, the, their very first one, and it, it is exciting. Well, Mike, thank you again, and we can't wait to see the success of it all.
Well, from outer space, I now have my feet firmly back on the ground, and it is time to jump into something even more futuristic. <laughs> wow. So, Sergio, we're inside Climb E. What are we experiencing? Okay, Climb E is the vision, our vision, Ital Design vision of the future mobility. So it is uh, the merging of vertical mobility and horizontal mobility. You still see the real interior of car, you still see the, the people around you, yeah. your body, your hands, but outside you will see this virtual city. All right, let's give it a go, shall we? Well, wow, Sergio, thank you for transporting me to a whole other universe. Um, it's quite bizarre that I'm actually just sitting here at Goodwood Festival Speed with you guys. front door in the middle of the party and he, of course he won the race which was just spectacular so he come back with in absolute spectacular style he arrived this must have been 10 o'clock in the evening he was in shorts and a sort of t-shirt and his hair was you know like like it is so he was take whipped upstairs put his dinner jacket on came down and um, I presumed he would you know sort of disappear after dinner or something but not a bit of it no he stayed for the show and he was just so enthusiastic and and um, he was like a boy really so excited about it all I think of all the moments we've had with the crowd at Goodwood and the crowd being caught up in the moment um, we've had a couple of them um, but that was one of the one of the absolute big ones yeah. See him and Moss drive up the hill together was a pretty emotional moment. And again, grown men uh, were crying. It's like it really is a, a, a big moment. And we lifted Jenks. He was too frail to even come out of the car. We picked him up out of the body of the of the SLR and brought him actually in here. And he lay on this he lay on this very sofa for a while, kind of recovering from the whole the whole experience. <laughs> We have made our way into the drifting section of this chuck it all in and enjoy batch, which means that we will be handing you over to our drift masters behind the mic. Looking forward to hearing this. Take it away, guys. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is the last session of the weekend. We are delighted to see our drift cars back on the hill. And as you can see, Steve Biagioni there in that uh, Nissan GTR with an LSX turbo engine in it. Ian? Yes, certainly is. Yes, Steve Biagioni uh, making his way up the hill in that 880 horsepower uh, Nissan uh, GTR 35. As Becky said, engine swapped to a Chevrolet V8 with a huge truck turbo on it. If you haven't had a chance this weekend to go over and have a look, you've got a few more hours left to get there and have a glass before he does make his way home and off the line. You can see, hand out the window, waving to the crowd, is the one and only Kevin Quinn in this incredible Nissan Silvia S15. Two JT underneath the bonnet, Becky. This one you absolutely adore. I do. I'm, I'm a big fan of a clean build, and, and Kevin Quinn, absolutely. He's almost OCD when it comes to building cars. That thing is so clean inside, but he is a big fan of the So if you're anywhere in the vicinity of that car right now, you might want a little bit of protection. 
competition because he loves that limiter. He certainly does, yeah. And look, these guys, this is the last run of the day for those guys. So they're going to put on a show. They said they have plenty of tyres left over from a rain and a cancelled day. So they're going to blow the tyres off the back of these cars and put on an incredible smoke show as Kevin Quinn makes his way up the hill towards Morecambe. And fires the car past the commentary tower. Absolutely on the rev limit, up right to the edge of the circuit. As Kevin Quinn, no messing around, Becky, he's a showman for sure. He makes me laugh because he always pushes it right to the edge. When it's the last run of the day, you know you're either going to have uh, a huge moment or something absolutely spectacular and nothing in between. As you can see, Peter Viensek here, it's the last run. And uh, this is a brand new build, it's that A90 Super 2JC. Beautiful looking car. There are some things that he's still trying to work out with me. He said to me the other day, he said, I actually had no, uh, I had no wipers when it was raining the other day. Oh, wow. So they're still kind of uh, sort of Still fine tuning it. Still fine tuning it, yeah. Electrics. I mean, who needs, who needs windscreen wipers these days anyway? <laughs> it's not like we had any rain. Well, no, the two-time Polish European champion makes his way now up towards the Consauer as he fires the car into Malcolm. Absolutely to the edge of the circuit, 90 degrees, and uh, he is pushing, wants to put on a show. Will he keep that enthusiasm all the way up past to the wall, to the flint wall? And he does, serves us slightly, now backs it in. Very nice, gets the front bumper onto the hay bow and lit all the way up the hill is Peter Vincek. He's uh, carrying a lot of speed there, I mean. Uh, it's really good to see them in the drive because that's what we were talking about the other day. The name of the game is grip. The more grip that you have out there, the better because then you can put on an even more accurate show. This is now George Barkley in that brand new HGK build. It's a 2JZ, it's a 2 Series. It's a really nice car, actually. Do you know, if I was going to have a new drift car built for me, I'd definitely go for a 2 Series because they're just so light and nimble and really well balanced. But uh, he really loves putting on a show for the people. He's uh, there. He is, hand on the roof, as always. Classic George Barkley. Yeah, it certainly is. George Barkley loves to put on a show. Loves to be here at Goodwood and said that he's going to go out and give it his all on this one. And he's uh, if you've been down in the paddock, blowing your eardrums out with the anti lag as he makes his way back into Cathedral this afternoon. And there we go, George Barkley destroying the tyres on the back of that carbon Kevlar BMW F22 2 Series, as Becky said. And as I look down underneath the bridge, George Barkley is going to do a rolling burn out the whole way up the hill no messing around fun fact you know always people are asking now how long do these tires uh, last but do you know what they probably take 40 tires on a competition weekend and then you would use an entire set of tires in just one chase run on one lead run so uh, the consumables are definitely the rubber if you're going to start drifting they certainly are yeah but these guys are using a brand new pair of tires for every single run up the hill we we're estimating around 500 pounds in cost to just do one run up the hill this weekend pricey but it looks good it certainly does look good so George Barkley take it tentative past the flip wall doesn't want to damage that beautiful car now as he makes his way up the hill brand new build as we say this and is he'll his be first debuting it. oh and uh, Axel uh, Hildebrand just take a little trip onto the grass Becky not where we want to see him no but you know what like uh, this car the rotor vet as he calls it it's a three rotor with a turbo obviously we saw Mad Mike he's a four rotor naturally aspirated but this car as you said it's quite funny listening to the purists uh, looking at this the Americans are like oh beautiful C6 Corvette and what does it have in it a rotary. That's a rotary. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, confused faces the weekend when the bonnets were opened down in Cathedral Paddock and guys were walking past saying, well, that should have an LS3 in it from Chevrolet and it doesn't anymore. It has a Japanese triple rotor turbo engine with the exhaust straight out the wing. It stinks with race fuel and it makes a hell of a racket and he gets away with it because it looks so cool as Axel Hildebrand goes up the hill. And here we have the e-tron. Uh, I mean, this car, you have to say, all of the e-tron cars are so well turned out. They're very futuristic, straight out of a sci-fi film. But he's giving it the best shot. Do you know what I think? When, they, when the drifters go up, you see all of the other drivers start to uh, misbehave. Yeah, Tom Christensen doing an incredible job there in that uh, Hoonitron, the e-tron built for, of course, Ken Block in that iconic Jim Carner video and uh, almost getting it wrong there down towards Morecambe, but makes his way up now. And uh, do you know what? I love the way these cars just rotate on their axis, these four-wheel drive cars. And here we go, Mad Mike with it. Yeah, in the incredible Mazda RX-7, that quad rotor, naturally aspirated Mazda. The OG, as we spoke to him the other day, I mentioned it with Becky on the commentary saying that this is the original car that Mad Mike began drifting in way, way back. And he said that he kept the patina on the car, Becky. They just aerosoled over it. They left all the holes and all the damage to remind everyone what this car has in its heritage. Listen to that. I mean, it's absolutely blowing our speakers out in the comments box here, but that it's just an incredible sound. And he is such a master of the rotary engine. I mean, this car coming back up the hill, it, it just sounds incredible, doesn't it? And it's popping and banging, throwing flames everywhere, so just coming into Malcolm. Very nice. 
Yeah, nice it's all about revving it. <laughs> Using all of it there as he comes through Morecambe now. Mad Mike Reddick shooting some flames out the back. This car is an all-rounder. It's got the show, it's got the sound, and it's got the smell now of the two-stroke coil burns. From the exhaust as Mad Mike Widdett makes his way to the final part of the hill, up towards the finish line. Absolutely firing through. Front bumper on the hay bales, Becky. No messing around for Mad Mike Widdett. I will say, of all the RX7 FD3Ss that I've seen, his is one of my absolute favourites. Well, there we go. That is the end of our drift show. Becky, it's been an honour, as always. We'll step back and uh, time to end our weekend here at Goodwood 2023. It's been absolutely incredible. We love having the drift cars here, and we will be back next year bigger, better, smokier, noisier, and all the good stuff. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, guys. That was absolutely wonderful all the way through the weekend. And one of the sights and sounds of the Festival of Speed. That was, that was great. The sheer enthusiasm. Isn't it wonderful to hear the commentary for the drift Kana that we have seen out there. Thanks to Ian, thanks to Becky. That was wonderful. Going to welcome back Alice Powell into commentary once she has arranged her laptop. And we're about to send the rumble of NASCAR to the hill climb in the concluding moments of this 30th Festival of Speed. And it certainly is Miller time. This is excellent to see on the circuit. The Buick Regal built in 1983. And this is... Uh, the car that belonged to Bobby Allison. And uh, great to see it now attacking on the circuit. We talked about this when it went up the hill earlier in the week, Alice, how there's a clear lineage for the Buick that was on sale at the time there. And then, of course, when you see it in racing decal, when you see it in racing livery, and it's racing as much as NASCAR always have, they, they're like Formula One catch up. We've always been packing the races in. <laughs> We certainly have, but aren't they just so impressive, these NASCARs? Celebrating, of course, 75 years of NASCAR this year. Hugely impressive, and we, we, we got the treat to see them go up earlier, and it's uh, such a treat to get to see them go up again. Yeah, very much is. So this superb Buick Regal being driven by Mel Pocock behind the wheel. And if it's a little bit louder on the microphone, it's because we are having to outshout the rumble, the growl, and uh, the sheer outrageous noise of this gaggle of NASCAR stock cars that are climbing the hill. And we're going to cram it all in now. There's a real mixture coming your way. If you remain at the circuit, you can see plenty of you taking uh, photos. And so many of you are going to have so many great shots to show friends, family, anyone that you're close to. That's the 71st, uh, 75th anniversary car uh, that was down there earlier on. And that uh, is turning circle, absolutely pathetic. It's noise, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's impressive. I don't think they're meant to do a big circle, <laughs> no. are they? We've got some rally cars now out to just add to the noise. And look at these. I mean, they were so fast and so impressive up the hill. I mean, they can just go across the grass. They don't actually have to really take the proper corners, do they, Alex? Not at all. Choose your own adventure. Why not when it's built like that? The car built by Toyota for the Dakar Rally, the GR there to Brumel behind the wheel and having a lot of fun as he completes his last run in there. So we have combined. If you're wondering what is it, OK, we're getting a lot here. We are getting a lot. We're combining batches due to some of the overrun from earlier on. It means that you are going to see quite a lot. And here's some more action in front of the house, kicking up the dirt, kicking up the dust, getting rid of the rubber. Why not? You're not going to need it for the rest of the weekend. Those tyres taking a pounding, Alice. Yeah, rally showing they can do drifting and donuts as well. So the drifting there has come slamming on the brakes through Malcolm Corner, kicking up so many dust. And here we have Jensen Button now. The 2009 world champion who took this car in the Garage 56 entry to the 100th edition of Le Mans, celebrating NASCAR's 75th year. That's why they uh, continued this project. They took so much weight out of the car. They built it to run 24 hours. It saw the flag. And you get the feeling when you speak to Jensen about the experience, Alice, that he just loved it. In fact, he loved it so much. He's thinking about a full-time return to racing next year. It, it, clearly, the bug has bitten once again. Yeah, and he actually said when he was up in much older single seat, I can't, I can't remember. So Williams, it was, it was uh, Ross Williams. Williams. Uh, he actually said, "I miss my NASCAR 
So uh, giving the crowd plenty to see down there, doing some donuts, plenty of burnouts as well. And uh, you may, maybe, just maybe, Alex, we might see him take a full season, like you said, in NASCAR, but he wasn't giving any secrets away. <laughs> he is loving it. You can it. tell he's enjoying it. Look at that. He's having the time of his life out there. If you haven't seen it as well, dig out his interview after his first NASCAR Cup race at the Circuit of the Americas because he was a man who looked like he just got out of a pub brawl. He was astonished at the driving standards behind the wheel. He was back behind the wheel in that category in Chicago recently, but surely the highlight of his year, getting behind the wheel of this car in the experimental class of the uh, 100th centenary edition of Le Mans, and he is lighting up the last of the rubber outside our commentary box window. So yeah. much you can barely see him. I think there's going to be quite a competition between the three of them that were behind the wheel to eventually have ownership of this one. And I don't think NASCAR will want to give it up at all. They are very, very proud of what they did with that entry, the Hendrick Motorsports entry. Smell the rubber, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. If you're, smell a Mulcom, the rubber. if you're a Malcolm Corner, you have no choice. It is uh, a terrific run. That's uh, one of the most memorable runs that we've seen as it continues all the way up the hill. We have some prestigious entries still to come behind as we review Jensen Button's last run behind the wheel this weekend in the Chevy Camaro, the one that did the whole 24 hours of Le Mans. Yes, now we have the brand new Hyundai Ionic 5N in its drift spec. The N standing for Nürburgring, of course, slamming on the brakes. Are oh, they going to attempt to do a donut? Yes, oh, just about. <laughs> it's a heavy car, as we've heard, but they, they, this is the spec, the spec that they've brought. They brought a, a, a variety of different models for the launch of this launch. Uh, specifically, the N version on Thursday. Uh, plenty launching their cars uh, this week. And there's still time to go and see the manufacturer's stands. There's still time to admire all of it. Uh, but understandably, plenty of you are watching by the side. <laughs> Oh, oh wow, Jensen, you've done a proper good job of that, haven't you? Look at the rubber left. That is outstanding. <laughs> World champion class burnouts in front of you at the end of the Festival of Speed. And now we're, now we're talking. Uh, they, have had, uh, they have had a very, very interesting Festival of Speed. Certainly at this corner, stand back. We're heading into Malcolm. And that's expertly done. I'm really showing that a two-ton electric car can do drifting too. Absolutely. Uh, the run being completed, easy around the flint wall, and all the fun completed. And now we're 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 bobbing between groups here as we go back to the ones that should have been running at this stage. We are combining groups. This is the Lagonda, I believe. The, yep. the lovely purr of the Lagonda M45R. It certainly is built in 1935 and actually was a Le Mans winner as well. It's a 4.5 litre straight six and being beautifully driven up the, the hill by James Wood, so I can't imagine he's going to be stopping to do any donuts. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, not in that beautiful car at least. <laughs> no, far more, far more ordered. And uh, oh, spoke too soon. Careful now. Oh, uh, a wow. tap on the head. A tap on the head to say, what did I nearly just do? Thankfully. That was nearly a, a long nose into a short nose there, wasn't it, for the, for the Jaguar? <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Not the grass, not the grass, oh. not the grass. Heart in mouth. And then well gathered and breathe again <laughs> for one <laughs> of our favorite entries. You're curious, of course, the version that has uh, been up the hill so many times, purchased in 1956, winning the whole thing in 1957 as we make our way to the Renault Alpine entry from the 70s. Yeah, another Le Mans winner, plenty that we're seeing going up the hill are Le Mans, the Alpine Renault, the two litre V6 turbocharged with obviously a big airbox, the top of uh, just behind the driver there. So heading 
up the hill and actually probably one of my favorite cars that we we're seeing going up the hill yeah if anything screamed 70s yeah. <laughs> it's a giant air box with that livery and helping now competing of course in formula one but this was the uh, the winning entry They're great to see it back on the hill once again yeah it's lovely isn't it we were, had the pleasure of seeing all these cars obviously here earlier on in the day and we've got a nice variety going up the hill we've got a, a cadillac going up we've got several other cars more rally cars to come away as well all mixed in with this this bunch, the two batches combined, of course, as the Alpine comes up now to cross the line. And the twin turbo V6 has completed the run, so back out there once again. And uh, we now move to a, another Le Mans entry. And we're running through quite a few, as you, uh, as you would expect at the end of the day. Yeah, taking, coming into Malcolm Corner now, just the size of those rear tyres, Alex. The Toyota 92C, driven by Johnny Molum. Nicely done. Take it nice and gently up the hill, as I would too. And Toyota, who spent so long trying to win the great race, uh, eventually ended up dominating. Uh, that wonderful example from a few years back now and we're showing you the best of rally we're showing you the best of nascar we've got classic icons from le mans as well we've also got uh, some sports cars sitting on the line but now we're heading into the quattro era of things and uh, this distinctive look has been uh, uh, time and time again after the hill and we're seeing it one more time now as we Rotate our way in true rally style through Malcolm Corder. Definitely showing us that it's the end of the day. Oh, it's almost like we're still doing the drift competition with, with some of the driving out there at the moment. As the Audi sprints up the hill, many people still here trying to get a glimpse of these incredible cars, getting their cameras out. Great demonstration there by the Audi. Stick from fist behind the wheel as well. The uh, original, original stick uh, behind the wheel and a rally icon, both driving and both in terms of the bar. Great to see. And we are, we are bobbing all over the place, all over the place with uh, various out there. And uh, this superb looking, this is uh, the, the Radford, the Jensen Button uh, coach built return era and uh, being taken up the hill once again, part of uh, Jensen Button's really enjoyable retirement from Formula One, this project. I think he's had lots of enjoyable re retirements, hasn't he? He seems to be enjoying himself a plenty as just streaming past our commentary box window was David Braven in his Jaguar. And now we have Harry Tignall really showing up. It doesn't quite look like a Ford Mustang necessarily from the front, but it certainly is, and it definitely does from the back. In GT3 spec, and another car getting rid of its Sunday rubber at the back. Uh, a reminder that it will be the GT3 class at Le Mans next year. So you're going to get plenty in that specification of car fighting for class honors. And uh, Ferrari, you know what those class honors mean. Of course, they were taking the overall prize this year, but for a very, very long time, they've always been competitive in the GT classes at Le Mans. Yeah, they have the Ferrari 488 Challenge, which we saw go up in the hill in the shootout with Andrew Morrow behind the wheel. And there we go, another iconic XJR9. And that is Mike Wilds behind the wheel. And he was saying on social media how much of a lucky boy he is to have the chance to take this beautiful car up the hill. And I have to agree with him, Alex. Yeah, that is motor racing heritage right there. And I know for so many of you watching Trackside or on the stream, that will just mean a lot as soon as you see that livery, that sound, the covered rear wheels as well. This one, maybe not quite as famous, but the 2003 Bentley 
Uh, they really did turn up. They saw what they conquered. They disappeared again. Um, but this distinctive design, of course, in British Racing Green. You get a lot of attempts for British Racing Green. That is British Racing Green. The livery of it and uh, dominant as well with the uh, Bentley Speed 8 currently in your picture. Yeah, very special car. 2003, 4-litre. V8 turbocharged, and as you said, Alex, it, it conquered, and it certainly did that, winning the Le, Le Mans 24-hour race. And just a be what a beautiful, beautiful car. And every time I see this, I've seen it several times over the hill this weekend, and every time I see it, it's almost like seeing it go up again for the first time. If you thought we were going to have a quiet end of the day, I bring you the Mazda with Johnny Herbert, so it's never going to be a quiet day when Johnny's around, <laughs> is it? His Le Mans winning machine restored to the circuit once again, officially. The 787B, it was a 2.6 litre quarter rotor engine. And all of those years that Toyota tried to win it and Mazda rock up and they build a reliable car, a reliable car that got to the flag and uh, it was the rotary engine. The car remains the only non-conventional piston power winner. Yeah, we're going a little bit back to some rally cars now. We've got the Nissan 240 RS with John Saunders behind the wheel. Look at the lean going through Malcolm Corner as you're going to see it appear. Are we through the hay bales? Yes, we do. Beautifully driven, nicely done. All the way to the top of the hill. Back to the start line now, Alex. Yeah, back to the start line. And this, this has been a little bit finickety, the car currently in your picture. The Matra has needed a restart a couple of times down there on the start line. It's been rescuing from the top of the hill. But it is absolutely worth restarting every single time. And some of the trouble that it causes because it is a classic example of racing from the 70s at the famous circuit, 1974. And uh, it really was a, a special car. Emanuele Pirro, he knows a thing or two about triumphing in the famous race, is taking it. At a, at a, a leisurely pace around Malcolm Corner, but a reminder, it's not had the most reliable week, so I don't blame it. No, I don't. It is last one, obviously, up the hill. And wow, this this just reminds me of uh, my steering wheel that you would, and probably many people do, back in the day where you used to screw it to your desk and you'd have a small <laughs> yes. PC and you'd be playing on Colin McRae Rally. This, this is what that reminds me of, Alex. Yeah, this is from 1996. It was the car that Colin McRae took to victory at the Acropolis Rally. And Subaru taking that year's manufacturer title. He was unable to retain the driver's title, but that, again, a fantastic example of motor racing heritage. <laughs> the wonderful crackle as well. Great to see. And we're following it up. We're, we're following the career of Colin McRae here. This is where he left Subaru when he moved to Ford. And this was the car that he achieved victories in as well. It certainly was. It's the two-litre, four-cylinder turbocharged, making its way up the hill. Just look at that. I mean, what a great batch we've got. Mixing these two batches together with the World Rally cars, we've got Le Mans cars, we've had the drift cars. I mean, anyone that has stayed behind, you're getting absolutely scored right now with these incredible cars. Yeah, great to see as well as we cycle our way through and we are back to uh, batch one here. And the Peugeot 205, the T16 E2 version is from 1985, part of our 50 years of the WRC celebration. Many, many a hot hatch was purchased off the back of this car competing in the World Rally Championship. Beautiful sound. Oh, you can just hear it going up the hill from our commentary box into the distance, and you can still hear it purring along up the hill. And obviously had good success in, in rallying, as we've got more rally cars coming your way as well. Plenty still queuing up at the bottom of the hill, so if you are 
either side of the straw bale so you can remain in situ there's plenty still to see as we make our way through the uh, concluding batches uh, of at the end and uh, this well this just an iconic livery look at that and, i and absolutely love it and the lancia delta hf is out there i know this will be a favorite for many of you watching this stream and the car is contending with Morgan Corner. I'm, I'm intrigued to see at the end of this cycle who's, who's taking a risk on the on the edge of the Morgan turf and who's driving very, very sensibly. With the car that expensive, I think that's probably a wise I idea that's a very to rein it in. Idea. And then, I mean, another, we, get, we are just being pleasured here by these incredible liveries, the Alfa Romeo 155 going up the hill now again with that famous Mar martini livery alex and it it's just well, it screams 90s touring car <laughs> it definitely because does. it it was all about this 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 was in the golden era as well and it really does sum it up this is from 1992 and it was a, a works car back when uh, when everyone seemed to have a works entry in touring cars somewhere or the other yeah certainly did two-litre four-cylinder turbocharged actually has been up the hill already so we, we saw that it was in the the time shootout session so having another run up the hill again but it, it certainly does scream touring cars excellent stuff as we cycle our way through <laughs> TCR again, isn't it? We've seen this plenty of times, the TCR version. And again, took part in the shootout for anyone that saw that earlier on. It's this, uh, I, think, I think everyone saw the shootout, Alice, mainly because the shootout lasted four years, I believe, to be exact. I mean, if uh, some may have been at the bar, I don't know where you were, Alex, but I'm <laughs> guessing you were at the bar. But I, I can't possibly comment. <laughs> no, not at this stage of the day. It's a two-litre, and, well, this isn't a two-litre. This is the BMW iX5 hydrogen, but the Hyundai was a, a two-liter force in the turbocharged, which actually is a current, well, you could say current, 2022 entry into the TCR championship. Excellent stuff. Uh, we are into our final, final batch on this run. And it has been a run where we have thrown it all in. It is the equivalent of chucking it all out of your suitcase and into the wash in, uh, in, in Goodwood style. And uh, we've got the long hydrogen car. We've got the uh, more modern hydrogen, the more relatable, if you like, uh, hydrogen car following it up in the BMW 4x4 behind. Coming past you all now, but uh, you will, you won't hear it, but you will see it. And that, that concept car, being chased towards the end of the batch and this is the BMW iX5 hydrogen and they have uh, introduced this later on to the run and uh, we've, we've seen the, the long car the long concept all the way through and now we are uh, we are concluding the run concluding the batch there we are distinctive car on the hill all the way through. It, you? you are not, not. Miss it. mainly because it goes on for days but uh, brilliant the essence of the festival of speed pushing innovation looking for the next step forward when it comes to technology and uh, that is an excellent excellent way to conclude a batch where we really did show you even more than perhaps we were expecting in the commentary box but uh, i think we've ticked it think how many race wins we've just seen go up the hill alice too many to count i think alex too many to count and that's why i love this this batch and actually uh, combining both batches here to we still don't go away we still have the supercar and first glance to come after this and we can see on screen now the Fiat 131. So the Fiat 131 is uh, is completing the run. Uh, so it was built in 1976, this car, and it was used by the work team between uh, 1978 and 1980. And it then went on, having completed uh, and, and scored a couple of third places in the championship, it then went on to be used all the way until 1983. And in a sea of beautiful cars, that is an appropriate way to bring this batch to an end. And it has been a delight 
to talk you through so much here at the Festival of Speed. Alice, pick us out a, uh, a highlight of that last batch. You always ask me the most difficult questions. Yeah, that's so I don't have to talk at the end of the run. Yeah, no, I, I know. Bit of behind no, the scenes there. That's the best thing. So uh, <laughs> I can't pick a favourite, to be honest. And this, I believe this is only my second festival of speed. And uh, I absolutely love it. So I'm unable to pick a highlight. Uh, and we can see that beautiful BMW stand. And uh, we're going to have a little look now and check out a little bit of rallying. And they had a shootout as well. Let's see how they got on. James Lepley in the Escort Mark II wrestles in across the line for third fastest. Elliot Payne still leads. Gary Lacodu in the Toyota Celica. The Ford Escort Mark II of James Lepley is third. Gavin Edwards is fourth. Fiesta R5 is fourth. Simon Larby's MG Metro is fifth. And James Williams is Hyundai i20, the top six. And alongside Rod. Oh, 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 that was a bounce and a half on the Mitsubishi. Oh, the Galant, yeah. It was, wasn't it? That was a, uh, a sort of precarious landing, if one can call it that. I think that's um, one of the original Mitsubishi uh, Galants. Certainly is, but I was just looking back down on the list there, because alongside Roger Duckworth is Mark Broomfield, and Mark Broomfield is his long-time co-driver, and I'm sure he's got his pace notes there. I am sure he's been down this stage so many times, he's going to be calling the shots now, and Roger Duckworth's going to be listening very carefully to the experienced Mark Broomfield, and uh, a great pairing. Just recently back from Barbados about three weeks ago, they were 10th overall uh, over there in a big fight, and Saunders, John Saunders going for it. John Saunders looking quick indeed. Oh, the stubby little Metro almost nosedive in there and breaking its if, front spoiler. If my mathematics are correct, there is 1.72 seconds between David Brown and Roger Douglas in terms of Friday's times. So a slight spin or something such like for Roger Duckworth and a good run for David Brown. 1.7 seconds here is very little. John Saunders of the MG Metro goes fastest overall. So MG Metro on us very much oh. going Saunders' way. George Lepley Lep in that Mitsubishi we saw having a bounce and a half went second fastest. That mean Elliot, Elliot Payne has now been knocked down to third in the Ford Fiesta Rally R5. Then Gary Lakodu in the Toyota Celica. James Lepley in the Ford Escort Mark II in fifth. But now we are well and truly into crunch time. David Brown in the Ford Escort Mark II RS 1800 and Roger Duckworth the fastest from Friday's shootout in the Subaru Impreza WRC has just set off on his run and is really in prime position. But, as Zav has mentioned with the maths, a poor run from Duckworth, a good run from Brown, and it could all switch around. But we saw a quick shot of Brown just down at Delta, and there was a little bit of a stutter. He was having a problem coming out of the arc of the car, and I think he lost a couple of seconds there. I could be wrong. We will see on the stopwatch when we get towards the end. It's Ford Escort versus Subaru Impreza, and the Ford will be the first to cross the line on David Brown's run in the Mark II RS 1800. What's it going to be? I don't wow. think it's going to be enough. It's only fifth fastest overall. All eyes then turn to Roger Duckworth in the Subaru Impreza WRC. The final car, the final run on the final day here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed on the Forest Rally stage. For overall honours then, can Duckworth do it? Well, just a few moments until we find out. But I think that was expensive for David Brown. As we say, we caught a quick glimpse of him down there at Delta when he was yeah. trying to do his 360, and we can maybe see that on the replay later. Meanwhile, back with Roger Duckworth. How does he do it through Delta? Beautifully. 
Yeah, nice, neat, tidy, and if it looks slow, it's probably fast as he makes his way out through Delta, back uphill now, Gamble, Dakar, next to face for Roger Darkworth, then through into Mexico, the uphill left-hander, the rear kicks out, then you're straight into the right-hander, snaking around that Subaru, it is made for rallying, you think of rally and you imagine a Subaru in blue ringing its way around the tight and twisty forests, which we have become so accustomed accustomed to and treated to over the last couple of days here uh, on the Goodwood Estate. Over the flying fin jump then for Duckworth. Crashes back down, nicely does it, little bit of air time, but carries the speed forward. Just a couple of more corners then for Roger Duckworth. Can he do it? This the shootout on the final day. Duckworth was fastest on Friday's shootout. We combine the times. A few more meters to go for Roger Duckworth with Subaru and Brezza. What's it going to be? It is fastest overall. Roger Duckworth in the Subaru and Brezza WRC with the combined times takes it ahead of John Saunders in the MG Metro 6R4 and George, Le Le uh, George Lepley in the Mitsubishi Gallant VR4. Wow, what a contest. That's absolutely <laughs> fabulous. This what is where it all went away from, from yeah. Brown. Yeah. It was just that slight stutter. And I say that was oh, a second, second and a half, maybe even two seconds is where he lost it down there. And he lost that vital momentum. But with Mark Broomfield alongside Roger Duckworth as well. I noticed that. I, yeah, yeah I, I, that pairing, uh, that dynamic duo together, uh, they have won many rallies together, many contests, including the British Rally Sprint Series at Silverstone, uh, including winning previously over at Barbados and Welsh yeah. rallies, tremendous experience. And if you talk about racing pedigree, as we said on Friday's programme, Roger Duckworth is the son of Keith Duckworth, the designer of the ubiquitous DFE engine. So he has motorsport in his blood. He loves his rallying. He's a staunch member of Southern Car Club, of which I am very proud, and you're a member too, I believe, Xavier. Uh, but they put on this race, and everyone will be chuffed for that. And uh, hopefully, Roger is as pleased as Punch. I think he certainly will be. That got very uh, tasty to the end. Elliot Payne as well, shout out to him. Third fastest overall, considering he was on the back foot, really, after uh, having such a slow time in Friday's shootout uh, due to the wet weather we had. So to get up uh, into uh, into the top uh, five, at least, was a, a really good effort from, from the youngster Payne there. Um, and uh, this is uh, Jess Gwynn, I believe, who had the issues earlier on. So that car was obviously moved aside with, uh, we think, gearbox issues for, for Gwynn. My guess is somebody's gone down into the forest with a couple of bits, screwdrivers, hammer and a big hatchet and managed to get it connected. Yeah. Well, we await the uh, rest of the running here as there's a bit of uh, work to be done to uh, redress the oil drum and the marshals get to work if in doubt get the staplers out and uh, stick it all back on and uh, that is a bold jacket you must say that is wicked <laughs> and it's always oh, an all-in-one it's a two-piece very very nice work there from that marshal keep that up lovely you've got a jacket like that in your locker uh, no <laughs> <laughs> he's got several well, Snake Hips Jardine. Oh, He's has got he? Seven. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what? That doesn't surprise me somehow. Oh, dear. Oh, no. Jess Gwynn, uh, we think, was looking like uh, she was back up and running, but it's just stopped right at the top of the hill. And uh, You're going to have a red flag, I would imagine, for a little minute or two. Yes, well, it's already out at the end of the shootout, but I just imagine they won't get restarted uh, straight away um, for the uh, remainder of the running uh, that uh, anybody can now come back out, should they so please, to uh, get the final bits of running in on this last day. So the recovery vehicle straight to that Subaru, which is stopped just at the, the top of the, uh, the flying fin jump. And, uh, and then we will get underway. But as we've been celebrating 50 years of the World Rally Championship, 
No. The highest class of international rallying launching back in 1973 with over 35 countries having staged rounds since. And uh, teams now free to compete in cars complying with groups Rally 1 to Rally 5 regulations. And of course, we have been looking at the origins of Rally really from Group A, Group B, WRC Group M, it's been an absolute fascination and education as well for many, especially if this is your first time seeing rally cars in action. Uh, a fantastically open paddock as well. You can come around and stay as long as you like and talk to as many people, see as many different cars as you like. And it really is uh, a brilliant opportunity to even bump into a couple of legends as well. We've had the likes of Thierry Neuville here, the, uh, the five-time runner-up in the WRC Championship, and also the likes of Seb Ogier, the second most successful World Rally Championship driver. We've even had legends. Uh, we've had Elfin Evans here. We've also had legends like Peter Solberg. Uh, Stig Blomqvist, we were told, uh, was, was certainly around in the paddock too. And... Uh, many many fantastic brands and manufacturers on display as we celebrate the likes of the group b legends the dawn of modern rallying to its current day guys as jess Gwynn gets a handy lift home so after the shootout we can take a look at the overall times with fridays combined with this afternoon's and it was roger duckworth who took the fastest overall time which was a 609.2 in the subaru impreza a reminder friday's t uh, shootout was very very wet so very different conditions john saunders getting the mg metro 6r4 plaudit in second ahead of lepley Elliot payne and gary lako doing that toyota salika the top five Simon Larby in the other MG Metro, Metro Knight. James Williams looking very rapid, but of course due to Friday's slow time, down in 10th in his Hyundai i20 R5. And into the second page there, and Alan Watkins heading that up uh, from 11th in the Ford Escort Mark II, RS 1800. Dave Watkins in the other Escort, but the RS 1600 down in 13th. Richard Keane's Focus WRC 14th ahead of the other MG Metro, Martin Overington. Nigel K. Chevette, 17th. The McRae Enduro Evo, that was the first car out in the shootout, down in 19th, just in front of the Hyundai Coupe of Graham Middleton.
Kazuki, you've uh, been a sort of unfortunate person and you've had to be a passenger quite a lot this year, but you have now actually managed to get behind the wheel of this hydrogen Yaris. Um, it looks a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. I basically try to maximize the speed on the hill climb, but of course this is uh, only based on the road car, so compared to those cars around, it's yeah, still nothing special, but it runs with the hydrogen combustion engine, which is yeah something new around, uh, I think. I feel like you need to speak to Toyota and get them to enter something for the shootout for you. Well, <laughs> among, yeah, Rowan, Duke, yeah, myself, yeah, it was a nice uh, way of shootout, but uh, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, completely new technology, I think. I think it was new to everyone uh, in Bluetooth here, so I was, yeah, quite proud to bring this car, proud to be in the car, and uh, yeah, it was a really nice uh, showcase for us. The Festival of Speed is, it covers so many bases from rallying to motorcycles to sports cars to Formula One. Um, as a you know, former Formula One driver, a sports car driver, it must be great to see all the other areas of the sport come together because you don't see them anywhere else, I guess. I think uh, this last batch is a really good example for the diversity of the cars uh, in Goodwood. And uh, yeah, I mean, from rally car, NASCAR, drift cars, prototype cars, yeah, I mean, everything basically and uh, i think it's a beautiful of, of uh, good good speed uh, and uh, yeah i mean also talking about the diversity for the carbon neutrality i think we have a lot lot of options here and uh, this time i think we could see electric cars hydrogen hybrid yeah i think we have so many options so yeah i think we have a bright future Kazuki, thank you thank you very much harry you've been having lots of fun in the uh, the Mustang GT3 car, brand new. Um, do they know you're doing burnouts at the top of their head, isn't it? <laughs> Last run of the weekend. Uh, you know, these cars, they're super you know, not technological now. It's all about electronics and laptops. And I saw them flicking around with a laptop and they just gave me a wink and a thumbs up. I just said, floor it and uh, we'll work out the rest. And uh, yeah, they did the magic. It was some, some serious uh, uh, burnouts there. It was good. And it's obviously very new. I mean, just tell us a little bit about it. Does, it. does it feel like a good basis of a race car? Yeah, absolutely. We've been uh, testing it almost exclusively in America, uh, but the car's now obviously in Europe. This is the first time um, anyone's seen it in Europe, and we, we've got an extensive test program over here now, uh, performance testing before back to the States at the end of the year. The car's going to be homologated. It's gonna, the factory team's going to be in IMSA next year. We're going to have a WEC team with Proton Competition, uh, who are obviously a fantastic team as well, and then it's going to be available to customers. So this car's going to be Bathurst, 12 hours, Nürburgring 24, Spa 24. I'm looking forward to it. And judging by the way you came into the top paddock, you're yet another racing driver that doesn't pay for his own tires. <laughs> Again, you know, we've got these uh, Pirelli tires on. We ran, come up on wets, and they said, uh, we expect these to be slicks by the end of the day. So uh, you've, got, you've still got more tread left, though. You need to try harder. <laughs> I saw Jensen. I was watching it on the live stream of the car, and I thought, yeah, I'm following his... Uh, in his tire marks and stop, you know, in front of the house and give it an extra burn up. But uh, maybe we should have got the guys on the laptop uh, to have done it a run or so earlier. But uh, yeah, it's fantastic and uh, it's really exciting that Ford are back. You know, huge, um, huge motorsport program for them coming now as well. Obviously, with the Red Bull announcement in F1 and uh, and you know, global sports car program with Mustang. Cheers, Harry. Thanks, man. Well, all fun and games. And uh, Jensen, we saw a lovely shot just now. Jensen Button getting a ride down in the car that we've seen him go up uh, earlier on and giving a wave to all the fans, which is really great to see. And Jensen Button thoroughly enjoyed today, clearly. And, um, yeah, I think the fans got a, a chance to get a great view of him. So that was lovely to see just a, a few moments ago. We've got some cars lined up down at the bottom for the final run up the hill. Uh, they are the uh, First Glance and Supercars. Uh, that are a very big part of this weekend of the Festival of Speed. Uh, some cars that have been launched here this weekend. Uh, but for Jensen Button, who is one of the great heroes of motorsport and still is getting involved in all sorts of different things, it was great that uh, he could do that. And just look at that. One of the fans uh, has got a tyre, who's managed to get it signed by various people. What a great idea that is. Lovely thing to have. And I hope that is something that is kept for many, many years to come with... Tremendous memories of being here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. 
and seeing things that uh, are just unique here. Very lovely to see. And the sun's still out this evening as we go into the final stages. It's been a, a bit of a strange weekend, I know, and many of you will have missed the action. We all did on Saturday. But thankfully, it has been a really good day today. Um, Henry Catchpole joins me, uh, Henry, who's an expert in uh, road cars, particularly the supercars and the first glance cars that we're going to be getting in just a few moments' time. And uh, you got to have a little run up the hill earlier on as well, Henry. So that was that was a fun thing to do, wasn't it? Oh, it was great. It's always always lovely to drive up the hill. And uh, yes, in the uh, Girardo and Co, the Citroen C4 WRC with a, a fantastic Red Bull livery. So that was that was great fun. Well done. Well, good for you. And uh, I look forward to you talking us through some of these cars. Uh, but let's go down to Laura and David now. Thank you very much indeed, Ben. Yes, we are outside Goodwood House and um, awaiting celebrations and presentations for our winners over the course of the last four days. And indeed, the winner of the shootout is just behind us here, David, the McLaren Solace. Of course, there you are in all its glory. Let's get, uh, we should get out of the way. That's what people really want to see, isn't it? The McLaren Solace in all its glory, of course. Uh, a brilliant run and what a car. What a beast. Well, yeah, as is tradition, at the end of the day for the shootout, we get the winning car and the Solace GT there. Fresh, box fresh, as we said. There, it looks brilliant even from the back there. What a great run and a great drive as well. First day, first week. It's uh, Festival of Speed for Marvin, so a fantastic drive. Yeah, Marvin straight out the box. First time here in Goodwood and straight up the hill in a time of, in 45 seconds, yes, Max Chilton's record, of course, in the McMurtry, not under threat today, but still a really, really decent run for him. And Travis Pastrana, special mention to him as well, of course, in that Subaru. Absolutely. He was a crowd pleaser. I mean, the car was doing so much, but you've got to give it to that car. Brand new car and it did the work. It didn't get the, the record, but nobody expected that this weekend. Absolutely not. Uh, well, I can hear the roar of engines in the background. So while we all wait here and the crowds indeed gather uh, to present our winning cars of the weekend, we are going to head back onto the hill climb with our commentary team for our last batch of the day here on Sunday at Goodwood Festival of Speed. Thank you very much. We've got a, a Ferrari, uh, the uh, Ferrari 599XX Evo, just heading up to the hill at the moment. We've got a, a real tremendous bunch of cars that are all planning to get their final little run, and you'll hear some lovely noises. There are plenty of Ferraris actually here in these two batches. There really are. Sort of, there's everything from the, the XX programs we've just seen with the 599 there, and also the FXXK went up just after it. This is, is a road car, a very limited edition road car. This is the Daytona SP3, fantastic naturally aspirated V12 in the back of this, with those amazing slats on the rear of it. And as we mentioned before, of course, this is actually the first official use, I think, of the uh, Daytona name for a road car because it was unofficial uh, back with the 365 GTB. Yeah, very much inspired, though, by 1960s racers, wasn't it? Um, the 330p41 Daytona back in 1967, that's kind of what got them the name. And uh, it's lovely that they're using that heritage to produce a, a, a beautiful car like this. It really is, yes, and it's absolutely, absolutely stunning to see that going up the hill with that. And sort of taking a lot of the inspiration, obviously, sort of carbon tub and things like that that we've seen in the uh, LaFerrari 4, but without the hybrid in this instance here. It's just, just the naturally aspirated V12 doing the legwork there. Yeah, and uh, yes, I think a lot of people will give a, a breath on that one. It is very, very beautiful indeed. Um, I've got some more coming up now. So that looks like one of the Bentleys coming up. Uh, this is the Bentley Batteur. So we had the Bacala uh, before it, which was the open top version. This is the Batteur, uh, named after a body of water, in fact. And this is sort of part of the celebration, really, of that fantastic W12 engine uh, for Bentley. Sort of, you know, obviously lots of sort of sustainable fuels uh, in various of their cars going up the hill this weekend. But this is a, a real sort of celebration. So monster power in this. Because the W12 is being phased out now, isn't it? It is indeed, yes. Yeah, being phased out. So, uh, yeah, this is a, a bit of a, a last hurrah and sort of really coach built, built in very limited numbers. Uh, this and the Bacala. I can imagine the value of the W12 Bentleys over the years will continue to, to climb up the order. I should think so, yes. It's an engine that's done exceptionally well for them over the years. And here we have uh, one of the Koenigseggs coming up the hill. You can see the 0 to 400 to 0 record on the side of that. The Koenigseggs have been fantastic. Uh, one for the around the supercar paddock and looking under the skin, particularly this one we'll see here. Uh, they've had the rear deck up and all the beautiful jewel-like suspension that you've been able to see uh, under the skin of this. Yeah, no, it's great. Very stunning machines. And uh, the Koenigsegg, which is, they, they, they have delivered, uh, founded in Sweden from 1994, and they've delivered some 
absolutely stunning machines over the years. And a little bit of a wobble there with this fun rear wing on the Koenigsegg Jesko, but uh, keeping it together, no mistakes made. Uh, this one has uh, well over a thousand horsepower, doesn't it? It does. This is uh, uh, the Esco's. It's a tribute to the company's founder, uh, Esco von Koenigsegg. And the two variations of this: the Absolute, which is a top speed one, and the Attack, which is the the more track focused variation of uh, the car. Okay, making its way to the top. We've still got uh, some lovely cars coming up. I can notice that uh, one of the Aston Valkyries, in fact, uh, is due to come up in just a moment. But we're getting some. Uh, uh, one of the Astons, uh, uh, the Astons coming up already and uh, putting down a, a nice bit of rubber on the way. So this is the latest DB12, so this has just been launched down in the south of France, in fact, uh, with all the journalists getting in this, and it's, it's the sort of the update of the DB11. It's 80% new from the DB11, though. Uh, it's the, the V8, the twin turbocharged V8, so we've got no V12 uh, in the DB12 this time, but it's, it's had a lot of influence from... Um, they've poached a few engineers from Ferrari, in fact, in the development of this car, and it's a fantastic car to drive. I've been lucky enough to be behind the wheel of this, and um, yeah, it really does feel sort of perhaps more than the sum of its parts. Uh, it's E diff for the first time in an Aston Martin DB, and obviously the sort of the DB bloodline, uh, incredibly famous over the years, and it feels like yes, a really, a really good DB, and so we should see some more cars from Aston Martin coming. Uh, with this uh, development team in the sort of the coming months and years. Here we are, the Aston Martin Valkyrie. We've got uh, two of the Valkyries. This is the this is the AMR Pro, isn't it? Because the, this is the super super special one with the big wings. Yeah, this is the AMR Pro. So actually quite a different chassis, narrower chassis than the road car, but the full uh, aerodynamic benefits obviously sort of without the uh, need for the road regulations and pulls uh, over 3G as I've actually experienced um, uh, before in that car. Absolutely. Incredible. And Darren Turner um, that was driving that as well, so he was having a, a lovely play, a very experienced racer, of course, with a great deal of success to his name. And this is the DBS 770 Ultimate. Uh, the name is sort of giving lots of clues away there, 770 being the uh, horsepower that this is producing. And in fact, a lot of the sort of work that went into this was then sort of carried over into the DB12 and Ultimate because it is the final of this DBS variation. Well, it is great to see this mix of Aston Martins that we've got here this weekend. They have moved things on a lot, and it's, a, it's a, an important stage, of course. Um, and, of course, they're in Formula 1, they're having a pretty good time as well, so that all helps. They really are, and I, th I think it's one of those things that Aston really has come an awfully long way in the last few years. If you think back to when the, sort of the V8 Vantage was there, and um, it was getting a little bit long in the tooth, and now they've come with the Valkyrie, they've got the DB12, they've got all these new cars coming out, and they're in Formula 1. It's, it's really been fantastic to see this sort of resurgence of... Uh, Aston Martin, and here we have the McLaren DB1 going uphill. Nice to see this. Yeah, and uh, just heading up the hill. It may be well be. I think it's Bruno Senna in the car this time. That's nice to see. Very nice to see. One of the the nicest people you could ever meet, Bruno Senna. And uh, yes, the famous uh, livery on his helmet going up there. And this is one of the the sort of the triumvirate uh, with the LaFerrari and the 918. Spider, which was a Ferrari and Porsches, and this was uh, uh, the hybrid hypercar that came out from McLaren at the same time. Um, fantastically fast car, it still looks just as good today. That wonderful sort of um, sculptural rear wing up on its struts there, and still incredibly fast, uh, this car. It is the, the McLaren P1, it's one of the all time greats, as you say. Uh, that uh, McLaren have produced, they've certainly produced some remarkable machines over the years, and it's lovely to see Bruno Senna taking the car up. And here we go with uh, by the by Gordon Murray, um, and very much part of McLaren, but uh, with a slightly different one. Absolutely, this is the, the T15 with uh, Dario Franchitti behind the wheel, and obviously, as you can say, it's, it's taking sort of lots of inspiration from the McLaren F1 in the past till naturally aspirated V12 in it sounds absolutely glorious revs to over 11,000 rpm and it's got two passengers in it i think because again it's got that central seat of two two passenger seats has not it Ooh. absolutely and it's a, a wonderful place to be to hear the noise the induction noise of that car because obviously you've got the roof scoop and then it goes down and because the passengers sit just behind the driver they get the sort of the best of the um, the, the sound effects from that v12 we just had a, quite a slide from the Rolls-Royce that <laughs> went past our commentary box, but I think it uh, sorted it all out pretty uh, effectively in the end. 
uh, suit. And this is the uh, AMG GT, yet to be uh, released, obviously still in its disguised uh, livery here, but due to be unveiled fairly soon. So nice to be seeing the updated version of that. Rather like that, um, that livery there. Yeah, it is. It does look good, doesn't it? So is that something you'll be going along to the launch for, for a, as part of your normal I, day I, work? I hope so, yes. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully I'll be behind the wheel that fairly, fairly soon. Oh, well, that's great. And uh, it must be a great part of your, your role, um, bringing all the information about new cars, but getting to actually drive them and uh, sit in them when they're in so early on. So Pininfarina, um, Batista is the next one. This is the uh, one named after Nino Farina, yeah. the first Formula One world champion. And again, this is super, super powerful. Absolutely. So they haven't given it any more power for the um, special edition, but it didn't really need it because it has over 1,800 horsepower this is obviously fully that just electric seems crazy 1800 horsepower <laughs> just remarkable isn't it and here's uh, i suppose one of, one of its competitors really so this is the lotus avaya uh, going up and uh, again fully electric from lotus and it's wonderfully sort of sculptural design uh, on this car i've always sort of likened it rather to sort of almost a like a sort of sculpture with those voids going through it uh, for the aerodynamics and we've seen that sort of style of language come down into the emira as well yeah, no, and as you say, it has the same similar amount of power, if not more. It's nearly 2,000 horsepower, isn't it? So Gavin Kershaw, lovely to see him driving the Lotus. He's a very key part of Lotus, a good racer himself, but he's been part of that development uh, engineering uh, team at Lotus for many, many years. So next one getting on the way. And that's the Pagiani, uh, oh, that's another one, isn't it? Yes, the Pagiani Huara, is that how you say it? Pagiani Huara R, so yeah. yes, it's one of those ones I always had to look up how to spell every time I wrote it uh, for, a, for a magazine. But uh, Pagani, obviously the, uh, the tiny but very influential, really, manufacturer um, from that famous uh, supercar valley in, uh, in Italy. And it sounds absolutely wonderful. It's a great noise. That's a really great sound. And Andrea Montemini driving it, uh, very, another very experienced driver. And uh, giving us that noise as he gets up the hill. Uh, I mean, I know we've got some amazing noises, but that one's quite characterful. It really is very, very special, that noise. We've got an electric car just going past us, and that, it was busy sliding around. But because there's no engine noise, you just hear the, the squeal of the tyres. It's quite funny, this mix. We're getting more and more used to it now, um, how you get this uh, the mix of uh, silence from the engine, but you get all that noise from the tyres, don't you? Absolutely. They've had a lot of a lot of attention to NVH and that sort of thing. So uh, we've got the Hurricane Evo Spider going up the hill now. So uh, another naturally aspirated engine, which is wonderful to hear. This is a V10, uh, naturally aspirated V10. Probably the last we're going to see of the Hurricane um, before it gets replaced fairly soon. But, uh, you know, what a wonderful car. Nice being the Spider version. Obviously, you get uh, that open air symphony. Yeah, we're seeing some special editions, aren't we? Just before they start making these of the Hurricane, um, and we've seen a, a sort of a version that you can go and play off-road with this as well. Yes, we've had the um, Storato, which is the off-road version, the STO, which is the uh, more track-focused version, and um, both fantastic fun. Uh, they really sort of seem to have absolutely nailed the Hurricane recipe in these these final ones, and um, yeah, I've had a lot of fun driving those in the last couple of years. You're good. a lucky man, aren't you? You know, you I am very us, lucky. Well, I yeah, drove I that, and then I drove that, and we've we've barely ever had a chance to see them, let alone. Right. Um, okay. Thank you very much for all that, Henry. Um, we're going to bring James back in now because the motorbikes are on the track, James. Yeah. They are, they are indeed. Uh, we're looking at the uh, the Yamaha here. This is a little special one off the DB40 to celebrate 40 years of their Delta Boxer chassis frame. Uh, it's actually a Yamaha XSR 900. A little bit of wheelie there. Good stuff. So that's uh, what that's uh, this bike's in aid of. And he's uh, again nice little wheelie in front of the the crowd. It's kind of a retro style bike. You can style it yourself. It comes with what they call a you know, personalization package, uh, yard works, and you can kind of tick your own boxes on it. Uh, this is the uh, the Norton, absolutely beautiful thing. This is the naked version uh, of their Superbike. It's their own engine. Uh, it's 1200cc, 72 degree V4, 185 brake horsepower, revs of 12,500. A really, really pretty bike and, and very nice indeed. Um, so yeah, good to see Norton sort of coming back in it, especially with their own lump sounding so good. 
Uh, that looks like we got the, uh, the BMW, that is, that's the uh, M1000RR, all carbon, carbon wheels, very lightweight, 210 brake horsepower. Uh, I was on the launch of this bike, it's an absolute weapon, very, very clever electronics as well, really does aid you. It's got an anti-wheelie, which you can see there. Now, this absolute animal, watch this man here. This is a 400 brake horsepower, supercharged Triumph Speed Triple and it's just about to come past us and look at it it just spins it's got extra long wheelbase supercharged 400 brake horsepower and the thing just slides and slides and slides and the man does know how to ride it i will give him that and uh, what a beast 400 brake horsepower on that and he's gonna need new time by the time he gets to the top so lovely to see uh, really nice and behind him, you've just seen him, that bright yellow that you might have just glimpsed. That's the uh, the Speed Triple 765, the Moto 2 bike. Um, this is the uh, Supercharged Triumph. And uh, it was the bike behind him. And that's quite relevant because Triumph now sponsor all the engines in Moto 2. So every engine in the class of Moto 2 is now a Triumph. And uh, they, they, to kind of celebrate that, Triumph have brought out a Speed Triple 765 Moto 2 Limited Edition, which is the motorcycle behind this one. He's still playing around. I mean, we've got to watch him. Isn't that great? I get it. I, you know, I, he's been absolutely brilliant. So, um, you know, it's uh, been been lovely to see. Now we're looking at the electric, the Arc Retro. So that is the, the Moto 2 machine that we were talking about. Um, so there's just seven, it is a 765 size engine, and there's just 765 of each of the two color schemes being made, um, you know, so to uh, celebrate their Moto2 engines. And just behind them was that Arc Vector. We haven't had much chance to see that. It's a real premium electric motorcycle. So that's the end of the road bikes, and um, a lot of fun it's been too. Thanks, James. Thank you so much for your input. Absolutely wonderful. We're back into the first glance cars now. This is the BMW i5, the first electric five series. Of course, BMWs have done electrics for a while, but they haven't done the five series until now. Uh, no, they haven't. And it's uh, BMW really sort of going all in with their electric cars, and we're seeing more and more of them now. It's sort of it's actually very conventionally styled an awful lot of them, but they're getting very good range from a lot of their electric cars, and, and obviously enormous amounts of performance as well. We're seeing sort of some of them actually rival the M cars in terms of the performance that they are putting out. Yeah, no, it's great stuff to see. Uh, we're seeing quite a lot of the new cars coming out now um, because this is what's called the first glance batch. So these are many of them brand new. Some have actually been launched at, he uh, at Goodwood. Others have been launched maybe a month or two ago. Um, there's even one or two here that uh, certainly won't be being sold until next year or even beyond, which is all part and parcel of uh, the fun of the Festival of Speed. The Mini Next Generation Electric, that's, uh, that's getting up the hill now as well. Um, so built in China and uh, part of the, the, the Mini's uh, electrical work that they're doing. In fact, this is the JC1 1 to 6 edition. So that's, yeah, that's a um, slightly different version to the one I thought that we're originally they were going to have. That's it, great to see the Mini's going up the hill. And now we're on to the uh, Defender, uh, which we've got going up the hill. There's fantastic sort of heritage uh, green that we've got going up there. This is the 75th limited edition. It's Defender 90, so it's obviously the shorter wheelbase. And um, it's been doing incredibly well uh, for Land Rover, this car. Yeah, and it's going to be a bit of an anniversary next year, isn't it, for, for Land Rover, I believe. So uh, that'll be an interesting one as well. Um, we may see even more of them here next year. Uh, lovely to see it, though, that this uh, 75th lim limited edition. Uh, it's just caught a glimpse of the hi-fi going up there. The watchword with that is Lux Tech, apparently. <laughs> so uh, it's nothing to do with the hi-fi in it, although it does have a hi-fi in it. Apparently, it's a, a Meridian hi-fi. Um, but yes, electric uh, luxury uh, vehicle, but blending it more with technology. That's its, its USP. So it's a full five-seater, but with two electric motors. Um, this is the Tesla S-Plate, I believe, heading up. Absolutely, and just incredibly quick, uh, the Teslas. They've obviously been setting um, all sorts of benchmarks, and they, sort of, they, they still sort of feel like um, the cars that you have to beat when you bring out uh, a new electric car to some extent. And this is the Plaid version, so the, the very quickest that has been uh, for a long time. Yeah, I mean, Tesla are always known for the power, but the, the, the fact this is the most powerful Tesla, isn't it, I believe, uh, to now, I mean, that's incredible, really. Yeah, absolutely, they are 
just incredibly quick. It's, it's a very strange sensation when you get into one of these and you do a full launch, and you launch and sometimes under two seconds uh, to 62 miles an hour. And it's, it's a very different feeling. We're not quite sure why uh, compared to the launch you get on the internal combustion engine. But um, yeah, it's something that we've all had to get used to. Yeah, of course, the torque uh, is very different. It's coming up behind the electric Caterham, actually, there. Yeah, well. absolutely. A different form of a, uh, electric, which is well, that weighs just under 700 kilos, that Caterham, actually, which is impressive to see. That's it's good, because the they've kept the sort of similar weight to what you would get in a, in a normal Caterham 7, uh, even though they've gone electric, which normally adds extra weight with batteries and electric power. So here's the MG Cyberstar. This, uh, this is a good one to see as well, because this is a first view, isn't it? It is, yes, absolutely. They're sort of potentially going to put this in, into production uh, next year, possibly, I think. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, really nice to see MG sort of going back to what we think of MG as. We've yeah. obviously seen the MG4 going up the, um, the hill as well and uh, the rally concept version. But this is, yes, it's going back to what I think of as MG and many other people's when you think of uh, Morris Garages. Oh, absolutely. I think this will feel familiar. And it's great that they've created this uh, electric... Uh, version and a drop top electric now so uh, you know that is moving on uh, seeing into the future it's uh, been created by uh, china's uh, saic design group in london and uh, yeah so rear wheel drive it's a very very much as you say representative of mg's history yeah, potentially under fifty thousand pounds as well. So it's kind of you know pretty competitive uh, for given it's got four hundred and fifty brake horsepower and not sixty under three seconds. So yes, might become a very popular car indeed. So heading up the hill now, we've just got a few more cars, uh, I believe, uh, in the in the run. It's the Mustang uh, Mackie uh, rally. With, I think I glimpsed Adrian Formo behind the wheel of that. We had Friday driving that up. Now the. Uh, Hyundai, we've seen this car heading up the hill quite a few times, the Ionic 5N, uh, this electric car. It's, it's done, I think it's probably done more runs than almost any other car we've seen, and it's been great fun to watch. Absolutely, no, it's fantastic to see it. Um, you see the N brand on the hill and uh, drifting around just in front of the comms box. There. Yeah, it only once touched the tire, the, the, the bales at one point, I remember, but otherwise it's been OK. Um, Toyota have got some fun stuff here too. Absolutely, Toyota really doing it for the enthusiasts. We say, sort of uh, fantastic range of cars that we've had from them. This is the Supra, but we've got the GR86 as well, and the GR Yaris, obviously. Um, and uh, we've, we've seen them here with the World Rally team as well, um, going up the hill. So it's um, fantastic to see Supra, uh, the Supra name back. Yeah. The uh, Supra GT4 Evo lightweight version does have a roll cage. Um, modified suspension as well um, and uh, yeah you're getting such a mixture of, uh, of cars here just the last little run this is the Bentley Flying Spur Speed Edition and a much bigger a more powerful car, of course, a big, powerful car. But uh, again, I think, isn't this one of the last of the W12s? It is, yes. Yep. So we're seeing this. Uh, the Flying Spur has always been a bit of a bit of a favourite mine. It's a, a wonderful car. It's slightly longer wheelbase. Actually, makes it a really uh, enjoyable car. Sort of through the through the bends. You might not think about that when you look at it, but it is really, really good to drive. Yeah, and. Uh Although it's a big car, uh, it's got all the ability to, to be thrown around, even though it's got a lot of weight and a lot of size, it clearly gives the driver a lot of confidence. And that's a very important part of what a Bentley is. It might be a large machine, but uh, it's one that's got to satisfy the driver. It's a lot of manufacturers uh, who go that way. Of course, Porsche, some of their bigger cars, they, they do the same as well in making sure that it all, all comes together. This is a Lamborghini, so again, you're looking at a, 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 a different version of the bigger cars. Yes, this is the Urus Performante, uh, which actually has a, has a rally mode uh, in it. We've obviously seen the um, Storato, which is in fact just going up the hill behind it, drifting through Malcolm. But uh, the Urus uh, Performante also has a rally mode, so you can take it off-road and do some, do some drifts, um, perhaps on the way back from the school run. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? The sort of fun that people are going to have with uh, vehicles like this. Um, the Urus Performante, you can see Clement Schmidt is driving this up the hill for now and still some lovely cars still to head up the hill actually in this last batch of the festival of speed for all of you who've uh, enjoyed this weekend and i do hope you've had a great day today we've been very lucky today with the weather everything has come together we've had a fun shootout and here we are with one of the pole stars pole star of course one of the best well-known electric manufacturers and they're coming up with new stuff all the time 
They are. This is the Polestar 3. We've also got the uh, Polestar 5 here uh, this weekend in its uh, camouflage. And that's the that's the first bespoke chassis that they've done. They've always sort of obviously lent a bit on, on Volvo in the past, but they're, they're now branching out to, to, to really go alone. And really? They've done, that's interesting. Yeah, they've, they've done some uh, really interesting stuff and interesting, I think, for the enthusiasts, the way they support the um, uh, tunable Olin's dampers to their cars as well. So sort of really focusing on that. Oh, it's, it's, it's good to hear that, that they're sort of going up their own path. I mean, that's very much blended with Volvo, uh, but the fact that they're now developing their own versions is, uh, is a lovely thing to hear. And this is the Genesis GV80 Coupe, and it is just a concept at the moment. Um, you can obviously see quite a lot of the, the style uh, language um, in there that we've seen from Genesis before with those stripes down the side. Also, you think of uh, American football players that are putting the, the wall paint on underneath the eyes like that. And it's uh, Gethin Jones behind the wheel, who's had the misfortune to co-drive for me. Uh, oh, really? Passed in my rally car. Oh, yes. that's so nice. there we are. So he's having a much nicer time on his own, I should think. <laughs> now he's doing the driving rather than doing the co-driving. Were you a good team together? Oh, I think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think the car didn't last very long, so we did some left-handed throwing in a forest. It was great. Great. Well, I know you, you enjoyed the rallying that you did and still very much love it um, so there we go over the line I think we've got one or two more cars just coming up but we're almost done now yeah I think uh, we're actually getting some of the safety cars coming up past us I believe that's pretty much the end of the final batch the first glance batch but um, Henry thank you so much for all your input I mean I know you're writing uh, about new cars all the time but it's great to have you because there are so many cars that we've had in this group that obviously I've never seen before hardly know what they are and so thank you very much for all your understanding and um, knowledge of these machines not at all it's been uh, an absolute privilege to be doing some of the commentary I've been coming to Goodwood for um, almost all of its 30 years it's uh, it's wonderful to be up here and um, speaking to everybody so thank you very much Dee. great okay well uh, it's been good to have you with us and we've had a great team here and uh, I do hope that everybody who now uh, everybody's starting to make their way home I do hope you all have a good journey and I do hope you have lovely memories from today because it has been an, a, a fantastic uh, performance by cars by people uh, the weather everything has worked for us we've been extremely fortunate and I do think we've seen some remarkable stuff that will be memories for many years and I bet actually um, I can imagine in the in in the paperwork, and you're involved in in putting puts in magazines, etc. Uh, and there'll be quite a lot of pictures from the Festival of Speed that will be put out in those magazines. Absolutely, yeah, we'll see them in magazines. The magazines still exist, and obviously on social media and yeah. all the, the videos and YouTube as well. So yes, it'll be wonderful to see in the days to come. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to finish off with some of the highlights that we had from those two batches. So one batch was the supercar batch seeing cars that uh, so many people dream of, to see so many of them together, to hear the sound that they make as well. Uh, some of them are still being developed by top, top drivers. And as we saw Dario Franchitti in the T50, the Hispana Suiza as well, another remarkable car. You've seen some amazing machinery here today, but it's been great fun. And thank you so much for being a part of it. Uh, we really have had a great time. Difficult day on Saturday, of course, and I do feel for everybody didn't get a chance. But from all of us in the booth, from me, Ben Edwards, thanks for joining us. It's been great. What a festival of speed it's been up here in the top paddock. We've had everything from Formula One to drift cars. We've had rally cars and, of course, the shootout, my favourite part of the weekend. It's been non-stop action, and I've absolutely loved it. We'll see you again next year. Oh, Ed, we really have. Well done to you up there in the hill as well. And here we are, our category winners, pre-war racing cars, Julian Maggio, the Maserati Tipo, 65.43, the winning time. In the Goodwood 75 shootout, Max Moritz in the Porsche 935, 55.59 seconds. And single-seaters, Michael Lyons, McLaren Cosworth, M26, 46.89 seconds the time. Great, well done. And... Um, Rally cars, we had Adrian Formo and the Ford Puma WRC, 49.47. Oh, and this was something, wasn't it, in the modified and AWD, Travis Pastrana in that 1983 Subaru, 46.37, his time and second overall. And in the sports racing cars, of course, it was that brand new McLaren Solus GT driven by Martin Kirchhofer in a time of 45.34. In the production GT races... 
47.40 and in the saloon and stock cars jake hill in the nissan 48.18 his time and production cars Murslav magood in the rimac nevera 49.32 and finally, production GT racers Adam Smalley in that Porsche 911 GT3 Cup. And they were our winners. And here we are as we started the whole weekend here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed, standing in front of the central feature, celebrating 75 years of Porsche and in front of the magnificent Goodwood House as well, celebrating three decades of this, the Festival of Speed. And you can see the presentation actually happening behind us for all of our winners that we have just listed. David, it's been something, hasn't it? What's been your highlight? Well, I just can't believe we're here now. It seems like an age ago we're here, Thursday morning, with this gorgeous structure behind us. We had all them launches on Thursday. Of course, this unique Saturday where we were just in the house with without any spectators, but today was fantastic. All those balcony moments and Seb Vettel, I thought that was just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it more than made up for it today, didn't it? And as Ben Edward said in commentary, we are so sorry to those who couldn't make it. Uh, they only had a Saturday ticket, but the atmosphere in here today has been brilliant and hopefully we'll see many more of you next year as well. Um, let's take a look back, shall we, at the moment of the shootout, that McLaren Solace of Marvin Kirchhofer going up the hill. Let's take a look one more time. This is the McLaren that we uh, have seen going up this hill already, the Solus GT. And uh, it's actually Marvin Kirchhofer who's in the car this time. So we shall see just how rapid it will be. Again, this is another supercar with a mid-engined 5.2 litre V10. Let's watch it as it go, ready to get off the line. I think this could well be right up there. It's a central seat cockpit as well, as a racing driver loves. Absolutely, and it launches off the line as we eagerly look at its first 100 metre, and it's not quite as fast as the Rimac, but it certainly has got the pace to charge up the hill. And they've got fantastic on board here of Rob Bell taking it up earlier, 829 brake horsepower as it steams past. Marcovici Brock slams onto the brake through Malcolm Corner, takes a little bit gentle, and you can see how dirty it is there, Ben, kicking up the dust. Yeah, and you've got to be so careful with track limitations here. There are no curbs to go on. You can end up, and you can end up in that wall too. We've seen cars hit that flip wall before, but it was beautifully done. Marvin Kirchhofer is actually driving it very, very well, and the sector times are looking good. This is going to be a very rapid time coming up the line. 45.34, that is a very quick time, fastest so far. Oh, 45.34, an absolutely on the limit there. Expertly called by Ben Edwards and Alice Powell earlier on in commentary. Oh, it was something, wasn't it, David? It was absolutely fantastic. And that car, if you see when he opens up, it's like an airplane cockpit. Stunning looking car and obviously very fast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, besides the shootout, of course, we've been celebrating so many magical moments in the history of motorsport for McLaren, 60 years, what a way, for their 60th birthday to be topped off here. Uh, for Lotus, for Porsche, 75 years for them, 110 years for Aston Martin, 75 years of motorsport here at Goodwood. And we've also been celebrating some of the greats, uh, of course, on the Goodwood House balcony as well, as we always do here at the Festival of Speed, not least Sebastian Vettel. And here he is, Ayrton Senna's McLaren, the last McLaren, that great driver drove. Sebastian Vettel walking through the Guard of Honour up to the house, a special, emotional, poignant moment, and one in which he's showing the future of motorsport as well and showing where his passion now lies. Absolutely, yeah. He's just had a fantastic day, as we all have here at the Festival of Speed. Yeah, he truly has. Sebastian Vettel, I believe, is somewhere up in the house still as well, very much enjoying his first time here at Goodwood in over 10 years. And here, of course, with Race With No Trace, the very important cause that he has here, all the cars he was driving, indeed on synthetic fuel as part of an alternative fuel system here at Goodwood. About 20% of the cars here were running on. Well, David, um, that's been it. We've seen just about every single weather system possible, um, it seems, over the last four days. And we've seen plenty of action out there in the rally stages. It's been brilliant, hasn't it? I've loved it. I've loved it. Even though we had that one day off, it's been an absolutely great 30th celebration of the Festival of Speed. Yeah, it truly has. Big thanks to you, David, for being a wonderful co-host. And it truly has been a celebration of car culture, of motorsport, of all that we love about the wonderful Goodwood Festival of Speed. Thank you all so, so much for watching. And we'll see you again next year.